Last winter I was driving down the freeway at night, going between suburbs of a large metropolitan area kind of thing. So there were plenty of cars around, but it was mainly midnight or so, and it had been snowing when it isn't always white during winter here. I saw a car pull over on the shoulder of the freeway with a guy standing next to it, clearly in need of some assistance. I saw them as I was driving past, but since it was later at night and was cold out, I figured I might as well take the exit, loop around, and see if the guy still needed help. I get there, and it's a middle-aged working class type of guy standing outside of his pickup. He's wearing blue overalls, slender, is slightly balding, and puts off what I can only describe as a weird vibe. I couldn't put my finger on it, but it was one of those weird gut feelings that you aren't sure why you feel. He says that he's been having car troubles, is from two hours out of town, that his alternator is shot and that his battery needs a boost. I've owned a car with a shot alternator and I know that when the battery dies, you need to boost it for a little while if you're going to get it running again. I tell him it's no problem, commiserate with him for a minute, pop my hood and he says he's going to go grab his cables. When he comes back, I notice in his hand that he has some sort of concealed metal object. I've no clue what it was, but I saw it for a brief moment and saw that it wasn't a knife, but that it was metal and a little shorter than the length of his hand, and he was clearly trying to keep it concealed from my view. This all happens so fast, so I'm immediately on high alert. I see it for a split second as he's bringing the cables to me so that I can hook up my battery. I instantly take a step back and put some distance between us and tell him that he can hook up my battery and I'll wait in the car, all the while an instantaneous full fight or flight, getting ready to block an attack if he were to lunge at me. He doesn't, and starts connecting the cables to my battery as I'm sitting in my car. I start to wonder if I was imagining things as he connects the battery, and we both wait for the battery to charge. Maybe it was just something that was bundled in with the cables that he just had in his hand. Maybe I misread the situation as dangerous. After a few minutes, he goes to start his car, shouts that it isn't working, and then walks back to my car where he waits in front of it. After a few minutes of waiting, he puts his head back under the hood of my car to fiddle with the cables. All the while, I'm of course watching him intently to make sure he doesn't come to the car window because I was still spooked. He shouts some things about how it isn't working and asks me to come out to take a look. I open my window a bit casually tell him to not worry, and that it's probably just going to take some time. Luckily, I can just barely see my battery in the dark, through the gap under the popped hood of my car through the windshield directly in front of me. I see him then fiddle with the cables, and hear him shout again that it isn't working, and for me to come out. Then, I see him slip out the metal object I'd seen earlier, and saw him touch it to my battery terminal as spark shoots out from where he touched it. He starts yelling and jumping back, as I immediately jump out of my car and tell him that something came up and that I need to go now. I honestly don't remember much of what he was trying to say as I cut him off, or exactly what I said outside of that I needed to get the fuck out of there without taking my eyes off of him for even half a second. I don't even remember how the cables came off my battery, but I slammed the hood shut, jumped into my car and drove off. I still have no idea what his plan was, no clue what he was trying to do, or what on earth he was trying to make happen, but I do know for a fact that what I saw him do is in no way what he was telling me he was doing. But as I left him there and drove off, I was practically pinching myself, trying to make heads or tails of what just happened, and I cannot stress this enough that the guy just gave off the weirdest vibes like the hills have eyes kind of weird vibes. Maybe he was planning on trying to short my battery so that I was stuck there. But to this day, I wonder if I encountered some sort of mass murderer who had been planning on kidnapping somebody at the side of the freeway as they stopped to help. Who knows, but either way, it was weird as fuck. And it spooked me, and I noped the hell away from that guy as fast as humanly possible. I still wish I'd gotten a license plate or something to give to the cops, 
But in that moment, the only thing going through my mind was just to remove myself from that situation as fast as possible. I used to be employed as a child protection worker. A report came through about a stepfather who was being abusive to his children. I was given the investigation by my team leader. When I interviewed the oldest child with the police, she had very visible physical injuries and told me exactly what had happened. I'll spare the details, but it was horrific. As the children were in his sole care, we knew that they needed to be removed immediately. We sent a team of two workers out to the children's school while myself and a colleague called the stepfather into the office. I lead the interview and it was horrible. He didn't even try to deny that he'd hurt his stepchild, basically saying, That's my kid. I'll do what I want and you can't stop me. When I served him with the paperwork, he absolutely lost his mind. He was swearing and screaming and said, If we were outside this building right now, I would fucking kill you. We ended up running out of the interview room, pressing our emergency alarm, and I even had to make a police report about the whole thing. It got really messy. The next day we had court for the children and my manager decided I shouldn't attend due to everything that had happened the previous day. My colleague who attended told me that this man was at court and yelled several times something to the effect of, where is that bitch of a worker who took my kids? I remember feeling a little freaked out, but it's not uncommon to hear things like this when you have to remove a child. It's understandable that emotions are very high. You build a bit of a resistance working in this field, and overall, I mainly felt relieved that those children had been placed with an aunt and were safe. About two weeks later, I had to stay back late at the office on an unrelated job. It was about 9pm when I finished, and I was the only person there. I walked out the back of the building to my car. It was really dark, but when I got close, I thought I saw a shadow moving at the front of my car. Just for a second, and then it was gone. I was about 20 meters away at this point, but it startled me. I stood there for a second, just looking at my car, wondering if I was just being paranoid. While staring into the darkness, I started hearing tiny rustling noises. And whether imagined or not, all of the true crime horror stories I've ever heard flashed into my mind. Safe to say, I freaked myself out and sprinted back into the building. I called my boyfriend to come pick me up and explain what happened. By the time he drove up to the front doors, I'd convinced myself I was being silly and asked him to drive me around to my car. He circled around and with the headlights shining on my car, I could very clearly see that all four of my tires had been slashed. I was an absolute mess that night and called the police immediately. I was pretty sure that this man was responsible, but as I hadn't seen him, I couldn't say for sure. I took a few days off and came back to a meeting with my manager, who had put together a safety plan for me and the other staff. She'd organized to have a security guard escort us to our cars and said very clearly that no one was to stay in the building after hours alone. Then about a week later, a letter was delivered to the office addressed to me. Any mail that comes into the office goes through our reception staff. Our lovely receptionist opened it, and it was a note that said, You're as good as dead, bitch. The words were typed and printed. She was an older woman and burst into tears when she read it. It didn't say who had sent it, but I am convinced that it was the same man. Over the next few weeks, letters kept coming, each one getting longer. They addressed me as bitch and homewrecker, saying that I kidnap and abuse children. It was just horrible, horrible stuff. The threats in the letters were the worst. The person writing them threatened to assault, torture, kill find out where I live and burn down the entire building. To be honest, the police were less than helpful. They basically said that given the nature of our work, they couldn't conclusively say it was this man, although they had questioned him. To me, it all seemed like a pretty massive coincidence. 
I'd never had anything like this happen before. They did say they were taking the letters very seriously and tracking down where they'd been posted from, but I never heard anything back about that. My workplace took the threats very seriously too. All of the security was bumped up across the building, and all staff completed refresher training on emergency management. One day on the way home from work, I noticed that a car was following me. At first, I thought I was being paranoid, so I drove down a bunch of little streets, doubled back onto the same route in a way that would make absolutely no sense. Even after all that, a dark green Camry was still placed a little way behind me. I freaked out but had already planned in my head what I was going to do in this situation. I headed straight to the police station, planning to pull right up in front of the building and beep my horn until I had someone's attention. The second I pulled into the police station, the green Camry drove straight past and disappeared down a nearby side street. I sat there for a good 20 minutes, too scared to get out of the car in case they came back around the corner. It dawned on me that in my panic, I'd forgotten to get the license plate. That upsets me to this day. I told the police what I knew, but they told me that the man didn't have any car registered in his name. This was the final straw for me. I was a nervous wreck. I was looking around constantly at work and at home. I knew that he lived relatively close to me, so I even stopped going grocery shopping in case I ran into him. I stayed on stress leave for a month and heard from colleagues that letters kept arriving. I was very honestly ready to quit, but then COVID happened. It really changed everything. Everyone went into lockdown and all access to the office was restricted. I started back working from home, driving a work car to and from appointments. I didn't go into the office regularly anymore, only allowed in small working groups when absolutely necessary. Over the next years, the letters slowed and eventually stopped. By the time we were allowed back into the office, there hadn't been any sign of this man for almost seven months. About a year later, I left child protection. I don't know what happened with those children, but my hope is that they're happy and safe with their family. And as for the man who I believed stalked and threatened me for doing my job, let's not meet ever again. So this happened a while back. I was probably around 10 to 11 years old, meaning my brother Alex was around 8 to 9 years old. We were walking home from the bus, which takes about 7 minutes when I noticed something was off. I didn't see anything at first but I just knew that something was wrong. So my brother and I start walking home, as the only two who got off at our stop were him and I. This blue and silver beat up truck drives past us, and I think nothing of it. It never slowed down or stopped, it just kept going. Alex and I were holding hands, as my grandmother always told me to do with him as he's my baby brother, and I want nothing to happen to him. Nothing happens at first, but then the same truck drives around again, driving our way this time. It was driving slower this time and went up the road and turned, out of sight. Now, Alex and I were nearing the three-way intersection that connected the cul-de-sac road to another side road, right off the main road the man just drove down. I happened to look down the street and see the truck driving real slow down the street towards us again. I knew we had to run. I knew there was no other option. I knew that if we didn't, my brother and I would not be safe. I didn't know how I knew, but I did. As soon as we passed a house that blocked us from view, I turned to Alex and spoke to him exactly four words. No questions, just run. And we did. In our driveway, there's a row of bushes and pine trees that divide our home from the next door neighbor. I dragged him in there and told him to be quiet and I'd explain later. I watched as the same truck drove down and around the cul-de-sac again before coming to a stop right in front of our house. I had to hold my brother's mouth shut because he was crying and I was scared that whoever was following us would hear him and hurt us. 
I was more worried for him than myself at this point. I was in fight or flight mode. I was the big sister. I had to protect him. I looked at him and said that the truck was following us, and I told him not to be scared. I said I wouldn't let anyone hurt him, and it seemed to calm him down a bit. After what felt like hours, but was probably only minutes, the door to the truck opened, and out came a man. He was tall, skinny and messy, short hair covered by a torn baseball cap, ripped jean shorts, and a puke green tank top. He entered our yard and looked around a bit. Alex and I were still in the bushes, and I was trying to find a way to get to our house safely without getting this guy's attention. The guy left after what felt like forever and entered his car. He started it and drove around slowly. I waited a few minutes to make sure he was gone before turning to my brother and saying, We need to run. When I count to three, we're gonna run behind the house to the back door, okay? He agreed and we waited a few more seconds before I started counting. I still didn't have a good feeling about this, but I knew we had to move. I started counting. As soon as I hit three, we booked it across our driveway and into the front yard to go around the house. As soon as I left our spot, I heard it. The sound of accelerating. He saw us. He was waiting for us to leave. He chased us up our driveway as we ran around the side. I grabbed Alex's hand and practically dragged him around the house and made him run ahead to the garage door to see if it was locked while I searched for my house key. The garage door was open, and I swear to God, I saw this man round the opposite corner of the house that we did as I entered the house. We entered it, and I slammed it shut, locking it and deadbolting it. I didn't stop running until I opened the house door and ran downstairs with Alex, screaming our safe word. It woke my aunt, who worked the night shift and was sleeping, we told her everything, and she stayed up with us until my grandmother got home. We called the police, and that was my first ever interaction with an officer. The man was never caught. To this day, I don't know what he wanted, but I'm sure it wasn't good. I'm just glad my grandma drilled stranger danger into my head. I don't know where my brother and I would be right now if she hadn't. I've quibbled with the thought of publicly sharing my story for a while now. Recently I've arrived at a place where I think the benefit of sharing outweighs the risk, so I'm taking a chance and just putting it out there. Maybe it will help someone. Many times I've looked back on the odd events leading up to the scariest night of my life, October 5th, 2015. I'd like to say that I did everything right, but honestly, in hindsight, I should have done more. I'm convinced that my son, who was three and a half years old at the time, actually saved me from harm that night. I could have easily become another statistic in the crime database. Although my stalker did not hurt me physically, it took me months to get past the psychological damage. Here is my story. In May 2012, I temporarily exited the workforce following the birth of my son, Chris. He was born with a physical birth defect that would require multiple corrective surgeries during his first year of life. He was also born two and a half months early, which had complicated things further. Chris's father, Aaron, agreed that I should stay home with our son until he was a year old, considering the circumstances. In May 2013, I felt comfortable enough to leave my son with a babysitter, so I went job hunting. I ended up being hired on the spot as a waitress at a small but very popular chain restaurant in my little town. Let's just say this little diner is widely known for their waffles and leave it at that. I was hired on to work second shift. After two months I'd worked my way up to first shift. By the summer of 2014, I'd long built a clientele of regular customers that enjoyed my service and tipped me well. Enough for me to have a little put back in savings, which came in handy when Aaron and I broke up. 
I ended up moving out of our apartment with Chris and renting a small two-bedroom trailer in the same town. It was mid-November of 2014 when I first met Ryan, the man who would later stalk me. It was an abnormally slow Saturday morning shift at the diner. Two men walked into the diner together and sat down in my section. They were my only customers at the time, so when the older man of the two started making small talk, I had the time. The older man introduced himself to me as Ryan, and the younger man with him was his son. Right away, by his body language and tone, I could tell Ryan was being flirtatious with me. He even cracked a cliché joke, saying, There's no way you work here because you're too pretty and you have all your teeth. Honestly, I wasn't really amused with that tired kind of humor. And while Ryan was decent in the looks department, I was a little annoyed with being casually hit on by him. I was 25 years old at the time and much closer to his son's age. But nevertheless, I faked merriment because a happy customer equals a better tip. It's just part and parcel to the job. Suffice it to say, my fake laughing and smiling paid off, earning me a $10 tip on a $20 ticket. They were only there for 30 minutes too. Not too bad, I thought to myself. The following weekend, Ryan came back to the diner. This time, he came alone. There was nothing unusual about this interaction than from the last. I took his order. We chit-chatted when I had time. I kept his coffee refilled, and that was it. But apparently, he enjoyed his experience, because again, he left me a nice $12 tip on an $8 ticket. Ryan began visiting the diner every weekend from then on up until the end of December. By then, he had started coming two to three times per week, and at this point, he really started showing an interest in getting to know me. Now, that's not something unusual per se. I had some other regulars that I actually developed friendships with, so I did tell him things about myself in casual conversation during his visits. Just normal things that normal people talk about. One of the things I eventually told him about was the medical miracle that is my son. I even bragged about the fantastic job his doctors did, showing him the before and after photos of his surgeries. Over the past several weeks, Ryan's attitude toward me had changed. He was no longer this annoying, flirty, middle-aged guy, but rather a seemingly caring person. Maybe I was naive, but I genuinely appreciated his kindness, and I did not interpret it as a romantic gesture at all. Ryan continued coming by on my shifts for breakfast three times a week. February 2015 is when the first strange event occurred which was soon followed by a string of more. It was a Tuesday afternoon. I had picked Chris up from the babysitter and was heading home from work. Now, where I lived was on a small uphill dead-end road. As you pulled onto my road from the main highway, you could easily see my trailer on the right side at the top of the hill. It was positioned perpendicular to the road, and the back side of it is visible as you drive up the road. As I eased my way up the hill, something immediately caught my eye. I could clearly tell my back door was open. I put the brakes on immediately and tried to figure out what to do. I literally never touched or unlocked that door, much less opened it, so I knew something was off. A door is not going to unlock and open all by itself. I ended up parking my car off to the side of the road and calling Aaron. At this point, we were on good terms and co-parenting our son very well. Aaron came straight over and checked out my trailer while I remained back in my vehicle with Chris. About five minutes after entering, he called me and told me it was all clear. So I made my way up the hill, expecting to have been robbed or something, but nothing was missing. There was no damage to the door. So Aaron basically brushed things off, saying that I must have forgotten to close the door myself or something. I knew better, but since there was no sign of a B&D, I let it go. Two days later, I come home from work, and the same thing. My back door is wide open. At this point, I know I'm not crazy. I know I'd lock that damn door. It didn't have a deadbolt, by the way. 
they just had a lock on the doorknob that you turn. I had even tested it out that morning before work to make sure it was locked. So I called Aaron again. I stayed parked with Chris on the side of the road while he did a quick pass through my trailer. And again, nothing out of the ordinary except my open back door. A quick inventory showed that nothing was missing. I was nervous at this point that someone had broken in twice, and Aaron disagreed. He attributed this problem to a faulty doorknob lock. He then went to Lowe's and purchased a type of heavy-duty swivel lock to install on the door that locked from the inside of my home. He wanted to put my mind at ease at least. So while he installed the lock, I combed through my house. I mean, I literally spent hours after Aaron left inspecting every nook and cranny of the trailer. The outlets, my shower head, vents, my panty drawer, everything. I thought that maybe some freak had broken in and planted secret cameras since they didn't take anything. I didn't find anything amiss, so I begrudgingly let it go. Two days after that, I'm off work heading uphill on the road toward my driveway. My son is spending the weekend with his dad, so I have the house to myself that evening. A wave of relief washes over me as I see that my back door is still closed. Now, I don't know why I decided to do this, but something compelled me to actually inspect the door up close. I needed to make sure it wasn't tampered with. To my horror, I discovered that it had. There were pry marks along the edge of my door jamb. I immediately went inside and unlocked the door so I could open it and inspect further. The edge of the door was bent to hell and back on the inside where the doorknob met the jamb. That damage wasn't there two days ago when Aaron installed that new lock. I deduced that someone had probably been using the credit card trick to easily break into that door since the way it locked was by the knob. And when they figured out it would no longer work, they tried to pry it open, not knowing that a new lock was on the other side of the door. I'm thankful that lock held. At this point, I called the police and made a report. They basically told me there wasn't much they could do in this instance other than document the incident. They told me to call them if anything else happened. Needless to say, that wasn't satisfactory to me, but I didn't know what else to do. I didn't feel comfortable sleeping at home that night so I ended up making the hour drive to my parents' house and crashing there. Nothing else happened for a little while. By March, I'd been able to put February's events behind me and feel secure in my home again. I was working and going about life as usual. At this point, Ryan had begun visiting the diner five days a week. Oddly enough, he was there each shift that I worked. It became a running joke with the other waitresses and in fun they teased me about having a stalker. I would soon find out just how true that actually was, because in April, things got weird. I came home from work one day to find my grass had been mowed. Now, I usually paid a neighbor to do it for me since I didn't have a lawnmower. My yard was small, but maintaining it was a requirement of my lease agreement. My neighbor didn't charge much to mow it, and he needed the extra cash, so it was a win-win. I knew I hadn't asked my neighbor to mow recently, so I thought it was strange. I asked him if he went ahead and decided to do it anyway. He said he hadn't. So then I called my landlord and asked her if she had mowed my grass for some reason. I knew my grass hadn't been high enough to warrant that, but it was the only plausible explanation. Of course, she said no. She hadn't mowed my grass. I was stumped. I then assumed that an anonymous neighbor must have mowed my grass out of the goodness of their heart. You know, like a pay it forward kind of thing. I mean, what else was I to think? All throughout April and the beginning of May, my grass was being anonymously mowed once per week. I know it sounds strange hearing it, but at the time, I genuinely thought a neighbor was just doing neighborly things and didn't want to be recognized for it. On May 5th, 2015, Aaron and I decided to take Chris to the zoo. When we got back from the zoo late that afternoon, we discovered that my front door was cracked open. Ugh. Now, my front door didn't have a deadbolt, but I must have forgotten to lock it. 
How stupid of me. You can imagine how upset I was due to my back door being tampered with multiple times back in February. I just didn't understand why this was happening again. Like all the other times, nothing was taken. My belongings seemed untouched. Yes, I was feeling targeted, but I didn't call the police because I felt like I technically had nothing to report. There was nothing stolen or vandalized, just an open front door. So I let it go again. Two days later, I would discover the depth of things. May 7th, 2015. It was one of my rare off days. I was at home relaxing when the diner called me. I answered thinking my boss wanted me to come into work. It wasn't my boss, but my co-worker Celia. She stated that someone named Mary called the diner asking to speak to me. Mary had asked for me by name. Since I wasn't at work that day, Mary left her phone number and requested that I call her as soon as possible. I thanked Celia for the message and ended the call perplexed. I didn't know who Mary was, but out of curiosity, I gave her a call. Mary ended up being Ryan's estranged wife. She informed me that Ryan had a nervous breakdown while they were arguing earlier. He started raving like a wild man about how Sarah is a better girlfriend than she is a wife. He told her that we were in love and that he'd been taking care of me and my Down Syndrome son for months. My son doesn't have Down Syndrome, by the way. She initially thought it was all just crazy talk considering his mental state. He mentioned where I worked. He said we were going to get married. He said that I had asked him to adopt my son. He said that he was going to run away with me in order to get away from her. He even told her he started visiting me after following me home one day. When he said that, Mary knew that something was very wrong. Ryan had somewhat of a history with mental issues, and Mary was used to him weaponizing things to hurt her feelings during arguments, but she said that this time was different. She knew he had started frequenting the diner, and red flags went way up for her when he admitted to following someone home, so she decided to call the diner and see if anyone by my name worked there. When Celia confirmed this, Mary perceived the possible danger, and she left me her name and number, requesting a callback. My head was spinning at this point. While things were finally starting to make sense, I was still gobsmacked. At one point in the conversation, Mary mentioned my grasping mode. Yes, Ryan even flaunted the yard work he did for me in her face. It was all very strange and very surreal. Basically, Ryan had been obsessing over me for months. He became delusional and it created a whole relationship between me and him in his mind. It was all in his head, and obviously he was the one breaking into my home when I was gone. Why he did it, I still haven't pieced that 100% together. He never took anything. I imagine he was mowing my grass because that was his little way of taking care of me. Anyway... By the end of the call, I decided to go to the police department in person to file a report about Ryan. I thought at the very least this is harassment and I needed it documented. Maybe I could get a restraining order. Mary offered to provide an official statement to the police as well, to which I thanked her. The police department took our statements and the harassment complaint was filed. Although I couldn't get a PO based off of my statement alone, the officer did assure me that he would personally go talk to Ryan. I then went straight to the diner to inform my boss, Chase, of the situation. Now, Chase took this very seriously. Just that morning, a third shift waitress actually brought up to Chase how a man came in the diner very early, at around 4am. This man was trying to get her to tell him which days I'd be working that week. She told Chase it made her uncomfortable. So when I told Chase about Ryan, he went back and looked at the camera from that morning. And sure enough, the man that was bothering Third Shift for information about me was Ryan. So Chase initiated the process through corporate to get a permanent ban on Ryan from the diner. It was approved at a later date. I was scheduled to work the following day, and I was nervous throughout my entire shift. But thankfully, Ryan didn't show up. 
nor did he show up the following day or the next day after that. All was quiet at my home as well. The officer showing up at Ryan's house to speak with him must have spooked him enough to stop. Weeks, then months went by. No Ryan in sight. No vandalism at my home. No mysteriously mown grass. Nothing. My life had gone completely back to normal. But things changed again in October. October 5th, 2015. It was around 8pm. My son Chris fell asleep on the couch while watching a movie. I had dozed off as well, until I heard a few very light knocks on my front door. I then walk to the kitchen and look out the only window that faces my driveway. No cars there except my own. So I figured the light tapping I heard at my door was either just the TV or my half-asleep brain playing tricks on me. I then returned to the couch and started playing a game on my phone. About five minutes later, I heard a few light knocks on my door again. This time, I was wide awake, so I knew my brain wasn't playing tricks. So I walked back over to my kitchen window to double-check the driveway to see who was there. Again, my car was the only one in my driveway. Right as I go to close the kitchen window blinds, loud knocking suddenly erupts at my front door, and I mean loud, angry banging. I guess my instincts kicked in, and I sprinted to the couch. I scooped Chris up in my arms and ran down the hallway to his bedroom. I did the only thing I could think of in that fraction of a moment. He was groggy and confused, but he listened to my instructions. Get under your bed, stay under your bed, and don't come out until I tell you to. I then ran to my kitchen and grabbed a knife while dialing 911. I actually screamed at the door that I was calling the cops in hopes that it would scare them away. I positioned myself at the end of the hallway, which connects my son's room to the living room. This way I'd have a clear view of both the front door and my son's bedroom doorway. As the operator picked up my call, the banging on my front door was getting even louder. 911 said she was dispatching police right away. She instructed me to stay on the line until they arrived. About 12 minutes into the call, the banging got more violent, rattling pictures off of the wall. I thought for sure that they would break down my door at any moment. 911 asked me where I was located in the home, and I told her. She asked me if I could hide somewhere. She told me not to put myself in danger. In that tiny moment, I felt enraged. Hell no, I'm not gonna hide. I'm not taking my eyes off of my son's bedroom under any circumstance. Where are the cops? And besides, I lived in a small trailer and the only hiding place for an adult is my bedroom closet. I'd be easily found. So I just erupted over the phone. Look lady, I'm a single mom. I have no man, no gun, and no place to hide. If he breaks this door down, what am I supposed to do? Throw this knife at him. Where are the fucking cops? She assured me again that the cops are on their way and to stay on the line. More banging, but this time it moved to the actual side of the trailer. It sounded like they were taking a baseball bat and beating against the outside of the trailer. At that moment, Chris started shrieking. I ran the few steps over into his room to check on him. The loud commotion had just pushed his fear gauge over the edge. He was screaming and crying incessantly under his bed. I quickly ascertained that he was physically okay, and I returned back to the end of the hallway to check on the front door. As I was explaining to 911 that my son was okay but just scared, I noticed that the banging had suddenly stopped. I waited another minute or so, trying to listen out for any sign of further escalation. All I could hear were sobs coming from my son's room. All in all, it took the cops 23 minutes to arrive. By then, the perp was long gone. For reference, I live about 10 minutes away from the police station. 911 even called it in as an active home invasion. I was livid about the response time. My front door was made out of some type of metal, just a cheap generic trailer door. It was now covered in dents. There were noticeable scratch marks on the lock. The siding on the trailer was damaged where the perp had hit it with something. Given the history, 
I immediately suspected Ryan was the perp. The police said since I didn't actually see the person, they couldn't arrest him without an eyewitness. The most they could do was make a report. They did end up canvassing the immediate area in case he was on foot. However, there was no sign of him or anyone around and about. I deduced that he probably had parked nearby out of sight. That way his vehicle wouldn't be spotted or recognized at my home. My home was situated near a thin patch of woods that has public access roads on the other side. I am also absolutely convinced that Ryan had nefarious plans for me that evening, but when he discovered my son was at home with me, he bailed. He stopped trying to break into my home the moment my son made his presence known. For whatever reason, Ryan always lit up when I talked about my son. He used to initiate conversations about Chris just to watch me dote over him. Looking back, I guess it was his morbid way of bonding with my child. And I think in his own warped way, he grew to care about him. So when he heard Chris scream, he decided to not follow through with whatever his plan was for me. I ended up taking a few days off of work because I was so shaken up. I stayed at my parents' house during that time because I was afraid to go home. My landlord had the damaged door replaced while I was gone. Realizing that I had a job and a life, and that I couldn't stay gone forever, I knew that I had to go home. So I got a gun, a small caliber revolver, but it would do the job. And then I went home. I lived in that trailer for another four months before I saved up enough money to move. It was totally peaceful during those months, with no further events or altercations, but I just couldn't stand being there anymore. Since then, I've changed jobs, met someone special, gotten engaged, bought a house and got a dog. No further sign of Ryan anywhere during any of these life changes. It's been nearly seven years since any sign of him. Ryan seems to have disappeared out of my life in the same manner he first appeared out of nowhere, and I couldn't be happier that he's gone. Hopefully, it stays that way. So a bit of background here. My father was in the army for 21 years. He retired and moved to a very small town in central Florida. He got bored after a couple of years, and even though we didn't need the money between his retirement and what my mom was making as a bookkeeper slash tax prep, he wanted to go back to work. He started working at various gas stations, and it being a small town, the owners wouldn't care if I came there and helped him out with stocking the coolers, or even running the register, as long as I didn't sell any beer or smokes. This all took place in the late 80s and early 90s. The actual story I'm going to tell took place in 1990, and I remember the date well, because it was shortly after my birthday and being 15 in Florida, I just got my learner's permit, and my dad would let me drive him to and from work, just to get some experience on the road, both at day and at night. I was sitting in my usual spot at a table that was set up along the windows, book in hand, feet propped up and a Mountain Dew on the table, along with some snacks. I would generally spend most of the evening that way, reading books, getting up to run the register and stock the cooler at different times. I remember glancing up, because something caught my attention that was unusual, and I realized that a lady was walking up our parking lot from the direction of the interstate. This in itself was really strange, because where we were located, you didn't get many people walking and definitely not walking from the direction of the interstate. I figured she'd broken down somewhere and was coming to use the phone to call for a tow truck or something. I was completely wrong. She came into the store, looked around for a few minutes, and I remember getting just a strange and creepy feeling about her. She walked up to the counter and started telling my dad a story about how she'd gotten stranded and needed a ride up to the next big town up north from us. Ocala was the town. Remember that. My dad lets her know that he's working, and there's no way that he can take her. She turns and looks at me, and while she's looking away from him, 
My dad catches my eye and suddenly shakes his head no. I was confused for a second, but then she turns back to my dad and points at me, asking if I can take her. My dad responded back that I only had a learner's permit and wouldn't be able to drive her anywhere and then drive back. Normally, I would have done it, even though it was illegal because I'd done it a few times before already. I didn't argue with my dad since this was completely out of character for him. He was normally chatty with the customers, but for whatever reason, he was almost curt and dismissive of her. It turns out, he had a bad vibe about her from the minute he had seen her walking up the drive. Well, she cusses him for a minute, and he basically tells her to get out of the store. She slammed the door open. I thought the glass was going to break from how hard she slammed it, and then she stalks out of the store and down the driveway. I keep an eye on her and continue to watch as she makes her way back up to the interstate and then starts up the northbound on-ramp. Almost a year passes, and in my bedroom, less than a week before my 16th birthday, I hear my dad yelling from the living room, Son, get your ass in here and look at this. I quickly run to the living room and see my dad pointing at the TV, and I look at the mugshot of the lady up on the screen. I immediately remember the lady who had been in the store. Turns out, I almost gave a car ride to Eileen Wernos, who was later convicted of being a serial murderer and then later put to death. I still have nightmares about what could have happened. This happened one night about a quarter after midnight. I was in my bed when I heard frantic knocking. I walked out of my bedroom while the knocking continued again, and I heard a woman saying, please help me, along with crying, but it was faint. I looked out the peephole to see no one there and no other doors were being knocked on, just mine, which is odd itself, but I'm also on the third floor. Why would someone walk all the way up to my apartment if they were in distress? I think it was a recording, because if someone really needed help, they would be banging on everyone's door. I called the police immediately and the dispatcher told me not to open the door. They also asked if I had a weapon. I've heard of this tactic before, while slightly different of it being a recording of a crying baby. It's insane when thinking about the statistics of stranger abductions usually resulting in murder. It's just so sick to try and prey on people's empathy. Police drove by. I saw them using their spotlight to look through the complex, but I had no idea if anyone was found or by chance someone was hurt if they found them. I've barely slept with all the possibilities of how this person found me, where they saw me, when they followed me, or if they live in this complex. I'm four foot ten, live alone, and don't know many people in my area. I don't have any family that are close either. I wonder, have they been watching me and know all of this? It's making me go crazy. Stay vigilant. Don't fall for these tactics and know that not everything you read on the internet is false. I heard about this a year ago and wonder if I hadn't already been aware of this. Would I have opened the door? Where would I be right now? Would I be alive? This world is fucked. For an update, I talked with the management to let them know what's going on. As of now, no one else has reported to them anything similar happening. I'm going to contact the police again for an update. I was redirected to another police department, but they weren't the ones who responded to the call. I know it takes some time for reports to be filed, so I'm just trying to be patient. I just want to know if this has happened to anyone else. I've ordered a ring camera and will be picking it up shortly. At least this way, I could get a video of them if they come back, and it might help me sleep better. As far as it being a prank, absolutely it could be, but I would be more inclined to believe it if it happened to other women in the apartment. Maybe it has, but they haven't said anything. One side of the coin, it's a very cruel prank that I shouldn't worry about. The other is that someone has been watching me.
and had something sinister in mind. It's horrifying to think that someone would pull an elaborate prank like this, or real-world things that happen that we never think could happen to us. With guns and self-defense classes, I will be getting both of these, but they both take time and a lot of money. I don't want to just get a cheap gun with no training. That won't help much. It will be something I won't invest my time and money into. But for the short security, I can only really get a ring camera and stay updated with the PD. I have since installed my ring camera and it's working. I feel much safer knowing if they come back, I can at least have a recording of them. I know I need to talk to my neighbors, but right now I'm exhausted from no sleep and I'm still spooked, so I will do that tomorrow. Also, hopefully the police report will be filed tomorrow, and I can finally talk to the deputy about this. This is about the first stalker I ever had. When I was 13, I was in a long-distance relationship with an incredibly insecure 16-year-old. He had pushed me into getting an Xbox 360 and then forbidding me to have any guy friends on it. Though back in 2010, it wasn't exactly easy to run into other lady gamers, so naturally I made friends of the male variety. During one of the many short-term breakups in that relationship, I ended up meeting a group of guys while playing Gears of War. They added me and over the next couple of days, I'd play and chat with them. This one guy named Tweaker was the most vocal of the rambunctious group and was immediately very flirty with me. Being the naive moron I was back then, I figured he was just joking around. We'd be playing and he'd follow me around maps saying he'd protect me, or if he had the most kills in the game, then I'd have to tell him I loved him. Things like that. At this point, I'd only known these guys for maybe two days. Tweaker left the party to get food, and his friends were telling me that he definitely had a crush on me, but not to lead him on because he was a hacker. Let me say that in my very short time of not only being a girl on Xbox, but also it being a time where if you logged into your friend's account, and people called it hacking, I didn't believe that, nor did I think his flirting was anything more than joking. I wish I'd listened to their warning. The next day, my boyfriend decided he wanted to speak to me again. He saw me in the party with Tweaker and his friends and joined. He started calling me a whore and all that good stuff before getting kicked. Suddenly, Tweaker is losing it and asking who the fuck that guy was, so I explained the situation just for Tweaker to be genuinely confused. I thought I was your boyfriend. I made the tragic mistake of giggling, thinking he was joking. What's funny? You said you loved me. His tone was chillingly serious. His friends got quiet in the party, but sent me a message telling me to be careful with how I respond. What does that even mean? At the same time, my actual boyfriend is blowing up my phone with even more nonsense. Now in a rock in a hard place, drowning in confusion. I do the best my 13-year-old self can to defuse the situation. I try to clear up things with Tweaker while also apologizing to everyone that I'm not allowed to talk to them anymore. From there, my boyfriend logged into my account and blocked them all. The next day, I log in to see 47 messages from Tweaker. These were the ramblings of a madman. Why did you block me? There's no way you were the guy like that. I'd never treat you like that. Respond to me. I know you're reading this. I can get him to leave you alone. We can be together. We can be happy. Respond to me. If I can't get to you here, I'll find a way to reach you. I'm confused and freaking out that my boyfriend will read all of this and start yelling at me again. Still not comprehending that this guy is serious, later that night, I'm on Skype in a call with my boyfriend. Suddenly, a message pops up. There you are. Who the hell is Jean? How are they messaging me when I haven't added anyone? So I asked. It's Tweaker, duh. I told you I'd reach out. I blocked him immediately. And instantly, I get a message on my Facebook from Jean. 
or a tweaker. I can get you here too, love. I blocked him. Then my phone vibrates. There's no way, right? We'll be together soon. If I wasn't freaking out yet, I definitely was now. How is he doing this? Fuck. When they said hacker, is this what they meant? Stupidly, I tell my boyfriend. And he yells at me and blocks me. The usual. Now in tears, my phone rings. Out of reflex, I answer and I hear. What's wrong, baby? I'm not your baby. I don't even know you. Leave me alone, I respond. We'll be 18 soon, and I can come down and take you away. We'll be together, I promise. I sat there, speechless as he read off my address, my middle school, names of my family members. Apparently he was in the same state as my grandma and didn't live far from her, which he eagerly let me know. I hung up. What do I do? Who the hell is this guy? Every day for the next month, he would call, text, and message on everything I had available to reach me. There was no blocking him. He'd just unblock himself. Change my password, he'd get back in the next day and fly into a rage. Not once since that phone call did I respond, yet every day he would let me know he was coming and that he loved me more than life should allow him to. Then one day he called the house phone and my mother answered. Hey, your friend Jean is on the phone, she told me. I lost it. I hadn't told my mom anything about what was going on. Now this guy is calling my house, talking to my mom. I'm done with this. I take the phone and say, never contact me again. There's something wrong with you and you need to get help. If you don't stop, I'll go to the police. I'm sick of your shit. He was silent for just a second. Then, in an erratic, breathless voice, he hissed, You fucking slut. I've done nothing but love you, you ungrateful whore. If you don't want to be mine anymore, then I'll give you to everyone else. With that, he hung up. But it was dumb to think that was the end. The following weeks, I received a massive influx of texts, calls, emails, and even letters from so many different people, only to find one email from Gene. He sent me four links to different websites. Under the links, he wrote, If I can't have you, they can. Suddenly, it all made sense. He posted not only my number, email, and my damn address, but also my full name and pictures of me to predator and trafficking forums. I am not and have never been a security guard, but I remember one time. I was closing the store with my boss. We locked the front door as we closed and cleaned. This was late at night. Well, near the end of our shift, we heard scratching at our store's front door. It's a glass door, an automatic slider, but as I said, it was locked. We originally shrugged it off as an animal or a tweaker. That was until we finished cleaning. My manager heard scratching at the back door, but it can't be opened from the outside. Someone or something was trying to get in. The scratching was violent and near the lower part of the door. He was back there finishing up an inventory check as it all happened. He shouted at whoever it was, basically leave or we're calling the cops stuff. The scratching stopped right after that, and he made sure that the door was locked from the inside too, by procedure. Well, he also opened the door to look around. He saw no one or anything, but there were claw marks where the scratching was. Animals are not uncommon in that area, but they're usually stray dogs and cats and such. Normal stuff. These claw marks were not. Not our normal, at least. He came up front where I was putting cleaning stuff away. I was at our main checkout area next to the front door. I asked what happened. As he told me, we heard a loud scratching sound at the front door again. But we both turned pale as we saw a human-like hand with claws at the door and two eyes that were reflective. I was young and actually quite strong, 
My manager is a shorter and smaller guy, but also older. He called the cops, and we didn't leave until the cops were at our door. The officer escorted us to our rides, and as we left, he followed. Even the cops saw this. As we were pulled out of the driveway in a line, we saw a human-like head peeking out from us at the bottom of the building's corner. We all pulled out and stopped at a nearby gas station. The cop confirmed what we saw and he had some other cops drive by and they looked around. Despite what we saw and what cameras saw, we still don't know what it was. The officer is pretty sure it was a prank because he went around the area and asked anyone with a camera facing our store for possible footage. There was nothing. It didn't ever happen again. I used to be one of the nighttime duty managers at a hotel. The hotel consists of a main house which was built in the late 90s slash early 2000s and the old house which was built in the 14th century. There are a few spooky stories about the old house and the grounds which all come from actual events. At one point, it was listed as the third most haunted building in Britain. I wouldn't say that I was a believer or a denier of ghost stories. I thought some events can be explained and some can't. Being a local, I was familiar with all the stories and my dad had worked there for years when I started. Like I say, wasn't a believer and wasn't a denier. That was until I became a duty manager. Being a duty manager is a simple enough role, dealing with complaints from hotel guests, handing over to the next duty manager and everything else. One of my duties as a nighttime duty manager was to lock up areas of both parts of the hotel, places like the bar, restaurant, and gift shop. Other things such as making sure fire doors are closed, the emergency lighting is working, and closing and locking windows for security. This part of the job was extensive. Every window, fire door, and emergency lighting. I had to check this every single night. Now, the old house is where all the spooky stuff happens. In the old house is a chapel, pretty standard for a house of that size and age in Britain. This is where I experienced the first spooky thing. There's one window in the chapel, that no matter how many times you close and lock that window, the next time you walk past it, it'll be open again. This was experienced by myself, the other duty managers, and even the security guards. Nothing horrifying, but it gets worse. The next spot is a set of chairs called the Jerusalem Staircase, named so as the wood for the stairs comes from Jerusalem. Some stories about a ghost dog on these stairs that trip people up. I don't think any of this. It's stairs. People trip on stairs all the time. However, they lead to a room called the Long Gallery. Now this isn't a very long room. It's close to 100 meters. Other than length, there's nothing else to the room. I was doing my rounds one night, had come in to do my checks as normal, when suddenly I can hear heavy footsteps coming from the other side of the room. Which is possible. There are guest rooms at the other end. I shine my torch down the room and can see nothing. Then it gets scary. The footsteps slowly became harder and faster until they sounded like someone was sprinting towards me. I'm frozen. Next thing I know, whack, I've been shoved against the wall with pain in my back, stomach, and chest like I've been tackled. There is a similar room directly above, but that's only accessible to duty managers and security. Again, not the only person to experience this. The last couple relate to a confirmed murder in the house. It's a long story, so I'll give a TLDR. Lord of the house and his wife are expecting a baby. Lord has heard a rumor that his wife had an affair, had a local nurse abducted and brought to the house to deliver the baby. The baby was then snatched by the Lord and thrown into the fireplace, and he murdered his wife. The nurse escapes and curses the family, saying no male heir will be born to the family. The curse kind of came true. No male heir has survived long after birth. Now the bedroom where all these events took place is a popular part of the house 
with guests visiting all the time. However, it's not the real room. That's directly above. I have been in the room more times than I can count. Reports of a crying baby are common, but never proved. One thing never reported was blood dripping from the ceiling. As mentioned, the real bedroom is directly above, so myself and security investigated. We found nothing, nobody, not even a drop of blood. The second part is about a sculpture in the chapel of one of the male heirs that died shortly after birth as a result of the curse. The sculpture is pretty normal looking, a baby in a cloth with its eyes closed. Apart from one night, the eyes were open. I ran so fast out of that chapel, I'm pretty sure I broke the land speed record. So there's my experiences. Before I explain the light post man, I need to provide some background information. I live in a rural area of the United States. I don't mean farmland. I mean thick woodland, no neighbors, and a 30 minute drive to the nearest store. Yeah, rural. Anyway, our roads are decrepit and flanked by trees so thick that you can't see through them. It was on these roads where my friends and I would carelessly ride bikes and skateboards, which is a good segue to the matter at hand, the light postman. I was in my mid-teens and just had a really fun day with a friend. We skateboarded to the closest town, bought Mountain Dews and ice cream, then skateboarded around town until dusk. Admittedly, I urged my friend that we should head back sooner. However, I gave in when he protested. By the time we reached the end of my road, it was completely dark out. The moon was very bright though, so we could see the road very well. Oddly, no vehicles drove by the whole time, and my friend and I were excited to have the road to ourselves. We reached about halfway when we approached the gravel pit on my road. The gravel pit had a single flickering light post with an orangish glow. We had just passed the gravel pit when we heard a male voice shout, Hey! Behind us. I froze. My friend hopped off his board and headed toward the gravel pit. I reluctantly, followed close behind. He abruptly stopped at the edge of the road leading into the gravel pit. It was then that I could see the source of the voice. A man was leaning against the light post. I could swear there was no one there when we passed by, and the closest house was my own. Fearlessly, my friend took a step forward and asked the stranger, What's up? What are you boys doing? The stranger replied in an unsettling tone. We're skateboarding, my friend said casually while raising his board slightly in response. Oh yeah, the man said, taking a step forward. Why are you out so late? He took another step forward. We were just heading back, my friend said. I could hear nervousness in his voice now. Oh yeah, the man continued. Where are you going? He took another step. His posture was definitively menacing now. That was enough. I had a sudden and overwhelming feeling that I was in danger. An instinct, I suppose you could say. I began to skateboard away into the darkness. My friend, realizing that I noped out of there, promptly followed behind. I heard the man's voice booming behind us. Hey, come back but we just went faster. I repeatedly checked behind us to see if we were being followed. Thankfully, we were not. It wasn't until later that I realized that I'd never seen the man's face. All I saw was a silhouette. His face was conveniently hidden in a shadow due to the light post being directly behind him. It was unsettling to think about that at the time. It is still unsettling to think about it. Why was that man there? Where had he come from? Why was he interested in us? So I'm currently traveling sea with my two brothers. 
we just arrived in Saigon this morning. In the evening, after dinner and a few beers, my two brothers and I decided to sit on a bench in Haodan Park and have a quick smoke. We were chatting away, sat on the bench, when I noticed a Vietnamese man repeatedly looking at us and walking in circles very near where we were sitting. At first, I wasn't too concerned about him. However, my spider senses were alerted. Then a minute or two later, I noticed another Vietnamese man dressed as a grab delivery driver acting suspicious and repeatedly looking at my brothers and I. The stalkers were both on the phone, and I believed they were communicating with each other. Being in a foreign country, my brother told us to leave. However, it was a good 600 meter walk to the park exit. As we were walking, I noticed both Vietnamese men had gotten on mopeds and were following us through the park, stopping behind trees and watching us. They overtook us and sat at a bench further down the path waiting for us to cross their path. Being aware of this, we left the path and started walking on the grass, avoiding the men. We were about a hundred meters from the exit when my younger brother looks behind us to see one of the men sprinting towards us. My younger brother took a fighting stance, standing his ground and asking what the man wanted. The man's posture became small and he began talking very quietly. Both me and my younger brother kept a good distance and told him to leave us alone as we walked back towards the exit, noticing the second assailant also approaching us wearing motorcycle gear. However, my oldest brother decided instead of trying to get out of this situation, he got closer to the whispering Vietnamese man to hear what he was saying. Both my younger brother and I were yelling at him to get the fuck out of there, but he was being a dumbass. It took the Vietnamese guy five seconds to win my brother's trust. Then out of nowhere, when my older brother was leaning in very close trying to hear the man, the Vietnamese guy grabbed my brother's crotch. He was shocked. I was ready to fight, expecting to be robbed or something, but the guy grabbing my brother was really unexpected. After that, we started shouting and the men fled. For context, both my younger brother and I are competing MMA fighters. The whole situation was unexpected. We didn't engage in any violence towards the men, just shouting at them. And that's the end of the story. Be careful in the parks at night in Vietnam. And to those two men, let's not meet again. Seven years ago, two of my best friends and I went to Europe in order to visit my friend Carrie's daughter, whose husband was in the Navy and had been stationed there. Anyway, on the last leg of our trip, we had decided to visit Dublin, Ireland for a few days. Everything went great while we were there, and on the last night, we decided that we would go and have a couple of drinks at the pub that was just a couple of blocks down from our flat. Well, my friend Carrie is a pretty friendly lady, and after a drink or two, we were all feeling a little more comfortable in our surroundings. And she started chatting it up with the Irishman, Dave. Right away, Carrie's daughter and I felt there was something a little off about this man. After about an hour of talking, Carrie had wanted to take pictures with him, and he seemed to get pretty upset about this. He told her that he doesn't take pictures, and he doesn't have a Facebook, and that he doesn't want his picture on any kind of social media. Okay, I get it. There are lots of people who don't have Facebook or Twitter or whatever for their own personal reasons, and I respect that but this man just acted downright paranoid about everything. At this point, I thought maybe he just had a wife or girlfriend, and he's afraid that somehow they'll see pictures of him in some place he's not supposed to be, on some American woman's social media account, and impending doom will ensue for him. I tend to be very paranoid though, and I told her daughter that we need to take a selfie, but instead of taking a selfie, I snapped a picture of the man. I'm not saying it was right, but I've been through some pretty shitty stuff in my lifetime, and I've learned that one thing you do not do is ignore what your intuition tells you, and mine was telling me something was off, and if anything happened, I wanted a picture of this man. 
Dave would look around a lot and try to get my friend to go outside and smoke with him, even though she told him several times she didn't smoke anymore, and he encouraged her to drink more. Eventually, Carrie's daughter was ready to go back to the flat, so, knowing how my friend has the tendency to wander when drinking, I asked her if she would watch my purse for me and not go anywhere while I walked her daughter back to the apartment real quick. By the time I arrived back at the pub, Dave had gotten Carrie outside to smoke, and he didn't look excited to see me back. Now, I'll admit that sometimes I probably like to over-dramatize people's facial features in my mind, because it makes the conversations in my head more exciting, but I'm pretty sure I saw some genuine disappointment there. Since the pub was closing, Dave asked us if we wanted to go somewhere else and drink with him. When I pointed out everything was closed, he said there were places that were always open we could go to. Carrie was eager to go, and I followed, even though my gut was telling me this probably wasn't going to end well. But I was also not ready to return to the apartment and go to bed. So, lo and behold, Dave walks us to a door that has a flashing neon sign above it that says, Open 24 hours, but there's no name above the door, just the sign. We walk down a flight of stairs, and Dave pays 15 euros for each of us to enter. When we get to the bottom of the stairs, and what to my wondrous eyes doth appear, but a blackjack table on my right, and roulette-like table on my left, and in front of me is a row of five bar stools, with five scantily clad working women sitting upon them. At this point, Carrie and I look at each other, and Dave starts claiming that he didn't know what this place was, but that we'd probably better act like we belong here, so that we didn't stir up any trouble. I automatically get a grim feeling, because he had no problem shelling out the money for us to come down there. And for someone who didn't know what this place was, the bartender was quick to bring a Heineken, and then ask if his friends wanted anything, in which he ordered us each one as well. After they gave us our drinks, Dave told us we should go downstairs so that we could talk without looking suspicious. Of course, Carrie and I had already been questioning the prostitutes about how much they liked their jobs and everything, so I'm pretty sure there isn't much else we could have done to point out we were newcomers. Whenever we went downstairs, he sat us at a table and a man came down after him and kept trying to talk to him. He told the man he was talking to his family and he didn't even know him. The guy sauntered away, exclaiming, Fine, if that's how you want to be about it, we can talk later. I should also mention that David told us that he was born and raised in Dublin, so I found it hard to believe that he had no idea where he was taking us when he brought us here. So at this point, in my overactive imagination, I'm 97% sure that we're going to be sold into sex slavery and this is the end for us. But I sit there and listen to him ask my friend a bunch of weird questions, which include, is there anyone waiting for you back home? Which she takes to mean, do you have a boyfriend? And she launches into that whole story. Meanwhile, I'm getting up to pee every once in a while and dumping my drink down the sink because I don't trust this man or this place. Eventually, as the conversation gets weirder, I pull out my phone and start texting one of my friends back home. All of a sudden, Dave starts paying more attention to me, asking me what I'm doing and telling me that I should put my phone away before I get into trouble and that I shouldn't be on it anyway when I'm supposed to be on vacation. When I didn't put my phone away like he told me to, he asked who was so important that I was talking to right now anyway. Everyone at home should be working by now. I told him, oh, I'm just texting my boyfriend, to which Carrie starts to say I don't have a boyfriend. I play it off like she just forgot that Andrew and I got back together right before we left. He commented, what do you need to text your boyfriend for right now? And he sounded like he was kind of angry. Now, I may have just underestimated our situation. It could be that he was really afraid we would get beat up or something for me having my phone out, but there was no signs that said, no phone, 
and no one had said anything to me about it while we were upstairs, so I felt like he was acting this way for a whole different reason. He'd also said, you're not taking any pictures of me now, are you? So I told him that the reason I was texting my boyfriend was because I'd given him my iCloud information before we left, and a list of places we were staying and what nights, because I knew it wasn't safe for decent looking American women to be traveling alone with no idea what they were getting themselves into. And he'd messaged me because he noticed that my GPS didn't show me back at our apartment yet, and that he wanted to make sure we were okay. I didn't feel bad. After telling him that, he was fairly quick to get us out of there, saying we'd been there long enough, and it wouldn't look funny if we went ahead and left now. He then asked if he could walk us back to the apartment, to which I say we're fine, but Carrie told him that would just be peachy, and so he walked us to our flat. Now, thankfully we'd rented a place that had a gate that you have to unlock before entering the area where the doors to the rooms are, and ours was on the second floor. We reached the outside of the building. Dave is trying to talk Carrie into letting him take us on a drive around Ireland, and then taking us back to the apartment, but earlier he said he walks everywhere or takes taxis, and by this time it was almost 3am, so it's not like we would have seen anything in the darkness. So I tell him no. We aren't going on a ride with him right now, but maybe in the morning we could meet up and he could take us. He says that would be a great idea, but he wants to come up to the apartment until we are ready to go. Carrie thinks this sounds okay, but then asks me if it sounds okay because she really isn't sure since she's been drinking. I tell him and her that it probably isn't appropriate since we aren't the only ones staying in there. Dave says that he'll be real quiet and asks how many other people are in there, and if they're girls too. The whole time he's saying this, I'm trying to shove Carrie through the gate away from Dave, and he's trying to get into the gate, so I tell him we'll meet him at 8am at the bridge for him to take us on our ride, and he says that's too late, we should be gone by 7am. I say okay, we'll meet you at 7am then. He's reluctant to leave the gate, and tries one more time to make it through but I'd wedged my foot into a crevice between where the cement from the outside of the gates came through and met with the stone that made up the floor of the lobby area, and so he couldn't shove me out of the way. Finally, he slips away. I push Carrie up the stairs and told her to go open the apartment door, and here's how you know that I've lived through some stuff, because I'm going right back down to that gate to make sure he didn't slip a rock or something between the gate to prevent it from closing, so that he could try to sneak up to our room somehow later. When I get to the apartment, I'm locking all the doors and checking my window to see him just staring up at where our apartment is. I don't know what he was thinking, but something was off, and he didn't even know what floor we were on, unless Carrie told him whenever I took her daughter back to the flat. We did not meet him in the morning, and I hope we never meet again. I still have the pictures we snapped of him. I love going on late night drives. There's something about the empty road and the night air that just really chimes with me. I don't need to have a particular destination in mind, I just need gas in the tank. One night, not that long ago, I was out on one of my drives. i just come off the highway, I decided to drive up to a high point I knew of in the mountains. I figured that the view from up there would be pretty perfect. I planned on having a smoke and playing some tunes, and then heading home. I live out in the sticks by the way, it's not that uncommon for me to use mountain roads often. I was driving through some of these winding and narrow roads heading up the mountain, the type of roads which are sided by nothing but thick forest. I went over something, I don't know what it was, but shortly after I drove over it, my car started to make strange noises. There was like a hissing sound. I realized what had just happened, I must have driven over a nail or something because it sounded like I had a flat tire. 
There happened to be a little kind of rest area up ahead, so I decided to pull in and take a look. I was really annoyed. I loved my car and I threw most of my money into maintaining it. I had just upgraded my tires and now one had a puncture. The area wasn't big. I guess that it was primarily used as a rest area. You know, maybe for truck drivers with those long overnight drives. There was a restroom and a vending machine there. Since it was really late on a Sunday, no one was out. I had the place to myself. I parked my car and looked at my back tires. I could see the issue. There was a puncture. I was so annoyed. I lit up and just stood there, probably sighing and looking dejected. After the smoke, I decided that I might as well make use of the facilities, so I headed into the bathroom. Once out of there, I looked around. There was nothing but mountains everywhere. It was really quiet out, and I'll be honest, it was a little spooky to be there alone in the dark of night. My cell phone started ringing, and that made me jump out of my skin. I reached into my pocket and pulled it out, and I realized that it wasn't ringing. I was mistaken. Another phone was ringing, and it had the same generic ringtone mine did. It sounded as if the phone was coming from the other side of the little bathroom building. I was scared now. I didn't know if I was alone anymore. I loitered by my car for a while, expecting to see someone come out from behind the building, but no one did. Come to think of it, if there was someone out there, then they must have arrived on foot because there were no cars in the parking lot but mine. I decided to go check the back of the bathroom. I was half wondering if someone was hurt or something. Maybe someone lost their phone. I figured I might as well try and find out. I looked around the corner of the brick wall as stealthily as I could, and I couldn't believe what I saw. Lying on the ground were countless smashed cell phones. One of them was ringing. I thought about the chain of events which had led me to that parking lot and then I ran back to my car as fast as I could. I didn't care about damaging my car. I just pulled out of there as fast as I could. I headed back down the mountain passes and back towards the safety of lights. I chose to drive off for a few reasons, and if they aren't obvious, I will break them down for you. So one, I believe that the flat tire was deliberate. I think that I drove over something that was probably placed in the road, it was placed strategically so that I would have to pull into the rest area to check my car. I think that the rest area is where something terrible happens. I think that the phones were smashed up and thrown there, but whoever had been doing whatever they had been doing with the phones failed to break at least one of them. So that's why there was one ringing. I wonder if one of the victims, and I say victims because I believe something sinister is going on, I wonder if it was one of the victim's friends or family members calling to see where they were. What makes me say this is because I can remember as clear as day that a lot of the phones seemed feminine. They had little stickers or gems. I could tell by some of their cases that they probably belonged to women. Now I think about it, maybe someone was calling to make me pick up the phone. Then when I was distracted, I would have been rushed. I'm not sure but I'm very glad I got out of there without finding out. I reported this to my local police, and they said they would look into it, but I didn't hear back. I really wonder what might have happened if I answered the phone. I don't like thinking about what happened to all those owners of those phones. I have actually prayed once or twice that they just suffered a robbery. When I was in Afghanistan, we were in the mountains right on the Pakistani border. The first few months of deployment were pretty hairy, but as soon as winter rolled around, the fighting season dried up. Things got really quiet. Night shift went from, when are we going to get hit, to, what kind of weird shit am I going to witness tonight? I think it was February or so, and I was out on guard patrol in the north facing machine gun shack. We all had night vision devices, so since it was pitch black, we always wore them on night shifts. Well, I was looking out into the mountains when I see what looks like a guy come crawling out from behind a boulder up the hill, 
about a hundred meters away. Being February, we hadn't gotten hit in almost a month because there was two feet of snow on the ground and the temperatures were hovering right around zero. So the Taliban chucked deuces back to Pakistan and left us alone for the cold months. Now, this guy was on all fours like an animal, just sitting there, half behind a boulder, seemingly staring into my soul. So I pointed the machine gun at him and turned on the visible laser. I put the laser right on his nose and didn't get a reaction. Nothing. The guy just stared at me. So at this point, I'm getting a bit freaked out. I'd been blown up, shot at, almost RPG'd, and now some local is playing fuck fuck games. I radioed into our tactical operations center that there was an unarmed local staring at me on the north post, and I either wanted someone to clear me to wax him, or come out and look at what I was seeing. E5 on the radio tells me he's sending a private out to babysit me. Fucking dick. The guy comes out, looks up at the hill at this guy, and promptly nopes out of there. He goes back to the tactical operations center and tells the E5 that there really was a guy just staring at us out on the mountain. So the E5 comes up to the shack, and I point this guy out. I shit you not, as soon as the E5 gets an eye on the local, the guy jumps up, hops up on the boulder, and starts screaming like somebody just dipped him in boiling water. Guard tower at the east corner can now also see the guy, and as soon as the crazy local started howling, East Shack loses about a 30 round burst of 762 out over his head. That shit is loud when it's dead quiet. The crazy guy jumps off the rock and runs down the mountain, screaming the whole way. It was dead quiet the rest of the night, but the commander upped security to 50% meaning half the guys on our outpost had to pull security for the rest of the night. The running joke for the rest of the winter was to be on the lookout for the mind-controlled experiment that the CIA lost track of. It freaked me out. Good for a story, though. I'm an ordinary single woman who will turn 30 this year. I've been thinking a lot about my life and I want to share this terrifying experience. It happened when I was young. When I was young, I lived in a quiet area of northern Kyushu. Ever since, I can remember my dad hasn't been in the picture. It's always just been me and my mom. She wasn't there as often as she could have been, I guess, because she had to work two jobs to keep a roof over our heads and food on the table. This happened in spring when I was in the early years of elementary school. I was on my way home from school. My mother did worry about me getting home by myself at first, but we didn't live all that far from the school. I came home from school as usual, headed into our building. We lived in a block of apartments. I took off my shoes and went inside. I put my school bag down, sat at the table, and started doing my homework. On top of the table was the dinner that my mom had prepared for me. In the morning, mom would head off to work at a nearby toy factory, and then on her lunch break she would come home and make something for my dinner. When she finished work at the factory, she would then head to her second job, working in a restaurant downtown. I was doing my homework. It was really tough. I wish I could have asked mom sometimes for help. It must have been about an hour after I came home from school when I heard something. I heard a man's voice call out. Hello, is someone in here? I looked up to see the dark silhouette of a man stood in our hallway. I always forgot to lock the door at that age. I say silhouette because of the way the sun in the west was behind the man. I couldn't see him clearly. I remember that the first thing that struck me about the man was the fact that he was wearing a white long coat, the kind that doctors wear. The man started speaking before I had the chance to think. Miss, terrible news. Just terrible news. Your mother. She's collapsed in the factory and she's been taken to hospital. Oh my god. Not mom, I thought, as I raced over to the doctor. I followed him out of the apartment. There was a big rusted black bicycle downstairs, just outside of our apartment's lobby. He lifted me up and put me on the child's seat at the back 
and then climbed onto his seat and started pedaling. We rode off under twilight skies. I was looking off to the side, watching the city pass us by. I asked the man, Is mom going to be okay? He didn't reply. I asked again, Nothing. No matter how many times I asked him about mom, he didn't say a word. After a little while, I noticed something. Even though I was young, I thought that something was wrong. I realized that we were going the wrong way. We were heading towards the woods and the mountains, and the hospital was back in the other direction. Hey, mister, I don't think we're going the right way. He didn't say a word in response. I started to panic. I shouted at him. I tried pleading with him. I pretended I didn't care, but nothing I did could make the man talk. Then, a very basic but frightening question rose to the forefront of my mind, and that question was, where are we going? I was becoming more and more frightened by each passing second. All the town roads and sidewalks were behind us now. We were on trails and dirt roads. There were dense rows of trees either side of us. It was darker there too, without the street lights. Why are we going down a dark forest road? The man just kept pedaling. We were not going to stop. I thought this man isn't a friendly man. He's going to hurt me. He wasn't behaving like any adults I knew. He wasn't like mom or my teachers. This guy was strange. In those moments of quiet contemplation, for the first time in my life ever, I thought about death or being killed. I was so scared that I just started to scream as loudly as I could. I wish I had the presence of mind to do it in the town where there were more people and more lights. My scream made the man talk. He spun his head around to me for a second and then said, We will be there soon. No need to scream. I'm a gentleman and I'm kind. He said that weird statement with a look of sheer frustration on his face. I knew that I needed to do something but it felt like I didn't have many available options. I decided to jump out of the bicycle seat. I then hit the ground really hard and scraped my knees. I staggered to my feet and then ran as fast as I could into the woods. I must have tripped and stumbled a couple of dozen times, but there was no way I was going to stop moving. From behind me, I heard the strange man yell out, Miss, where are you? Tell me and it will all be fine. Your mom is about to die. If you run away from me, then your mother will die. Do you understand? So hurry up and get out here now. He sounded angry at first, and then he went into a more friendly voice, as if he was calling a cat or something. Miss, come on out. It'll be fine. I'll take you to see your mom. Come on. I felt disgusted by him and his voice, but I didn't want mom to die. I wasn't sure if I should have gone back to the man or not. He was wearing a doctor's coat. I was wrestling with these thoughts in my mind. I was really torn. But then I reminded myself that there were no hospitals in the woods, and that made him a liar. And if he was comfortable enough to lie about the hospital, then he could have lied about mom too. I hid behind a really big tree, and I just waited until I couldn't hear the man anymore. Apparently, I was found the next morning in a cemetery at the foot of the mountain, which was about three kilometers from my home. I don't know how I managed to get there, but I was walking around in the dark. An old man who came to clean a grave found me hugging my knees to my chest beneath a big tree. I can't remember much of that. I found out that mom didn't collapse. She was fine. She came home from work, and when she found that I wasn't home and that the door wasn't locked, she called the police and reported me missing. I have no idea what happened with the man, but my mom and I have our suspicions. We think that he must have known about my mom's workplace to feed me that lie of her collapsing in the factory. I don't know if there was an arrest. My mom tried to shelter me from replaying that night's events. We don't talk about it. There are a few questions that are left unanswered. What was the purpose of taking me out into the middle of nowhere? I'm not sure I want to know the answer to that one. Even today, when I try to remember that guy's face, I just can't.
so you can imagine how much help I was to the police at the time. I cannot see his face. Everything is dark now. It was a traumatizing event, and one I am lucky to have survived. Back when I was in high school, I would go over to my friend's house and drink. She lived on the outskirts of town. I remember that I would have to walk down dark, unlit forest roads to get home from her place. It was usually fine in the summer, but in the darker months, it was too creepy. I say it was too creepy, but I still walked there and back at least twice a week. It was great to have a place to drink and chat without being disturbed. The walk home was always daunting. But thanks to the wonderful power of alcohol, I managed to summon up the courage to hit the road, even when it was pitch black out. She lived down a dark and deserted road, which used to be a popular one. It ceased being popular when the soccer stadium in our town shut down. I think the team moved. It's not important. So I would walk home from my friend's house down this old, desolate road, which was always empty and quiet. One night, in one of the darker months... I heard some voices while I was walking home. I guess that there were about two or three men out there. Well, this is where you will have to forgive my teenage curiosity and stupidity. I wanted to see who those voices belonged to. The reason for this was because there were rumors around town that the forest area near the old stadium was a local haunt for gay people. I was dumb and drunk, so at the time I thought I would take a look to see if the rumors were true. Not the best move on my part, I know. I could blame the booze and say that my drunken state motivated me to go into the woods. I was always a little bolder whenever I was drinking. I knew the woods quite well, so I thought I would go unnoticed. I approached and saw some silhouettes through the gaps in the trees. It looked like one guy was surrounded by other men. The guy in the middle looked as if he was floating. It was the strangest thing. I could see this guy's legs dangling above the ground. Another guy was hugging the legs of this floating guy. I wanted to see what the hell was going on, so I decided to get a little closer. I got close enough for mumbled and half-whispered voices to be heard. I was watching where I was going. I stepped on a dead branch that I thought could take some of my weight, but I was wrong. It snapped. The mumbling voices stopped instantly. There was an awkward silence. I was feeling full of regret and now fear. Why did I have to come down here to see what they were doing? I should have known it was a bad idea. Next, something unexpected happened. I heard a snorting kind of laugh. A nasty laugh. I saw that there were three silhouettes facing towards me now. I prayed that I was hidden in the darkness of the trees. I stood there silently bracing myself to run at any moment. A muffled male voice then said, Oh, you want to be next, huh? That was enough for me. I ran as fast as I could, and I didn't stop until I saw streetlights. I got home without anything further happening, but it was really scary for me. I didn't really understand what one of those guys asked me. That's probably down to my naivety at the time, I guess. I know what it means nowadays, and by the end of this, you will know too. It's not what you're thinking it means though. When I got to class the following day, I noticed crowds of gathered students all chatting away. It didn't take long for me to find out what the topic of discussion was. In fact, several of my friends wanted to tell me the news. Apparently, someone had taken their life in the forest by the old stadium. There were cops all over town now asking people questions. They found a body hanging from a tree in the woods. So, what does that mean? Well, I think I saw the staging of a suicide out there in the woods that night. I think those other men had taken a life, and I saw them setting the scene when I went snooping. This was a long time ago, by the way, back probably when prejudices towards certain lifestyles were accepted. I wondered if the reason that man lost his life was down to the location he was in that night. If that is so, then the question I was asked by those men in the shadows is all the more terrifying. 
I reported what I saw that night anonymously from a phone booth, but I don't think anything was made of it. Why can I say that with confidence? Well, because five more men have taken their lives in those woods over a ten-year period. I wouldn't be surprised if those men all shared something in common. Thankfully, the old stadium was demolished, and the forest area isn't there anymore. I hate to see nature get destroyed for more concrete constructions, but in this case, I feel kind of good about it. My friend and I were in the car, ready to leave for a music festival, when we got notice it was cancelled. We were all ready to go, so we decided to just drive and find somewhere to camp for the weekend instead. We ended up in a sort of summer resort area upstate. It was the end of season, so the place was completely empty. But it was pretty, nice lake and scenery, so we figured we'd stay. There were no pesky families with kids to interfere with the partying we intended to do. The semi-creepy but friendly attendant assigned us to a site, so we drove down to it. We quickly noticed they'd put us in a site that was furthest away from everything, literally on the edge of the woods, surrounded by empty sites, completely isolated. We thought it was weird, but still, it's what we wanted to just drink and smoke in the woods in peace. So we set up camp, then fucked around until it got dark. As soon as we settled down in the tent and put out the lantern, we heard an unmistakable sound off to the left of us where there was nothing but empty campsites, maybe a hundred yards away. Someone was slowly and deliberately sharpening an axe or a knife against stone. Long, slow, metallic strokes over and over and over. My friend was terrified, but I was laughing, thinking this attendant guy was obviously fucking with us city slickers. She insisted we would have heard him coming and decided to call the check-in boot. He was still there. It was almost half a mile away. There was no way he could have gotten there in time, and we could still hear the sharpening sound, and the attendant guy confirmed there was no one else in the place except us. We ended the night locked in the car, holding a can of bear mace. My friend fell asleep, but I watched and listened all night. Shortly before sunrise, the noise stopped, the sun came up, and there was nobody around anywhere. I still can't explain it. This weekend, I went through the weirdest road trip of my life. So, for a bit of context, I work with my mom, and we fairly often go on long road trips for work. This weekend, we were coming back from a business fair about 14 hours away from where we live. After about one hour on the road, I noticed a blue SUV towing two bikes in front of me. I remember it stood out for me because the bikes were really nice ones. Eventually this car overtook a truck and it got away from us. After about two more hours, I noticed a car overtaking us and it just happened to be the same blue SUV with the bikes from before. I even remember my mom asking if we'd seen this car before and me answering, yeah, he probably stopped for gas or something and we passed him. The thing is, along the next four hours, this happened at least two more times even though we had stopped ourselves. At this point, I was already thinking it was weird, but this guy must make a lot of pee stops and likes to make back the time by speeding. We were about eight hours in when we got to a point where the road was completely blocked by other cars that had stopped. We assumed that there was some sort of accident in the road ahead, and that had stopped traffic. I didn't have internet to check, but I could still see a map of the area on my phone. So I started to check for alternative roads while my mom left the car to talk to the other drivers. I found out there was an exit from the main road about 200 meters from where we were and that I could use it to go through an alternative road that would take me back to the main one about 5 kilometers ahead. My mom got the same information from a truck driver who said it was a very narrow dirt road 
too thin for his trunk, but we could probably go through it and skip the accident. She also found out it had been a pretty bad one and that they probably would take a few hours to unblock the road. Knowing this, we decide to drive through the side road to the exit and try to find this alternative path. We also switch seats since I'm better with maps and my mom drives as well. It was already pretty dark at this point, but we had no problem finding this road. The thing is, it was a really bad dirt path, so we had to go pretty slow. We even reached a small wooden bridge that I had to leave the car to check if it was stable, and it was totally deserted. A bit later, we reached a split in the road, and I look back at the map to see which way to take. I find out we should go left, but after taking a second look at the map, I noticed something that made me even more creeped out than I already was. The river we had just crossed was called Rio des Mortes, which is Portuguese for River of the Deaths, and it encountered the main road at the point we estimated the accident to be. I decided not to say anything, and we continued to follow the path until we got back to the main road, where we switched seats back again. At this point, the main road was deserted as well, probably because every single car going in this direction had stopped at the block in the road. After a short while, we started seeing a few ambulances go by in the opposite direction every now and then, which looked normal at first but it eventually was looking like we'd seen way too many of them for a single accident. They also looked exactly the same, but that is what you expect of ambulances. The main road was also very dark at this point, and it went on without anywhere to stop for much longer than we remembered from our way back to the business fair. Eventually, a car starts to approach behind me, and after a little while it overtakes us, and to make things even weirder, it just happened to be the exact same blue SUV with the bikes. We eventually pass by a big city, and I suggest we should stop somewhere to eat something a bit nicer, even though it would make the trip longer, and my mom agrees. All the weird stuff stopped happening after that, but I tried to google the incident when we stopped to eat, and then again a day later at home, and I couldn't find anything about it, which is pretty weird as well. As a crew guy on an off-road racing team in Baja, California, and Mexico, I got to test drive some rigs and trucks, so technically a truck driver. We were driving down south along Sea of Cortez with a buddy at night at this four-hour dirt road to Gonzaga, which is pretty much in the middle of fucking nowhere in the desert, and we see the lights of a car behind coming down fast, and now effectively tailing us and the bastard had bar mount headlights on top, or what seemed like it, which are really bright. It's normal that locals and gringos get wasted in the nearest spring breaker town, and then go down this road really fast to test their rigs, since there's no police there. So I try waving him off to get the guy to keep his lights low since he's blinding us, but he isn't slowing down a bit, nor does he turn the lights off, and it's a really dangerous dark road. Finally, near a curb near the shore, I found a spot to bail off the road without crashing, and we see the lights passing by us really fast and going straight to the curve, and we were like, that's it, he's gonna crash down to the sea. But the lights didn't fall and kept going straight into the beach and the sea, and then pitched up abruptly into the night sky and disappeared. We didn't say a word for a minute or so, and then my buddy says, did you see it? And I say, the fucking flying truck. We didn't talk about it anymore, as it simply didn't make sense to talk about it, or with anyone else when we arrived. My friends and I were driving back from a rave in Denver. We take 287 from Fort Collins to Laramie because it's the quickest way home. 287 is a beautiful drive during the day, but empty and sketchy at night, especially during winter. 
I was in the back seat, so I missed this, but I asked my friend, who was in the passenger seat, to tell me the story again. Owl Canyon is a little two-lane detour that I think might have even been unpaved at the time. My friend said there was a car on the side of the road just after Owl Canyon, so rocky-ass cliffs. It was pitch black either side of the road. There was a guy just chilling in the middle of the road in all black, trying to wave us down. We didn't see him till maybe like 20 to 30 feet, and we had to swerve to miss him. I don't know why he wanted us to stop but I don't think it was for anything good. This would have been around 3am probably, and like I said, it would be empty out there at that hour. So this is weird. The helper in me is like, maybe he was in trouble, but I'm glad my friends have some street smarts, because if he had some bad intentions or some kind of weapon, we would have been fucked. We were all pretty young at the time too. This isn't as exciting as some other stories, but I wanted to give some Wyoming flavor to the sub. This state is so big and empty. There's no way there's not some backwards creepy stuff happening all the time. Every weekday, I would wake up early for a morning workout, then head to my job. Generally, I would leave my house around 5.30 because my morning drive took around 25 to 30 minutes, giving me enough time for two hours before I needed to leave before my shift started. Most of my drive was just putting loud music on, trying not to fall asleep and it being a freeway before 6am, almost everyone was going at least 10 miles per hour over the speed limit. I drive most of the time on a main interstate before turning off onto a smaller highway, which I would only use for a mile or so. This highway was three lanes on each side. People also drive fast on here, but usually no more than 75 miles. And while you get some unsafe drivers in the morning, most people aren't swerving erratically. This highway runs north to south. An on-ramp from a main street becomes a lane. Then there are two entrances from the freeway I would take every day one from the eastbound side and one from the westbound side. I hope that makes sense, but basically, I got on from the eastbound side right as three cars were entering from the westbound side. One was some sort of orange sportyish car and the other two were identical dark gray sedans. I don't remember exactly what make and model they were, but I remember them being fairly uncommon models, not a sedan you'd see a hundred times a day. One was in the front of this orange car, one behind. These guys were going at least 80 miles per hour. The orange car would change lanes, and the car in front would cut him off, while the one behind would change lanes to remain behind him. They kept this up the entire time I was on the highway near them, weaving in and out of cars, not slowing down, before I pulled off at my exit. This could be a complete coincidence, and some asshole drivers but I definitely got the vibe that the driver of the orange car was trying to get away from the gray cars. Maybe it was extreme road rage, or maybe something more sinister. Regardless, I'll never know. I took my dog out for a hike on the Appalachian Trail. I keep her off leash so she can run around and sniff like crazy, but call her back when I see other people. She's incredibly friendly, has never barked or shown her teeth to anyone. She doesn't jump, so it's not a big deal to me if she says hello to someone. So, walking down the trail, I see a guy walking toward us. I call her back, put the leash on, move to the side to let this guy pass. My dog goes nuts. Her hair stands up and she shows her teeth. She growls and barks like never before or since. I've always wondered what she saw in this guy to do that. I assume he's a murderer walking the trail, leaving dead women behind. I went on a mountain hike in Transylvania with a group of friends from school, and way up, 
after maybe 12 to 14 kilometers of trekking, we saw a house that was in the middle of nowhere. It had a barn with a few animals, a couple cows, chickens, and whatever else. As we got closer, we see a few people, a guy and five to six women. I'm not sure if there were more inside. The guy comes to greet us, barely speaking the language. We had a hard time understanding what he was saying. They lived without electricity, gas, or anything. This is in the early 90s, so there's no internet or mobile phones to worry about, at least for most people. Anyway, they all looked weird, kinda dumb expressions on their faces. We can barely understand each other. They asked us who the president was then, and if we wanted some milk. They looked at our clothes and shoes weirdly and curiously. Who knows when the last time they had human contact was, or maybe there were more crazies around those parts, I don't know. I'm not sure to this day what was going on. It's not typical in the region, so we kind of freaked out, especially because this guy looked a bit disturbed and we were too young. We were looking around to see if there were more of them. Paranoia was getting to us, thinking there must be a village nearby. What was also weird is that all the women kept their distance and never got close to us. It was like he was guarding them or checking us out if it was safe for them. One of my friends kept saying we don't want their milk and we just need to go because it's getting dark. We walked calmly for a while and when we thought we were out of their sight, we bolted out of there like crazy. Needless to say, we camped after a few hours, and we always had one person awake to keep watch. We told people that were living in the villages near that area about the mountain people, and they didn't believe us. They said nobody lives up there in the mountains. I will preface this by saying I know that the decisions I made at this time were not intelligent and that things could have gone very differently if I'd made alternative decisions or not been so lucky. So back in May of 2022, I was doing a solo month-long van trip around coastal British Columbia and Vancouver Island. I am a 5 foot and petite female and I was 20 at the time. While I was exploring the east side of Vancouver Island, my mom's van, which I was borrowing for this trip, suddenly began having issues. The check engine light began to blink vigorously, but luckily I was able to bring it to a dealership to get it fixed that day. I slowly made my way to the dealership and walked in slightly intimidated. A man called Jay approached me as soon as I walked in. My first impression of him was that he seemed to be quite nice and accommodating. He was probably in his late 40s or early 50s, bald, around 5 foot 9, and with a slim but strong build. He offered to drive me to a restaurant after my vehicle had been brought into an auto shop. I agreed, and as he drove me to a Tim Hortons, he told me I reminded him of his daughter, who was a few years younger than me. He dropped me off and told me to call his office when I was ready to be picked up. I agreed, and we parted ways. After a couple of hours, I received a text telling me that the issue with the vehicle had been quite mild and that they'd already finished fixing it. I called Jay's office and shortly afterward he came and picked me up. Right as he picked me up, a massive windstorm began and it was wreaking havoc in the affected areas. After I paid and got my keys back, Jay followed me out into the parking lot. I didn't think much of it until he cornered me beside the driver's side door. The way we were standing, I was leaning on the door to create whatever little distance I could create, which made it impossible for me to open the door unless I moved to be right underneath Jay's chin. He began telling me how much he missed his daughter, who lived in a different province with her mother, and how much he'd like for me to come for supper at his house with his new wife and son. At this point, it was 4.30pm, and he'd just gotten off of work. I being afraid to be mean and of the situation I was currently in, was coerced into agreeing. He refused to let me follow him to his home in my vehicle and insisted he drive behind me. 
After I shakily agreed, he only backed up a foot from me, allowing me to open the driver's side door and get in. As soon as I turned my car on, he sprinted to his vehicle across the parking lot. As I backed out, his truck was directly behind my van. He followed behind me very closely, almost blocking me in. As we pulled up to his house, he hurriedly got out of his vehicle, and before I could even open my own door, he flung it open. Jay rushed me into his home, directly behind me the entire time. When I walked into the house, I was greeted by his wife and their five to six year old son. They informed us that the power and cell phone service was out due to a storm. This is when I realized that I was now out of contact with everyone I knew. I knew no one on the island, and now I couldn't even contact my friends or family. I then became even more uneasy and uncomfortable. I stayed there for a few hours, unable to leave as Jay kept me within his sights at all times. After we ate supper, I was relieved, believing I would be able to hightail it out of there. To my dismay, as I began to head toward my car, Jay ran out and grabbed my wrist. He pulled me towards his truck, stating that I must see this lookout point before I leave. Scared and unsure of how to weasel my way out of this situation, I mentally froze, and it felt as if I was watching myself in third person get into his car, still being held by the wrist. As he drove towards us in this lookout, he began to tell me about his family. Apparently, his family had basically founded and owned the small town we were in, and that his family had connections to a notorious and violent biker gang. Now, the alarm system in my head that had been going off on high alert began blaring that I needed to get out of this vehicle even louder. He rattled off a story involving the biker gang and how the cops had tried to pursue him, but that there wasn't enough evidence to incriminate him. Right as the story finished, he parked his truck. He kept the doors locked and we looked at the view from his windshield. Jay asked me if I had a boyfriend and why I had decided to travel so far for so long by myself. I lied and told him I did have a boyfriend, but that he'd begun working right after finals ended, and that's why he couldn't join me. Jay gave me a creepy smile, and began trying to discuss the sexual aspects of my non-existent relationship. He then told me the worst places I could have sex with my fake boyfriend in explicit detail. Then he began to tell me that he's always had a thing for younger women. His own wife was 13 years younger. Jay told me he enjoyed flirting with me because I was young and pretty. At this point, I was seriously considering making a break for it, but I realized that we were surrounded by forest and that I, unlike him, had no knowledge of the area. I also realized that there was no way I could run or move as quickly as he probably could, seeing as I have a very unstable left knee from a skiing accident, so high impact activities like running were very hard for me. After what felt like 45 minutes, he began to drive us back towards his house. At this point, Jay seemed to become emboldened by my lack of reactivity to everything he had said and done so far, and put his left hand on my leg. As soon as his hand made contact with my skin, I froze again, and felt an immense pressure build up in my diaphragm and throat. It was as if my vocal cords had become non-existent, and I couldn't make a sound. Shortly after that, we pulled up to his house. The storm was still raging, and he then told me to stay the night on his couch. We had not exited the vehicle by now, and the doors of the truck were still locked. I promptly stated that I had paid for a campsite a town over, and that I had plans to hike a large mountain the following day, which meant I was planning to get up early to start my trek. Jay continued to attempt to persuade me to stay, using every excuse that he could come up with. The weather was awful, there was no power or cell service there either, that it wasn't safe for a young attractive female to camp alone and so on. I thanked him politely, but I did not give in to his whims this time. He began to become more agitated that I was refusing his offer, and he went off on a tangent about how I hadn't said no to anything else and how ridiculous I was being. His wife then came out to the front yard through the garage, and he abruptly stopped speaking. Jay unlocked the truck, and we both hurried out. 
I smiled awkwardly at his wife and thanked her for the dinner before I rushed to my van. She gave me an odd but understanding look as I sped walk to my car. As soon as I reached the driver's door, I heard him yell at me to wait. I turned back to look and I saw him marching towards me with a long black nightstick. For the third time in what felt like 15 hours, but was closer to 5, I froze and could no longer react properly. He closed the distance between us quickly. The only thing that gave me slight comfort was that his wife was still standing in the driveway. Jay told me in a chilling and dead tone that what he had in his hand was a baton and taser, and he wanted me to have it for protection. In Canada, it is illegal for citizens to carry tasers, and from what Jay told me, this taser wasn't even legal in the States. He shoved it into my hand, and as uncomfortable as I was, I took it and thanked him. Then, after a long and unsettling pause, he told me it was to protect me from men like him. At that moment, my eyes got huge, and for the first time throughout this entire experience, my fight, flight, or freeze response kicked in, and it chose something other than freeze. I opened the car door as little as I could and vehemently threw myself into the vehicle and locked the doors. He stared at me from two feet away with a dead and almost animalistic look of malice on his face. I screeched out of that neighborhood and never looked back. I didn't glance in my rearview mirror until approximately five minutes after I left. To my relief, there was no one behind me, and I let out a breath that felt like it had been stuck in my chest for hours. I arrived at my campsite half an hour or so after the entire ordeal. Generally, I would have sat outside and enjoyed a fire, but that night and the following two afterward, I only left my vehicle to go to the washroom when I was no longer at the campground. Luckily, nothing else happened, but to this day, I still have the baton taser he gave me, and I plan to use it if a man like Jay ever approaches me again. I grew up in Knoxville, Tennessee, in a private condominium community on a mountain-like bluff that on one side overlooked the Tennessee River and the downtown metropolitan area. It was surrounded by heavily wooded areas, and you could see the smoky mountains from another side of the complex, the famous body farm of the University of Tennessee, where they do forensic experiments on the deceased, even shares its backwoods with this property and gives this location somewhat of a creepy factor in itself. Anyway, this took place in 1981, and I was eight years old. My friends and I were usually always playing in the woods together, but if no one was available to play that day, you pretty much would go play in there by yourself. One summer break, on a quiet weekday afternoon, I was playing alone in some dense woods near our community swimming pool area. I was about a hundred feet in, just off to the side of a steep trail when I heard something running towards me at some distance. The brush was thick and you couldn't see further than your immediate. I couldn't see past all the vines, trees, and other foliage. I could tell it wasn't an animal because it wasn't a four-legged gallop, but a more familiar sound of two legs running with a solid heavy sound of branches and leaves quickly crunching underfoot. I could tell they were near, but not right on me like they were trying to close the distance quickly. I never saw who or what it was, but my spidey sense just said, run. I booked it out of the woods and ran a little ways to a spot us neighborhood kids would duck out in, next to the previously mentioned pool area. Whatever or whomever my pursuer was did not emerge out of the tree line. I said screw going back in those woods alone today. I went home, and that was where the story should have ended. Or so I hoped. A couple of days later on the weekend, I was at the swimming pool, which was now packed, and the security guard shows up and everybody was like, that's the hero. I was wondering what he did to get all the accolades, and I found out that the previous night, he had apprehended an escaped convict that was hiding out in the woods. If I remember right, 
the escapee was spotted by a tenant driving up our steep, winding entry road, who alerted the guard of a trespasser. Obviously not knowing the degree of danger of this individual, or real police would have been involved, the security guard just did his job and became a hero in the process. An extremely creepy feeling came over me as I put two and two together and realized that this was the mystery entity storming at me in that mad dash. That showed me just how desperate this guy was to snatch me up. I thank God that he didn't use a stealthy approach, but went full tilt and I had enough instinct to get the hell out of Dodge, knowing something's running towards me with complete determination and urgency. It haunts me to this day. What if I never made it out of those woods? Would I have met a grisly and macabre fate? This true scary workplace story occurred in the autumn of 2012, in Glasgow, Scotland. The light was fading as it was the evening, and Glasgow gets very cold at this time of year, so there was a bitter chill in the air. At around 6pm, my two friends, Neelam and Aisha, who were both in their early 20s at the time, worked as beauticians in a beauty salon in the West End area of the city, and they were just closing up for the evening when a group of three fairly large men wearing skiing masks aggressively pushed the door open and barged into the salon store front. They were carrying blue plastic shopping bags that were bulging. The men then closed the large front shutter down and had Neelam and Aisha trapped in the store. Both of my friends were a bit stunned and didn't know what to say or do. The men began screaming and asking where the female owner of the salon was to which they both shakily replied that they didn't know, which was true, as the owner was hardly ever there in person. The men had very thick Glaswegian accents, and it seemed as though they were white. However, the girls were not certain about this. Although both of the girls were scared, they thought the men seemed fairly amateurish, and thought they would just leave after realizing that the owner was not there. Things took a much more sinister turn, however, when suddenly the three men pulled out hammers and silver duct tape. The men then marched Neelam and Aisha to the back of the area of the salon, where they bound their hands and feet and wrapped their mouths up with duct tape. They were forced to sit down in chairs with wheels on them. The thugs then debated what to do next, wait on the off chance that the owner would come in or leave. The girls were obviously petrified at this point and were hoping they'd just leave. Neelan was especially scared as she actually had a cold at the time and was struggling with the duct tape that was now sealing her mouth. Her glasses also slid off her face as she was struggling, so she was now also struggling to see. She tried to say to the men if they could take the tape off of her mouth because of her cold, but she was only able to mumble as her mouth was taped very tightly. One of the men yelled at her to shut up. She tried her best not to cry, as that would have made things even worse. Aisha was still very shocked by everything, but was mainly concerned for Neela, and was just praying that thugs would go away. She also tried to speak, but to no avail. Thankfully, after a few minutes of looking at the girls and around the salon, they decided to just exit the salon's front door, but not before smashing the cash register and some mirrors with their hammers. They also threw some of the salon's equipment across the store. Surprisingly, the men didn't actually steal anything from the store. They then left the salon and left Neelam and Aisha taped up and gagged out back. The girls struggled for quite a while to free themselves from the tape, but Aisha moved her chair towards some of the hairdressing equipment and eventually managed to use a pair of scissors to free her hands and feet and then remove the duct tape from her and Neelam's mouths. As soon as Neelam was freed, they called the police. The police finally arrived and gave the girls some blankets and took them to ask questions. The whole incident only realistically lasted for about 20 minutes, although it felt much, much longer. Thankfully, the girls were not hurt. However, they were both very shaken up for a long time after this, and the men were never caught as far as they were aware. Both Neelam and Aisha attended identity lineups However, they could never say if any of the men they saw 
were any of the thugs because the trio had ski masks on. Both Neelam and Aisha are of South Asian, Pakistani ancestry, and Aisha did think one of the men did say something in Urdu at one point, but she was not 100% sure. Both of my friends quit the salon immediately following this and got jobs elsewhere. They're both doing extremely well now and have put this awful incident behind them. They never did find out what those men wanted with the owner, and they're very grateful she wasn't there, as things could have been much, much worse. They of course had their suspicions about the owner after this horrible incident, but they were both just thankful to be okay, and away from that salon forever. This happened during my junior year of college. The campus is in the city. My class ended around 8 p.m. and it was raining. Nighttime city rain is the best climate to take photos in, so I decided to walk around Main Street with my camera. I put my earbuds in to listen to music while I was walking. I got some great shots that night. I walk around the city almost every night alone and have never had an issue with safety until this night. That night I lit a cigarette and kept walking around. The vibe was good. About 20 minutes in, I noticed a figure behind me in the reflection of a building. I kept walking and noticed it was following me. I paused my music but kept my earbuds in. By this time, a lot of stores have already closed and the rain cleared out most pedestrians, so it was just me and him. I looked around and weighed my options. I could keep walking to find the nearest open restaurant, I could walk to the left towards the sketchy train station, or I could make a sharp turn towards my residence hall. I started walking to the train station, as this would be the area with the most people around, and kept my eye on the reflection in the buildings. He was still following me, staying about ten paces behind me. I opened my backpack and discreetly switched my camera with my pepper spray and kept it under my sleeve. He started to gain on me as we reached the next street. Finally, there were people around us. He tapped me on the shoulder and my heart jumped into my throat. I took out my phone, pretending I was pausing my music, which had already been paused for a while, started taking a video, and put the phone back into my pocket. I slowly turned around and took one earbud out. He was tall, skinny, with facial hair wearing a hoodie. He said he saw me smoking and asked if I could spare a cigarette and borrow my lighter. I said I was running low and didn't have any to spare. He nodded. I apologized and said to stay warm. He grabbed my shoulder again and turned me around. He asked if I could give him some cash to buy him a pack at the convenience store. I said I don't carry cash. He could sense my anxiety. He walked closer. That's not very generous of you he said. I think I instinctually took a step backwards and he followed. I said I really needed to get home, but I really didn't want him to know where I lived. New game plan. Even though I was less than three blocks away from my residence hall, I would take the train one stop just to get away from him. As I approached the stairs down to the station, he grabbed me one last time and said that he would remember my face. I thought about using my pepper spray and sprinting, but before I could do that, a man stepped in. Is there a problem here? He asked. He was shorter than the stalker, but bulkier. I made eye contact with him, and I think he could sense my apprehension to respond. The stalker smiled and chuckled. No problem. Have a good night. I will see you around, young lady, he said, before turning around and walking away. Once he was far enough away, I let out a big sigh. The kind man asked if I was okay and I nodded. I told him briefly what happened and pointed in the general direction of where I was walking. He wished me well and I went on my way. I triple checked he didn't follow me before I walked into my residence hall. I locked myself in my room and didn't sleep a wink that night. It took me a while to walk around alone again and I had friends walk me back after that specific class, out of fear that the man would find me again. 
Eventually, I was able to regain the ability to walk alone, but the paranoia will never leave me. And to this day, I still have never mustered the courage to listen to the video. This story takes place in Arkansas's Hot Springs National Park. My wife and I are avid hikers and decided to take a weekend trip from Texas to Arkansas over Memorial Day weekend. For anyone that hasn't been to Hot Springs, it's a very small town that is centered around its bathhouses and national park. We got into town at around 1pm and it was extremely crowded. I'll admit that we didn't do much research before committing to the trip, but that was okay. We figured we'd get up early the next morning and do everything that we weren't able to do today. We drove around a little bit, and after failing to find a parking spot, we decided on getting a quick hike in before checking into our hotel. Typically, we prefer the less traveled trails that offer a little more challenging terrain rather than the high traffic areas since we enjoy the solitude of being in nature and going at our own pace. We start our hike and decide to do a five mile loop that should allow us some good views and quick stop at a natural spring to grab some water. Our hike was going great. We came across a couple of other people along the way, but that was expected given the holiday and the time of day. About halfway through, we're coming down a steep incline that leads to a small clearing when we see a woman standing there looking into the surrounding forest. Initially, we didn't think anything of it, since we did spot some wildlife off the sides of the trail earlier in the hike. If anything, I thought we were probably going to run off whatever animal or bird this lady was looking at, so we slowed down a bit, just in case she was taking a picture or something. As we were about 30 feet away, she backed up to the middle of the trail and was looking down at her phone. I assumed we would just say hello, pass her, and be on our way. The closer we got, the more detail we got of the situation. She was probably in her mid-thirties, blonde, and in normal hiking gear. Nothing was really unusual about her appearance, but I just had a feeling in my stomach that there was something off here. As we got within ten feet of her, she looked up at us and said, Going down, I'll join you. Now, my wife and I have been lifelong hikers, and, in my opinion, it's rare for something like this to happen. Nevertheless, I try to be positive about the situation and believe this is just a fellow hiker looking for some company. This portion of the trail narrows and becomes a single track where you kind of have to be in a single file line to go through. So I went first, my wife second, and this lady third. I'm listening to the conversation and occasionally turning back to check in and make sure everything is going smoothly. The conversation is pretty normal. Where we're from, first time in Arkansas, first time on the trail. Then I start to piece things together and start to get a little more cautious of what and how I answer some of these questions. The lady then asks where we're staying while we're in town. Since we've booked everything last minute, we're honestly not sure of the name. So we skirt the question saying, we're not really sure, it's a little outside downtown. This doesn't seem to satisfy the lady, so she keeps probing and wondering where exactly we're staying. She started to get more aggressive. At this point, we're coming to a fork in the trail that takes us down to one of the local parks that's a pretty high traffic area. I try to speed up without seeming suspicious, and we eventually make it out without further issues. When we look back, we see the woman cutting back into the woods off the trail. I'm not sure what was going on there or what her intentions were, but you can never let your guard down while out hiking, no matter how rural or suburban the trail may be. Hello everyone. I was wondering if anyone here might know what this thing could be. Our house sits at the end of a quiet cul-de-sac and our backyard goes right into dense woods. One night, about 9pm, 
My husband and I were sitting on our front porch having a drink and just chatting with each other, and my youngest son, who was 11, was inside playing with his Hot Wheels. He opens the front door and says, Mom, my friend Blake is out back calling my name. I said, Huh? And he repeated himself and said, He keeps calling my name, and when I say what out the back window, he doesn't answer me back. I said, Honey, it's 9pm. There's no way Blake's parents would let him come all the way over here in the pitch black of night, alone. He accepted that answer and went back inside. I thought it was strange, but couldn't make sense of it, so I put it out of my head. Until about 20 minutes later, my son flings open the front door, and with tears filling his eyes, he said, Now it sounds like you calling my name, Mom. Are you playing a trick? I said no. He exclaims he's very scared, so I tell him, I've got this. I stomp through the house, fling open the side door, and step out to the porch which also faces the woods. I'm partially thinking my son is just hearing things, but he was genuinely afraid, so I'm gonna yell at whatever he's hearing so he can feel safe behind his mama bear mother. I yell very aggressively. Whatever you are, you are not welcome here. Get the hell away from my house and my child. I stand there, feet planted, ready, and in the dead, silent, pitch black woods, I hear very heavy footsteps begin to walk away. Branches are cracking and snapping as it walks deeper into the woods. I froze. I couldn't believe it. Something is out there. Something was calling my son to come out. Well, fast forward a couple of weeks, and I'm sitting out front with my teenager and two of the neighbor's teens. It's about 11 p.m., one of the teens shushes us and says, Guys, do you hear that? It's a woman. We all listen intently, and then we hear a woman saying, Help me. We all looked at each other, worried. So me being the adult, I stand up and walk to the side of the house towards the woods to see if I can hear it better. The teens follow close behind me. Help me. From deep in the woods. One teen says, she needs help, but as I'm listening to this woman, I realize there's something off about her voice. It doesn't sound right. We continue to listen, and the weird voice gets closer, and each time it says help me, it sounds different in pitch and tone, like it's trying to perfect its mimicking voice. I said, that's not a woman. That's that thing that tried to lure my youngest out of the house. I yell to the woods. I know it's you. I told you to get the hell out of here. These kids aren't coming to you. No more help me's rang out. Every once in a while, we all hear strange screams coming from the woods at night. I don't allow the kids to play back there at night. I don't know what it wants, but I can tell you it's creepy as hell. If anyone knows what this thing could be, let me know. Thank you. When I was younger, my dad used to take my sister and I to the park all the time that was in our neighborhood so we could get out all of our energy. It was safe to say we practically lived at the park seeing as we went there all the time. There were numerous play parks for young kids located in various places in the neighborhood, but me and my sister's favorite was the one that had both the swings and the monkey bars, which to a kid was basically playtime paradise. We would always stay for a couple of hours, and my dad would drive us there and he would watch us play until we grew tired and wanted to go home for a snack. This particular day, we were playing just like any other day, and after we were done playing, we were walking back to my dad's car as usual. Once we were inside the car, sweaty and content from playing, I looked out my window and noticed a strange man approaching the vehicle on the passenger side. I hadn't noticed him before, and based on how this particular situation played out, I can only assume he must have approached after we got into the car. The way the park is set up is that there's the park with all the playing equipment a little past the parking lot, and the gate at the entrance that the neighborhood security closed after hours so people couldn't drive through it. 
and a sidewalk so people could exercise along it or use its path to walk the park, if that makes sense. The man was coming from the sidewalk that faced the street. My dad had already locked the doors because he was always protective of us and always cautioned us about locking the doors and putting on our seatbelts, and he kept his eye on the man. He pressed the lock button again numerous times just to check. He doesn't really like people approaching the window like that. Once the man finally walked around to my dad's window on the driver's side, my dad just cracked it a bit. Remember how I said I thought the man must have started to round the corner and approach after we got into the car? Well, while he struck up an eerie conversation with my dad, he didn't see us right away, so he must not have seen us get into the car with my dad. And while he spoke, I noticed he had his hands in his pockets, as if he was ready to pull something out. A weapon, perhaps. He says to my dad once he rolls the window down, Hey, man. I need you to do me a favor real quick. My dad cleared his throat and said, uh, No man, we gotta get home. My kids are tired and my wife is expecting me soon. Which wasn't entirely true, because if I remember correctly, I believe my mom was still at work that day, and my dad had taken the week off of work to spend time with us that week, since we were on a break from school at the time. The man wasn't smiling before, but he looked shocked and his eyes shifted to see me and my younger sister in the back seat of my dad's car. The man changed his tune all of a sudden and plastered on a fake smile waving at us and said to my dad, Oh, I see you got the kids with you. Okay, never mind. Maybe some other time then. My dad didn't seem to like what he said, but he played along saying, Yeah, maybe another time. Sorry, man. Then before the man can say anything else, my dad rolls up the window. The man stands there for a minute, then slowly walks off with his hands still gripping whatever was in his pockets. As soon as he's just enough feet away from my dad to back out, my dad peels out of there. To this day, I don't know what that man's intentions were, or why he had his hands shoved in his pockets, but what disturbs me the most is the thought of what he might have done to my dad had we not have been there in the back seat. I brought this story up to my dad recently, and he said even though we were too young to understand at the time, the man was likely going to hijack him if he were alone, and due to us being there in the back, probably didn't want to catch a kidnapping charge as well. I feel so blessed, and I'm just glad me and my sister, as young and innocent as we were, were there with him that day. We might just have saved his life. My name is Jasmine. I'm currently a senior, but this took place during my first year and sophomore year of college. I attend a historically all-women's college. Coming to campus, I didn't know anyone, so I was randomly assigned a roommate. That's when I met Erin. At first, I thought it was great. My college is a predominantly white institution, and I'm a West Indian, and Erin is Asian, but was adopted from China by two white moms. Aaron and I were the only students of color roommate pairing in our whole house. We kicked it off pretty well soon enough. We did everything together. Going to trashy parties, venturing off campus, and just eating all of our meals together. I would even say we were best friends. However, I soon realized how clingy and obsessive Aaron could be. Since I want to uphold some form of confidentiality, I won't go into details. But Aaron had multiple mental illnesses diagnosed, which could factor into their behavior, but that does not justify their actions. At first, it was small things like leaving random gifts and food. Then the clinginess started to escalate. I rarely went on dates, but any time I did go on them, Aaron would never leave the room. They would watch my date and I make out until I had to plead with them to leave the room. Any time I was not in the room, they would constantly call and text until I responded. Despite not understanding personal boundaries, I begrudgingly agreed to be roommates with them for our sophomore year. One evening, I came back to our room a little later than usual, Aaron voiced being concerned about me. They went on to recite my schedule, saying where and what times my classes end, 
how after class they knew I would be in the library, and when I would get dinner. I was alarmed that they had my schedule down to the timestamps. Aaron started to interject themselves in all my friendships. They even slept with some of my friends from a neighboring college. Some of my friends joked that Aaron had a crush on me, and that's why they would get so jealous of me hanging out with other people. I had multiple conversations reassuring Aaron that we're still friends, but they needed to respect my boundaries and understand that we do not have to hang out 24-7. Every time, Aaron would break down crying. I mean snot running down their nose, face red and streams of tears type of crying. Aaron would say that since they were adopted, they have abandonment issues and that eventually everyone leaves them. I think it was the emotional baggage that made me stay in the friendship that long. Why I ignored the stalking behavior. I never saw Aaron as dangerous or a threat until we had gone to an off-campus party and they were drunk. A week previously, Aaron had hooked up with a guy on this campus and had ghosted them. Using a Snapchat map, Aaron was trying to track down his dorm. It was around 1am, pitch black, on a foreign campus that was heavily wooded. I tried convincing Aaron to come with me on the last bus back to our campus, but in an oddly cool manner, they looked at me and told me to leave them. They would not leave the campus until they talked to him. My friends who were from that campus said they would look for Aaron, so I left. On the bus ride back, Aaron sends me a Snapchat message, a photo with a black screen. Seeing the extent they would go through to get in contact with someone made it apparent I no longer wanted to associate myself with them. I started to distance myself from Aaron. I was only in the room for sleep. I had made new friends where Aaron could not be apart but that resulted in even more sobbing tantrums. I came back to the room and Aaron casually asked, how did you like playing with the cat? I was confused because I hadn't seen a cat. When Aaron said one of my friends on Instagram posted a picture of us playing with a cat, living with Aaron became unbearable. It felt as if they were always watching me, tracking me on my snap map, watching my friends' stories to see where I am and memorizing my schedule. I requested a room change, but it was too late in the semester to change rooms. I had applied for a campus job that would guarantee a single room. Once I got the job, I told Aaron I was moving. I turned off my location on SnapMap. My friends blocked them on social media. And when I was moving, I refused to tell them where I was going. I knew they would show up any time they wanted. The day I had packed up and moved out, they were sobbing worse than I had ever seen. Aaron kept repeating, Tell me where you're moving. I can help you move. The pandemic happened, and we were all sent home. I had returned to campus in the spring of 2021, and I did not know if Aaron had also returned. I remember panicking any time I saw anyone who had the same hairstyle or the same weight. Aaron drives a green car, and any time I see one, my heart would stop. The next semester, when everyone got to come back, it was to my horror that I noticed that Aaron lives across the street from me. I'm always looking over my shoulder, hoping they don't find out where I live. Despite all this, I'm only now writing this because Aaron made new friends, and one of them reached out, saying how they're all so scared for their safety. I'm just ready to graduate, so I never have to see them again. So this happened in autumn 2014, I think. Mind you, I was around nine at the time. I had been told by my older brother that a man had been stalking our mom. Once, when it was only my mom and I in the house, he came and knocked on the door. My mom was talking to him about something in the bathroom, and then he decided to come inside, without my mom's consent. My mom quickly told him to get out, and I froze completely. A few weeks passed and I'd forgotten all about it, but one night I was unable to sleep. I had this constant feeling that someone was staring at me. I looked outside my window, that for some reason didn't have any curtains, and I saw the outline of a man looking into my room, and then the flashlight turns on. 
I closed my eyes and covered myself in pillows and stuff, hoping he couldn't see me. I told my mom about it the next day, and that's when she decided it was time to move. I thought that would be the end of it. Around two and a half years later, there was a school break, so me and my younger sister were home alone while our mom was at work. She had told me that a man would come over to check our electricity box or something like that. I didn't really put much thought into it. That was until I saw who it was. My sister and I were watching TV in the living room, and from there we could hear any approaching cars. Around lunchtime we heard a car, and the same man from two years ago climbed out of it. I felt my heart stop for a few seconds, and that's when my fight or flight response kicked in. I couldn't really see a reason for us to fight if he didn't know we were there so I quickly turned off the TV and told my sister to hide and be quiet. The living room was upstairs, so we could see him even if he couldn't see us, but then he must have gotten the same feeling of being watched as I did two years earlier. He looked right up at me. He came to the front door and knocked. Hey, I know you're home. I just want to use the bathroom, he said. No way was I going to let him in. I know your mom. We used to be neighbors. That's when I bolted. I went to hide with my sister and called my mom. We could hear him fumble with the doorknob, trying to get in. Luckily, the door's always locked. My mom picked up, and I told her that the man was here. She said she'd come home as soon as possible. A few minutes later, after fumbling with the door, he decided to leave. That's when we heard the car drive away. My sister was shaking and crying, and honestly, I have no idea what would have happened if he'd gotten in. Thankfully, I haven't seen him since. I was driving home from work. I worked the 3 to 11 p.m. shift at a hospital in town it's not suburban, but not a big city. There are not many streetlights, and the route I take home consists of family homes on the left side and a park on the right side. As I turned onto this street leading to Route 7, a very old white Ford pickup came out of nowhere and pulled in front of me. The truck was going slow, so I put on my indicator to pass on the right. The truck slowed down and put on its indicator and went to the right. Okay, coincidence. I was approaching the corner where I would take a right and put on my turn signal, and the truck slowed down again and put on his right signal. Mind you, I can clearly see someone in the passenger seat and the barrel of a shotgun between them. At this point, I'm asking myself if this is really happening, or have I watched one too many Dateline episodes? I decided to test it. As we approached the street to our left, I put on my left turn signal and again he slowed down and did the same thing. As he went to turn down the block, I started to turn behind him. Thank God there were no cars behind me, because I swerved away from the block and gunned it down the street. I got to the main street and turned the corner so fast my tires screeched. I kept looking back to see if they turned around to follow me, but I didn't see them. Once I got to my town, I pulled over and called my best friend in hysterics. I don't know what they had in mind, and I'm thankful that I didn't find out. I'm not 100% sure of how good this will be or how scary it will be. However, when I experienced this, I assure you, I was terrified. A quick bit of backstory before the actual story. At my high school, we have grade sport days on Thursdays, and at the beginning of each term, every student from grades 8 to 10 would select the sport they wanted to do for that term. So me and my best friend chose to do tennis together. All sports would end at 2.30, and students were to be dismissed from school grounds. The day this took place, I walked home, and because it was a Thursday, significantly less people are walking home so that made me all the more alone during this situation. Now, onto the story. 
This took place when I was in ninth grade, during a Thursday sport day. My best friend, some of her friends and I, decided to walk as a group to the bus stop and then go to our houses. But me, being very keen to get home, decided I wanted to walk the faster way back to my house. My best friend tried to persuade me to continue to walk with them, but I declined and walked away from the group. I began my lone walk home, and after a street or two, I turned onto another street. As I neared the end of this street, I noticed a 13 cab's car idling about 20 meters in front of me, going the opposite way to which I was walking. The driver was paying attention to his phone, which was mounted on the windshield, and I just thought to myself, I wonder why he's going so slow, probably checking to see where his next customer is. Maybe it's a lazy student who doesn't want to walk in the heat. I continued to quickly pace down the street when suddenly the 13 cabs car sped up and veered into the driveway I was about to cross. I was confused as to why he would pull up right in front of me, so I looked at the driver to make sure I was okay to cross in front of the car as I didn't want to cause any issues. While looking at the man, I slowly began to walk in front of the car and he gestured for me to come towards him. My heart dropped and I picked up my pace, and once my face was out of the man's view, I broke down. I began to hyperventilate and cry, expecting him to follow me, chase me, or even kidnap me. I was too terrified to even turn around and look back at the man, but as soon as I turned off that road, I constantly looked behind me and continued to rush home. I cried the whole way home. Something like this has never happened to me before and I feel really ashamed about how I reacted, even though the man didn't do anything. What if he had? I would be so screwed. When I think back to it, I judge myself for how I reacted, and sometimes my brain messes up what really took place. Like sometimes I think that maybe he didn't gesture for me to come towards his car, or maybe he didn't look like how I thought. After this, nothing happened but I'm still extremely wary of my surroundings. There are so many ways this situation could have gone, but at the end of the day, I'm glad nothing came of it. This happened to me in my first year of college. Generally, I got back home by five in the evening, but that day a registration process ran late and I had to wait till 8 for the bus. Now before I get into the story, I need you to know that my college has a uniform policy and I too was wearing mine that evening. So I got off the bus and was about to cross a bridge when a man approached me. He was middle-aged, decent looking, but he looked very nervous. The conversation was odd. He apparently saw my uniform and recognized my college. He then said he went to the same college years ago and is now working with an NGO. He wanted me to give him my contact details and donate some money. At first, I naively didn't think much of it and gave him all that was left of my commute money, which wasn't too much. That was when I noticed this other person leaning on a bike to this man's left. At the time, I was a 19-year-old female who was stopped at a nearly empty road with two sketchy-looking men. When this second man started to make his way over to us and commented how the money I paid was not nearly enough is when I got this sick feeling in my stomach. They kept asking me for money, and I think at that point my brain had just given up. I looked around to see absolutely no one around me, and I suggested that I give them my number so I could donate some more later. The second guy pulled out an Excel sheet on his phone and asked that I fill in my address, phone number, and name on the sheet so that he can make a receipt. I wrote down a fake name, made up an address, but when I thought of doing the same for my number, I realized they might call to check if my number was legit right now, so I put down my correct number. Just as I thought, they checked my number and then backed off a bit, but before they could say another word, I was running across the bridge and into the apartment complex. I turned back and saw them cross the bridge, and that's when my phone rang. This guy was calling me, but I had this habit of keeping my phone on vibrate all the time so it didn't make any noise. I was hiding behind the shrub until they walked a bit further when I quietly somehow found my way out of the complex and walked back home constantly checking over my shoulder. 
Once I got home, I completely broke down. And above all, my parents were furious as to why I gave my number to an unknown guy. I blocked the number and my father reported it to the police. It's been two years since this incident, with the pandemic in between, and how I didn't have to go to college for almost two years. But now that I have to go back, I try to always keep a mask on, and I always wear normal clothes to college and change into my uniform in the washroom. I'm a 34 year old female, but this event took place when I was 21 and studying abroad in Europe. I was based out of Italy, but I convinced my parents to let me backpack for a few weeks by myself to other major destinations. To prep, I read a few books and articles about traveling safely alone and watched Taken right before I left, just for good measure. Okay, so here is the evening. I remember it like it was yesterday. I was by myself in Paris having dinner near the opera house. As I got up from dinner, I noticed a group of six men that got up near me and started off in the same direction as me. This wasn't of concern until I noticed that the six men followed less than 20 feet behind me and took the same turns, regardless of my walking speed. They all spoke with an Eastern European accent and dialect that sounded similar to my limited exposure to Russian. After about 10 minutes, they were aware that I'd noticed them and proceeded to attempt to engage me in conversation with catcalls and general questions, all spoken in English with an Eastern European accent. Starting to get nervous, I decided to pretend like I didn't understand what they were saying. Immediately, they switched to speaking to me in French, which I don't speak at all. After another 15 minutes or so of walking in large circles of several city blocks, nowhere close to my bed and breakfast, they had come up to only 5 to 10 feet behind me, ensuring they were impossible to ignore. Beginning to panic, I decided to use a non-native language I knew best, Italian. In addition to pretending I didn't understand English, ignoring the French and trying to stay calm, I began to speak back to them in Italian, saying phrases such as, I'm sorry I don't speak French, I don't understand what you're saying. Is there something I can help you with? Are you lost? And other phrases like that. I am fair-skinned with blonde hair and blue eyes, and they could tell that I almost certainly wasn't Italian. But after 45 minutes of following me and being stonewalled by a language that they didn't know, they got more brazen and were walking close enough to me to reach out and grab me. I wasn't completely lost, but trying to walk with faint confidence in where I was, as well as hiding my inner panic and acting more confused and concerned for them than terrified. If I turned down an unpopulated street, or worse, into an alley, I had no doubt that they would have moved to outright aggression. I didn't know what they wanted with me, but the persistence in attempt to get me talking made me think that it was nothing good. The sun was already setting, and I was nowhere near my B&B, and trying to ask for help would reveal my charade of being Italian. I didn't know the city well enough to find the police station, and I felt my options were running out. If I ran, at least one of the six would likely be able to catch me, and beginning to scream could result in having my mouth covered. Towards the end of this nightmare, I began walking up and down the exact same major street, with restaurants and tourists everywhere. I didn't want to leave this very public street and was hoping the obvious repetition might catch the attention of someone that could help. Finally, after an hour of being tailed and stubbornly refusing to show my obvious fear and disorientation, they stopped abruptly and began to walk down another street. Did they decide I was too much trouble to continue to follow, or were they now hiding, one or two of them at different intervals, in possible paths I would take back to where I had dinner? Shaking with anxiety and tension, I walked around in a nonsensical route back to my room for 45 minutes after they walked away, before I finally went inside and began sobbing immediately at the front desk. I explained to the clerk what had happened and asked if he thought I was finally safe. He was certain that I was indeed in danger and pretty sure I shook them off, but just in case, 
He locked the front doors and carried my bags to stay in the large room closet behind earshot of the front desk, but out of view of the front door. If you're traveling alone, please always be vigilant and aware of your surroundings. Listen to your instincts and assume a natural suspicion to anyone new. Try to stay calm, no matter how increasingly panicked you get. Keep a level head and try to think of your next move and continually assess your options. Most importantly, please don't let anyone follow you see where you're sleeping that night. In the 90s, I was in high school, and during one winter, I was just finishing up a book report I'd been typing. The computer at the time was located in our spare bedroom, which is only one window. It faced out to our backyard only. Also, like I mentioned, it was winter and during a really bad storm. My mom had just come in to tell me to hurry up and get to bed, as she looked out to the rain pouring down. We didn't have blinds or anything on the window due to my mom remodeling the room. She made a few more comments about the storm before walking out. I was basically done with my report, so I went to save it to go over in the morning before printing it out. As I started shutting down the computer, something caught my eye outside. I remember looking out the same window, thinking, that poor cat, he's getting soaked in this rain. But, no sooner did I think this, I realized it couldn't have been a cat I was looking at. There was no ledge anywhere for a cat to sit on or even be at eye level to me. To my horror, I realized it was a man wearing some type of nylon mask over his head to cover his face. I screamed so loud and for the first time in my life like that ever, I flipped backwards out of the chair and crawled out of the room as my dad and mom came rushing in. I screamed that there was a man watching me through the window. My dad ran outside to the side of our house the window was on. He took one look to see the gate to our backyard was wide open, and before the rain could wash away the tire tracks belonging to a bicycle, someone had been there watching me for who knows how long and was able to get away, and fast, because of the bicycle. Not only did they get into our backyard to watch me type a book report, but they also had to know there was a window there. The terrifying realization that came with that was that there was no other way to know about the window unless you had been in our home or backyard previously. Then came, how many times had this happened before? Not to mention my mom was just standing there looking out that window five minutes before. And as a 16-year-old girl, this was traumatizing. But I did not let it stop me in any way from living alone, nor from anything else later on in life. Although I would not stay home alone for a few months after, and I also slept on my parents' bedroom floor. I know it might sound like nothing, but until you have someone watching you with unknown intentions, don't be so quick to dismiss the creepiness of it all. I'm 40 years old now, single mom, I've got three kids. I've always been really close with my first cousin, ever since we were little kids growing up. We've always had somewhat of a bond, I guess you could say. I love him to death. He can be dramatic, but he keeps things exciting. We didn't have it easy as kids, but we had each other and we were only eight months apart, so we've always been pretty close, even through distance. Recently, I moved my children and I from New York to Pennsylvania in order for them to be closer to their father. So instead of having them commute to see him, we relocated our home base so the kids could stay put in Pennsylvania, and I would commute back to New York for work, for the time being at least. After a couple of years doing this, it was getting repetitive and old. One Monday night, I got a phone call from my cousin. It was different because usually when he calls, he's the one that has a problem and needs to discuss something pertaining to his life. And I listen. But this phone call was different. When I answered the phone, I was busy braiding one of the girl's hair, 
and I probably said something along the lines of, Hey, what's up? Are you okay? He said, Yes, I'm fine this time. I just wanted to know how you were doing, and if you were okay. But I said I was fine, just busy trying to get the kids in bed after their baths. It's a school night and whatnot, and trying to get ready for my next trip to work in New York on Wednesday. I asked him, Why, what's up? Again. He said, Oh, nothing. Just call me back when you have a minute to chat. It's no big deal. I agreed to do so. I told him I loved him and hung up the phone shortly after. That Wednesday, after the kids went to their dad's house, I departed Pennsylvania for New York as usual to go to work for three days while my children were with their father. I had forgotten to call my cousin back and see what his concerns were. En route, traveling through the city. Actually, it was after I passed the city and I was on the parkways, heading towards eastern Long Island. I had a near-death experience, so to speak. Long story short, I'd almost gotten into a car accident, and within a matter of three to five seconds prior to this near accident, I saw my life flash before my eyes and knew that this was going to be the end. This was it. I was about to die in this car accident, and my kids were no longer going to have a mother. Somehow, by the grace of God and my guardian angels, and whatever else was watching over me that night, I'd been able to do some stuntman driving maneuvers that managed to allow me to avoid hitting the car that had just cut me off, and also avoid hitting the other cars that were traveling alongside me in traffic. And after I had done this crazy stunt in my old beat up 200,000 mile 03 GMC Envoy, I realized that I was still driving on the parkway, and somehow not dead. I took a long while to shake it off. I drove another mile or two and then had to pull over because it was overwhelming. There was no way I should have been alive, and somehow I was. I grab my necklace, which carries my grandfather's Tiffany keychain with his initials graved on it, and my grandmother's gold cross and kiss them relentlessly, giving thanks, and eventually was able to continue driving on to work with the rest of the trip going uneventful. I was blown away. I was unable to talk about it for days. It was just too astonishing, and I wasn't even really able to comprehend how that happened or what force had been protecting me or why I was still alive. I just knew I was grateful as fuck, and there were definitely many of my angels watching over me that evening. So, after I finished my three days of work and returned back to Pennsylvania, I was sitting with my children once again doing something when my phone rang. Again, it was my cousin calling. I realized I'd never called him back, so I answered the phone. I said, Hello. Shit, sorry I never called you back, and I asked what he wanted to talk to me about. After he was done making sure that I was okay, he continued to tell me about a dream that he'd had. Now, this dream that he'd had was prior to my leaving for my last New York trip, and having had my near-death close encounter car accident experience, or whatever you want to call it, and me nor him ever having told anybody about it, he described my near car accident to me in every detail except that he was in the car with me when it was happening, in his dream that he'd had the week prior to my last trip north for work. I couldn't believe the words that were coming out of his mouth. He said that in his dream, he and I were driving. Somebody pulled out in front of us. We knew that we were going to smash into the back of him, and we looked at each other and said, Oh, fuck, and continued to crash into the back of the car causing all the traffic around us to crash as well and cause a multi-car pileup, in which we both and many others had died. He had described my close encounter car accident to a T. It was like in his dream, he'd left his astral body or something and was with me in the car while I was driving, and somehow had prevented it from happening. But this was prior to it happening, as if some kind of warning, which made him want to reach out to me to make sure I was alright. Somehow, he had a premonition dream about what was going to happen to me, but he was with me during the time, and was able to prevent it from happening, somehow. I can't really wrap my mind around it fully still. It's so hard to comprehend, but my mind was blown. 
He had called to check in on me because of a crazy dream that he'd had about us getting into a car accident together and dying. He had described the car accident exactly as it happened to me, with the exception of me surviving, somehow managing to continue driving down the road unharmed and car unaffected, and me being alone. Two or three days prior to it even happening to me. Now, I never told anybody about this near death or close encounter to a car accident experience. I still wasn't able to wrap my head around how I had somehow survived it, and the wheels didn't go flying off my car by the MacGyver style maneuvers I somehow managed to make to get out of it unharmed. And he had described to me exactly what I had experienced, all through a premonition dream. I was dumbfounded. I still am. I always knew we had a bond, but this is on a whole new level. Whatever. I'm beyond grateful that I'm still here with my children, for whatever reasons. I definitely had some guardian angels that night. And maybe the love and protection of my still living, lucid, dreaming, astral projecting cousin, too. The world is way weirder and mysterious than we know it to be, that's for sure. I count my blessings, and so should you. When I was a kid, there were rumors spreading in our neighborhood that a gang was wandering around and kidnapping rich children to extort money or to sell their organs to rich families in need of organ donors. Since those rumors were often made up to scare children to avoid going out at night, my mother didn't really care about those things because she knew I liked staying indoors. In addition to that, we were dirt poor, so my mom didn't pay much attention to that since she figured they would be unlikely to target children like me. However, it was my sixth birthday. I received some hand-me-downs from my cousin who's filthy rich. Like most kids, I stubbornly wore the gold necklace and insanely fancy dress I received earlier. My mom and my aunt brought me to a mall that day to celebrate my birthday. It was a fairly normal day. We ate something from a fast food joint and we went grocery shopping. There was a huge sale, and so there were lots of people during that time. I accidentally let go of my mom's hand and found I was lost. Remembering what my mom taught me when this type of scenario happens, I went and asked for help from the security guard nearby. The guard reported it, and announcements were made. There was this tall man who looked like my dad. He was holding balloons and a lollipop and claiming to be with me. The guards, believing that he was my dad, since I was staring at the man with a smile on my face and with our almost identical features, they immediately assumed that he was my dad. They gave me to him, and I did not resist believing that he was my actual dad, and he'd come to surprise me. The man walked out of the mall with me on his back, and at the time, I was not at all afraid. My mom and aunt then came to the guards looking for me. The guards were shocked and panicked when my mom told them that my dad was out of the country, and that they did not know the man. The guards informed everyone to stay alert for the stranger. Just in time, they saw the man attempting to bring me to a car in the parking lot while I was unconscious. The man was brought to the police station and questioned, but somehow he was not charged for what he did. I do not remember anything from the time I was brought outside the mall. Nevertheless, it was a big lesson for my mom and I. I wonder, if my mom arrived a minute later, what would have happened to me? So this happened about five years ago. A little background first. My dad had trained me in how to keep calm in stressful or life and death situations. I did the same with my kids. My kids were around 12 and 13 years old and in the back seat. My elderly mom was right next to me. We had just finished our errands and I asked if anyone wanted to go to the popular small lake that has a one-way road going around it at about a mile circular before going home. They all immediately wanted to do so, mostly to see the new duck chicks. There's a maximum speed limit of 20 miles per hour and several places to exit if you don't want to go completely around. 
The reason for the low speed limit is a lot of people go here for fishing, walking, or jogging. We got to see the baby ducks and slow to a stop at times to awe over the tiny chicks. I was halfway around when this huge man in a big truck went racing around the lake, going about 50 miles per hour. There was a lot of screaming from people racing to get out of his way. I immediately started to speed up and take an exit off the road. I was almost there when I heard the truck engine. My mom screamed, the kids were frozen in fear as I looked into the rearview mirror. He was coming up fast on me. He slammed on the brakes and came just inches from hitting the back of my car. Then he started following me aggressively and screaming all sorts of insults at me. I sped up and got out of there, but he kept following me. My mom was freaking out. My kids were terrified, but doing the breathing exercises that I taught them to keep themselves calm. I yelled at my mom to shut the fuck up. I threw my cell phone to my oldest son and told him to call 911 and inform the dispatcher that we were headed to the police station and to please have a few cops waiting for us. He did so and at times screamed in fear as this man went down a side street and turned back to ram us off the road. He would get in front of me and slam on the brakes, parked blocking the road or do a pit maneuver. I thank God that my dad had been in the military and taught me maneuvers to avoid aggressive drivers. I was able to avoid all the things he was doing. The dispatcher heard the terrifying screams every time I had to brake hard or swing the car around. I was cussing like crazy. We made it to the police station where there were several cops waiting for us. The guy was so angry that I don't think he realized where we were. He parked right behind me to block me in got out of his truck still screaming around to my side, got even more angry when the cops wouldn't let him near me. He swung out and punched one of the cops so hard in the head that he was knocked out. He got tasered and sprayed as he was tackled down. It took several cops to hold him down when he suddenly went quiet. He suddenly realized just where he was and began struggling again, saying that they couldn't arrest him because he didn't know that they were cops at that moment. I let out a relieved breath once he was in the back seat of a cop car. Paramedics came to check us all out. My mom had to be taken to the ER for extremely high blood pressure and suffering from chest pains. My kids and I were taken in as well. The moment that they realized that they were safe, the hysterical crying and clinging to me started. I was shaking and felt cold despite the warm temperatures. I was told that I was in shock. After, we all came home except for my mom who had to stay overnight. The kids were too terrified to sleep in their beds and wanted to sleep with me, but we were all too wired up to sleep, so I made some sleepy time tea and gave them melatonin. I, on the other hand, didn't take anything, and the comforting noises my home usually makes became scary. A few days later, I got a call from one of the arresting officers who told me that the man had several arrest warrants on him for similar things. He also told me that the guy had every intention of killing me and everyone else in my car simply because he was angry and wanted to release it. So it was a good thing I called 911 and went to the police station. It would take me a few weeks before I could fall asleep easily again. I had to put my kids into counseling and I still have nightmares from it, but it's more rare now. So, I'm a new Uber Eats driver. I've only been going about a month. I was just completing an order in the middle part of town. Not too suburbs, but also not too iffy. As I walked up to my customers, I see there's a man and a woman in the doorway and another woman across from them on the sidewalk. The woman in the doorway is standing timidly behind the guy and his jaw looks firm. She doesn't break eye contact with me as I walk up, but I tried not to pay it much mind. The guy accepted it, said thanks, and rushed him and his girl into the building. I started to walk back to my car when I noticed the woman from before gently calling for me to stop. She was gently saying, hey, and I almost didn't catch it. However, I did notice her trying to keep pace with me on my way to my car. 
That set my alarm bells off, and I did a quick little one-two step to get a bit in front of her. I jumped into my car without breaking eye contact with her, quickly pushed the lock button on my door, and she still proceeded to try and reach for my passenger side door as if to open it. She heard the door click and stopped on her way to grab it. She bent down to look at me through my window, and her eyes looked far off and bleary. She kept mouthing something, but just like before, her voice was very quiet and I couldn't hear her. I cracked my window just a bit so I could hear her, but not enough that she could get a hand inside. I said, Sup. I was pretending to be callous and hard, but I'm very soft and easily intimidated. I'm not good with conversation, and in most dangerous situations, I tend to panic. I'm really proud of myself at this point, that I was quick enough to think of all these safe solutions. She starts just talking in circles about, What are you doing? Where are you going? You can't deliver for Uber. You're in high school. And those types of questions. Keep in mind that I do have a baby face, but I'm 30 years old. I'm polite but curt with her, and tell her yes, I'm doing deliveries, and now I have to go. Did you need something, or did you need any help? I ask. She keeps trying to talk in circles, but as I'm about to insist that I'm peeling out, she says, hey, let me come with you. I get this weird feeling in the back of my neck, because she looks like what she said was a perfectly sane request, and still did not break eye contact with me. Also keep in mind that this entire time she's been speaking with a very gentle and quiet voice, as if she was talking to a small, scared animal. I say no thanks. She insists, saying, Just trust me, I'm gonna go with you. Just trust me. Again at this point, I'm getting more nervous. I say no thanks, I'm about to drive off. You should step back so I don't run over your feet. She tries to get closer, maybe thinking that if she doesn't move, I won't move. She's sadly mistaken, and I start rolling slowly forward, saying, you better step back. I'm about to crush your feet. She kept laughing to some unknown joke in her own mind, saying, you're so funny. You're so funny. I peeled out of there and confusedly looked back in my rearview mirror. I have never come across someone like that before, and I've been in much rougher neighborhoods than this, so I was very confused. I called my husband, who was used to living in the rougher part of my large city, and he said that she could have potentially been trying to trap me, so that another person or car can roll up to my driver's side and potentially jump me or try to steal my car. I'm always glad for his insight because of my shelteredness. I have no idea about all these strategies that people have to get one up on you. This all happened about half an hour ago, and I thought sharing this information might help someone out there. Stay safe, everyone. I started a new job this month and my workplace is only two blocks away from the bus stop, with one of those blocks being a public sports place with a public pool and running tracks and stuff that I always go through instead of around because it's shorter and busier so I feel safe. However, the next block is quite lonely with not a lot of traffic from cars or people. This morning, I was about to cross the street and an SUV stopped. I didn't find it weird because I thought the driver was being kind letting me cross before continuing on their way. After that, I kept walking really slowly because I always make sure to arrive exactly on time and I was like five minutes early today. As I was about to turn right, I finally realized that the same SUV was a little bit in front of me, almost at my side, turning right really slowly. My workplace is surrounded by houses in a decent neighborhood, so when I saw him driving slowly, I just assumed he was going to park in front of his house. However, he did stop, and I thought, oh well, maybe he has to open the porch, I don't know. But instead of getting out of his car, he just stayed there. That freaked me out, but I kept walking, like I said, really slowly. When I was about to be at the side of the car, I didn't know what to do. Should I run, walk normally until I pass him, or what? So I started walking more quickly, and when I was at the side of the car, he waved or did a signal at me, but I didn't catch it clearly. 
I ignored him and finally passed him, but once I did, he started the engine again so he was right by my side. I finally arrived at my workplace and he stopped again. I quickly rang the bell. I can actually open the door from the outside, but I didn't want him to see how. Also, by ringing the bell, I was basically telling the other people to come outside for me. Immediately after I rang the bell, he accelerated and left. I feel really bad for not trying to memorize his license plate number or even remember his face. I really hope no other girl has to go through this. Even if I had all of his information, I'm from a less economically developed country, so the police won't do anything about a potential creep. Now I'm scared. What if he comes back? What should I do? He knows where I work. I was recently driving from a campsite in southern Minnesota. I was driving on back roads. As I left a tiny, tiny town, maybe about 500 people, I noticed a silver SUV ahead of me. They were about a half a mile in front. The SUV pulled to the shoulder of the road, no flashers. I went around them, pulling into the other lane to be nice. As soon as I get by them, they pull right back onto the road behind me. I go through another small town and then to a bigger town of about 20,000 people. I'm turning from a single lane to a double. Traffic law states I have to go into the closest lane. I went to the far lane. They stayed right behind me. I'm nervous at this point. They've been following me for 30 to 40 minutes. I kept telling myself it was a coincidence. I knew my next turn did not have a turn lane. I decided to make the corner without signaling. I had signaled every other turn I made and so had the SUV. I was keeping an eye on him. No signal, but he followed me around the corner. I had not slowed down to give a clue I was turning either. The SUV followed me for another 30 minutes. I finally lost him when I barely made it through a railroad crossing before the train. He was stuck on the other side of the train from me. I made it the last 30 minutes of my drive with no sign of the silver SUV. This incident occurred back in late 2021. I was currently serving in the military stationed in California and I lived off base at this time. It was around 9pm when I was driving home from work. I pulled into my apartment parking garage and I noticed a guy I'd not seen before and I knew he did not live here. He was standing there leaning against one of the support columns just staring through my windshield. I tried to gauge what his intentions were by giving the old Midwest, hey, by raising my finger over my steering wheel. I got nothing, just a blank stare right at me. At this moment, I knew something wasn't right. I tried to weigh my options in my head. I can awkwardly back out of the very small parking garage and do a few laps around the neighborhood. I could call my roommate and tell him to come down. Strength in numbers, you know. Or I can be a tough and brave military man. I decided to stop overthinking it and just deal with it in my own. I backed into my parking space all the while this guy's directly across from my parking spot, just staring at me. I again do the Midwest finger wave over the steering wheel with zero reaction from the guy. I grit my teeth and get out of my car and start walking towards the only staircase up to my apartment. So I obviously have to walk right past him. I start approaching and say, Hey, how's it going? Just to gauge his friendliness one more time. And got absolutely nothing. So at this point, I'm thinking I'm either going to get stabbed in the neck or shot in the back of the head when I pass him, but nothing happened. I realized I was just overthinking it and began walking up the stairs to my apartment. I get about a quarter of the way up when I hear running behind me. I started to run up the stairs, skipping a few steps and completely eat it, cutting my hands and bleeding, but at this point I didn't care. I got up and kept going up the stairs and got to my door. This scene was honestly straight out of a horror movie. Me trying to get my key in the door when I turn and see him running up the stairs. 
it honestly feels like it all was in slow motion. I thankfully got the key in and was able to get inside the house, but my motor skills were not all there at this point, so I was struggling to lock the door. I braced it with my foot while he tried getting in, and I was able to lock it. He started messing with the door handle and banging on the door while I went and woke up my roommate. I grabbed my firearm from my bedroom, and we both just sat in the living room, waiting. After about a minute of this, we decided to call 911, and in about three minutes, around ten squad cars pulled up and searched the whole area. The guy was nowhere to be found. While finishing my contract in California, I was paranoid every time I went down to that garage. I still don't know what his intentions were to this day, and that's honestly the part that irks me the most. The university I went to was a very old campus built around 1850. It started as an old women's college with one building and grew over the 150 plus years to include a few other more modern buildings. The central old building was always empty and constantly under construction, but it seemed like progress was very slow. It was strictly off limits with threats of being expelled to any students caught within. I broke in three to four times with a friend. The first time we did some recon. The building was a squared U-shape with a fenced-in courtyard where the school kept landscaping equipment. It was snowing quite hard, dampening the sound nicely, and it was around 1 a.m. We hopped the fence and looked for access. Everything was locked and we didn't want to break anything yet to get in. We took some pictures and noted the rooms we would try to break in through. My friend went to hop back over the fence, lost his balance and checked his balls while I attempted to spot him. At that moment, I heard a young girl chuckle standing next to me. It was clear as day. I looked over my shoulder to see nothing, but heard another giggle. I jumped over the fence and sprinted back to my dorm. The second time we actually accessed the building, we broke a window to unlock and crawled in the basement. We found a large three-story spiral staircase that was beautiful and began to climb to the top. We could hear the eerie sound of what reminded me of a record skipping over and over, mixed with chanting. We got to the top and found a tape plastic divider blocking the wall, presumably for dust or asbestos. The sound was pretty loud at this point. It seemed to be coming from the opposite end of the building, maybe 50 yards away. My friend sticks a knife through the plastic to crawl through. Everything goes silent. We continue and find a room full of several hundred dead pigeons we decided to leave. The last time we broke in, we took two more friends with us. Again, we make it to the top of the staircase, but decided to explore the other rooms at the top. We found a very large room with high ceilings, a huge fireplace with a beautiful mantle overlooking the campus. I see campus security in their patrol vehicle about a block away, but I don't think he sees us. Suddenly we hear the sounds of footsteps coming up the staircase. We freeze and line up against the wall closest to the entry of the room. The steps clearly come to within feet of the entry and stop. My heart is pounding. I'm thinking it's security and we're fucked. I'm closest to the entry and the guy behind me is poking me to look. I lean forward and around the doorframe into the hall to see nothing waiting for us. So, I work as a baker for a small bakery in a tourist town. I'm regularly at work around midnight most nights. I'm pretty close to the local strip of bars and clubs, so I hear late night party goers quite often. Sirens a few times a night, people yelling, that kind of stuff. The weirdest story though, which started out creepy but didn't end that way, was when I opened the door around 4am to someone knocking. The only reason I opened the door is because my boss had literally just texted me, saying we might be getting an early delivery, so I thought it was just them. I opened the door and no one's there. I glanced around, 
thinking they knocked and ran back to their truck to start unloading, and then suddenly someone steps out of the shadows looking like Slenderman. I panic, but hold it together pretty well, and once they got out of the shadows, it obviously wasn't Slenderman. It was just a tall, skinny girl, with no pants on, or shoes, and a shirt that obviously wasn't hers. This poor girl then asks me if she can borrow a phone. It clicks in my mind what could have happened, and I tell her to come in. I let her use my phone. She tries to call her boyfriend, and tells me that essentially she came to after passing out. She didn't know where she was, and I was the only light on on the street. I didn't ask what happened to her, but she was saying something about pulling a firearm earlier, and was hyperventilating over the cops being called on her, so I didn't call them. Her boyfriend never answered the phone, but I helped her figure out where her hotel was, and luckily it was on the same block we were already on. I couldn't leave to walk with her or drive, because I had a million things in the oven, but I actually gave her my phone with the place pulled up on Google Maps and the flashlight on and she walked there. She made it back okay, showered and took a nap, and brought me back my phone later in the morning. She hugged me twice and thanked me profusely, and I'm just sitting there like, damn, I didn't think I was getting my phone back, but I'm glad it worked out okay. I don't know if she was sexually assaulted or just the type to strip when drunk or what, but she seemed okay after having been back to her hotel room. It could have gone a lot worse for her, so I'm glad I was the door she knocked on. But God, did she give me a heart attack at first. When I was about 9 or 10, my sister and I moved out of our school district just on the edge. It greatly affected the school's test scores, so they opted to put me and my sister in a school taxi service than to just make us change schools. It was cool. Every morning you'd get some driver to take you to school in a specific car. And then after school, you'd go to the pickup line and get in the same car with a possibly different driver. I didn't have to do the whole bus thing anymore, and it smelled far better. Win-win. There were about four different drivers that would rotate our route so very quickly we got used to them all and felt safe. I mean, after all, these people were being vetted and sent by the school. Why wouldn't you trust them? Like any other day, we got out of school and got in the car with one we didn't see as often, but it was often enough that we knew him. He pulled off and we went about our business. I was talking to my sister about her homework. She had just started kindergarten that year and was excited. We talked about the mean girls at school who were bullying her because she was bigger, saying she was slow and failed kindergarten. Now at this point, we should be home, so I look out the window and don't recognize anything. I was confused and thought that maybe this was a new route home because of the construction. Where are we going? I asked. I have to pick someone up. I immediately knew something was off but I was ten, so I didn't know exactly what. Of course, my sister didn't catch on. She was trying to do her homework then, so she wouldn't have to later. I was trying to be nosy, but he had the GPS turned away from us. I also didn't have a phone, because my parents didn't think that at my age, I would need it, so it would have been a waste of money. He drove around for about 45 minutes. During so, we passed farms and very little cars, until eventually, he turned into this apartment building and called someone. I'm outside. Where are you? I hear him say. No. Tell him I couldn't get the boy. I got the other two, though. Okay. I'll be waiting. He hung up the phone and told me again that we were waiting to pick someone up, and then he would take us home. Fifteen minutes. That man waited fifteen minutes before he called again and he then said he was leaving. I couldn't make out what the other person said, but he replied with, No, he's not coming. He told me sorry for the wait, and he turned the car around, and we started that long journey back. We didn't get home until 5.30, 
My mom was livid the minute she saw the car. She took us out and went for the driver. She had to be pulled back and she was screaming. The police were called and they questioned him. They asked us where we went and I really didn't know anything about it. I was trying to remember everything so hard it all became a blur. I was just panicking. From what I remember, he wasn't charged with anything and was simply suspended for a few days, then given different kids to pick up. I may have been book smart, but ten-year-old me wasn't life smart. I am so glad nothing came of it. It wasn't until years later when I told the story to a friend that she told me she thought I was going to be sold and someone chickened out. Okay, I know this is completely and utterly avoidable on my part, but I thought I'd share it anyway. It was 2 a.m. I had been drinking at a bar with my friends. I was drunk but relatively functional, and I decided to call a lift home. Somehow mid-lift ride, my lift was cancelled. I told him I didn't mean to cancel, and I asked the guy if I could stay in the car and reorder the lift. He told me I couldn't do that and then had me get out of the car. Immediately after I'd left the car, my phone died, so I was stranded in downtown LA after 2am. I decided to just walk until I found someplace open, which of course, literally nothing was open. Then I noticed some guy following me. I walked faster and he started calling out to me in an aggressive way. He also started walking faster. I eventually ran as he chased after me until I saw a car that was running. I knocked on the window and luckily they let me in the car. I was sitting there in silence in this stranger's car, sniffling and crying for 10 minutes in complete silence until my phone charged enough that it would last and a new lift got there. I had worse things happen to me in LA but it was definitely the scariest situation that could have ended horrifically if I hadn't found a kind stranger. I was drinking with a few co-workers of mine last week and decided I'd had a few too many and would Uber my way home. The guy around 35 to 40 years old picks me up in a nice car. The conversation started off normal enough until he starts talking about a girl he knows also named Jess. She was always hanging on me and trying to kiss on me and whatnot, but I thought she was too pretty, so I wouldn't date her. He went on about Jess from New Mexico and how she looked like an angel and how he thought she was too pretty to date. It lasted for about half the ride. Then he goes on about how he's seen a lot of strange things as an Uber driver. How a woman once got into his car and began to strip completely naked and began throwing her clothes out the window. He playfully jabbed that he hopes that doesn't happen this time with a creepy perverted smile. He then told me I was very gorgeous and how I too looked like an angel. It was an uncomfortable ride but it had finally come to an end when we pulled into my driveway he says, five stars for you, as I opened my door and stepped out. But then I heard his car door open too. He got out of the car. I was pretty drunk, but he was small and I wasn't too worried. I walked to my front door, keeping an eye out on the weirdo who just kind of stood at his door as I walked into my house. Nothing else came of this, so it was a bit of an anticlimactic ending, but it was a creepy encounter for me to say the least. Stay interesting, Uber. I must start my story by making the disclaimer that I was a bit high at the time of the event. I'd smoked with my boyfriend two to three hours before, so it was minimum really. With that out of the way, here it goes. I was at my boyfriend's house after a night of cooking and watching movies. I couldn't stay the night because I had a matter to attend on the next day. Usually my boyfriend would drop me off at home, 
but like I said, we'd smoked, so I preferred he stayed home and I could just ride in an Uber. It was quite late, a bit after midnight, and of course he did not like the idea, but it is usually safe to have an Uber ride back home, so I brushed it off. The time came for me to leave, and my boyfriend came with me to the Uber store to say goodbye and he made sure to get a look at the guy and the plate. And I went off. The drive from my boyfriend's to my house takes about 15 to 17 minutes. When we were about 7 minutes away from getting home, he suddenly started talking to me about gas prices and whatnot, asked if that was my boyfriend before. I said yes, and he just started giving me weird vibes, asking how old I was, if I drive a car, what kind of car, and that stuff. At some point, we were passing through quite a desolated somewhat long road, and there was a car stopped, seemingly having trouble. Then this guy asked me, hey, if the car was to suddenly stop in the middle of the road, what would you do? Let my parents know exactly where I am so they can come and then ask for help, I responded. Smart. Now what if I stopped and there was no one? and you had no battery on your phone. That would not happen. I always have battery on my phone, I responded, and he just kept insisting on what I would do in this situation. It felt really weird and creepy, and my heart was beating so fast. He suddenly stopped asking, and I was letting my boyfriend know everything, live location included. When we were very close to getting to my house, he started talking about how dark and far from everything this was, and how he'd never been here before. I don't know, it was so weird I didn't even want him to drop me off at my house because of not wanting him to know where I lived. When we got to my house, he just said bye, and I quickly walked home and locked the door as fast as I could. I'm not sure if I was just paranoid or if this was just really off, but it felt weird, and next time... I will definitely be staying at my boyfriend's. I recently moved into a new apartment with my boyfriend, who works away for long periods of time. An older man started to become friendly with me, knowing I was new to the complex. I made the mistake of telling him I lived with my partner, but he's away for work for a while. Almost every day after that, he came knocking on my door and waiting if I didn't answer. One time I was out in the common grass area playing with my brother, who was two, that I would occasionally have over. I saw him coming my way and quickly picked my brother up. The man started making conversation, asking about my brother, and literally tried to grab him out of my arms. I held onto my brother tight and pulled away, and as he started to cry, I made the excuse that I have to go feed him, and walked away. I'm extremely bad with confrontation as you can tell. A few days later, I heard a knock at my door and opened it without thinking. He walked straight past me into my apartment without even saying a single word, just smiling. I asked him if he was doing okay and he said, I'm good just wanted to see what your place looked like from the inside, and started walking into every room. He checked all my windows and commented, Huh, so all your windows have bars on them except the bathroom. I nervously laughed and said, Yeah, I guess they do. I didn't know what to do, so I walked out into the front garden, hoping he would follow me out of the apartment to try to talk to me. I just wanted him out because I was scared to anger him. Once he came out, I closed my door and said, I have to go to the shop now. Sorry, it's gonna close soon. And I walked off. That night, while hanging my washing out, another neighbor introduced herself. I told her what happened and asked if she knew the man. Apparently he'd been doing the exact same thing to her. She told her partner that this creepy neighbor was doing the same things to a young girl, and that was his last straw. He ended up going in talking to the older man. After that, the older man only tried one more time that I know of to knock on my door, which I hid in my kitchen for 10 minutes until he left. I haven't heard anything since and haven't seen him around, but I wake up at night panicking, 
thinking that he's planning on doing something to me. I want to start this off by stating that this is my first ever post, but I've always loved listening to the stories of the subreddit on YouTube, and I wanted to share my own. For some background, I'm female and I was 17 at the time of this story. I used to work at a pizza place in my hometown. The job sucked in many ways, but the worst part about it was that my manager had no problem leaving girls alone to close. Granted, the town I grew up in was small and boring, and many people left their doors unlocked, but I still thought it was risky. On this particular night, I was closing the shop alone at around 10. The last thing I had to do was take the garbage out, and the dumpster as well as my car were located on the side of the building. While I was making my way to the dumpster, I immediately noticed a man making his way towards me from across the shop's parking lot. He's wearing jeans and a black sweatshirt, and he had some sports cap on. Right off the bat, my heart dropped, and I got incredibly nervous. I threw the trash away and began speed walking to my car, when this guy says something. You got a cigarette? My paranoia told me that this question was sketchy as hell, and I struggled to respond for a moment. I just said no and got into my car, hastily trying to get in. And I shit you not, as soon as I closed my door, he booked it to my car and tried to open it. Obviously, I locked it immediately. I instantly started bawling and turned my car on. The man clubbed my window with his fists a few times without a word before booking it again into the nearby streets. I called my mom and then the police once I got home, and they opened up a small investigation but could never find the guy. There were no other cases of something like this happening somewhere else in the town, and so I think he probably relocated somewhere else to avoid being caught. I really have no clue what that man wanted to do. Sorry if this was kind of lame or anticlimactic, but it was pretty damn scary to me. I have this friend, Rick, who I believe has been stalking me for the past two weeks, if not longer. I'll give some background information, then get into the problem I'm in. Thanks in advance for any advice and help. We met back in 2014 in high school. He was always a quiet but nice and easygoing guy. We grew very close and I saw him as a brother. He didn't have a very smooth childhood. He saw his parents argue a lot, often for years. His mom even cheated on his dad and he saw the effect it had on him and the whole family but he wouldn't suspect anything out of the ordinary just meeting him at first. Around 2016, he started to become a bit paranoid and would seem a bit pessimistic at times. He never had many friends, neither did I for that matter. We had two other friends together that we saw often, and we were the only ones he trusted. I saw him have this strange panic attack when he ran out of a restaurant we were at, and he ran to a nearby park and yelled at people. I called his dad to come and get him, and he got him in the car and gave him a pill. Apparently, this had been the second time this happened recently then. Fast forward to June 2021. In between the last episode slash attack to now, Rick seemed normal as he could be, but I noticed he was a bit off and has been since then. He met a girl in college months before that he says he fell madly in love with, but she rejected him when he asked her on a date and blocked him on everything right after graduation. It took a massive toll on his emotional and mental state. He had another episode where he ran outside his house and actually provoked someone, and they punched him in self-defense. And then his parents took him to the hospital during that summer, and he was officially diagnosed with schizophrenia. So, from late 2021 until now, I've noticed he's quieter. He still cracks jokes and you can have a decent conversation with him, and he still seems like a nice guy, but there's been some stuff recently that I truly think is alarming, and that is why I'm making this post. So, I'll cut to the chase. For the last six weeks, we've hung out three times. This was actually after a hiatus where we didn't see each other since February this year, because I started working more hours and went to night shift. 
each of those three hangouts, I've noticed he looks at me in a really strange way. Like he's aroused and imagining me naked or imagining himself hurting me. We're both male and heterosexual. I'm saying this to preface what I'll mention in a bit. He also mentions how he's still in love with that girl from school, but proceeds to call her a slut, whore, and wants to assault her and kill her right after. He has said this numerous times, and even mentions going to the elementary school she goes to. He sent me a picture of that school on Google Maps, with arrows pointed at it and firework emojis last week. He also admitted to having parked outside her home, and sitting there for hours about five times back in 2021. For the past week, he's been insisting on hanging out several times a day, and when I was at Chili's with my parents on Saturday, he sent me a message saying, Chili's. He's able to see me since I'm on the Snap Map on Snapchat, since I use the app often to talk to other friends. When I went to the mall right after, he said, You're going to the mall again. You were there yesterday. Which is true. I went to the mall twice. Once with my mom, then with both my parents the day after to get some stuff, since one of our favorite stores was closing, so we wanted to check out some good deals. On the drive home that day, he messaged me saying, You didn't work today. We should have hung out. I replied, Maybe Wednesday, which was yesterday, and I didn't see him because I'm genuinely creeped out. So, the day after, on Sunday, he again insisted on seeing me, but I went to go play soccer instead with other friends, and then went to go do laundry afterwards, and when I was at the laundromat, he sent me a soccer ball emoji and a laundry emoji, indicating he saw me on the snap map. Here's the thing, he keeps mentioning where I am, and it's always within 10 minutes of me being on my phone. He's actually done this for the last two years, but never this frequently. It used to be like twice a month and I brushed it off, but now I'm noticing something actually concerning. He's also been calling me boyfriend and sending heart emojis the past week, and when I told him I might see him this week, which I won't, but I said so just to not make him mad because I'm actually fearful of him hurting me or others. He said, you think I can wait that long to see my boyfriend? This past Sunday, I didn't reply to him for about four hours, and he kept asking if I'm mad, and then said he wants me to reply no longer than a minute after he texts me each time. I have the feeling he's just constantly on his phone, looking for when I'm active on social media, and I really don't know why. He also admitted to me a month ago that he makes fake profiles to be able to gain access to that one girl's Instagram and look at her pictures and he says he does stuff to them. He even uses the nudity app to take her clothes off, he said. All of this is concerning. He currently doesn't have a job, and he hasn't had one for the last two years. I'm the only friend he sees and talks to, and I feel he's developed a compulsion, fixation, or dependence, or a mix of all three on me. And as I've mentioned, he has said he wants to assault and kill the girl that used to be in his class, and he knows where she lives and works. I have not mentioned my thoughts on this to him again, out of fear. He currently takes Risperidone daily, and he said he's been seeing a new therapist for just a month now, but I don't know if any of those are even working. I'm asking for any advice on how to approach this and what to do. My concern is that if I tell anyone like the police or the girl, he will find out and retaliate by hurting me or my family as he knows where I live. Any help is appreciated. This story is from a couple of years ago, when my buddy and I were out running and stumble on something very strange. I lived in quite a small town at the time, with a large industrial plant nearby where most people work at but there are a few that don't get their breadcrumbs from legit sources. For example, local gangs. Luckily, when they have their dispute, they usually shoot and harass the other gangs in the area and spare locals who live there. I have not stumbled upon any unrest in this matter and have never been in any crossfire before this day. Me and my buddy were preparing to take a long run around town 
taking some small roads and trails to get the miles clocked in. We started running some back roads and just enjoying the run and the small talk about some games we played at the time. We took some right and left turns, and after a couple of miles, my friend says that he knows a small path to the next neighborhood. It's a small path over some train tracks where there weren't usually trains running, and it's quite a fun path with some ups and downs. Also, it's a nice forest to be in, a very sparse pine tree forest with some very large trees. We run for like one minute on this path, and I can see a bit further down that a duffel bag is laying under a small bush on the right side of the path. It's a new bag that seems to be full of something. In my head, I'm thinking at first, it must be someone who'd forgotten it there. But then I remembered this path is not any path someone's going down with a duffel bag. It's usually some people who are running like us. I say to my friend, did you see that bag? And he of course answered, yes. Then I asked him, shouldn't we look what's inside? Nah, it's probably nothing inside, he answered. So, we continued down the path and didn't think much of it. Now, the strange part comes. We've just been past the train tracks, and a couple of yards further we see a man standing in a black suit, and he seems to be talking to someone on the phone. He seemed quite surprised that we were running there, as well as us about him standing there. He had some black leather gloves on. He was quite muscular, and the phone looked like the phone you get from a kiosk. My heart had started racing and my adrenaline had started pumping. What was this man going to do with us? He maybe had a gun on him, I thought. No man with a suit has any business to be here in the forest, but I tried to act cool and nodded him a hi. But he was still on the phone talking to someone and seemed not touched by us running beside him on the path. A while after we had encountered this strange man in the black suit, my buddy and I asked each other what was in that bag. He must have been searching for that bag. That's when I understood what could have happened to us if maybe we took that bag with us, or maybe searched the bag's contents and he came strolling down that path. This story still gives me shivers down my spine to this day, but I can't stop thinking about what could have been in that bag. But I know for sure that I don't want to see that man in the suit ever again. When I was 18, I used to work in a grocery store as a cashier. I got along well with most of my co-workers. We used to take lunches all together in the break room because there was only one big table for everyone to be seated. Everyone would talk to everyone, except for this guy, Jeff. Jeff was a butcher at our store. He wasn't mean to anyone. He wasn't weird or anything. I used to think he was more shy because he never talked to anyone other than to the others of his department. Sometimes, though, when people would tell jokes, he would smile, laugh a little, so I just guessed he didn't want to be disrupted, and he wasn't really a friendly person. I used to be a supervisor when this story happened. One night, I came to work to close the store. I went upstairs first, then went to clock in and talk with my manager to see how everything was going before starting my shift. When I went into her office, the first thing she told me was something along the lines of, if the radio calls, say you don't know anything, do not answer their questions, do not get involved. I was genuinely confused about what was going on. I just arrived and already it was implied that there was something big going on. I had no idea what the fuck was happening. Eventually, she told me that someone in the store was accused of murder. I was shocked. I couldn't believe it. At this moment, I had no idea of what had happened yet. I ended up figuring out it was Jeff with the conversations going around. Basically, Jeff lost it the night before. He killed his father, who was a retired policeman. He attacked him with a katana. The media also revealed that years prior to that, his brother and him had been involved in sexual assault stories. The most disturbing part to me was that I worked with him the day before the guy ended up not being found guilty because he was psychotic the night it happened. Thanks for your patience while listening. I don't exactly have another conclusion. Hey. 
Hey everyone. So I'm part of an online friend group on Discord. We're all from the same country, but most of us are from different cities. Everything was going fine between us, until suddenly, there was a series of unfortunate incidents where I had minor fallouts with them. I went through personal frustrations, and I unknowingly projected them onto people on the server. These fallouts continued over April and May, until one day I left the group in a frenzy. I admit I was pretty childish in how I acted with the group. I remembered to apologize to all the people there for my actions, and most of them forgave me. Afterward, the night before June began, one of them texted me asking if I knew certain people from my high school. I told them I did. I asked the person how he knew them, and he revealed to me that he knew a lot of people from there. Suddenly, the conversation took a dark turn. He started talking to me in a sinister tone, telling me he had some of my personal information, what college I went to, my route to it, who I hung out with in both my old high school and college, and he even claimed to have some of the photos from my personal Instagram. When I asked him how he had all of that, he claimed, A, he tailed my car, and B, kept repeating the phrase, the people at your college aren't bad at providing information. At that point, I was scared to death. He told me if I didn't return to the group, and if I didn't apologize to a specific person, he'd first dox me and then wait outside my college to kidnap and then kill me. After the conversation ended, I rejoined the Discord group out of fear and then went to bed. The next couple of days were rough. The fear of what he could do to me gripped me tightly. I lost my energy and motivation the ability to engage in my usual day-to-day -day interests, and I even lost my appetite for food. My family and friends both noticed that something was wrong with me. I was shaking constantly, my heart was racing all the time, and it felt like my life was stopped dead in its tracks. I was too scared to even tell other people about what was going on. Fearing for your safety is a fate I wouldn't even wish on my worst enemy. Normally, death threats like these wouldn't scare me, but what made the situation different were the following points. That guy lived in the same city as me, and relatively close to my neighborhood. Before this incident and my fallouts, he'd often tell us stories of how he got into major gang fights and dangerous situations. I had never received serious death threats before. I pretty much have been safe my whole life. Since this was my first time facing such a situation, it seriously traumatized me. A couple of days later, I contacted him again. I begged him to stop dictating me like that. Finally, he revealed to me his reason for scaring me. He told me he wanted to humble me, so I stopped being too moody in the group and rejoined. He said he wasn't dictating me anymore, but still wanted me to remember the conditions he put me on, as a request this time and not a threat. The situation was technically over after that. I did talk to other people in the group, including the girl he wanted me to apologize to about what he had done to me, and they all responded the same way. They assured me that his threats seemed mostly empty and that everything was okay. None of them approved of what he had done, but I also told them not to talk to him about it out of fear for my safety. This whole ordeal left me shocked, even though he told me he wasn't dictating me anymore. The effects of the whole situation took a toll on me. It's been a month and a half since this happened, but it still hasn't left me. My image of the group has been tainted. Every time I come across the Discord server and see him and others, my heart suddenly fills with dread. I've been thinking about leaving the group one day, but right now, I feel stuck. Normally, people would tell you to cut abusive friends off, but I find that difficult because he's part of the same group, and everyone else in the group has been incredibly kind and supportive of me. My mind keeps telling me that cutting that guy off means cutting everyone else off. Secondly, yes, I do have the option of just cutting him off my private socials, but I'm scared that he might threaten me again, even though he never implied he was going to force me to stay friends with him. So, this is my present situation. I'm stuck in a friend group that I don't want to be part of anymore because one of the people in that group thought it was a good idea to humble me by traumatizing me with threats. I've been experiencing traumatic reactions for a month and a half, 
where I have episodes of racing heart rates and an inability to eat, sleep, and engage in activities. I know that leaving the group is the best thing for me, but I'm too scared of what's going to happen to me if I do so. I even went to a psychiatrist about this, and he diagnosed me with PTSD. Right now, I feel like shit. I keep thinking about how peaceful life would have been had I not made the mistake of joining their Discord server all those months ago. My incident with that guy has made me realize just how evil some people can be. I want to avoid him, but because of my paranoia, I sometimes force myself to engage with the group normally. I don't ever want to meet him or interact with him in any way. I want to cut him off and forget about him completely, but I don't see any way out as of right now. It feels like I was slowly lured into a cage and immediately imprisoned the moment I settled in. I know very well that leaving the group is the right option for me right now, because if I don't, my mental health will continue to decline. But I need help in finally achieving that goal. In a way, this is a cry for help. It's early June. I'm starting to regret parking a mile away as I'm leaving my friend's jewelry studio, but it's a beautiful day. Anyways, so here I am walking down the street, crossing the bridge, admiring the river and whatnot. In the distance, the faint sound of bongos echoes off the buildings and into the street. Could it be a bar, a car sound system, whatever? As I get closer to the omnipresent bongos, I realize the source of the sound is coming from a stationary object. I've identified the source of the bongos. If you've ever seen the Tim Burton film, Big Fish, you will know Danny DeVito plays a circus carny, all dressed up with a curly mustache, a truly grimy vaudevillian display. Now imagine this, but as a six foot eight, burly, pot-bellied homeless man with a boombox, my first internal reaction was, wow, he looks like a six foot eight homeless Danny DeVito impersonator. Upon spotting me, Danny DeVito 2.0 turns to me and growls, Hey, come over here, and begins approaching me. I say, No thank you, sir, and quickly take off from my car. I'm speed walking to my car. Between my footsteps, the bongo music continues playing, louder as he approaches. At this point, I'm almost to my car. I'll knock the car with my fob and practically leap into the driver's seat. I fumble for the lock button. The side door lock doesn't work. He's reaching for my passenger door as I'm turning the key in the ignition. Car unlocked. Next thing I know, I'm driving away, and he is stumbling off the curb, reaching for my door handle to no avail. This happened circa 1971 or 1972, when my mother was about 14 or 15 years old. The incident occurred in a heavily wooded area near Montevello, Alabama. My mother is the oldest of five children, and she has three sisters and a brother, who is the baby of the family. One weekend in the cooler months of the fall, my grandfather decided to take the whole family, my grandmother, my mother, and all my aunts and uncles so seven people in total, into the woods for target practice with a rifle. My mother grew up quite poor, and they didn't always live in the best neighborhoods, so my grandfather wanted to teach the kids how to defend themselves with a rifle, if need be. Like I said, it was later in the fall, so the trees were bare and there were lots of leaves on the ground. The wooded area was just off a dirt road, so this was a fairly rural area they were in. Since it was so far off the beaten path, my grandfather became startled when he heard the roar of a car engine so deep in the woods. My mom remembered the car as being a blue Ford Galaxy. Despite the fact that my grandfather had a gun, he totally freaked out and told my grandma and the kids to hide under a pile of leaves in the woods. He hid with them. The man in the driver's seat got out 
dragged a woman's body out of the car and just dumped her there in the woods and drove away. After my grandfather was sure the man had gone, everyone came out of hiding and the woman sat up and stared them straight in the face. My grandfather asked the woman if she needed help. She said no, she would be fine. She didn't seem to be injured and obviously didn't want the help. She hadn't put up a fight with the man when he dragged her out of the car. So my father cut the shooting lesson short and decided to rush the kids home to safety. Well, on the trail back to the dirt road where my grandfather had parked their car, they passed the man in the blue Ford Galaxy driving out of the woods. My mom looked over and noticed that he had a huge machete laying across the front seat right beside him. My grandfather made sure that the man could see he was carrying a rifle, but everyone was careful not to give away what they'd just seen. The man struck up small talk with my grandfather, asked him how he was doing and what they were doing out in the woods. My grandfather explained that he'd just taken his family out for target practice with a rifle. The man told him to have a nice day and continue driving. The next day, my grandfather went back out to that spot in the woods. There was not a body there. However, he did find the woman's wig, her purse, some Kleenex, and a pair of eyeglasses. He collected the items and took them home. According to my grandfather, that area of the woods was known for having shallow graves and being a dumping site for bodies. My mother became hysterical when he walked in the door carrying that stuff. She started screaming. He killed that lady. He killed that lady. My grandfather ended up taking the items to the police station, but my mom doesn't think anything ever came of it. She never heard anything else about it after that. Well, she did hear one thing about it, I guess. Early the next morning, my grandmother called my mom when she arrived at work, just before the kids left for school. She told them not to take the bus that day, that she would come home and pick them up and drive them to school. When my mom asked why, my grandmother said, because that car is waiting for you at the bus stop. Every weekday, I would wake up early for a morning workout, then head to my job. Generally, I would leave my house around 5.30 because my morning drive took around 25 to 30 minutes, giving me enough time for two hours before I needed to leave before my shift started. Most of my drive was just putting loud music on, trying not to fall asleep, and it being a freeway before 6 a.m., Almost everyone was going at least 10 miles per hour over the speed limit. I drive most of the time on a main interstate before turning off onto a smaller highway, which I would only use for a mile or so. This highway was three lanes on each side. People also drive fast on here, but usually no more than 75 miles. And while you get some unsafe drivers in the morning, most people aren't swerving erratically. This highway runs north to south, an on-ramp from a main street becomes a lane. Then there are two entrances from the freeway I would take every day, one from the eastbound side and one from the westbound side. I hope that makes sense, but basically, I got on from the eastbound side right as three cars were entering from the westbound side. One was some sort of orange sportyish car, and the other two were identical dark gray sedans. I don't remember exactly what make and model they were, but I remember them being fairly uncommon models, not a sedan you'd see a hundred times a day. One was in the front of this orange car, one behind. These guys were going at least 80 miles per hour. The orange car would change lanes, and the car in front would cut him off, while the one behind would change lanes to remain behind him. They kept this up the entire time I was on the highway near them, weaving in and out of cars, not slowing down, before I pulled off at my exit. This could be a complete coincidence and some asshole drivers, but I definitely got the vibe that the driver of the orange car was trying to get away from the gray cars. 
Maybe it was extreme road rage, or maybe something more sinister. At the time of this happening, I was 19 and homeless in a big city. I just recently moved to a city and was on my way back to the shelter from a public library. I was taking a shortcut through an alley wide enough for a car to go through, and I had noticed an old beat up looking car come into the alley and driving slowly behind me. I figured they probably just didn't feel like they had enough room to pass me, so I picked up the pace and crossed the street. They drove to the same area of the street that I was on and kept pace with me. There was just one guy in the vehicle. He looked to be about mid-twenties and Hispanic. He rolled down his window and said, Hey, are you okay? How old are you? I look like I was about 14 and I'm pretty short, so I got that question a lot. I responded, I'm fine. I'm not a minor if that's what you're asking. He asked me if I needed a ride and I politely declined. Then he starts telling me he's just really concerned and wanted to talk, really insistently and smiling through almost the entire interaction. I asked him why we couldn't just talk on the street where we were, and he dodges the question and again asks me if I'm sure that I don't want to ride. My gut was telling me he had bad intentions, and if I were as young as I looked, I might have fallen for it. Instead, I looked around me to make sure I wasn't going to get ambushed and walked up to the passenger window. I told him in the most threatening voice I could muster, I know you don't really want to talk. I'm sure you have worse things in mind. I paused to take another look around, and I've memorized your license plates, and I'm going straight to the police station. I better not see you again. I never saw him again. Unfortunately though, I forgot to write down his license plate, the shelter curfew was going into effect soon, and I didn't have time to file a report at the station. It didn't occur to me to call the non-emergency number. I also purchased as large of a knife as I legally could for self-defense. I've spent my life in Georgia and love hiking all over, but I must admit, North Carolina has the best mountains. For this reason, I frequently drive up there and hike and camp. This time, I went up with my family in an RV and stayed with them in Maggie Valley. The next day, however, I had them drop me off about 10 miles away at the Cold Mountain Trailhead, and I planned to hike up and spend the night and be back down in the morning. I was by no means inexperienced at hiking or camping, but I had never camped alone. On top of that, I didn't bring a pistol. On the way up, the trail was surprisingly strenuous, not necessarily steep. I've hiked some steep stuff out in the west, but more like a ton of ups and downs and feeling like it wouldn't end. Eventually, it began to get darker, and I realized I needed to stop and set up while I still had light. So I stopped about a half a mile short of the summit and figured I would continue in the morning. Nothing eventful happened. I set up camp in a really good spot, ate my food, and went into the tent. At this point, I realized I hadn't run into a single other person my entire way up. This wasn't eerie at the time, but soon would be. I have trouble sleeping and usually lay awake for up to an hour trying to sleep. I thought I heard someone lightly walking around the general area because of the rhythm of the steps. I brushed it off as my mind running wild, but I did pull my big old knife out of my bag and put it next to me in the sleeping bag. That morning, I woke up and ate oatmeal. As I ate, I looked over my tent and noticed a strange bundle of dried twigs and berries tied with green cord propped against my tent. Internally, I was pissing myself but I packed my stuff up and took off within five minutes, and no way I bothered going to the summit. I headed straight down. On the way down, I realized there was a pretty heavy fog, and I ended up on a side trail that eventually ended and I was lost. I used a compass to eventually reorient myself, and I found the trail again. I made it out with no other incident. However, 
I come to find out the same morning that a 27 year old died on the same section of trail as me and it's possible I would have run into him had I not gotten lost and rejoined the trail later. His family seemed to have scrubbed the internet of several articles on him. The scariest part was knowing that someone knew where I was and watched me and I had no clue about them. Also, the circumstances surrounding the guy's death are weird. You can find articles about him. He supposedly fell trying to climb out of a ravine, but he was away from his backpack and it called 911, but he didn't get to speak to anyone on the line. This is a true story, and I've been kind of obsessing over what the fuck happened out there. I'll try to keep it as brief as possible without leaving out key details. I grew up deep in the mountains of Shoshone County, an hour from a grocery store. The wilderness is my peace and my home, but these woods, they are evil, and I never should have come to Washington. My wife's uncle bought some land just north of Spokane, Washington, with a friend of the family. They got it at a significant discount because a nearby aluminum smelter had polluted the ground and it was impossible to use the water beneath it. They had set up two plots and each had a camper to live in. Jay had been progressively getting paranoid and saying people were stalking him and watching him in the trees. About three months into living there, a man wandering through the woods there had an interaction with Jay and ended up attacking him and breaking his jaw. Upon being arrested, the man said he was overcome with a desire to see if he could kill him with a single punch. Two months later, my wife's uncle Jay was murdered in his sleep on the couch in his camper. His friend Kay found him and immediately ran as far away until he stopped to call the police. There was sufficient evidence of who did it and they quickly caught the killer who was a 19 year old boy who said he simply wanted his bike. He beat him to death with a power tool that was lying on the floor nearby, completely bashed his brains in. Kay was completely terrified at all times to be there alone. He had moved in with a family member until eight months later. He ended up with nowhere else to go and he had to return. In constant fear, he finally convinced my pregnant wife and I to come stay with him. The second I turned off the highway onto the property, I was overcome with dread. There were at least 250 crows covering the dirt road up to the property. I didn't sleep whatsoever the first night. I stared into the forest, searching for the cause of my intense fear. The energy of this place was so uncomfortable, and I assumed it was simply just knowing that my wife's uncle Jay was killed here. Even the days were eerie. Never did I have a moment where I didn't feel watched here. My wife and I always had a sense of fear especially after dark. Things sort of normalized for a while, until one day, Kay began puking and feeling very lightheaded all the time. I took him to the hospital and they said he was fine, probably a flu. At this point, it was the anniversary of Jay's murder. Three days after the date of Jay's death, Kay comes running out of his camper screaming, I can't breathe, waking my wife and I up and we run out to see what's wrong. Kay had gotten into his car and floored it, crashing into a nearby tree. I run up and peer through the window to see the most intense and most primal fear I have ever seen in someone's eyes. He was gasping and clutching his chest. Moments later, he breathed out one last time, and he was dead. We gave him CPR for 30 minutes until EMS arrived. On July 10th, one year and three days after moving there with Jay, and they both were dead. Now it's only the wife and I alone on the property. Every moment living in fear and not understanding what had happened here. I don't know why we didn't leave right away. One day I come out to get fresh water from a drum we kept and I smell the worst thing I'd ever smelled. The water container had a one inch opening on top and inside the water were bits and pieces of chipmunks, like spines and heads. They didn't fall in, 
Something ripped them apart before putting them inside. The nights were getting worse and worse. I never saw anything other than shadows messing with my eyes. I was nearly always filled with unease and intense fear. Fear in the woods, even at night, is new for me. We all get a little spooked in the thick of the wilderness in pure darkness, but compared to my home, this wasn't even a wilderness. The snapping of branches and pine needles crunching underfoot haunted my every night. The screeching owls loved to chime in right at the height of anxiety. My nights were spent peering into the pines, watching, always waiting for whatever evil to present itself. I knew it was out there, and it wanted me to know it too. One night, my wife and I return home to having the worst feeling I've ever felt. Every second driving up the long dirt road increased my anxiety tenfold. Something bad was ahead, and it was clear. The thick fog shrouded the pines. If it wasn't for the glimmer of the full moon, it would have been pitch black. Everything looked different, although it was right where we left it. Nothing seemed out of place. Looking around, I suddenly see this orange, long-haired, manged cat sitting on a stump. The cat's eyes were so intense, fiery, almost glowing but not quite. The cat, in my mind, was the embodiment of pure evil. I saw darkness in its soul. We started hearing branches snapping, pine needles crunching, seemingly from every direction. The brush was swaying back and forth, clearly indicating something was running within. Here I am still staring at this cat, almost frozen in fear. Suddenly a voice breaks out, echoing throughout the forest. Hello, is anyone out here? A little girl, I thought, but something was off. My gaze finally breaks with the cat, and my eyes dart towards the road. My wife yells back, Hello, are you okay? Anybody? The voice had changed. Help. Help me. It was the same person or thing yelling, but as if it was trying to disguise its voice. We yelled back several times without response. Somebody fucking help me. The most intense, shrieking, evil-sounding voice of a woman called out. It cut deep into my body. I'm filled with more intense fear than I can ever describe. But my wife, she's overcome with the need to find this person and she started to head off into the forest without a word. I grabbed her by the arm, telling her something isn't right. Why won't she respond? She tries to break free from me to go off alone. I tell her to get in the truck and I'll grab the spotlights, but we aren't going on foot. We roll the windows down, and I shine my intensely bright LED lights throughout the forest. We slowly creep down the road, yelling back. As we get further down the road, the voice strikes out. Please, why won't anyone fucking help me? The sounds are difficult to pin down in the woods, but this one was very close. I hit the brakes and stopped immediately. We shine the lights and yell back, searching. There's no sign of anyone, when suddenly the voice explodes into the cabin of the vehicle, as if they were standing right outside my window. Help me. Somebody fucking help me leaving my ears hurting and ringing. I hit the gas and didn't look back. We called the police when I hit the highway, and afterwards they said there was nobody around. I picked up our stuff the next day, and my wife gave birth the following day. We never stayed there again after the baby was born. What the hell could do these things? I have never even believed in paranormal things before, but I don't know what else happened. I was camping out in the desert with four friends, three females and my older buddy. He's a bit weird but cool. We're all on drugs, it's one of the girls' birthdays, and while they're all sleeping in a camper, we're sleeping in our individual tents. It starts to rain pretty heavy, night falls, and everyone returns to their designated spaces. The girls are loud, 
but still I'm starting to fall asleep when I hear one of them call my name directly. I wake up. They're now yelling at me to come to the camper. Well, all right. I get dressed, unzip the tent, slosh through some mud, knock on the camper door, and they let me inside. They all look pale-faced and shook. I ask them what's wrong, and they tell me something is outside of the camper. I look around, and the party stayed at the van, rolled my eyes, and told them there was nothing out there. But they insisted, and made me wait with them until they heard another sound. I remind them that they're on drugs, so it was probably just auditory hallucinations. But they swear it isn't, and I finally relent and sit down and wait. Minutes pass, nothing but the pitter-patter of raindrops, and then suddenly a scratching sound. It sounded just outside the camper. I tell them it's probably a tree branch, but they say it's something else and to go look. I sigh. I grab a flashlight and head out into the rain to do a circle of the camper. Nothing there, no footprints in the mud, no tree branches anywhere close by either. Weird. But there's nothing there, so I go back in and tell them the coast is clear. They're shook and still unsure, so I offer to just sleep there on the floor for a bit. I'm starting to doze off again when I hear a voice whisper, Psst, can you hear me? Yes, I say, and start to wake up. What's up? And the girls are all silent. One of them finally stirs and says, You heard that too. It wasn't me. I sit up and look around. The other two girls are asleep. We're staring into each other's eyes when suddenly, we both, clear as day, hear a child laughing in the other corner of the van. What the fuck was that? I exclaim. And the girl who was awake says that she's heard the laughing before, and that's what scared her. So we wake up the other two to see if they were messing with us. They weren't. They were annoyed. So now I'm thinking, maybe it's someone's phone. We find all the phones and out them together as well as any other electronic devices. Suddenly there's a loud creaking sound just outside the front door. Christ, I yell out, thinking maybe it was my guy friend. No response. I grab a broom and slowly open the door and peer outside. But there's no light and I can't see shit. I close the door and I'm freaking out. Now I'm wondering if some local townies or other campers were fucking with us. More scratching on the side of the camper. Suddenly I remember my friend is all alone. So I start to yell at him to wake up and to bring his guns over because I think there might be people fucking with us. After yelling for him loudly for 10 minutes, he finally wakes up and yells back that he'll be right over. He gets there and immediately I feel more secure. Two grown-ass men. We can handle this. I catch him up to speed, and he just mocks us and reminds us we're on drugs and imagining it. But I swear it's something real, and he agrees to stay in the camper on the floor with me, ready to charge into the night if need be. We go quiet. We wait five minutes. Ten. Fifteen. We're falling asleep. And then the giggles. The damn child laughter returns from just outside the van. My friend thinks it's one of the girls messing with us and tells us to just go to sleep. They swear it's not them, but he doesn't believe them and just lays back down. Not ten seconds later, there's a loud creak sound again and scratching, and it sounds like someone is just outside. He sits up alert, looks at our horrified faces with the same expression, we told you so and he rushes out of the camper into the darkness and rain, and we hear him fly around the van yelling, but he comes back and reports. No one was there. We start to talk about the campground being haunted. Old burying ground, maybe. We don't know. At this point, we're jabbering on just to hear our own voices. We all agree to just stay awake until the morning. The sun rises, the rain dries up, we pack up and leave. I'm getting gas in a local town when suddenly the thoughts hit me. I google, psst, can you hear me? And this is when I discover the evil Tron. Yes, friends, 
a small, sadistic, sinister electronic device that emits creepy sounds and can be attached to any metal surface. It was my weird friend. He had hid it underneath the girl's whippet canister. In fact, it wasn't theirs. It was his canister, and they lifted it from his tent while he slept. But he knew. He knew what they'd try, and he tricked them like a Trojan horse into bringing the device into their camper. I was collateral damage, and he just went with it, silently chuckling to himself. The mastermind. The damn mastermind. The fallout was bad between him and the girls, but I thought it was the best prank I'd ever seen pulled off. To this day, bravo. I was far up north, far north British Columbia, Canada, working in an oil rig camp out in the woods. I was working as a cook. I went out one afternoon for a smoke on the back deck. It was about two o'clock in the afternoon. It was a very quiet, still winter day. It was snowing those kind of big snowflakes that make it look like the world's moving in slow motion. So, as I was standing there smoking, just staring off in the distance, not looking at anything in particular. You know, looking left, right, up and down, and at my feet, whatever. I felt something looking at me. Then I looked straight ahead. About thirty feet or less in front of me was the tree line in the forest, and directly in front of me, in between two trees, I see the most gigantic wolf I've ever seen. This thing sitting looked like it was the size of a man standing. It was massive, sitting there and just staring right at me. We locked eyes, then I looked away for a split second and then looked back, and it was gone. I don't know. It just gave me the weirdest feeling. It was definitely like, hey, I see you. I could eat you, but I won't. Okay, bye. It's something I will always remember. Two or three times a year, we vacation in a cabin in the wilderness. Me, my wife, and our three young children and two dogs. I'm no stranger to the wild, and have made a lot of multiple day and week solo trips in national parks and even in the Arctic Circle. Yesterday, I went for a ten-mile solo hike. At the farthest point, after two hours, I heard my children arguing, playing, crying, laughing, and calling me from the forest. I was totally alone, and my first instinct was to run through the thick brush and trees to where the sound was coming from, but then I realized that it couldn't be my kids, and that I should just walk on and ignore it. I decided to walk back to the cabin. The whole family was there and never left. I know how my children sound, and I swear it was them. Later I realized the combination of all the sounds, laughing, crying, and playing and whatnot, made no sense. What was this experience? What did I hear? My brother is two years older, and we've probably spent tens of thousands of hours and then some in the woods together. Whether it was building forts or BMX treks to LARPing and hunting, we've traveled across the US exploring caves, canyons, cliff diving, mountain biking, camping, hunting whitetail, mule deer, wild boar, and whatever else. Since 2016, when we get the time off, I feel like adding this is important because there's genuinely nothing I wouldn't do or fear when I have him by my side, but this time was different, and we both felt it. We've had our fair share of adventures and stories to tell of all sorts, but this one has felt like a lingering stain on my memory. We're both mid-twenties, and it was 2019. This was probably my fifth time hunting the area, and the first I brought my brother along. 
It's a large forest area of public land that has a few country roads which are basically two tracks that stretch miles throughout the area. We make the trip up in my truck with our tents, three in total, one for each of us and another to change in and keep our gear in. Without making this long-winded, we set up camp a couple of miles from the truck, which we drove for quite a few miles through the trails, basically the middle of nowhere. The nearest main road is probably 8 to 10 miles away. We arrived late in the night, set up camp, and quickly fell asleep after a long trip. We spent the next day scouting and tracking, then made back to camp for the night. We cooked, then ate, had some beers and bullshitted, the night was still early, but we had a long day and decided to head off for the night. Everything up until this point was normal. I suddenly awoke to something smacking my tent and hearing my brother's voice call my name. I knew something was off. I called back to him and he immediately unzipped my tent and made his way inside. I could tell that he was disturbed when I went to ask him what's wrong and he immediately grabbed my shoulder and told me to shush. The sun wasn't up yet, so I think it was around 4.30 a.m. We sat in my tent, and what we heard still confuses me to this day. I can only explain it as whale sounds. Different tones of extremely loud noise that I could feel throughout my body. It would come and go, but there would only be a few seconds of silence in between the sounds. It would vary from high-pitched squeals and everything in between to very low sounds that had literal ground-shaking reverb. I regrettably didn't think to grab my phone or record anything that was going on because what I was hearing didn't seem real and in the moment I was awestruck. The sound went on until daylight started to break. I believe it was about an hour but I'm not really sure. Neither of us spoke and at the time I felt like I could feel the energy around me, almost like my body was covered in white noise, if that makes any sense. It wasn't even minutes after the sound stopped it started to rain, and one of the craziest thunderstorms while I was camping happened. The forecast didn't predict or account for any rain the days we were going to be there prior to making the trip. All the stakes for the tent our gear was in completely ripped out of the ground and both of our tents had multiple stakes ripped out as well. Those things we drove into the ground with an axe and would take some insane force to unearth every single one. My brother dismisses it and won't even talk about it, saying it was just machinery being dragged. But at the time, we both shared the same feeling of fear and dread. It just seems odd it was still the middle of the night and we were so far removed from any nearby communities or industry to hear and experience this occurrence. This happened circa 1971 or 1972, when my mother was about 14 or 15 years old. The incident occurred in a heavily wooded area near Montevallo, Alabama. My mother is the oldest of five children, and she has three sisters and a brother, who's the baby of the family. One weekend in the cooler months of the fall, my grandfather decided to take the whole family, my grandmother, my mother, and all my aunts and uncles, so seven people in total, into the woods for target practice with a rifle. My mother grew up quite poor, and they didn't always live in the best neighborhoods, so my grandfather wanted to teach the kids how to defend themselves with a rifle, if need be. Like I said, it was later in the fall, so the trees were bare and there were lots of leaves on the ground. The wooded area was just off a dirt road, so this was a fairly rural area they were in. Since it was so far off the beaten path, my grandfather became startled when he heard the roar of a car engine so deep in the woods. My mom remembered the car as being a blue Ford Galaxy. Despite the fact that my grandfather had a gun, he totally freaked out and told my grandma and the kids to hide under a pile of leaves in the woods. He hid with them. The man in the driver's seat got out, dragged a woman's body out of the car, and just dumped her there in the woods and drove away. 
After my grandfather was sure the man had gone, everyone came out of hiding, and the woman sat up and stared them straight in the face. My grandfather asked the woman if she needed help. She said no, she would be fine. She didn't seem to be injured and obviously didn't want the help. She hadn't put up a fight with the man when he dragged her out of the car. So my father cut the shooting lesson short and decided to rush the kids home to safety. Well, on the trail back to the dirt road where my grandfather had parked their car, they passed the man in the blue Ford Galaxy driving out of the woods. My mom looked over and noticed that he had a huge machete laying across the front seat right beside him. My grandfather made sure that the man could see he was carrying a rifle, but everyone was careful not to give away what they'd just seen. The man struck up small talk with my grandfather, asked him how he was doing and what they were doing out in the woods. My grandfather explained that he'd just taken his family out for target practice with a rifle. The man told him to have a nice day and continue driving. The next day, my grandfather went back out to that spot in the woods. There was not a body there. However, he did find the woman's wig, her purse, some Kleenex, and a pair of eyeglasses. He collected the items and took them home. According to my grandfather, that area of the woods was known for having shallow graves and being a dumping site for bodies. My mother became hysterical when he walked in the door carrying that stuff. She started screaming. He killed that lady. He killed that lady. My grandfather ended up taking the items to the police station, but my mom doesn't think anything ever came of it. She never heard anything else about it after that. Well, she did hear one thing about it, I guess. Early the next morning, my grandmother called my mom when she arrived at work just before the kids left for school. She told them not to take the bus that day, that she would come home and pick them up and drive them to school. When my mom asked why, my grandmother said, because that car is waiting for you at the bus stop. This is something that happened to me five or so years ago. I was fresh out of university with my degree in international development. I wanted to help underserved communities develop meaningful projects and see more of the world. I was young. I was naive. Eager to get started, I took one of the first jobs that offered me a position. It wasn't something I necessarily wanted to do, but it was adjacent to my interests and, more importantly, took me to a place I'd never seen before. I loved everything when I arrived. It was beautiful, sunny, and green. My new co-workers, all local staff, were amazing and so kind. My boss invited me to play soccer on Sundays with his family. My fellow project coordinator would go out dancing with me on the weekends. My roommate, a fellow expat working in development as well, was a fun and spunky woman I adored. I felt so blessed. Then, one day, it changed. I was walking downtown with a friend. There was a vegetable and fruit market that had great fresh produce directly from the farmers growing it. It was about a 20 minute bus ride from my apartment, so not close, but not incredibly far either. My friend and I loaded up and began walking over to a quiet corner to call a cab to help us haul our goods back. Then I heard it. Hey, hey miss and the guy recited my exact address. It took me to a second to realize he was shouting my address. I turned around to see a man hanging out of his car, slowly crawling along the road with us. My friend recognized my address too. She turned to me and asked, Do you know him? I'd never seen him before. He kept shouting, Yeah, you. You're living in the back house on the second floor, right? That made it even worse. I lived on a big suburban lot with two houses, one in the front where my landlady and her family lived, and the second in the back. The second house was split into two apartments. The bottom floor housed two students, while I lived on the second floor with my roommate. 
You couldn't see the second house from the road, much less the stairway that led to the second floor. My heart was pounding. I wanted to shout back at the guy, but I was scared. I was a 22-year-old woman living in a foreign country, and I didn't want to draw attention. I didn't know how people would react. I didn't know how he would react. So we walked. My friend tried to comfort me, saying that maybe he knew my landlady's family. I was probably the only redhead in the whole country. He could be my neighbor I hadn't met. The encounter didn't leave me. It stayed in my mind. A week or so passed and I stopped glancing behind my back whenever a car drove by. I started to feel secure. Then he showed up again. I was walking home from work. It was getting dark. My office was a 15 to 20 minute stroll from my apartment. Perfect as a quick way to stretch my legs. I was halfway home when I felt someone watching me. Then, the slow crawl of a car sidling up beside me. I knew it was him without looking. He recited my address while leaning out of his window, one hand on the wheel. Why are you shy? He asked. I ignored him and kept walking. There was no one around. It was getting dark. Come on. He cajoled. Let me give you a ride. I know where you live. Not reassuring. I started to feel my chest tighten. I wanted to call someone, but I didn't know what he'd do if I reached for my phone. I was practically jogging now, but he just sped up to match my pace. Listen, bitch. And now he was angry, his voice hard. You don't just ignore a man like that. I wondered what he'd do if he stopped the car. He looked fit and young. He could probably catch me. He could hurt me. So I did something that, in retrospect, seemed absolutely bizarre. I yelled at him, wildly, rapidly. I did it in my first language, not what they spoke in this country, not a language he would have ever heard, probably. I screamed curse words and threats anything I could think of. I'll never forget the confused fury on his face, but he did slow down, letting me run ahead. I could see a woman at a bus stop at the intersection ahead. If I got to her, maybe she'd help. Maybe he'd get scared off. By the time I got to the woman, he was gone. I kept walking home, looking behind me with every step. I told my roommate about what had happened. She told me not to bother reporting it to the police since they were corrupt and wouldn't do anything. When I told my boss, he told me the same. He said he had a baseball bat and would come whenever I called. I saw the man again two weeks later. He was sitting in his car, parked in front of the gates to my apartment. I had been about to take the trash out, but retreated before he could see me. I told my landlady and when she went over to confront him, he drove off. This continued for weeks, not every day, but once or twice a week. He was always there, waiting. I took cabs to and from work. I never traveled alone. I barely slept, waiting for him to break in and kill me. My last weekend abroad, he almost did. I went out drinking with a group of my friends, four of us in total. We were celebrating the end of my contract and I was happy to go home in a few days. I couldn't wait to see my family. I couldn't wait to put an ocean between me and the man. We had beers at a local bar, a five to ten minute walk max from my apartment. When it started to get late, around one, we tried to get a cab, but it was impossible. The roads were jammed and people were everywhere outside. Cabs couldn't even get to us. So, we thought, even though others warned us not to, let's walk home. It would be faster than calling a cab. We'll be fine. We're a group of four. No one will hassle us. We got halfway there when we had to cross a main road. There were no street lights. Not that kind of place. The road was absolutely empty. Not a single car in sight. We crossed the road. A few more minutes but then we were backlit with the bright headlights of a car coming up. We glanced back, a cop car, two men in the front, and I knew 
even though I couldn't see from the bright lights in my eyes, he was driving. He was a fucking cop. The jeep slowed as I knew it would. He rolled down the window to draw. Hey miss, reciting my address. Nice night, yeah? My friends immediately knew who he was. I could see how nervous they were. We were alone on a dark, empty street in the middle of the night. They were cops, so they were armed. No one would intervene, probably. It was too dangerous. You girls need a ride, he leered. His friend, who I could see now, was grinning hugely. My last few days, I thought. And this is how it ends. We sped up our pace. I don't know what our plan was, other than to get away. Then I heard one of the doors of the jeep open as the passenger jumped out. I don't think I've ever been so scared in my life, although I didn't dare turn back to see. We were at the turn to my street now, two minutes more to get to safety. The car was right behind us. Whoever had gotten out of the car was right behind us. Two of my friends were now ahead, while another clutched my hand and dragged me along. Then, out of nowhere, another car appeared. They were coming from the opposite direction, illuminating us all. When they slowed to see what was going on, I've never been so grateful. It was an older couple, and they looked concerned. I think they knew something very bad was about to happen. I heard, not saw, the car door swing open. I almost got hit as they sped past us in a hurry. The other car stayed, watching. They offered to escort us home, driving alongside just in case, but I knew he wouldn't come back. Not tonight. I still took a cab with my friends to their place for the night. We took my roommate with us, just in case. Nothing happened after that. My last two days were uneventful although I couldn't shake the feeling that he might show up at any given moment. Driving to the airport, all packed up and ready to go home, my cab got pulled over by a cop. My stomach dropped. I couldn't breathe. It wasn't him, although it could have been. It wasn't until I got on the plane, until I landed in my home country, that I finally felt that terror leave me. I still get nervous when cars drive up behind me, when men roll down their windows to shout at me. It's never him, but still, you never know. It's roughly nine on a Saturday evening. I'm sat in the passenger seat of an armed response vehicle, driving around a problem estate in the north of my city. In the driver's seat is Adam, a close friend and experienced firearms officer with seven years on the unit. All is well at this moment. So far we have seized a stolen moped that we stumbled upon in the same estate, and have also attended a road traffic collision, in which we applied aid to the driver until paramedics arrived. All patrols, all patrols, from control. Stay safe. Stay safe. The area of Orchard Road, due to an active firearms deployment. The radio beams into life with that message. At this moment, we are prepared to be called up and immediately begin discussing options for gear and tactics. Alright, if we pull up here and gear up, I'll grab my conventional, and if you go conventional and baton round, Adam asks me. Yeah, mate. Pull up here and we can start getting kitted, I replied. We pulled up into a nearby car park that was virtually empty and began to gear up. At that moment, the radio came to life again. TFC, TFC, all hotel units. Can I have you moving to the area of Orchard Road, please? Switch to TAC Ops 1 for brief. We are at this point sat in our cars listening to the brief. We switch our radios over to TAC Ops 1 channel and wait. There is silence. TFC, TFC. All hotel units and channel call up by call sign. The tactical firearms commander calls up, breaking the silence. Following this, units begin to call up. Five others in total, along with a dog van. Hotel Sierra 3-1. I called into the radio. All hotel units from the TFC. 
This job pertains to multiple logs between 2030 and 2045 hours regarding an address in Orchard Road. The informants state loud screams and bangs consistent with an assault or fight are audible from the address. At 2050, three response assets requested assistance, claiming there to be a subject inside of the address with another person making threats to officers, themselves, and the other subject. At the present moment in time, 2104, I'll be authorizing a firearms authority. Hotel Romeo 72, I'll be declaring yourself the operational firearms commander. So far. So far, he replied. Received. Unit straight to scene deployment, please. TFC out, 2106. Adam and I now began kitting up, both selecting to take our G36 carbines, while I also brought a less than lethal AEP launcher along as a precaution. Within minutes, we are racing to the scene seven miles away. As we near to the property around a mile away, we bump into one of the ARVs. The radio has remained quiet while we have been responding. We pulled up to the property. Police vehicles lined the streets, with officers visible at the front of the premises. Cordons have already been erected around the street, and the dog van is already on scene, with a handler at the front door. 3-1, we're state 5, I said onto the channel, letting them know we had arrived. We pulled up onto the curb. I stepped out, quickly being approached by a response officer, who began to brief me on the situation. Hello, mate. We've got two females inside of the premises that we know of, one of which is holding the other one hostage. She's barricaded them in and is making threats to us and the hostage. The dog handler has been putting challenges in. Unfortunately, no progress has been made as of yet, he said to me. Right, okay. Have we got containment with tasers and knowledge of anybody else inside? I replied to him. Yeah, we've got taser officers on the back and front door. We've checked, and there are no other methods of escape, unless she feels like jumping out of a window. And they're covered too. And we've not seen anybody or heard anybody mentioned, so we're unsure right now, he said. Adam and the two firearms officers from the other vehicle now joined us, as we stood beside our ARV being briefed. I turned around, facing the other firearms officers, asking them, You lads hear all that? Each replied yes via nods and words to the effect of that. Okay, what do we think? Contain and call out, maybe try and get a negotiator? I asked them. Well, if we try and get negotiations going now, obviously if this escalates, we'll go for an emergency search. One of the officers chimed in. Yeah, I agree with that, I commented as the remainder of the officers also added their approval in. Right, let's go in, gents. We've still got about four ARVs towards anyways, so we can update them. But let's sort ourselves out, I now said. All right, I'll update control if you lads want to go up, Adam replied. I now walked up to the front of the house, followed by the two firearms officers. About eight officers were positioned around the front, two with their tasers drawn, while the dog handler stood holding his dog, ready to deploy him. The other officers were positioned in cover, with one attempting to speak to the subject. Hello, we're already briefed. If none of the TTOs want to get back for us, please. Four of the officers, minus the two officers with taser, dog handler, and the officer attempting to speak to the subject, now walked back from the front, allowing us space. I now peek through the window, seeing an open door that led to a well-lit kitchen, in the doorway of which were two figures, who I could identify to be about five foot roughly, one of which had its arms around the front of the other, and an object in front of their throat, S and V. The rest of the house minus the kitchen was pitch black, and I could hear whimpers and crying clearly coming from the person with something to their neck through the open window. I raised my carbine to an off-aim ready position. Contact, two subjects, I now said, telling the other officers I could see the pair. A snap was audible behind me as I heard one of the officers preparing his baton launcher. The other was peeking further to my right, with his taser drawn in his right hand. Armed police, stay exactly there. Get your hands up now, I said loudly through to the pair. S reached across to the right, switched on a light, 
at which point the room I was looking through, I believed to be the living room, lit up, and I could now see a knife across V's throat. Oh, knife. Drop the fucking knife now. I screamed at S now, raising my rifle at the pair. I'll chop her if you come in here, you fucking rat. Fuck off out of it, S replied. Drop the knife now, armed police officers. The officer to my right now shouted at her. Drop it, drop it now, I repeated towards her. Adam had rushed up to us at this moment, holding an enforcer. Hotel Romeo 49 to TFC, one of the other officers called into the radio. Go ahead, 49, the TFC replied. Yes, yes. Currently a containment and call-out. Two occupants, one with a knife. If we can have negotiations officer towards please, and an ETA on further ARVs. 4-9, received from TFC. All ARVs are within a five-minute ETA at this moment in time. I'll attempt to source a negotiations officer. The TFC replied. Yes, yes, many thanks. The officer now said, ending the exchange. At this moment, another ARV pulled up as three ARVOs, one of which being the OFC, got out and approached us. Sit rep, the OFC said. Two occupants, one with a knife, one believed to be a victim. Threats made to occupants and officers. Negotiation should be on way. Light challenges in place so far. All right, let's try comms with them. Prepare for an emergency search. While this was going on, I still had the pair in my sights. My carbine still trained on S. Can we get a shield on this side to cover us? And maybe one with long arm, one with launcher, and the shield guy with sidearm or something? I suggested. Yeah, good shout. Officer, go grab me a shield mate. Officer 2, if you want to move to the right side with a crayon and cover with a launcher. One officer ran back to his ARV to retrieve a shield. Meanwhile, the second officer moved over to my right shoulder now raising his AEP launcher at the pair. Drop the knife now and you'll come to no harm. I now said to S. I'll fucking do all of yous. Fuck off you rats. S replied. It doesn't need to be like this. Just drop the knife. I'm not coming out. Fuck off home. S now screamed, growing more agitated. We're gonna need to move. I said to the UFC. Alright, let's get the door in. We'll go for a victim-led emergency search, lads. Everybody good with that? The OFC said. One by one, we each agreed that we were happy with it. OFC, TFC, the OFC now called into the radio. Go ahead, the TFC replied. Yes, yes, we're gonna make entry for a victim-led emergency search. Can you get some assets from the AMBO to stage and standby, please? Yes, that's received, the TFC replied, ending the interaction. All right, let's get that shield on the door and get ready. The final two ARVs arrived, containing two ARVOs each. They quickly moved up to the front door. All right, two persons inside, one with a knife, one believed to be a hostage. Threats have been made to officers and the subject. We're going for a victim-led emergency search, another officer said, informing the four new arrivals. Right. Let's get the enforcer up and use the dog to our advantage, the OFC said. Adam positioned himself to the left of the door, ready to use the enforcer. Meanwhile, the shield officer beside me and the officer with the launcher repositioned to the front door. I repositioned behind him, still holding my rifle. Behind me was an officer with a taser, and behind him was an officer with a lethal option. Another officer with a launcher moved to the window we were previously stationed on and continued to hold cover on them. Meanwhile, another officer stood to the side of the door, ready to deploy the stun grenades. Adam slammed the enforcer into the door repeatedly. As he did this, the door appeared to begin to give way. Armed police! Armed police! The shield officer shouted as the door continued to be hammered on. The door swung inwards violently as it had been hit to breaking point. Door, Adam said, indicating to anybody who may not be looking that the door was now in. He then dropped the enforcer and moved onto the back of the stack, unholstering his sidearm. Armed police! Armed police! Any persons inside of the premises, show us your hands! The shield officer shouted as we moved into the doorway. 
The OFC and four other officers joined the stack as we did this. Two officers broke off to the left, holding at the bottom of the stairs. Meanwhile, another officer moved to the very bottom of the stairs, covering them, while the shield officer moved into the doorway of the room I'd been looking through. Contact, the shield officer shouting as he saw S. She was alone with her hands up. As I moved up now, I also saw her. Armed police, stay where you are now. Hands on top of your head, I shouted, giving her an initial command. The officer with the taser behind me moved to my right, red dotting her with his taser. S lifted her hands onto her head, staying stationary. Interlock your fingers, I now instructed her. S interlocking her fingers, shuffling a bit. Right, slowly begin to walk towards us. If you make any sudden movements, you'll be tasered. Start walking when you're told. Can somebody with a launcher move up on our right, please, lads? I said, asking for somebody in the stack. The sixth officer in the stack, holding a launcher, now moved up onto the right of me and the officer with the taser. All right, cover on, he said, indicating he had a shot on her. Right, start walking. S began to take small steps towards us, her hand still on her head, looking straight at us. As she did this, the laser from the taser being pointed at her bounced around her torso. S was now four feet or so from us. Stop there. Turn around. S complied, stopping in her tracks, turning around. Walk backwards to the sound of my voice, slowly. S now began slowly walking backwards. As she did this, Adam moved up behind us, holding his cuffs. Stop there, I instructed S as she was now pretty much right next to us. Adam moved the cuffs into our view to let us know he was about to move up and restrain her before moving between us up to her and restraining her. He then moved her back and out onto the street before returning back onto the stack. We advanced to the next door as the room was cleared by the last three on the stack. As we moved up, we could see V on the floor. She did not appear to be injured however, was crying and clearly terrified. Stand up for us, please, I said to her. V attempted to, but clearly couldn't due to fear or shock or something of that nature, as a result of which we decided to take a more physical approach. The shield officer moved up, facing the right of the kitchen which was yet to be cleared. I held my carbine in an off-aim position near to V, as the officer behind me helped her to her front and handcuffed her to her front, before handing her off to Adam, who took her outside. We then moved up, clearing the rest of the kitchen before walking back to the main room, stacking on the stairs. We then climbed the stairs, seeing three doors, one ahead and two behind us on a bend. The landing was very small and narrow. The shield officer pressed up to the left facing two doors behind us, as two other officers and I followed. Meanwhile, three other officers cleared the room that was ahead, and the rest held on the stairs. We approached the first door, which was found to be unlocked, as one of the officers in the stack moved and covered the other door. The shield operator opened the door, moving into the doorway, before moving further into the room. As he did this, I peeked right, and the officer behind me peeked left. Finding both corners to be clear, we then pressed further in, checking wardrobes and under beds and everything else. We then moved out and stacked on the second door on our side, also found to be unlocked. The shield officer opened the door, revealing a cupboard that was pitch black, at which point he activated the torch on his sidearm, revealing it to be clear. He moved as far as he could in, as we cleared the corners, before ensuring there was nobody hiding inside. We now turned over to the officers, who had found nothing in the other room. The bathroom. Property secure, lads, I said. OFC, update. Two detained. Property secure. The OFC said into the radio. Yes, yes. That's received, OFC. The TFC replied. We then went downstairs before exiting the property, splitting up. Adam picked up the discarded enforcer he used previously as we walked to our ARV. Adam stored the enforcer before taking his helmet and mask off. Meanwhile, I unloaded and stored my carbine and baton launcher. 
I then removed my contacts, mask, and gloves. TFC, all hotel units. Firearms authority rescinded. 2118, the TFC said, meaning we should store our equipment, which was already done. We then walked over to the OFC's ARV, where the OFC, his crewmate, and two other officers were talking. We were quickly joined by the three other crews. One of the divisional sergeants came over to update us. Hello, lads. The subject is off to custody. The victim is with Ambo. She's safe and well. We're gonna get Soko to come over for a search. All right, mate. Thanks for the help. One of the officers replied before the sergeant walked off. Right. See you guys later. We're gonna clear off. I said to the group. Adam and I then walked back over to our ARV and left the scene, finishing our shift. We later found out that S was convicted for her offense and was issued a two-year suspended sentence and was forced to attend an alcoholic treatment program. It was also revealed that the cause for the incident was domestic abuse. Alright, I live in a major city in the south. It's a pretty big city, and as such, one finds themselves driving everywhere at all hours of the day. This is not an elaborate story, nor typically terrifying, but there's enough left unanswered that it still gives me the creeps to think about. It was around 1.30am, and I was driving home from a friend's house with my then-girlfriend, Allison. We'd been partying a bit. But as I was driving, I opted to maintain sobriety. Allison had a few drinks, but nothing serious and over the course of several hours. Now, the house I was leaving is not in a particularly bad neighborhood, but not a good one either. The city where I live, there are lots of gentrified areas where crack dealers live next to four-person families. It's a place where you are fine in the daytime, but you wouldn't want to be walking the streets alone late at night. Being familiar with the area, I decide to take a little cut through street. As I pull onto the street, I end up at a stop sign. I look behind me, and there's a truck that pulls out of an adjacent road behind me to my left. I move forward from the stop sign, and he continues to follow me. I think nothing of it. The road doesn't have many street lamps, so it's pretty dark, and I can't get a look inside the truck's cab. I drive about another 20 feet and all of a sudden I see blue lights in my rearview mirror. Cop lights. Now I think, oh shit, not again. However, as I look into the rearview mirror, I notice several things that don't seem right. For one, there aren't many police trucks in the inner city area. Sure, there are some, but they're not common. Secondly, the police lights are not on top of the cab like a normal cop car but next to the actual headlights by the grill, like a detective's car. I also notice there's an air freshener dangling from his rearview mirror. I've dealt with police officers on numerous occasions, but I've never seen one with a stereotypical pine tree freshener. Lastly, as I kept moving forward, slowly contemplating the situation, considering pulling over, I noticed the final strange variable. There is no police siren, no horn no noise. It was late, it was dark, and I continued to drive slowly as I thought about all the odd factors. If I'd only noticed the first two factors, I think I may have stopped, but the fact that the blue lights kept flashing without any sirens was just off. I know in my state, it is legal to pull into a well-lit area at nighttime just for these circumstances. I decided that the air freshener the position of the lights and the lack of sirens was just too weird. I wasn't going to risk pulling over in a bad area, so I decided to move forward at around 20 miles per hour until I got to a gas station. The truck continues to follow me. There are a lot of speed bumps and road signs on this road, and thinking there's a possibility of a cop pulling me over, I abide by all the laws. The final straw that I determined made this truck a false police officer. He also obeyed all the traffic laws. When a cop wants to pull you over, you pull over. And if they don't, they aren't going to let you stop at a stop sign to let you get away. 
This guy stopped when I stopped, moved forward when I did, and even turned as I decided to get to a more populated road. After about a hundred yards, he turns off his lights, both the blue lights and his main headlights. He takes a left behind me and peels away. It was at that moment I knew he was not a cop. I don't know exactly what I avoided that night. I drive a nice car, so it could have been a carjacking, but I don't rule out something worse. If it weren't for my ex-girlfriend's presence, I may have stopped. Ultimately, I'm just happy I didn't. This happened almost a decade ago when I was 13 years old. I remember my friend and I were excited about our first time trick-or-treating without our parents. We lived in a small town where nothing ever happens and we thought it would be the same that night. It started like any other Halloween night. We collected candy, ran into many of our classmates, and had a lot of fun. At 8pm we realized we had to head home, but on the way back we dropped by our teacher's house. She wasn't home and the street didn't have many street lights. To add to this, most of the houses had their lights turned off and their Halloween decorations were taken down. My friend and I were slightly spooked and disappointed by the lack of candy. We wanted to get out of the street as soon as possible. That's when a man emerged from under one of the few street lights. It was a police officer. Neither of us seemed to notice him before this, possibly due to the darkness. He startled us, but seemed very friendly. The cop introduced himself and pointed to an inconspicuous bungalow. He said an older man living in this house was inviting trick-or-treaters inside. Someone called the police, but when he arrived, no one was answering the door. He kept telling us his police car and partner were just around the block. We looked around, but couldn't see them. I was a pretty paranoid kid. Growing up, my mom loved watching crime shows, and she'd always tell me tidbits of lessons. One of these was a story about fake cops, although I don't remember the details. I remembered people can pretend to be police officers to gain trust. Throughout this whole exchange, I was terrified. His lack of badge, police car, and partner did not feel right. I was also conflicted because he was smiling and seemed like he just wanted to help. That was until we heard his strange request. He said he needed to speak to this potential predator and needed our help. Since we were young girls, the man would answer if we knocked. The officer claimed he would hide behind the bushes next to the front door. He would wait for him to invite us in, jump out, and catch him red-handed. At that moment, I knew my friend felt the same way I did. We both fell silent but one of us managed to ask if we could discuss. The cop said yes, but told us we had limited time. The street was silent. He could hear everything. I remember feeling the way of wanting to say something, but fearing he would hear us and escalate the situation. We just stared at each other for what felt like forever. The cop was getting increasingly impatient and told us we had to decide quickly. Around that moment, a family came down the street and noticed the officer. They were coming over to see what was happening. That's when the cop said he'd be right back and did not go anywhere. My friend and I scrambled to collect our thoughts and decided to run away. We sprinted out of the street and didn't look back. On our way home, we discussed theories that ranged from him being a fake cop, him playing a prank on us, or him being a real cop but we misunderstood the situation. When we told our parents, we downplayed it a lot and doubted our experience. In the end, we didn't call the police, but our dads drove to that house and the area around the house. There were no cop cars or police officers in sight. Over the years, I can't say I regret not calling the police. At the time, my friend and I were convinced we misunderstood what was happening. We even told our class the next day and most, including our teacher, thought it was not alarming. Looking back, I find it extremely strange a police officer would put two children in such a potentially dangerous situation, moreover with our parents not present. I wonder what his motives were, but it will, unfortunately, 
remain unsolved. This happened seven years ago. It was a Saturday night at 2 a.m. I went out with some friends and they dropped me off about 40 feet away from my car. No big deal. I'm a 20-year-old man and the street had good light. When I approached my car, I noticed it was unlocked and my glove compartment stuff was scrambled all over the car. I got my phone and dialed the police, but when I was about to call, I was approached by a young man with a hoodie that was in the car behind me. He asked me if I had a wheel wrench to change his tire because he had a flat one. I said, yeah, sure, but first let me call the police. My car got broken into, but he insisted that I do not call the police because he was drunk driving. He kept insisting, and I didn't want any trouble, so I got my wheel wrench and gave it to him. And indeed his car had a flat tire, but something seemed odd. He kept insisting to help him but I was just looking at him with a feeling that something was off, and I didn't know what it was. Two minutes passed, and shit hit the fan. Suddenly, one car was coming at a high speed and brakes right next to me, and four middle-aged men got out, screaming, What the fuck do you think you're doing? In my mind, I just thought, Well, this is how I die. Behind me, the young man who was changing the tire starts running, and no one follows him because they have me. One of them grabbed me by the neck, threw my phone away, and pushed me to the car, yelling several times, Do you know what you're doing? While the others are punching me in the head. I was scared to death because I didn't know what was going on, and I just said I didn't know anything and tried explaining my point of view, which none of them believed. They said if I didn't tell them who my friend was, I would get beaten even more. Two more cars stop, and at this point, it's about 15 people around me screaming and threatening me. One of them mentions that they'd call the police, and I felt relieved. The police came and they took me into their van, and I explained everything. They understood my situation and said I was free to go, and that I could file for assault. I got into my car, still having people screaming at me, and drove to the police station where I filed a complaint against the man who assaulted me. It was several weeks later that the police explained to me that the man I helped was a criminal and the vehicle had been stolen. That the men who were screaming and the man who assaulted me were friends of the owner of the vehicle. I got an attorney and I went to court. My attorney spoke with the attorney of the guy who assaulted me and their attorney said I should drop the case, that this will be a loss for me. When court day came, what happened was that their attorney said it would be best to make a deal because the guy didn't have much money to pay, that it would take months and that the law and court couldn't make sure he would pay me. What my attorney advised was to go ahead with the deal of half the value of we proposed, and that guy would pay right now. So I had two options. Condemn him at court. The judge would probably make him pay, maybe a less value, and he would have a criminal record which could have repercussions on me. And even if the value was more than half, he didn't have any money or possessions, and it would take him time to pay. And number two, he would pay me half the amount right there and make an apology to me. I went with the second option, got some cash. He made an apology, and we went on with our lives. I hope the fact that he needed to get a lawyer and go to court served as a lesson. I was traveling by car to an out-of-town job assignment. I had stopped at a popular busy gas station to fill up the car, stretch my legs, use the restroom and grab a snack. I was approached by a developmentally disabled woman who appeared to be in her 20s. She was looking for a ride to a town a couple of towns over. Her ride had abandoned her while she was in the restroom. She was a little upset. She didn't have a cell phone and didn't know any numbers so I could call someone for her. I checked with the employees at the store, and they said that she'd been there for an hour looking for a ride because she said her friends left her while she was in the restroom. 
I then made the decision to do something I'd never done before, offer a stranger a ride. I wasn't going to go to the town that she wanted to go to, but I was heading in that direction. I told her I could drop her off at the grocery store in the next town where I would be turning off to go to my destination. The grocery store was always busy, and it was very likely she would have an easier time getting a ride to where she wanted to go. Also, she'd be 5 miles away from where she wanted to go instead of 25 miles. She'd have an easier time walking that distance if she had to. This was agreeable to her, and we set off. Right away, I noticed a van following us. I tried to lose the van, but it kept pace. Meanwhile, the woman wanted to play with my phone. I told her no, it wasn't a toy, it was for work, and then I moved it out of her reach. The van speeds up and starts to get closer. The woman suddenly remembers her boyfriend's phone number and we need to call him. I can't use my phone while driving and I was approaching the outskirts of the business district of the next town and there were no cell phone use while driving signs everywhere. I told her, we're almost to the grocery store, we can call him from the parking lot. She becomes agitated and yells, no, you have to take me home. I told you I can't do that, I'm not going there. It's in the opposite direction of where I need to go. I'm expected soon. We'll call him from the parking lot, I responded. She becomes more upset and frustrated. The van is getting closer. I pull into the grocery store parking lot. It's about 4pm. The grocery store is busy. I pull up in front of the store and ask her for her boyfriend's number. She can't remember his number. She won't get out of the car, she's arguing with me, and the van is pulling into the parking lot. There's a sheriff's deputy parked nearby, and I roll down my window and signal that I need to speak to him. He walks over to me and asks what's going on. I tell him where I met the woman, and now she won't get out of the car, and under my breath I tell him that the van has been following us. The deputy tells the woman, she brought you where you asked her to. It's time for you to leave her car now. She slowly gets out of the car, and I ask once more for her boyfriend's number, and she says, You're crazy. I don't have a boyfriend. Oh look, there are my friends now, and she points to the damn van. The deputy and I share a look, and he says, Give me your contact information. I can delay them for about 20 minutes while I check their license and registration and lecture them about abandoning a special needs adult. You get out of here, and I'll check on you before my shift is over. And don't pick up any more hitchhikers. I left and went on to my destination. He called me to make sure I got to where I was going, and then told me that they were keeping an eye on the van and its owner. He told me he also contacted a colleague at the sheriff's department in my county where I was working, that she would contact me in a day or two. While I was on assignment there, I spoke to two deputies and a detective about the woman in the van. No one ever told me anything about them, but they were very interested in them. My nightmare is one day, I'll turn on a true crime show and see a report about this woman and her gang, robbing and killing people. So, woman looking for a ride at the travel stop, let's not meet again. So I live in a village in the UK which has a relatively low crime level, but still has some dodgy characters who like to cause trouble. We've had a spate of burglaries and car thefts in the past few weeks, which has had people in the local vicinity understandably concerned, and what seems to be a lack of police interest as very little has been done about it, and police presence has been minimal. People have been on edge as one homeowner was confronted by the burglars and had his house targeted twice in just under two weeks, so tensions have been high. Neighborhood Watch have been posting letters saying they're going to be patrolling and recording anything they see for police use if it comes to it, but nothing has come of it so far. I've been going for walks around the village in the evening and have never seen anything untoward, so I never really thought I'd come across anyone up to no good as I figured that the criminals are waiting for people to go to bed or whatever before making their move. Last night though, 
I was making my way back toward my home, and two cars shot past me at easily twice the speed limit, and while it was loud, I didn't really register it as the road is long and clear after 8pm, so it's not unusual to have boy racers blast up and down in the evening. The one at the back came to a stop really suddenly, and I thought they'd hit something because of how abruptly they stopped, so I jumped up to see what was up. It was probably around 8.30 at this point, but it was relatively bright still, so I could see well and saw the passenger door open, and some man or kid got out with gloves on and a baseball cap pulled down a bit so his face was obscured, and he put some kind of backpack on. I slowed down a bit because something just didn't feel right, and for some reason, my mind jumped to, he's about to kill someone, and I felt my heart go a bit crazy for a moment. I didn't really know what I was going to do, and in retrospect, it was pretty stupid of me to get involved, but I decided to run at the guy as fast as I could and yelled something. I have no idea what I yelled, probably something stupid, but it made the guy jump and whoever was driving just floored it and shot off down the road. I end up tackling the guy and we both fall over, cracking my elbow off the ground in the process, and possibly done some damage there but the guy just hits the ground and stays still for a moment, which freaked me out. Then he started trying to fight me off. I'm not really sure how long we were tussling for. It felt like 10 minutes, but it was probably more like one, and then I somehow end up holding the guy down. I'm not a hugely muscly guy or anything, but I'm pretty broad, so holding him down wasn't so hard. It's pretty obvious at that point to me that the guy was intending to break into the house he was walking to, and I've since realized it was empty and he was probably going for the copper pipes or something to sell on, but either way, I was enraged. The whole time he was saying something like, I just need it for the cash, but I wasn't really listening as the adrenaline was coursing through my veins. Next thing I know, a guy from across the street has come out to help after hearing me yell, and his wife shouts that she's calling the police. So we're both holding this guy down while he's spitting at us and trying to bite our hands, and I'm in a decent amount of pain from my elbow, so I'm holding this guy adamant I'm not going to let him go. After what felt like an absolute eternity, police turn up and put the guy in the back of the car while they take our statements, and they end up going into the house to see if everything is okay. I realized the door had already been pushed and kicked open when they step in, and that this guy must have already hit the place and was coming back for more, but the policewoman who was taking my statement wouldn't tell me anything about it and kept ignoring my questions. At this point I'm getting annoyed because my elbow feels like it's got knives sticking in it, and this guy in the back of the car doesn't seem like he's that concerned, even though I can't hear what they're saying to him or his responses. Anyway. After a few minutes, they open the back door of the car, and this guy gets out, nods at us, and just jogs off down the road. I'm cursing and getting really irate, and the policewoman tells me that because no one actually caught him with the stolen items, and I'd injured myself in taking him down, that if anything, he was the victim of being thrown to the ground and a misunderstanding, and that I was to blame for any injuries. Apparently everything I heard and saw was circumstantial I guess, because this man is a seasoned burglar who served time for it, knew exactly what to do if someone confronted him in the street, and knew he wouldn't get done for not having anything on him at the time. I kick off, because there's something in the law about going equipped to steal, and as far as I'm concerned, he was, by definition, by wearing gloves on a warm day, a baseball cap to shield his face when the sun wasn't out and a backpack that was empty and clearly to be filled with ill-gotten gains. Regardless, I get ignored in my complaints and told to leave it be and get taken home. This morning, I logged onto Twitter and saw from our local feed that the house was broken into again in the early hours and the carpet set on fire. Undisclosed things were taken and the house across the road where the couple helped me out had a window smashed and cars keyed up, presumably in retaliation. If a police car had just stuck around for a few hours that night, neither would have happened, and they could have probably caught this guy, who's no doubt in the wind now. 
I also imagine if they'd taken a shoe print thing and his fingerprints and checked it against previous burglaries, they would have found a match. But I digress. Now I have a mashed up elbow and bloody knuckles from falling and hitting the ground with my fist to steady myself and zero faith in the police. It really makes you feel like you shouldn't bother trying to help out or prevent a crime if those in power don't want to do everything they can to do the same. Part of me wishes I just bought a treadmill. I was contacted by the police officer I spoke to. He was apprehended in the next village over around about the time I was typing the original post, ironically enough, and he's been arrested for multiple burglaries. I doubt I'll hear much more than that, but I'm really pleased to know that he's been caught. When I was in high school, me and a bunch of friends piled into one of my friend's car and drove up to some abandoned houses near our town. The houses were bought by a big company to tear them down to build more office space, but the project was abandoned and the houses were never torn down. They had been empty for about 20 years at that point. I really didn't want to go, but I'd just gotten into the cool crowd and I wanted to fit in so I went along. The houses were falling apart, covered in graffiti and trash, and it was dead silent and pitch dark out. The only light we had were our cell phone flashlights. Most of us were terrified, but a few of the older boys were being rowdy and making a lot of noise. I told them to shut up because I didn't want the cops to come, and I knew this was a hot spot for squatters, and I didn't want us to get robbed and or murdered. The whole time, I kept feeling like I was hearing shit behind me, but I tried to brush it off, thinking it was just my imagination. About the third house we went to, I found an old Victorian doll covered in dust and cobwebs on the staircase. I don't know why, but I picked it up to look at it. It was creepy as all fuck, one eye missing in matted hair and torn clothing. I quickly put it down and walked away to continue exploring. A few minutes later, in dead silence, our footsteps creaking on the old wooden floors, we heard Mama and a soft child's voice coming from the door. I looked at my friends. They looked at me. We hightailed it back to the car and sped away. We never went back after that. This was either a doll with a pull string or you pressed its belly to talk. I don't remember, but no one was anywhere near the doll when it went off. I don't really believe in ghosts, so my logical mind wants to think that I probably just knocked it when I put it down, or it was displaced a bit with all of us walking around the house. But it was still creepy as fuck, nonetheless. I've submitted a police report, and this is definitely an imposter. This just happened to me. I was walking to my car, and a sheriff's car is honking at me and driving by. I'm thinking the sheriff needs to enter the driveway of the hotel I'm crossing, so I move out of the way. He motions again, so I cross the driveway and he follows me. Then he motions me over, all while his windows are up. I remove my earbud and start walking closer. He rolls down his window and says, Get in. And I'm like, What? He says again, Get in the car. There's stuff in the front seat, so the only place to get in is the back. I ask him for his badge number, and he rolls his window up and speeds off. The tires literally screeched. It took me a few seconds to realize what happened, and I called my husband. I'm low-key shook. That is a predator, and he's using a uniform as power over women to possibly harm them. I'm upset at myself, because other than seeing things in his car and the fact he was in a uniform, I can't get details of how he looked. So I was in ninth grade at a really shitty school. The system there sucked, 
and it was located in a dangerous area of the city I lived in. I actually just remembered the story because it was so usual for things like this to happen there that for me it was just normal, so I forgot about it. But looking back at it now, I realize that it's not normal. So I was in PE class and we were running laps around the school on the sidewalk to stretch. I was with my friend group of five girls, and we were walking behind as always because PE for us was talking about the school drama all period. So we were walking and talking about the recent drama when a red truck slowed down beside us. It wasn't unusual. Every time we were walking outside the school, a creepy man would slow down, so we didn't think anything of it and just kept walking and ignoring him. We saw this truck two or three times more. He was driving around the school and slowing down every time he passed by us, so we decided to tell our teacher, and he made us go back inside into the gym. We started playing whatever game we were doing when the teacher came to me and told me I was asked to go to the main office because someone was there to pick me up. I was panicking because no one was supposed to pick me up during class that day, and I thought that maybe something bad had happened to either my mom or my dad or someone in my family. So I got changed into my normal clothes, grabbed my backpack, and rushed to the office. When I got there, the lady told me that there was a man waiting for me outside of the main doors. I got a bit confused because usually when my parents came to pick me up, they'd wait in the hall until I got there. I took a look through the glass door and saw an old man. I had never seen this man once in my life. I quickly walked back to the office and told the lady that I didn't know him, and what she told me next froze me. She told me he had said he was a friend of one of my parents, and that they asked him to pick me up because my mother got into a car accident. He told the lady my first and last name, my age, my mom's name, and the grade I was in. I was shocked and immediately asked if I could call my parents to confirm. So I called my dad and he told me my mom was just fine and he was at work. The lady just told me to go back to class, and I never saw that man again. I never knew what happened after I left, and how he knew all this information about me. My parents talked to the police about this, and there was never anything. We never had answers. Since that happened, I moved into a much safer city, and I hope I never see this man again. Several years ago, a man was murdered in a city I was working in, and parts of his body were turning up at various locations. I think his hand and foot had been found, and a week had passed. I'm an architectural designer, and I was surveying an abandoned chapel that was slated to be renovated into condos. It was apparent that homeless people had been squatting in the chapel, but I wasn't sure how recently they had been there. When I went into the basement, though, it was clear someone was either there or had just left, based on the smell. There were no lights due to the power being cut, and I didn't stick around long enough to see if anyone was currently occupying the space. Two days later, someone reported that they found the torso and head of the murdered man in a building attached to the chapel. I had been too freaked out by the smell in the basement to continue onto the attached building, but I'm almost certain I would have been the one to find the body. I was just a 12 year old boy riding my bike home from a friend's house, as I did most weeknights after school. We lived in a middle class neighborhood, so my parents never concerned themselves with letting me ride around, sometimes until it got dark. This particular evening, there was still some light left, and I turned a corner and started to descend a steep hill that led to my street at the bottom. Something didn't feel right, and as I cruised down this hill without needing to pedal, I sensed the car next to me was following me. I looked to my right as I was on the footpath and not the road, and could clearly see the car was following me at a pace slower than the posted speed limit. 
I decided to see if my instincts were correct and started to pedal faster to see if the car would also speed up. He did. As I crossed over one street that branched off the road I was descending, he sharply pulled his car in to cut me off but I responded quickly and took a wide berth around the front of his car as he almost hit my bike. I was now experiencing sheer terror, and I pedaled as fast as I could back down the hill. I knew if I crashed now, something terrible would happen. I could hear the car rev its engine wildly as he attempted to catch up to me. My ears pricked up, trying to establish how close he was. I saw his car fly past me and pull up sharply into a driveway just in front of me. I pulled into that driveway, in front of his car, and noticed I had no room to get past the car to continue down the hill, so I was trapped. He got out of the car and stood behind his door and said, Get in the car, I'm a policeman. My father was a cop, so the first thing I said is, Show me your badge. Not that I would have gotten in the car if he had one, but I knew it was unlikely he had one. He shouted at me to get in and started to close his door so he could walk towards me. I shouted if he took another step, I would open the front door of the house and start screaming. He jumped back into the car and sped off. Whenever I watch Mystic River, I can't help but get goosebumps. My dad used to work at a military fortress. He wasn't serving or anything but his company, such that it was based there, and as such, they had custodial duties to the base. One occasion I remember him going on about was around New Year one year, and he was working quite late, so it was dark when he left. On the drive home, he realized he'd forgotten his phone, so he turned around to go and get it. He parked up and walked through the glasses, over the drawbridge, and through the arch, which brought him into the main square from where his office was visible on the top floor of the block on the right. He noticed that the light was still on in one of the end rooms of the office. It was odd, he thought, because he'd been the last one out and locked up, so his first thought was that he'd locked someone in. When he got up there, though, the lights were all off and nobody was about. He received his phone in quick order and left in a little more than a hurry. There were other happenings too, which didn't involve my dad. On one occasion, his boss came in one morning to complaints from the night cleaners, accusing him of peeking at them from behind doors and hiding and giggling and flicking the lights on and off, which was obviously a surprise because he'd been at home all night. The army occupied other floors in the block and often complained about loud parties from the office, which never happened plus soldiers regularly seeing apparitions among countless other spooky things. So I live in a small town where everyone leaves their cars unlocked and the front doors open. We pretty much know everyone, or at least know of everyone. My graduating class was 69. There's a small Topps grocery store in the town, and I went to get ice cream and cold drinks from my mom since I was home from college. I get what I need and check out saying hi to the cashier, whom I went to high school with. As I'm walking out, an older gentleman is behind me. He looks a bit dirty, and maybe he'd been working on farm equipment or in the fields. It's not uncommon, so I smile and wave at him before I leave. Now, most of the time, this is where the story ends in my town. You say hi and leave, and that's how it seemed to be, until I got about halfway to my car. I'm walking and taking my time, and the man speed walks past me and almost bumps my shoulder. He's also making these click noises that he wasn't making in the store, but I dismiss this thinking he must be in a hurry. So I get in my car and make my way out of the parking lot. That's when I realized he's following me, or at least it seemed like it. So I start heading home and he's still behind me. I live on a road that's kind of in a D shape, so instead of making my turn onto the straight of the D, I went around the bend, then turned down the straight. This is a major out of the way way to get to my house, 
so now I know he's following me. I drive past my house and see some cops with someone pulled over on the main road. I pull behind the cop and wait. The truck drives past me. I wait just a minute longer and catch my breath and beating hard. The cop eventually came up to my window and I explained it all. They're gonna keep an eye out for the white Ford F-150 for me. I hope I never see that old man again. A few years ago, I was on a dating site where I matched with a police officer. I thought his dog was cute and figured this was my opportunity to finally pet a canine police dog. I was quickly disheartened after listening to him complain about his recent divorce. I don't recall details, but I remember that it was very apparent that he was the problematic person in that relationship. I was also really grossed out by how he fetishized me for my big chest, tattoos, and hair. I was very upfront and told him I wasn't interested and that he was setting off some red flags for me. He begged me to give him a chance, but I said no and blocked his number. A few days later, I get a knock on my door at around midnight. My heart dropped into my ass. It startled me so much. I looked out my peephole and saw a stranger holding food. It's an Uber Eats delivery driver. I tell him through the door that I didn't order food, but he said someone else ordered it and he knew my name. I asked him who ordered it and he said a name I didn't recognize. I tell him I don't want the food and give him directions to the dumpster to throw the food out because at this point I have no idea if he actually is from Uber. Later on I'm going through my dating app matches and realize it was the cop's name. I go through my blocked messages and this guy has texted me a lot. The last text said, I hope you liked your dinner. I decided it's best to unblock this man so I can keep an eye on what he's saying, in case I need to be worried about my safety, or if I'm gonna need to buy some bear mace to drop a cop. A few weeks later, I'm at work, and I get a call from a number I don't recognize. I answer because I assume it's a new client. A voice on the other line says, Hey Rachel, I'm at Starbucks across the street. What's your drink order? I ask. Who is this? I don't have you in my appointment book. Assuming it's a regular and I made a scheduling error. He says his name again, and my heart drops into my ass. How does he know where I work? I ask him how does he know where I live and work, and he explains that he did a reverse image search on photos from my dating profile, found my social media and my Yelp page from my salon, then looked up the address from there. I tell him I'm calling his station and reporting him for stalking, and if he ever comes near me, I will consider it a threat and will be ready to physically defend myself. After all that, he still begs me to give him a chance. I hang up, call the police station he works for, a very small town, and I complain. They won't even let me email screenshots of my creepy texts. I could tell nothing would be done. The lady literally said, Oh, I'm sorry. He's going through a lot right now. Literally treating it like he's the victim. He mostly left me alone after, but I was so scared living alone for the first time in my life. I have a semi-popular meme page on Instagram with about 8,000 followers. I sifted through and found like five of his accounts. I blocked them and moved on. This was several years ago but all these memories came flooding back when I noticed a familiar profile photo on an account who commented on a post. I must have missed an account of his when blocking. I had posted a photo of me holding two big tunas I caught on a fishing trip, and he commented, God, I wish I was one of those fish. I'd like to know what it's like to be held by you. Not 911, but alarm dispatcher. We monitored for an assisted living tower, and one night we started getting fire alarms. One apartment unit to start, then two. It quickly multiplied. We sent the fire department on the first alarm per procedure, and got no answer at the front desk of the place since it was after hours. After one or two updates on the multiplying alarms, 
I waited to get disposition to find out if we had a real fire. It certainly looked like it. The alarm seemed to be coming in sequentially from room to room and floor to floor. The thing was, it didn't stick to just fire alarms. We also monitored the dedicated medical alarms in these apartments, and they were lighting up along the same pattern. We report those to FD Dispatch too, so I was at the limit of what I could do. When I finally get an update, it felt like my chair was spinning. Yes, there was a fire in this apartment building, and they were trying to put it out. There were even some legitimate medicals, but those were most likely people signaling that they were trapped in their rooms. The other possibility, and it was impossible to tell the difference unless you were a firefighter on scene, was that the medical button or pull cord mechanism had melted and sent a signal as it died. We watched for way too long, as the building sent up ghost alarms no one could do anything with but wait out, hoping if there was a finger on the button, they'd be found. The details were that my family, gay moms and a brother, moved out of a trailer park to a subdivision in another town. We upgraded from a mobile home to a two-story house that had pillars in the front. It felt like a fairy tale. That was until my moms went on a camping vacation and my brother and I went to my dad's for the weekend. Turns out, in the middle of the night, right before my moms came home, the power went out. When the power went out and back on, it caused a surge, something that could happen in anyone's home at any time when the power goes out and randomly comes back on. Because of this surge, the smoke detector had a short circuit and disabled completely. At the very same time as this was happening, there was some dog fur behind the dryer that was next to the plug. When the surge happened, the electric current sparked the plug behind the dryer and ignited the dog fur. This was the cause of the house fire and the death of my dog, one cat and the other cats having gone through traumatic things that night. We closed all the windows when we left, leaving the fire to eat every single bite of oxygen in the house. My family dog passed away in her sleep in the upstairs room. One of my cats passed away at the edge of the crawl space, trying to get away. Two of my other cats had hypothermia from the cold water that was leaking in the basement and scarred lungs from the smoke they inhaled. But they survived. We didn't know the damage until our next door neighbors, who agreed to let my dog out, came to let her out the next morning. They couldn't open our door because it was melted shut from the inside. They called the police and found out what had happened. It was news from the small neighborhood we lived in. In fact, it was the talk of our streets as dumpsters got dropped off in our driveway to collect the soot-ridden walls and materials that were left of our house. My moms had to go through everything dusted and melted, to inventory it for insurance purposes. One day, they allowed me to come to the house to see it. They thought it would be good for me to understand what had happened to our house. Though it was awful, it was reality. For my ten-year-old self, after seeing my room covered in black and things melted and misshaped, I left and sat on our front porch while the cleaners and workers passed me to collect more damaged goods from my home. My neighbor across the street, a white older man with a beer gut, white hair, and full-on white beard to match, approached me. I knew him from when we first moved in. He introduced himself to our family as Rob. He was retired and liked a motorcycle when the weather was right. He sat next to me on the front porch. My head in between my lap, I didn't bother to lift it. Hey, I'm real sorry about what happened. He had a southern draw to his tone, though we lived in Michigan. I grew up with family in the south, so it didn't stand out too much to me at the time. I didn't say anything in response. I think I was crying. I know both your moms work pretty crazy hours. I know you're going through a lot right now. When you're done with school on some days, if you get lonely, just know you can come over to my house if you want. We can talk. I can make you food. We could play games. Whatever you want. At the time, I thought he was being like every other adult in my life. 
offering me a safe space and place to be. I didn't think this was weird. In fact, I think I mentioned it to my biological mom that he offered to look after me, and she said it was sweet of him. I never took him up on his offer because he was seemingly in his 60s, and I couldn't imagine us hanging out. I would walk home every day from school after the bus dropped me off, and he would see me and say hello, but that was it. Fast forward five years. My next door neighbor, the one to watch our dog, was a stay-at-home mom with a husband. They ended up having two children and were on their third at the time this happened. She homeschooled her children, and she was overall kind of loose in the head. She had a lot of time on her hands. She was an extreme couponer. She canned almost anything she could get her hands on. She joined a lot of MLMs. You get the idea. Because of all her free time, she watched a lot of TV, one of which being America's Most Wanted. On one episode, she saw a man that looked exactly like Rob and his brother, saying they traveled across the US, found girls that were younger than teenagers or were teenagers, assaulted and killed them, and then traveled across state lines to do it again. They had been doing it for 20 plus years. They were on America's Most Wanted because they would move to a state, commit a horrible crime, and then move to another state. Because they moved to another state, it made it almost impossible for other police forces to communicate with each other. My dumbass neighbor did not call the cops like they tell you to do on the show. I cannot tell you why, because she didn't even know herself. When she told us, a year later, she was so flabbergasted and couldn't believe it, so she thought it would be a good joke and confront him. He approached her gardening one day because he was retired, so he was often home. She was incredibly nervous and said, You know, the weirdest thing happened. I swear I saw you on America's Most Wanted. Rob was a friendly guy, rosy cheeks and sunny disposition. When she said this, she said his face turned dark and he looked extremely angry. He said to her, you think I would do that to those girls? She didn't disclose what she saw him on America's Most Wanted for. The very next night, unbeknownst to our entire family that that encounter happened, I went to the bathroom at midnight. Our bathroom had a window that was facing the front of the house, and I could hear a lot of noise going on. I checked out to see what was happening, and there were multiple U-Hauls in front of Rob's house, loading stuff. I remember being really weirded out that someone would move in at that time. I was also only 15 at the time, so I didn't know how the world worked. I thought this could be normal. It turns out that my moms had also woken up to the same noises that night and saw him move. Our neighbor didn't tell us the truth about their interaction at least a year until Rob moved out. She seriously was not a bright person and I think she was ashamed of how she handled the whole situation. This was in 2015 when I was 15. I was sleeping over at my friend's house and we were home alone. We smoked some weed and were really baked. We realized we needed some munchies at about 1am so we walked about two miles to the 24-7 grocery store. My friend was really paranoid the whole time we walked, thinking someone was going to jump us out of the bushes or something, I don't know. We make it to the store, get a shit ton of snacks. My friend says she's too scared to walk back home, so we sit in the little lobby in front of the grocery store, trying to find a taxi. While we're sitting and failing to find a taxi because we live in suburbia, where there are no taxis in the middle of the night, we see a group of three guys around our age come in. Five minutes later, the three of them run out of the store, all holding some kind of liquor. The one employee half-acidly chased them to the door, but shrugged when they escaped inside. At this point, we realized we weren't going to find any taxis, so we decided to suck it up and just walk home. We're leaving the store and walk past this little seating area maybe 75 feet from the grocery store entrance. There were the three guys, just chilling and drinking their free booze. 
One of them shouts, asking if we'd like to join them. I immediately panic whisper to my friend, no, 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 but for some reason she says yes. I don't know how she was too scared to walk two miles in the dark, but not scared enough to say no to these guys. Well, I'm not leaving her, so I sit down too. They give us each a beer and they're talking about random high school stuff. They all seem to be pretty intoxicated already, and one guy seemed to be on something else too. He was incoherent and flopping around the ground. Not in a, I'm dying way, just in a, I'm really fucked up way. We sit there for maybe 20 minutes before my friend realizes this maybe wasn't a good idea. So we look at each other like, let's get the fuck out of here, what are we doing? And say we need to go home. They say they don't mind us walking home and say that maybe they can come to my friend's house and smoke some weed, which is obviously not a great idea, and we said we were okay, but they followed us anyway, so we decide to walk to the park nearby her house and then ditch them there. They threw the one really fucked up guy in a shopping cart and offered to carry our shopping bags. We did buy a lot of munchies, so we agree. They throw our stuff on top of the guy, they were nice guys, we just were not down to have them in our house, and they were very pushy about wanting to come over. We make it to the park and they disperse. The messed up guy tries to climb over the playground fence but gets stuck and just stays there, hanging over the fence. The other two start dicking around the playground. My friend and I grab our shit and make a break for the trees. They didn't even notice we left. We got back to our house laughing about how weird the whole situation was and dive into our munchies at last. We pass out in front of the TV. The next morning, her mom came home while we were making some breakfast. We were just chit-chatting when she asks if we heard about that hit and run over a drug deal gone wrong involving some students at our rival high school. We hadn't, so we asked for more information. She pulls up a news article showing four mugshots three of which are the guys we met the night before. Turns out, they and a girl tried to get weed without paying for it and ended up pushing the dealer out of the moving car or something like that, and it killed her. After hearing that, we just stared at each other. I was deer hunting with a friend on some property my uncle owns in a pretty remote area. It's right off of a main road, only a couple trailer homes along the side, and to get to the tree stand, it's a good 20 minutes of walking up and down hills through some thick forest, so let me try to paint a little bit of a picture here to make this easier to explain. At the base of the last hill is our two-person tree stand for hunting, then there's about a hundred feet of land to the lake but this part is pretty thin, about 60 feet, creating a peninsula jutting from the land to our left, with the rest of the lake behind it. So, about 45 minutes before the sun rises, we start to hear knocking sounds from the tip of the peninsula that sounds like a lot of male deer fighting with their antlers. We start getting pretty excited, thinking hell yeah, there's at least two bucks out there. Then we hear the knocking coming from the other end of the peninsula as well. Well, that's crazy. We have four male deer here. The knocking goes on for a few minutes, getting a little closer. Then we realize it's way too precise to be deer fighting. Then I notice that when the one on the right clicks once, the other one clicks once. When one clicks twice, the other clicks twice. They're directly mimicking each other. This couldn't have been an echo. They were spaced out a little far apart. It wasn't instant like an echo would be, and they were both about the same in volume. Over the next few minutes, the knocking sounds get closer and closer together. Then, for about ten minutes, nothing. When out of nowhere, we hear something like an animal on the peninsula dying, almost like a hurt dog yelping. Then we hear a loud thud, and all goes quiet. We look at each other, not sure what to say. I stand up and scream, who's out there? 
Then I hear the most blood-curdling, awful noise that I've ever heard in my damn life. I'm shaking right now just thinking about it. It started as a low, deep growl and turned into a high, raspy howl, and my blood instantly went cold. My friend and I looked back at each other, saying, What the fuck was that? at the same time. So, I yell again, something like, You better get out of here. Whatever it was howls one more time and takes off through the woods, and I swear you could feel its footsteps. Whatever it was, it was bipedal. I've taken many tracking and hunting classes. I grew up in the woods. I know what a running deer sounds like. This 100% had two legs. Then it crashed through some cattails on the edge of the lake and through the forest. We could see it moving and see how fast it moved through probably a foot of mud and cattails. We didn't say a word. We got down one at a time while the other was pointing their gun where we heard the noises and walked out of there backwards. We left, called everyone we knew, but as college-aged kids, none of our friends were up. Nobody believed us, so I wanted to go back that afternoon to see if I could find any tracks in the mud where we saw it run. My friend wouldn't go with me, so I went alone. When I got to the cattails on the peninsula, something else had already come back before me. A large branch had wiped all of the footprints from the mud and was laying next to them in the woods. I've been back maybe twice since then. It's been about five years. I'm always armed, and I'm always with someone else. A little less than a decade ago, two of my buddies and I descended from the mountains during the night because of a massive storm that flooded our camp spot. We arrived into the small town at the base around 2 a.m. and checked the established campsites, but they were all so muddy and flooded. We noticed a tent set up in there though, and as we walked away, we all realized at the same time that a man with a large white beard and wearing all black was walking at the same pace as us out of the campground area. As we walked closer towards the main road, we eventually lost sight of him. Since we had parked my friend's car in the next town and had taken a bus back several towns to start our hike, we had never planned to come to this town and therefore had no means of transportation out of there. We decided to get some rooms for the night and headed back on our hike once the storm had passed the next day so we walked to every hotel in this town, but they had no rooms available anywhere. After about an hour of walking in the rain, we stood under an awning at the gas station, and the worker came out to tell us that the post office building was open all night, and sometimes stranded hikers spent the night in there, and it was fine. So, we went there. We threw our sleeping pads on the floor and tried to get a few hours of sleep now that we were sheltered. At some point I hear my friends say, someone is watching us outside. We all get up and look, and it's the white bearded ninja creepy looking guy. He's just standing there with his nose on the window, staring at us. Then he slowly walks away after a few minutes, while looking back at us a few times before vanishing. We all agreed to leave this building before getting murdered in it, or that maybe that man's campsite was flooded and he might have been trying to sleep there as well. Either way, we decided to sit in a covered bus stop bench and drink the last of the warm beers in our backpacks while watching an incredible lightning show. Not too long after though, we saw the white bearded ninja guy sit at the bench across the street from us, outside of a restaurant. We just sat there doing our thing while he distantly looked at us and sometimes laid his head down on a table. This went on until about 6 a.m. when the rain stopped. He just walked away and we left shortly after. We later found out that he is in fact a homeless person who lives there. He probably just wanted a place to sleep. I have seen him several times over the years as he's always hanging out outside that same restaurant. I bought him food and offered him a beer, but he declined the beer. 
I ask them about his life, but he speaks so low and mumble that I cannot understand anything he says. He seems really sweet in a way, but obviously mentally ill also. The locals say he's harmless and just a bit lost. Anyway, I'm not sure what to think of him, but when I saw him standing in the rain, staring at me as I woke up, it freaked me the fuck out. I used to camp at this fairly secluded spot on state land. I've been going up to that site since I was a kid, and it had become an annual tradition for my buddies and I to kind of unplug and rough it for a few days. However, at the time, it was relatively unknown, and it was a bit of a trek to get to the campsite. Middle of the woods, but close to a lake. Perfect for swimming. We're talking no cell signal, no light pollution, you're just out in the wilderness. My buddies and I were geeked to get out there and spend the week camping every summer. One summer afternoon, I'm the first to arrive, ready for a week of camping, drinking and swimming. However, to my dismay, I discovered that the site already has an established campsite going. There's a couple of tents set up. Granted, it's a fairly large campsite, so I decide to haul my gear over and see if I can talk to the other campers into letting us share the spot. Who knows, they might be cool, and maybe it'll be one big party. I come up to the site, and there's no people, and the tents are empty. There was evidence of a campfire, so I know there were people here not too long ago. I decide to check the lake. Maybe they went swimming. There's a steep path that leads from the site to the lake, and as I'm walking alongside it, I discover some debris that is blown down along the path. There's a sleeping bag, some tools, and some clothes that have been on a line, but now they're all in the dirt, all evidence that the site has actually been set up for a while. The clothes are wet with ditch water, they've been sitting on the ground in the path for some time. There's no people at the lake. And when I return to the site, upon further investigation, I discover that the site's been abandoned for some time, but that doesn't explain why they just left everything behind. From what I could tell, the people camping here had left in a big fucking hurry. There's clothes, there's food and other gear. I mean, it's an entire camp. The tents were fairly new. It's not just stuff that you leave behind. Unless you're scrambling and only grabbing the essentials. What was weird to me was that the fire was out, but there was still ice in their coolers and beers, so it couldn't have been too long ago that they were there. My other buddies arrive, and we decide to set up camp nearby and keep an eye on it. Maybe the people had to leave for an emergency or something. We wind up camping out the whole week, and no evidence of people coming back to retrieve their stuff. Luckily, the DNR happened to stop by on patrol, and we filled them in on our discovery. They let us know they'd be packing up the stuff to take into a lost and found up at their station. Kinda creepy, mostly weird. Who knows what happened to those people. This story takes place when I was around 10 or 11. Before I begin, there's a few things I need to explain. Firstly, the city I grew up in is a small city. It has a population of about 100,000 people. It was also named the most dangerous city in my country, three years in a row. So, as you can imagine, it was a pretty sketchy place filled with a bunch of unsavory characters. Secondly, I was an extremely naive child. I was very sheltered growing up, and even though my parents did try to teach me stranger danger, it went in one ear and out the other. Thanks to my naivete, I put myself in very dangerous situations. It's a wonder how I'm still alive with how incredibly dumb I was. Anyway, my parents weren't extremely well off, so we lived in a three-bedroom house. There were four of us, 
so I shared a room with my sibling in a cul-de-sac. It was a pretty tight-knit community where everyone knew everyone. I had to walk about 20 to 30 minutes every day to get to school, which was located in not the safest place, but it was safe enough. I had to walk along a pretty busy intersection on my way to school. Remember this for later. One day after school, there was a strange person standing outside of the building. They weren't on school grounds, but on the sidewalk that bordered it. We'll call this person Herbert. Feels fitting, given the reasoning for them being there. Herbert didn't seem interested in talking with any of my classmates, but the minute I walked past, he called me over. You'd think I'd be smart enough to ignore them and be on my way, right? No. I strutted my dumbass over to them and initiated a conversation with them. Now, Herbert was clearly trying to conceal their identity from me. They had sunglasses that covered their eyes, and they wore a hood. All I could see was the bottom half of their face. They introduced themselves and asked me what my name was. And of course, being the massive idiot I was, I happily told them my name, what grade I was in, the general area of where I lived, you know. Things you tell creepy hooded figures standing outside of a middle school. Well, more days passed, and Herbert would sometimes be outside of the school. He'd call me over so we could have a nice little chat. He was gaining my trust, and every time we talked, I'd reveal a little more about myself. I can't exactly remember what we talked about or what I told him, but knowing me... I was giving them my entire life story. I do believe Herbert did try to invite me over to their house, but I said no. Not because I was starting to realize this entire situation was extremely dangerous. No, it was because I was scared to arrive home late. Come to think of it, I'm wondering where the hell the adults were this entire time. I don't remember them ever intervening. Not once. I retract my statement about the school being safe enough. Anyway, the last day of school comes around. I had packed up my stuff and was on my way home. Now, while I was walking home, traffic was headed in the opposite direction of me. I was walking north, and the traffic was going south. I remember I was deep in thought. I was thinking about what middle school would be like, where I would fit in what cute boys would be there, that kind of thing. Suddenly, this blue truck slowly drives past me, a lot slower than the rest of traffic. Keep in mind, this is around 3.30pm, so it's still pretty bright out, but that didn't stop this guy from slowly driving past me. I briefly looked over at him, and we locked eyes. He seemed to be in his mid-40s to early 50s. He was balding, a bit on the fluffier side, and he was creepy as hell. I felt alarm bells going off inside of my head, and a little voice told me to hide my face. I quickly used my binder to hide my face from him, and just kept walking home. When I was certain he was far enough away, I dropped my arm and looked back at the truck. He was in the process of heading down a nearby alleyway, which I knew looped around back to the main road. I was having none of that. I practically ran the rest of the way home and turned a 10 minute walk into 5. What made this situation even more terrifying was I remembered seeing that same truck parked a ways down the street from my school whenever I was chatting with Herbert. I also knew it was the same truck because it had a tennis ball on the antenna. I only saw that truck one last time. It was driving through my neighborhood, no doubt looking for me. Thankfully, I was in the back seat of my parents' car while we were on our way to visit my grandma. The back windows were tinted. They just drove right past us, and I never saw them again. I moved in with my mom and stepdad a few months after I last saw them, for reasons completely unrelated to them. But to Herbert and their creepy accomplice, let's never meet again.
Every weekday, I would wake up early for a morning workout, then head to my job. Generally, I would leave my house around 5.30 because my morning drive took around 25 to 30 minutes, giving me enough time for two hours before I needed to leave before my shift started. Most of my drive was just putting loud music on, trying not to fall asleep and it being a freeway before 6 a.m., Almost everyone was going at least 10 miles per hour over the speed limit. I drive most of the time on a main interstate before turning off onto a smaller highway, which I would only use for a mile or so. This highway was three lanes on each side. People also drive fast on here, but usually no more than 75 miles. And while you get some unsafe drivers in the morning, most people aren't swerving erratically. This highway runs north to south. An on-ramp from a main street becomes a lane. Then there are two entrances from the freeway I would take every day. One from the eastbound side and one from the westbound side. I hope that makes sense, but basically, I got on from the eastbound side right as three cars were entering from the westbound side. One was some sort of orange sportyish car and the other two were identical dark gray sedans. I don't remember exactly what make and model they were, but I remember them being fairly uncommon models, not a sedan you'd see a hundred times a day. One was in the front of this orange car, one behind. These guys were going at least 80 miles per hour. The orange car would change lanes, and the car in front would cut him off, while the one behind would change lanes to remain behind him. They kept this up the entire time I was on the highway near them, weaving in and out of cars, not slowing down, before I pulled off at my exit. This could be a complete coincidence and some asshole drivers, but I definitely got the vibe that the driver of the orange car was trying to get away from the gray cars. Maybe it was extreme road rage, or maybe something more sinister. Regardless, I'll never know. So, drivers of those gray cars, let's not meet. I'm a security guard for an alarm response company. We answer alarms for businesses and private residences. 99% of the time, it's a motion detector set off by a cat, or a restaurant forgot to disarm their stuff before the stock truck arrived to unload. In this case, I was called out to a house where the back door alarm was set off, like it thought someone opened it. The owner was out of town but she was alerted by her app and had her mother meet me there. We check the door. It's locked. We figure maybe someone tried the door, but it didn't budge, setting off the alarm. But there's a light on inside. The mother mentions this to the daughter on the phone. The daughter says she isn't sure if she left the light on or not. It's a good idea to make people think someone's home, but she just isn't sure. That gave me a bad tingle. The mother wanted to go inside to check. However, she didn't have a spare key. The neighbor did, but they were asleep and the mother didn't want to wake them. So, I fill out my papers and go back to my normal patrol routes. An hour later, the same house sends an alert out. I'm the only one in my city zone, so I answer it again. When I pull up, Police and CSI are there talking to the mother and the now awake neighbor. They are reviewing the video footage sent to them by the daughter. I look at the footage. Four armed men wearing masks and hoodies came out of the bathroom a minute after the mother and I left. They proceeded to rob the place. They'd broken in and locked the door behind them for appearances. They're the ones who turned on the light. The mother told me three guys had robbed her daughter's home a month before. Somehow, they knew when this girl would be out of town. They appeared smart, desiring a quiet robbery without conflict, but they brought guns, so they were prepared to shoot their way out of trouble if need be. The mother had wanted to go in, if she'd had a key or woken the neighbor for a key, 
we would likely have been shot dead by these guys when we went inside. Work doesn't give me Kevlar vests or anything. If I ever get another house call and someone is there, I'm not going inside, no matter what is asked of me. I count myself fortunate the way was blocked this time, because I was prepared to foolishly go in and check if I could. The 1% of calls where something is actually off, it has never been as bad as this one. So for context, I was living on the Fiji Islands back in 2016, and I was 14 years old. This story happened to my family, but mainly my mom. It was on the 31st of October, and I was at my school for a Halloween-based party, and my parents and little sister had gone to a family friend's Halloween party. The house was empty. My party finished at 9pm, and my dad came to pick me up, but dropped off my mom and sister at the house because our security alarm was ringing. Because nobody was home, my family obviously called the security company over, and they sent a van with three security guards. My mom opens the house and lets everybody in. They check out the whole house and see no one. My mother checks all the cupboards and under the bed with my little sister, who's only 12 at the time. The security go outside in the garden and into the basement, to check if there's anybody there and it's not an accidental ring. We don't have any pets, by the way. My mom turns on all the lights from the living room and the balcony. She starts to open the window and the gates that protect all the windows to get on the balcony, but when she looks at the keyhole to put it in, she notices flip-flops on the floor. She then looks closer and she sees two pairs of legs hiding really close to each other against the wall under a garden sofa. My mom yells out of her lungs. The two guys got scared and jumped off the balcony into my garden. One of the guards grabs the guy, but the second intruder jumps on the guard, and they run away, jumping over the fence and running into the forest. My mother regrets yelling, and says that if she came down and talked to the security quietly, the guys wouldn't have gotten away. My mother was crying, holding my sister to her side telling her everything will be okay. The security then called the police, and they did a report describing the guys and started a search. The cops were here in a minute since I live about a hundred meters from the closest police station. The guys who jumped lost a hat and their flip-flops, and they left socks that they used as gloves and two knives. Sadly, the two guys were never found. But, two weeks later, my mom pulls out of the driveway looks in her rearview mirror of her car and sees what she's 90% sure is the two guys opposite our house staring at her. The short one had the same new hat and the other guy had brand new flip-flops. When my mom drove away to the police station, the guys were gone and never to be found again. I got home after with my dad to my mom and sister crying. My dad was mad that he didn't stay but my mom drank and could not drive. Luckily, my mom saw them before she opened the window, otherwise something bad could have happened. I'm now 21 and live in Australia, and even though I did not go through this myself, it really scared me because I was young. And now that I live alone, I check the entirety of my house and make sure my house is always locked, to the point that I've actually locked myself out of my own home many times. My name is Slade, I'm 25, born and raised in Arizona. This just happened to me, so I decided to bring it here to all of you wonderful people this evening. I'm a huge stoner and don't drive. I decided to take a bus a few miles down to the dispensary. This was at about 8.30pm. I wanted to get a new Indica cart, Purple Punch, it's my favorite by far. I got it and walked back towards the bus stop to go back home. As I walked closer to the bus bench, I noticed a guy sitting there. I didn't think much of it. I'm antisocial, so I always go into any social setting ready to be absolutely silent. However, 
and I didn't get a chance this time, because as I'm sitting down, he starts asking me something, but I had my headphones on and couldn't quite hear what he said, so I took my headphones off and asked, what was that? And he responds, did you want to get your hair cut? Whilst staring at me with very wide eyes, not blinking. If I were a betting man, I'd say he was on something. I definitely wasn't expecting that question, and I just awkwardly say, Oh, uh, I'm alright. I then noticed he was wearing an Arizona Cardinals uniform, and I just so happened to be an Arizona Cardinals fan, so since my entire socializing ability revolves around sports, I decide to ask, Are you an Arizona Cardinals fan? He then looks at me funny for a split second. No, I just got this a few months ago, he says. I then ask, ah, so how long have you been cutting hair? Without blinking, he answers, just picked it up a few months ago. Who taught you how to cut hair, I asked, even more sketched out at this point. His eyes shifted and then he says, I learned on my own. Come on, man. Let me touch you up in the back. Mind you, he was consistently pushing to cut my hair throughout this entire conversation. I even told him like, Yo, I don't have any cash on me right now. Indicating that I couldn't even pay for this service even if I wanted to. But he just answers with, That's no problem. I got my clippers in my bag now. Come on. So, I decided to just be real with this guy. Listen, I'm real sorry. I just don't feel very comfortable getting haircuts from people I don't know. And like at night and shit, you feel me? This guy never changed facial expressions this entire interaction. He finally says, True that, and continues to glare into my soul. I decided in that moment, it was time to get the fuck out of there. Luckily this bus stop was right in front of our local Circle K, so I walked in there for a few minutes just to kill time, because unfortunately that bus wasn't showing up for another 17 minutes. I didn't want to stay long because I didn't want the employees to think I was stealing or some shit, so I waited only about 6 to 7 minutes, and literally as I'm walking out there, I see the haircut guy walking in, still staring at me. Luckily I walked past him and noped the fuck out of there to another bus stop down the street. The bus finally got there. I saw the guy back at the bus stop, but he didn't bother me anymore, and I made sure to keep my eyes the complete opposite of his direction the entire time. I tend to overthink most social situations I'm in, even if they're extremely quick, but how would you have handled the situation? Would you have let the guy cut your hair? Am I weird for reacting the way I did? I was alone at the gas station when a guy in a brown suit holding some container of pink liquid came out of a white paneled van and walked over to me. He told me that he was selling the liquid as some kind of carpet cleaner. I still lived at home and had no need to add to my parents' cleaning supplies, especially since this was an unmarked container that looked like paint remover. I explained this to him while just having a bad feeling in general. I don't know exactly why but my spidey sense was tingling. He asked me where I was going, and I exaggerated a board game night at my friend's into a party at my friend's house. He smiled and said, I bet you get all the girls at a party like that. I didn't. I used to be like that when I was younger, he continued. Then, something changed in his face, and my internal danger sense lowered. We're cool, man he said, as he smiled at me and closed himself back into the paneled van. It could have been face value interaction, but to this day, I feel like it would have been a big problem if we weren't cool by the end of the conversation. Honestly, the first night really outside, Everything is scary. I've been homeless for about four months some years ago. At first, I could stay with friends, 
but I didn't want to overstay my welcome. I'd actually lie to them, telling them I've got a place to go to. Luckily, in those four months, I only had to really sleep outside for about two weeks. The first scary thing was just finding where to sleep, where people can't see me and it's relatively dry. Then when I found some places to sleep, I was consistently worried about people seeing me. The other scary thing was every single sound. A car drives by slowly, some drunks in the distance singing. The next scary thing was the cold. I would only sleep very lightly for about 30 minutes at a time and wake up shivering. I was 19, about 6 foot and 95 kilograms, not really a small guy, and I was scared as hell. I imagine it's so much worse for women. My best advice would be, don't be an idiot and ask for help. Although it was extremely tempting, I didn't abuse drugs or alcohol. I didn't look homeless. I was just a big idiot thinking, I can fix this by myself. I don't want to impose on people, that kind of thing. I was 19 back then, I'm 33 now, and I'm happily married, and we have a nice home. I was about 15 and was in Costa Rica for the summer, as I have a lot of family out there. It's a big family, and most of them live in the city, but we had this house in the deep country a few kilometers outside a tiny town called San Pedro. It was mountainous with thick jungle forests, a serene place really, an old little house with some hand-constructed pools and decks up the hill. There was power and water, and it was enough for a relaxing getaway. It was up the mountains, surrounded by jungle and some random ranch land and farmland. It was honestly the most beautiful place I've ever been. But, given its isolation, it could end up being a little creepy, especially after dark. You'd see lights in the forest where there shouldn't have been, and sometimes you would see weird shit in the sky. When under the tree canopy, it got dark fast, and all kinds of things would come out and make noise. Noise in the jungle at night is honestly pretty normal, but one particular night, we had a weird one. It was myself, my abuela, my tia and tio, and my cousin. We were all settled in bed, reading as we didn't have any internet out there and smartphones were a new thing. It was actually almost dead quiet that night, more of an anomaly really. It was a sudden scream that broke the silence, and not just any scream. It was somewhat human and absolutely blood-curdling, like a woman mixed with a cat, vile and terrifying. It started pretty much right outside the house and traveled all the way up to the pool area, a good distance, still very loud. Meanwhile, as it moved up somewhat quickly, there was this thunderous sound of what sounded like a dozen horses in full gallop moving with the screaming thing. It got up past the pool into a field behind it all the way up to the river. A good minute of horror. Needless to say, we were all shaken up a good bit. My little cousin, who was like ten or something, was unable to sleep again that night. Oddly enough, once everything had settled down, the jungle carried on like usual. Bugs chittering and whatnot. The following morning, we went to look, and sure enough, Tons of hoof prints. A local farmer said his horses escaped, but that doesn't explain the screaming. My abuela told me it must have been La Bruja or a witch. People out there believe in such legends, elves and fairies. But you know, in a remote jungle or countryside, who knows what lies within. Anyway, that's my little tale. I was driving on a back road at night, heading to my parents' house, when a Cadillac started following me. It was a one-lane road at night, drizzling on and off, and this guy I notice has been following me for a little over two miles. At first, I thought it was paranoia, 
So I used my blinker and they copied me. Every time I did it, a sole blue light went off on their hood behind me, I guess trying to make me pull over. I called 911 and stayed on the line until the police intercepted me. The guy following me ended up being wanted on warrants for skipping bail on a sexual assault charge. Definitely came way too close that night. I'm a female long distance trail runner who loves mapping out really cool routes that take me into various places I would likely never venture. I used to live in the East Bay of the San Francisco area. It's a very suburban, well-to-do area with relatively low crime. Adjacent to the city is a plethora of open space preserves with endless trails. There are various ways to get into these trails, so I like to explore all the different entrances. I found a unique trailhead in a town next door called Alamo, up next to a gated community. I'd never been over there and thought it'd be a safe, fun run. It was the middle of the day, and I was running through the neighborhood to get to the trailhead. No one else was around, and I saw very few cars on the suburban streets. It was particularly deserted. I'm guessing most people in the area probably commute to the city and don't hang around their quiet homes during the day. As I'm running along, a cop car passes by me, headed away from the gated community. Whenever I saw a cop car while running, I felt safer, knowing they were out patrolling. A few minutes later, the cop car drove by me again, heading back to where it came from. I wasn't sure it was the same cop at first. And it passes by me again, heading in the original direction. Again, I thought maybe it was a different cop. I changed streets to stay on my route. I didn't see the cop for a few minutes, until there he was, driving by me on this adjacent street. I thought I was kind of losing my mind. Was it the same cop? I keep running. He passed me again, facing me, this time much, much slower. I saw his face, sunglasses on, white, probably mid-thirties. He was expressionless, staring directly at me. I looked forward with confidence, not at him, not changing my pace so I don't arouse any suspicion. After maybe another five minutes, I suddenly realize he's behind me in the car. He's creeping along at my pace in the road next to and behind me. He is literally following me. He follows me for at least a minute. No sirens, no dialogue, just following. I turn around once, and I think he's looking directly at me. But it's hard to tell through his sunglasses. He certainly wasn't looking down. I didn't turn around again after that, out of confusion and because. I didn't want to give him any reason to interact with me. He then suddenly does a U-turn and speeds off towards town. I'm thankful I didn't have to interact with him for any reason, and that this story doesn't end weirdly. After that, any time I saw a cop while running, I felt kind of uneasy. I contemplated the reasons why this might have happened. The most rational reason is that the same person called the cops, saying there was a suspicious person in the neighborhood. But that doesn't make much sense because I'm a young woman in jogging clothes with an armband for my phone and all. Another thought was that perhaps he was escorting me, but that also makes zero sense. The third option, well, I really don't want to think about the third one. A year or so later, I read some news articles about cop corruption in my area, but I think I'm reading into it too much. Creepy cop. Don't follow women who jog alone. If it wasn't a cop car but a regular Joe, I would have called the cops. What was I to do since it was a cop? I was shopping at a grocery store. I was in the drink aisle reaching for something when I suddenly got a bad feeling. I turned my head to look back and jumped when a man who was extremely close to me, like an inch behind me,
quickly moved past me. My knee-jerk reaction was to reach for my back pocket to make sure my car key was still there, and it was. So I brushed it off, thinking maybe it was someone in a hurry who perhaps almost ran into me absent-mindedly. As I finished grabbing my drinks, I glanced at him. He stopped a few feet from me, hands behind his back, casually walking back and forth looking at drinks. He did not have a cart or a basket, but maybe he was just grabbing some drinks and didn't need one. I moved on to another aisle, and after I reached to grab something and turn around, there he is again, except this time a few feet from me. Again, hands behind his back, looking at items in the aisle. Spooked at this point, I went to check out. As I'm in line, I look behind me and don't see him. Good, I'm in the clear. I turn my head back around and bam, there he is on my left, looking at something near the checkout line. There are several different checkout lines, as well as a self-checkout, so the odds of him being there coincidentally seemed low. He still did not have a cart or any items. Not knowing what else to do, I just stare directly at him until he notices me. He immediately walks off and I don't see him again. Considering how close he got, I think he was trying to steal from me. I was probably seen as an easy target because I was alone with a purse. Either that, or I just stared down some innocent, poor soul. First off, I would like to start with the fact that I'm not a believer, not in God or anything else superior. I was never curious enough to look into stuff like this, and even if God exists, I simply didn't care because clearly, with multiple surgeries literally from the day I was born, I wasn't his favorite. I'm a 27-year-old male, and I've had multiple heart surgeries throughout my life. It started off as a heart murmur with an open heart valve repair when I was born, I went on to have an aortic valve replacement surgery when I was 16, and a stent placement in the coronary artery near my heart at 23. I'm finally clear right now, and don't have any showing problems, at least for the near future. Surgeries have all gone great, until the third one came around. The stent placement didn't go as planned, and the balloon inflated early, stopping my heart almost immediately, since the coronary artery was cut off. I was clinically dead for three minutes. In those three minutes, that felt like an eternity. I felt as peaceful as ever, like coming back from a hard day at work with nothing to do for the rest of the day and knowing you have the day off tomorrow. I remember loving the feeling, but not seeing anything. Not black or white or something like that. Just nothing. Like a transparent background that goes on and on and on. Just as I was getting used to the feeling of laziness, the voice of my grandpa who passed away in 2018 came around and told me, you shouldn't get used to it. You're not staying long. Immediately after that, I woke up in the hospital bed with my mom right next to me, calling for the doctor to come in. He explained the situation to me and how I was dead, and they were literally about to cover me with a bed sheet, and a pulse just popped out of nowhere but I wasn't surprised at all. Like I already knew what happened. I never had the guts to tell this to anyone, since they would just call me crazy. And frankly, I would call me crazy too if I heard this from their point of view. Four years have passed, and I'm still wondering every day on how this happened. Was it an actual miracle? Was it hallucinations from anesthesia? Or am I just crazy? I need some advice on what to do in this rather strange situation. Last night, after a party, a guy who was a friend of a friend offered to drop me home. I was hesitant and wanted to book an Uber, but he insisted on driving me. The problem was, I was feeling quite drunk and out of sorts. When we got to the parking lot, he sat in the car with me, turned off the lights, and said he'd wait for a few minutes since he was feeling a little high too. 
I got scared and said I would get out and wait, but he convinced me not to and even discouraged me from booking an Uber. Things took a weird turn when he started driving in the wrong direction, assuming I was too intoxicated to notice, but I wasn't and asked him to take the correct turns. He kept taking detours and taking off the GPS, but I managed to use my phone to navigate and get us back on track. During the ride, he started praising me excessively, talking about how other girls in his life weren't good, but I was different. He seemed to be pushing me into something more. Even though I have a long-distance boyfriend, it made me uncomfortable and I insisted he take me straight home. After reaching home, I realized he left his ID card in my bag. Now, I want to return it to him, but given the weird behavior during the ride, I'm not sure how to do it safely. I don't want to meet him alone again. Our mutual friend has moved to another state. I ended up dropping his ID off at a friend's place, and I asked him to take it from there. He seemed to have realized, but wants to not talk about it. He asked me to hang out again, and I mentioned that he got a little too drunk that night. I told him the location of his ID and blocked him. However, I don't want to be part of any drama, so I was not really rude as I initially thought I would be. I politely told him that this made me uncomfortable, and that I didn't want to be friends anymore, and blocked him. When I was in high school, my two friends and I were walking on the side of the road to a McDonald's. It was really dark out, but about 20 feet up and on the other side of the road, we started to notice a lighter clicking, like definitely at us. We whispered about it, but kept walking, hoping to pass by. A homeless man walked pretty quickly out of the dark towards us, saying, Hey, I know you see me. We tried to just keep moving, and he said, I just need some money. We kept walking until he said, I know you all don't want to die for some money. We stopped and turned to face him, petrified. I kind of led the conversation, telling him we'd give him what we had and just to take it easy. We pulled out our wallets and started to give him the few bucks we had, and he sat down on the grass, clutching the cash and sobbed about how hungry he was. I had kept a five dollar from him, so I pulled it out and gave it to him, saying there's a McDonald's right there and to go get himself something to eat. He just kept crying and praying like, Lord, help me. We decided to leave him there, and all I could say was, God bless you, man. And we kept walking. That was a real eye-opener for me. Kind of inverse to that one. I was at a Taco Bell with some friends on a road trip. I went back to the counter to order some food, and this guy approached me. He looks like how you imagine the redneck who wants to do weird things looks, and he can't stop stuttering and he's visibly nervous. He keeps going on about, man, something's wrong with my truck, if you could come take a look at it. I tell him I'm probably the least qualified person in here to help him, but he insists, man, if you could just take a look at it, I don't know what's wrong with it. I had no intention of doing so, but I glanced at my friends, and they're all shaking their heads. One of them very loudly says, Jake, no, and I nodded to him to assure them I understood the situation. When I turned back, the man was halfway out the door and headed back to his car. It still shakes me to think about the reality of this, and how easily my life could have been ruined in an instant if I didn't know better. I'm not sure what the takeaway is here. Some people are just on shit luck and don't feel they have options. Some people want to do terrible, terrible things to others. Always better to assume the latter, I guess. It's been a while since I was a 911 dispatcher, but this story is one that stuck with me years later. For context, I live in an area near Houston, Texas, and this happened shortly after Hurricane Harvey back in 2017, where lots of homes were flooded and some even destroyed. 
I answer the phone and ask the caller what's going on. The person on the other end of the line is an older lady, and her voice is shaking. She tries to tell me what's going on, and tells me that her husband has been going through a rough time. He's lost his job, he's been spending a lot of money trying to fix their house after the hurricane, and their dog just died. She tells me that he's locked himself in our bedroom, and I'm not sure what to do. At that point, I realized what's going on, and the pit in my stomach grew to the point where I wanted to vomit, but I didn't want to assume anything and was direct with her. What do you think your husband is going to do? I ask. She responds. Her voice becomes even shakier and cracks, saying, he's locked himself in there, and I think I heard him load his pistol. My adrenaline spikes as I upgrade this call's priority. And at this point, I can't do anything for the man locked in his room. I'm just trying to talk to my caller to keep her calm. We talk about how long she's lived at the house, the different stray cats that she's fed over the years, how she really enjoys cross-stitching but never ends up finishing any of her pieces because she likes the feeling of starting to cross-stitch but never has the patience to finish them. As we're talking, I hear a loud bang and my heart drops. The ambulance and police were less than two minutes away, but they were already too late. I keep the woman on the phone, making sure that she doesn't go into her bedroom, talking to her, keeping her calm as anyone could be in this sort of situation. After a few moments, I hear pounding on the door, and I check my map. The police are on scene. The woman's name was Evelyn. I tell her to go to the door and let the officers in. She thanks me for staying on the phone with her. And before she hangs up, her voice breaks one more time and says, He was the strong one. He was supposed to be the strong one. In many rural areas of the American West, cutting firewood in national forests is a necessary chore if you want a warm house through the winter. Our home in mountainous central Idaho was no exception. It was normal for my dad to pick my brothers and I up after school and head up into the mountains for an afternoon of firewood gathering. My dad would fell the dead trees, then saw them into chunks. My brothers and I had the task of rolling the wood to the truck and loading it. We would continue this assembly line process until we had a truckload of wood, usually before nightfall. Hot, sweaty, and exhausted, we would pile into the truck cab and make our way down the mountain. At home the next day, we would unload and split the wood and stack it into neat little rows. This process was repeated until we had a winter's worth of fuel for our house, our grandma's cabin, and any extra for elderly neighbors. This particular afternoon, we decided to try a different logging road on the other side of the valley. This was well outside our family logging area. No real reason for the change, but my dad said he wanted a change of scenery. This logging road hadn't been maintenanced in some time. Large rocks and fallen branches littered the path. My brothers and I had to walk out in front, pushing rocks and wood out of the way as my dad lurched the truck up the switchbacks. Yard by yard, we slowly made our way up the mountain. The hike was physically brutal. As we ascended the mountain and got farther into the trees, this odd feeling started to set in. I wasn't sure if it was the exhaustion from the hike or something more. There was electricity in the air, like the whole mountain was buzzing at a wavelength just below my senses. In some odd way, it felt like the mountain knew we were there and it wasn't welcome to that fact. I wanted to say something to my brothers, but before I opened my mouth, my younger brother said, Does anyone else feel like we're not welcome here? My older brother and I stopped in our tracks and looked back at him. Both of us nodded in agreement. This moment was broken by my dad honking and motioning us to continue clearing the path. Reluctantly, we pushed forward to a small clearing in the woods where we finally stopped the truck. My dad, oblivious to our apprehension, or simply choosing to ignore it, 
grabbed his saw and went to work. As the wood was felled and loaded, I couldn't shake this feeling enveloping me like a dark shroud. I noticed my brothers were taking occasional glances over their shoulders as we worked. Everyone but my dad, it seemed, was on edge. The sun nestled down into the trees, and twilight began to set in. As the light drained from the sky, my anxiety only intensified. It wasn't until my dad unexpectedly told us to load up that a wave of relief flooded over me. I could see the tension in my brothers melt away as well. The truck wasn't fully loaded, an oddity. Getting a half load was a waste, according to my dad. We would sometimes work into the dark just to make sure the truck was full. But tonight, he seemed eager to head home. With everything loaded, we started down the road. Although dead tired, everyone seemed to be in a much lighter mood. We were chatting and cracking jokes while trying to blow off steam from the afternoon. We were almost out of the tree line and into the valley desert. Going down the switchbacks, you want to be careful, especially with a load. Even if it was half that, a brown blur jumped up from the downslope of the switchback. Shit was the only word that came out of my dad's mouth as he slammed on the brakes. Loaded with wood and traveling downhill, there was no way to avoid smashing into the blur. The truck finally ground to a standstill. The four of us peered through the windshield, nobody saying a word. Illuminated in the yellow glow of the headlights was a crumpled body of a deer. Grumbling and cursing the deer's existence, my dad exited the truck to investigate. Doing as they were told, my brother stayed put in the truck. I didn't listen, following close behind my dad. The truck was fine. We hadn't been traveling fast when we smacked the deer. Just some hair and blood in the grill guard. Hitting a deer really wasn't that unusual. The mountains were full of them. What was unusual was that the deer dropped so quickly. At faster speeds, deer could still be upright and sprinting away to die in the woods after a collision. That last burst of adrenaline dump. This one fell over like a rag doll. Before even approaching the carcass, a deep, foul smell hit us. Deer smell bad when they're alive, but this was on a whole other level. It was the smell of decay and rot. My stomach began to turn as we got closer. My nostrils were burning. Coming up on the deer, it was clearly dead. Really, really dead. The stench was so overwhelming, my eyes were watering. The body was a true horror scene. The deer's eyes were gone replaced with a sunken, hollow hole, as if to overcompensate for their absence. The tongue was swollen and black as coal. It could not be contained and hung out the side of its mouth. The underbelly was split open, entrails and offal spilled into the dirt. In the dim headlights, it looked as though as the deer's fur and viscera were moving, wiggling almost. Holding my breath, I bent down for a closer look and my heart stopped. The deer, inside and out, was covered in maggots. It was dead all right, but our truck didn't kill it. Clearly, it had been dead for days, if not weeks. I backed away, retching. That electric anxiety came screaming back. My dad was always the quiet, stoic type, but right now, even in the dim headlights of the truck, I could see the abject horror in his face. His gaze wasn't on the deer, but focused down the mountain. Poorly masking the fear in his voice, he told me firmly to walk back to the truck and get inside. I obeyed without objection. As I grabbed the door handle, a loud shriek came out of the trees. Branches were shattering and breaking. Something was heading up the slope towards us. I slammed my door just as my dad reached the truck. Before his door was shut, he pressed on the accelerator. The truck launched forward, sending us over the deer carcass and racing downhill. With mine and my brothers yelling, it was hard to tell that the shrieking was following us. Our truck popped out of the tree line and into the desert sagebrush. Once out of the woods, 
Everything quietened down. We were left with only the rumble of the engine and wind through the half-open windows. Pulling into our property, the truck came to a stop. We sat in silence. No one moved to leave the truck. Everyone started talking at once. We all had questions. What was that screaming? How does a dead deer jump uphill in front of a truck? There was no way the truck killed it. My dad just shook his head and motioned for us to quiet down. That deer was dead when we hit it. It didn't jump out in front of us. It was thrown at us. We stared at him. He explained that all day up on the mountain, he had felt uneasy. Not wanting to worry us boys, he kept it to himself. He described it like walking into a stranger's living room while they were upstairs asleep. That feeling never left him. And as twilight came, he happened to catch a shadow in the corner of his eye, not far into the woods, and saw figures moving from tree to tree. He couldn't focus on them long enough for a good look before they dodged behind the trees. His stomach dropped. Working hard to keep his composure, he hurried us to the truck to leave. It was after hitting the deer and discovering it was long dead that my dad pieced together what was happening. Something threw that deer to get us to stop. Before the shrieking began, he could hear something moving in the darkness beyond the road. It was a trap. Running back to the truck could have started an ambush or trigger a prey drive, so we walked back to the truck. The second we were inside, he drove that truck downhill with no intention of stopping for anyone or anything. That feeling of electricity didn't disappear until we hit the county highway. My brothers and I never saw anything as we drove away, but those screams from the forest will never leave my mind. We didn't gather firewood the rest of the season. For the first time in his life, my dad just bought what we needed. And although we started to gather wood again the next season, we've never been back up to that particular mountain. The Forest Service has permanently closed and reclaimed that road. The only way back up into those woods is a long hike, one I'm not interested in ever taking. Whatever was on that mountain... Whatever threw that deer carcass, whatever chased us out of the woods, it did not want us there. It wanted us gone, or worse, it wanted us dead. I have a story to share that has really traumatized me for quite a while now, and I feel this is a good place to share. For context, it's important that I state that I'm from Aotearoa, New Zealand. We do have the odd missing person or scary case, but it's otherwise safe here, and not much happens. I mean that in a way that as a 19-year-old girl, I feel comfortable to walk the streets at night or go on hikes alone because it's pretty safe and everyone looks out for one another, generally. This happened in the summer of 2019. My boyfriend and I were headed out on a picnic date spot we'd visited before plenty of times, Karakariki Track. It's at the end of a very long, windy rural farm road off the state highway, so you drive like 15 to 20 minutes from the main road down a long farm stretch, and at the end is a large cul-de-sac and surrounding massive farm. The owners of the farm had left the land kind of open to the public as a reserve because there are native trees and other things, and because about a 15 minute walk from the cul-de-sac slash car park, there's a small waterfall you can swim in. The track is really popular as it's one of the closest swimming spots to the nearest city, and it's really scenic. You cross footbridges and pass by creek beds and that kind of thing. The farmers still go through every now and then and do their farm work, and there are fenced off areas that the public can't enter as they still actively work the land. This particular day, my boyfriend and I were happy because it was empty in the parking lot and it was a really hot summer day, so that was really rare. The farmer was crossing the cows through the gate on a quad as we arrived, and he smiled and waved at us. He's an older man and we'd spoken before as we were regular visitors, 
So we set off towards the waterfall. We crossed one footbridge and passed through a big paddock of cows. The track is quite narrow and the creek is right off the edges, so you have to be careful. We saw the waterfall, decided against swimming as we had no towels, and headed back towards the car park. Now on our way back, we decided to go down a little bit of a steep gravel off-ramp on the track that led to a more private tree-covered area right by the creek. Here's where it starts. We were kissing and whatnot. I was laying on my stomach reading a book, and my boyfriend was sitting up playing on his phone, and he was rubbing my back and playing with my hair. We were there for about ten minutes before I turned and glanced up the gravel path, and way up even further on a hill through one of the farmer's gates, I saw a big man on a quad bike who I didn't recognize as one of the farmers, as there's only an old couple who work the land. He was just sitting there, staring at my boyfriend and I, and I don't even want to think about how long he'd been there before we noticed. I told my boyfriend, and as soon as the guy saw we were both looking at him, he opened the gate and started heading down. Now both of us immediately got up to leave, as we did not want to have a conversation with the farmer about us getting freaky on his land, which is what we both assumed would happen. But it was so much worse. This guy came down the gravel track and ran his quad right through the creek. He left it there running in the water and got off. He was talking to himself, saying things along the lines of, Ah, oh, fuck. I've messed up my quad. i fucked my engine over and over before he even got near us. My boyfriend and I were gathering our things to leave at this point, and he starts to head toward us. He didn't even make small talk, which was really strange, because he went straight into saying, Have you guys seen any fish? I'm looking for some fish to kill. My boyfriend tells the guy there's no fish in the creek as it's fresh water, and he's probably best off to catch some eel, and this sends him into a fit and he starts saying, I don't want no fucking eel, I want to kill some fish. I would made it a point to not look the guy in the eyes as I didn't want to draw the conversation towards myself because I was already extremely freaked out and I didn't want him to notice that. My boyfriend is much more of the calm and strong one when it comes to stuff like this, but for a second I did look at the guy and I thought he looked like his face was slightly deformed possibly Bell's palsy, as I work in aged care, and I've seen it a bit and it looked similar. I bent down to tie my shoe up, and when I was standing back up, that's when I saw a pistol on the man's waist. Listen to me close now. This is the first and last time in my entire life I've ever seen a real-life gun. It's incredibly hard to get a firearm in New Zealand, especially after the regulations following the mass shooting in Christchurch. And not only that, he had one pistol on his belt and was waving another one about in his hand while he talked to my boyfriend about wanting to kill some fish. He was aiming it down to the creek every now and again and then swinging it around his finger. My boyfriend gave me this stern look, and stern is the best word for it, because the look spoke a million things to me in that moment, and he nodded his head towards the gravel hill leading back to the track. I grabbed the two bags we had, Fake checked my phone and told the man that our family were waiting for us back at the car park. He completely ignored what I had said and instead said, That's a cool hat you got on. Or something about my hat that was completely irrelevant. So I dismissed myself and said goodbye and made my way to the hill. In my mind, I did not want to look back and see my boyfriend be shot and then a gun at my head. I knew our best bet was getting up this hill onto the narrow path he couldn't ride his quad down and sprinting to the farmer's house. As I'm walking up the hill, this guy says to my boyfriend, That's a real pretty girl you got there. And it was like all the intentions of his I didn't want to believe were confirmed. I felt like I would die. My boyfriend, though, said a quick thank you, we'll be off now, and headed up the hill with me. The guy kept talking on like the conversation hadn't ended even as we headed away and he stood there, gun in hand, watching us leave. As soon as we were around the corner, we sprinted all the way back to the car park where there were ten empty bullet cases. 
We had run into two girls in bikinis just arriving at the spot as we did, and we informed them about everything. They got into their cars and left immediately. We tried to go to the farmer's house to ask if he knew the guy, as we'd never seen him on the land before, but they were not home anymore. As for the gun, it's still so freaky to me as I'd never seen one before. But these pistols look quite old and rusty, and when we discussed the incident on the way home, my boyfriend suggested they were probably handed down to him from someone else. This incident had stuck with me for the past few years, and my boyfriend and I have not been able to return to the spot, which sucks because that's where we had our first date, and it was a really sentimental place for us. I had to drive past the road leading to the track for like a year as I commuted between towns, and it always made me feel sick. I could have lost my life or my partner that day, or so much worse. And I'm always extremely grateful that my boyfriend is the man he is, and was able to steer the guy away from us for us to leave, and to communicate to me through movement to tell me what to do in my freaked out state. He told me after that he was ready to die if he had to, because knowing the guy had been watching us beforehand and complimenting me in the way he did, it was clear that he could have had some scary intentions. It's also made me way more fearful now to travel in the bush alone, which I've done my whole life. Rural Northeast Ohio, an hour and a half southeast of Cleveland. Back in 2020, my wife and I really got into fishing after a small, off-the-grid type vacation. We decided to keep the good vibes going when we returned home by making plans to fish the following week. We decided to head out near where my parents live because there was a large lake that everyone fished at, but I also knew of a small lake just up the way that only a few people knew of. When we arrived at the large well-known spot, it was packed. We tried to find a place to cast in, but after searching for about 20 minutes, I packed up and we just went to the hidden gem of the road. When we arrived, no one was there, and we gave each other a high five and started finding a place to set up. My wife went about a quarter mile away from me and we began casting in. The pond is surrounded by about three miles of wood on each side, and it was nice and peaceful, or so I thought. About 15 minutes into it, my wife waves me over with a scared look on her face. Thinking she's probably hooked something she couldn't pull in, I started jogging down to her. When I arrived, she looked me in the eyes and said, there's a baby crying in the woods and someone's yelling at it. I started to laugh and explain we were the only ones here, but she insisted. We packed up our things as we both felt a bit uncomfortable, and we were just going to call it a day and get out of there. But some weird curiosity took over both of us, and after loading up the car, we both walked into the woods to see if we could find anything. About 20 feet in, we saw a baby shoe, then a few more feet, children's clothes, then a whole camp set up with wet children's clothes everywhere, soaking wet. Toys, socks, shoes then piles of human waste and adult male clothing. We looked at each other and turned to leave when we heard some crazy movement coming from behind us. We turned around and saw something running through the woods to the right of us. We both just took off running as fast as we could. We jumped back into the car and I drove straight to my parents' house. They only live four miles from the spot at most. I ran into the house and explained everything to my dad what happened and he told me I could call the state trooper, who was the only sort of authority in the area, so I did. They just told me they would check it out. Nothing ever came of it. I have no idea if they believed me or not. I never really thought about this again until this past weekend. I visited my parents again for some holiday cookout. My grandparents now live on the same property after some health complications. Right when I was leaving, at about 10 p.m., my grandpa looked me right in the eye and said, Drive safe. There are people in the woods. I asked him what he meant, but he does have dementia coming on, so I was worried this was a flare-up. He then went on to say a few more sentences about people traveling with children through the woods. 
I can't stop thinking about it. When I was a kid, I used to spend my summers in my grandparents' summer home, which was located precisely in the middle of Mountainville, nowhere. Like, there's not even gravel road access to the house. You gotta trek through some pretty dense bush on a pretty steep incline in order to get there. Because I was a kid, one who had no inkling of what internet was, I loved everything about it. Endless exploration, rock climbing, and other danger-seeking opportunities. I convinced my grandfather to build me and my cousin a treehouse, eating the best food known to man, swapping scary stories by a campfire. Everything was awesome. Everything. Except that one time I came across a random well in the middle of the woods. Now, wells in and of themselves can be pretty creepy, but I think this one takes the cake. It looked like something that belonged in a medieval fantasy horror story. It had this really tall, pointy thatched roof, a base of grey, mossy, misaligned stones, and even had a wooden bucket, which didn't strike me as weird at the time, but looking back, the bucket was spiffy clean. It was made of this nice, glossy wood that wasn't chipped or marred in any way. Really, it looked brand new, so that was weird. I remember stumbling upon this well, and instead of being absolutely thrilled to explore it, like my reckless, curious child self would have been, I felt sick, like physically nauseous. I couldn't stand to look at the thing without feeling gross. I had zero desire to go near it. I did go near it because curiosity won out in the end, and I wanted to have a story to tell my cousin, so I went up to it and looked down. Man, I kid you not, this thing had stairs in it. Shiny, wooden spiral stairs leading down to who knows where. For some reason, this scared the piss out of me and I hightailed it out of there real quick. I never told my cousin because I know he would have wanted to go and find it and climb down. And the idea of doing that honestly made me feel like crawling out of my skin. It still does, just thinking about it. Anyway, the real scary part about it is that this random ass well started popping up and still does pop up in my dreams from time to time. Like, it just appears in the middle of whatever dream I'm having. To this day, and I'm an adult now, it still scares the life out of me. To be honest, I don't believe in the supernatural, but I don't think I'll ever be able to overcome this instinctual fear to go down this well, in dream or otherwise. I was driving through eastern Washington on some state roads. There were no rest stops or cities, but I'd done the route enough to know that there were these massive dirt areas every 40 miles where you could park safely away from the road. I decided to call it a night and closed my blinds and laid down to watch something on my phone. After roughly an hour, I hear someone try to open the driver's side door. I haven't heard any vehicles on the road the whole time I parked but I get up to have a peek out of the curtains. As I'm looking out into the blackness of the driver's side window, I hear them try the passenger side door. I peek down from the top of the curtain but can't see anything, so I start the truck and kick on the lights. I'm fairly freaked out at this point, so I'm still not opening the curtains but peeking through the gaps. Nothing, nobody is standing near either of my doors or parked within sight lines. I take a deep breath and close the sleeper curtains too, because for some reason, that's gonna make things better, right? After laying back down and convincing myself that something blew against the truck, and it only sounded like the doors, I hear what sounds like someone trying to pry open the vents on the sleeper. The door handles start clicking again, and the truck starts shifting like someone's climbing on it. I hit the little alarm button in the sleeper, hoping to spook them off but it does nothing but add to the noise of the door handles, fingers tapping and the hiss of air coming out of the suspension. 
and suddenly it stops. A few moments where I can only hear myself breathing and my heart pounding before I hear another truck approach and then drive by. I spent the next few hours waiting for whatever it was to come back, but it never did. In the morning, I couldn't find any footprints or damage to my truck, but on every window were tiny, human-looking handprints, like a toddler had licked their hand and stuck it to my window over and over. My father and I were taking a quick hike just a few miles north of Butte, Montana. It's not absolute wilderness that far outside of Butte, but just a few miles outside. Most towns in Montana means you're way out in the backwoods. It wasn't an unusual day by any means, a warm June afternoon, perfect for a little hike. We were only a mile or so from where we parked when we saw a large trash bag along the trail. I hate litter bugs, especially out in the woods. I intended to haul it back with us and dispose of it properly. When I attempted to lift the bag though, it was heavy, much heavier than I'd anticipated. Curiosity got the better of me and my father, and we split the bag open to see what was inside. I was expecting a dead animal of some sort. It's not totally unusual for someone to dispose of a dead dog or cat in this fashion in this part of the world. Some people out here will poach deer and leave the trimmings like this too. Upon opening the bag, we saw a boot, and then socks, and then pants. We then realized they were attached to human legs. It looked so unreal, like a movie prop, like someone took a saw and cut off a store dummy's legs at the groin. This had to be some sort of a prank, right? It wasn't. I fell backwards and started having a panic attack. Nothing prepares you for something like that. My dad, on the other hand, sprung into action. He immediately closed the bag back up as best as he could, and it started to slowly survey our surroundings. That freaked me out even more. Through my gasps, I asked him what he was looking for. All he said was, There might be someone watching us. Can you imagine stumbling upon a serial killer's dump site, and they're at a distance watching you? That really didn't help my panic. As I tried to calm down, my dad called the Silver Bow County Sheriff and reported what we'd found. Limp-legged, we hiked the mile or so to the road and waited for the cops to show up. The authorities searched the area with cadaver dogs for a week and never found any other pieces of the body or even a scent trail to follow. The sheriff's people even searched our truck and interviewed us to see if we might be responsible. Nothing ever came of the whole incident. Not one single thing. It's been just over ten years, and nobody has any idea who the Lex belonged to or how they got there. No missing persons report that matched up, and DNA from the Lex never showed up on any databases. Butte, Montana has a reputation for being a bit of a rough side, so it's not impossible the guy was a local who ran into trouble. But why wouldn't his family or friends report him missing? Surely someone would have noticed he was gone, or at the very least, legless. I don't think we'll ever know the truth, but someone out there knows what happened, and they aren't too eager to give us the whole story. This was a story when I was younger and braver, and kind of did stupid stuff without thinking. This story is a wild ride, and it's all true. I used to work at a pizza shop down the street from 2pm until they closed. I usually didn't get off until 11 or so at night. I had a car, but was close enough to walk, so I did that most days to save gas. This particular night, I was doing my usual thing, jamming to one of my playlists, tired, but happy to have a good job and just generally happy with the way my life was going. Up ahead, about a block from my place, I see an attractive guy in dark clothing walking, but not with a purpose really. He was taller than me, maybe 5 foot 10 or 6 foot or so, and he had shaggy brown hair. 
The closer I got to him, the more I could tell he was really good looking. Like, even in the dark of night, I was starting to get excited. His features kind of escaped me now, but I do remember he had very thick eyebrows. I took one earbud out, and because I'm from a dangerous city and haven't really cared about stranger danger, I decided to talk to him, maybe even flirt a bit. How's your late night going? It's good. Just looking to get drunk, he says. Oh, that I can help with. I've got a mini bar at my place. I live just down the street. That was, not verbatim, how the conversation went. During the walk back to my place, I got no red flags from this guy. He seemed totally normal, and I was honestly thinking, well, just through sheer luck, I met a really handsome guy, and he seems cool and fun. I was beside myself, really. So, we get to my apartment on the second floor. I jump into host mode and offer him to have a seat and make himself comfortable. The apartment is about 640 square feet, so it's very small, except for the bathroom. You can't see the rest of the apartment from any area. I head into the kitchen, and while I'm pouring drinks, I glance back over at him. It was then that I noticed the first red flag. As I was asking him questions, he's more delayed with his answers, especially more so than he just was on our walk there. It was just odd to me. I go back over to the couch, pass him his drink, and sit down next to him. So what do you do for work? I asked. Oh, I'm not here for sex. He puts his drink down on the table. What do you mean? I'm not after sex either, I respond. He stands up. What do you got? He asks me. His nice vernacular and friendly face are now gone. I'm having a hard time processing what he means by this. I said, what you got? The second I stand up, he pushes me back. I fly across the room, hitting the floor, but not hard enough to pass out or anything. I get right back up, but he's already grabbed my laptop and my work bag. As I start towards him, he cuts around me and makes his way towards the front door. I'm right behind him when he makes it outside. I manage to grab a hold of him and we tussle again in front of the door. Now I shout out, calling on help from the neighbors. It's late at night, so no one comes. I'm shouting, please help, I'm being robbed. The thing is, he has my laptop. It's not just any laptop. I hate to admit it, but my entire life was on that laptop at the time. Important photos that I'd not backed up. Thousands of dollars of music programs, video game programming stuff for a development team I helped, really expensive software and other stuff. It was, in my mind, irreplaceable. I give chase down the stairs, across the dog walk park, and as I start to gain on him, we tussle again and the only thing I can focus on is my laptop. I knew that I had to, at any cost, get my laptop back. That was absolutely all I cared about. Somehow I get a grip on my laptop. I tug at it again, and I guess he decides I'm not worth all of this struggle. He gets up and starts to take off again. I now realize he still has my work bag. It has my cell phone and wallet in it. I take off towards him again, and this time, he shouts back at me. Follow me, and I'll stab you again. This makes me stop in my tracks, and he gets away, underneath a street lamp, along the sidewalk. I immediately inspect myself. Was I stabbed? No way, there's no way. Then I see blood running down my leg. I see blood on my arm. Two places where he cut me good. I'm scared, but the blood makes it look worse than it is. I decide that's enough. I got my laptop, and that's all I really wanted anyway. I hobble back home and get inside and lock my door. I called the police using my neighbor's phone the next day and filed a police report, explaining the situation, showing the stab wounds and declining medical service. I can't afford that, and I was fine all things considered. So, all that guy got was a shitty cell phone and a wallet with like 30 to 40 dollars in it. The cop called my friend back several days later and said they were not able to find the guy and that he would keep me posted.
This was years ago, so I don't know where the robber is now, but I have every electronic thing of importance backed up on multiple drives. This happened about a year ago. I was living in Barrio Logan in San Diego at the time. My place was the side entrance of a duplex, and the house was right next to a park. One night at around 11pm, I was playing Call of Duty. I had my front door open and the screen door locked to help cool down the house. As I was playing with my friends, I heard screaming outside but thought it was just my game. I then heard it again, followed by a female scream. My friends over my headset pointed it out and asked me what was going on in my house. I replied to them that I thought it was the game. Nothing is happening in my home. I got up and checked outside. Right across the street, there was a man shoving a woman around the street and punching her while she was screaming. She pulls out her phone and he grabbed it and threw it across the road at my fence. He never saw me. He then runs around the corner and she goes the opposite way. I run out and catch her around the corner and I try to help her out. She kept walking and blankly stared at me over her shoulder. I asked her if she had somewhere to go and she didn't reply. I asked her if she needed help and with that she replied with, Go away, in a shaky voice. I was going to turn back to my house when the man whips around the corner and starts screaming at me. He starts telling me that I'm getting into something that I don't need to be in. I got a weird feeling off that guy. He then puts his hand under his shirt and asks if I'm trying to get shot. I backed off and said, Hey, I'm sorry. Wasn't trying to get in someone's business. I just saw her crying and asked if she was okay, but I'll let you handle it. I walk past him to go back home and he starts walking behind me. I started sprinting and sprinted all the way around the block, took the back entrance to the alley and went inside. I called the police and five minutes later, five squad cars zoomed by my home. I'm not sure if they caught the guy or not. Hey everyone, before I begin, this has been reported to local police with as much detail as possible. I have been searching for several hours on who to reach out to, or how to put into words something I went through this evening. Tonight, my girlfriend and I were heading home from a picnic at a local park. As we drove away from the park and approached the stop sign, I noticed that there was a car parked at the stop sign. I remember thinking to myself that it seemed really odd. We pulled up to the car and stopped, and when I looked over, I saw a man, his wrists tied together a terrifying expression on his face, as if he was screaming or crying for help. I froze and asked my girlfriend if she'd seen what I did, being as we pulled just forward from the car. She asked what I saw, turned around, and he was still there, wrists together on his steering wheel, staring and making eye contact with her. We both panicked, asking, Do we call 911? Do we circle back around? trying to make sense of what we just saw, and I think it hit both of us at the same time, when we realized that it was most likely a tactic to lure us closer to his car. I know I've personally read multiple stories of possible trafficking tactics happening in my country. I'm lucky to have seen these and knew to get away as soon as I could. Sure enough, when we drove off, he followed us for about a half a mile until we got to a busier road and lost him. I have been in a state of fear and confusion and panic ever since. It may seem like an overreaction, but I have, number one, never been in a fearful situation such as this, and number two, never seen someone tied up before, in possible danger. I guess I'm looking for reassurance, wondering if anyone out there had been in the same or similar situation. I'm really shaken up by this, and I'm truly baffled that we live in a world where this happens. Stay safe, everyone.
I got married too young and then divorced when I was 23. A few months went by and I started having these nightmares. Long story short, a girl in a white dress with brown hair matted with leaves and dirt walks into my house, tracking muddy footprints. She stops and stares at the attic stairs, which are down for some reason. I ask her why she's there. She screams and the whole house crumbles. I never saw her face. I had this nightmare almost every night for three months, and when I say almost every night, I mean probably 95% of the time. For some reason, I started sleeping in my living room as opposed to the bedroom. I just wasn't comfortable in there. So I'm sleeping on my couch one night and wake up at around 2am for no reason. I check my phone and see that I have a text from my friend and respond. I started getting very uncomfortable and then I heard a knock at my door. I walk around and peek out the window and there's a girl there. I can't see anything other than her white hoodie which is up and long dark hair coming out of it. She knocks and then knocks again, not urgently or anything, but she didn't appear intent on leaving. So stupidly I crack open the door. In a quiet voice she asks if she can use my cell. I still can't really see her face because my porch light was out and I'd been putting off changing the light bulb for no reason at all. I ask if everything's okay, and she just repeats she needs to use the phone. Again, against my better judgment, I put my cell phone to the dial screen and hand it to her. I see her hit a few things and put the phone to her ear, and the screen light gave me a better view of her face. She was younger, somewhere between 18 to 22, plain, Nothing particularly distinguishing in any way. She waits for a minute, then says, Hey, I need your help. I need your help. Yeah, okay. Then hands me the phone. So I look at my phone, and it's still on the dial screen. Something felt weird to me, so I clicked over to the recent calls, and she hadn't called anyone. When I look up, she was gone. Not quite vanished but like way, way down the street, farther than anyone should have been able to cover in that time frame, walking away. After that, the nightmare stopped. Potentially related, two months later I got a call from a friend late at night, who was like, hey, you want to come over for a beer? I wasn't doing anything, so I did. I got back at about 1am, and my house had been broken into, totally trashed with a bunch of valuables gone. I certainly don't think my friend had anything to do with that, but I sometimes wonder if that girl was casing my house that night. It's the only correlation I can make between the dream stopping and real world explanations for that weird experience. The whole thing was just really weird. As a kid, I lived in the camper in the woods on my grandma's huge-ass property. I have no idea how much land she owned, but it was huge. Not the little kid version of, wow this is huge, but actually huge. My grandma had a farm, including cows. A storm shut down the power, which shut down the electric fence and a cow got out. So the next day, my teenage cousins come up to go find the cow and a little six-year-old me put on some snow boots and went with them. Again, this place is huge. We walked around for hours. Sometimes we would find what we thought might have been tracks, but they would just stop. Eventually we get to a part where none of us had ever been. We weren't allowed because it was a really unruly creek. You slip and you'd probably never be found. We were about to turn and give up when we saw a cow grazing. I was like, this isn't the cow we're looking for. How did this get here? We get closer, and this thing is wild, like borderline feral. It was not grazing on grass, but the cow we were looking for. Obviously, we booked it back to the house, thinking this cannibal cow was going to absolutely kill us. Like, they can't even do that, right? We tell my grandma what we found, and we thought she'd call us crazy, but her and my cousin's dad said, was it almost completely black? 
Yes, it was hard to tell because it was filthy, but I think so. Turns out there was a storm a couple of years ago where a cow got out and they never found it. They assumed something got in the woods and ate it. They figured that's what happened to this cow too, but they let us go looking anyways for funsies. Well, it was getting eaten in the woods by the other cow. They went to try and find it and the dead cow. They found the carcass. The cow had been struck by lightning and was dead before the cannibal cow ate it. And it didn't eat much of it at all, but to us kids, it looked like a lot. Anyways, that's the first time I saw a dead cow, and the first and only time I saw a cow eating another one. I have no idea what happened to the cannibal cow. Oh, also, on the same property, five people were murdered. Also, that's not the first time an animal got hit by lightning. My grandma had a blind pony that was blinded because it was hit by lightning. Mostly blind anyways. I think it could kind of see still. It died years later due to age and going deaf. And it fell down a hill and died. The summer of 2008 was a rough time to graduate from college. I just spent four years getting a degree, only to find out that the job market had all but dried up. As bummed out as I was about being unemployed for the foreseeable future, I found a deep appreciation for backcountry camping and hiking that summer. Growing up in the Rocky Mountains and graduating from a college in western Montana, I was not a stranger to hiking or camping. But that summer, it became an escape to the point of an obsession. Going on daily hikes and camping beneath the stars really helped my mental health while I worried about my life's purpose and my future. It was June and unseasonably cold, wet, and cloudy. The daytime highs barely touched 50 degrees, and at night, it dropped below freezing. Despite the weather, I planned to hike around the Anaconda Range that week, and I wasn't going to let that deter me. My plan for the week, funnily enough, was hike from Storm Lake over Storm Lake Pass and down to Upper Seymour Lake. Storm Lake is a challenge to get to and requires a 4x4 pickup and some driving skills. The road is a narrow two-track, winding its way through thick pine forests. The way was slick with rain, but I made it to the top with little heartburn. I set up camp on the north shore of the lake and decided to do some fishing. The fishing was miserable. It was cold and nothing was biting. The best thing about bad fishing is that my thoughts were free to wander while I sat on the shore. The rain was a constant light drizzle and created a natural white noise. Time passed and my daydreams were cut short as a low rumble from up the canyon overtook the sound of the rain. The rumbling was not unlike a distant diesel engine. There are no roads that go beyond where I was camped. No machinery or vehicles could be up that canyon. Maybe it's a plane, I thought, looking up into the rain clouds. But the sound wasn't getting closer or farther away. And the sound wasn't above me. It came from beyond the lake and up into the canyon. The sound was stationary and constant. This was most certainly not a plane, or a truck, or a bulldozer. All of this wasn't outright scary, but nonetheless, my hair stood on end while I sat there listening. After twenty minutes, the rumbling faded away, and I was left again with only the sound of raindrops. Soon enough, I caught a decent-sized trout, cleaned it, and headed back to camp to get ready for dinner. The fish cooked up fine, but to be honest, I hate trout. It's edible, sure, but totally unappetizing. They taste like mud. I ate as much as I could stand and tossed the rest into the lake. Building up my fire for the night, I sat back to enjoy the evening with a bit of whiskey. Night came fast. The mountain ridges put the sun to bed early and the rain clouds obscured the starlight. It was dark, really dark. The sounds of crackling warm fire and the rain bouncing off my tent were a great comfort and it was starting to lull me to sleep. I reminded myself I needed to build up the fire before bed. I walked over to my pile of scavenged firewood and grabbed an armful. 
it was growing louder than before, and closer. I may have had a few too many pulls of whiskey and was tired and grouchy. This noise was ruining my camping trip and my buzz. Frustrated, I yelled into the blackness of the night, Hey, shut the fuck up, asshole. Like a switch being flipped, the rumbling stopped, and so did the rain. My heart skipped a beat. I realized that was not a convenient coincidence. There was an intelligence out there, something sentient, observing me and responding to my screams, and I wasn't getting the most positive vibes from it. I threw all the logs on the fire and retreated back to my tent. More on edge than ever, I just sat there, listening, listening to the fire crackling, to my rapid breathing, and beyond that, to the silence of the darkness. Before this moment, I had felt alone but safe. Now I felt alone and vulnerable. Beyond where the light faded, I felt there were a million eyes in the dark watching me. My paranoia began to subside when the rain suddenly started again. Not a drizzle, but a massive downpour. I was glad I'd built up the fire, or it would have been snuffed out for sure. My tent was being pushed down by the force of the storm. I thought about bailing to the truck, but I knew I'd be soaked to the bone instantly. Risking injury or death over getting wet is the kind of logic only whiskey can produce. I could feel the rainwater pooling and moving under my tent. This storm wasn't letting up. The urge to get in the pickup and drive away was even more tantalizing. I could get my stuff tomorrow in the daylight and spend a few nights in town, but I'd had a bit too much to drink. Driving, especially on that slick, muddy two-track road, would have been a death sentence, but I still needed a safer place to sleep than my wimpy tent. Grabbing what I could, I ripped open the tent flaps and ran for the truck. I was soaking wet by the time I settled into the driver's seat and locked the doors. Turning the heat on full blast, I hoped that would dry me out. It was going to be a miserable night, though. I reclined my chair and tried to calm my thoughts with deep breaths. The rain wasn't letting up. I was warm from the heater, and I was riding the crest of a good whiskey buzz. The fire was still raging despite the rain, and kept the campsite well lit. I remember the truck's clock reading 1.06 a.m. I blinked. It was only a moment, but when I opened my eyes, the rain had stopped. It was foggy and quiet. The once raging campfire was just embers, and there was morning twilight to the east. The truck's clock now read 5.45 a.m. It was morning. That couldn't be right. Almost five hours gone in the blink of an eye. I must have passed out. My head was killing me. I didn't feel like I drank that much to justify that kind of hangover. I turned off the truck and stepped out to survey the night's damage. My tent was completely flattened. The tent poles were shattered to pieces. Everything was soaking wet. Smothering the remains of the fire, I dragged all my junk to the pickup and tossed it into the bed. My hike over the pass wasn't going to happen, that was for sure. It was around 6.30 a.m. before I finished packing up my camp. As I climbed into the cabin of my truck, I heard the rumbling again through the morning fog. I drove out of there as fast as I could down that muddy bobsled track of a road, not once looking in the rearview mirror once. I have never been back to Storm Lake. I probably never will. So, before I get into this, I need to throw a disclaimer out there that I was 18 years old when this event took place. I've never done hard drugs in my life, I don't drink alcohol, and I started smoking weed when I was 22. Also, there were three other teenagers with me that night who were also sober and witnessed this as well. So, my friend and I were hanging out with two of her guy friends Friday night after school and the plans were that we were having a sleepover at my friend's house. We were just hanging around town, 
Nothing much to do in a small Georgia town but walk around the town square and go to the trails. Well, after shooting the shit for a couple of hours, we got hungry and ordered a pizza for pickup. We got the pizza and drove to a pretty quiet neighborhood where one of the guys lived. The neighborhood was kind of tucked away into a forest, so it was really quiet and really dark in that area of town. As we were sitting there outside, eating pizza, using the hood of the car as a makeshift table, I looked up and saw what looked like a large, pitch-black mass that resembled a primate in shape and movement, swinging high in the trees that had to be a good 800 feet away from us. Even from that distance in the night, it looked so huge. But that made no sense as we live in a small town in Georgia. There are no large primates here. I alerted everyone to this figure in the trees, and we were all baffled and amazed at what we were seeing. I remember just having this sense of dread washing over me as I looked at this figure, trying to make sense of what I'm seeing. Then, it seemed like it noticed us. We couldn't see any distinct features, and the figure was pitch black, but somehow, you just knew it was watching you. Suddenly, this shadowy black figure stood tall, and you could almost see it shifting before your eyes as it began to resemble more closely the shape of a large man holding onto a branch with one arm, just staring at us with unseen eyes. Everyone was frozen, so still and so quiet. It seemed like the sounds of the night froze in place with us. We were just transfixed on this dark figure in the trees. Then, this creature crouched over, and as it did, its shoulders seemed to stretch impossibly higher, reaching over its head. All of us were in shock and terrified at seeing this, maybe a little in denial as what we were seeing was defying any logical explanation because you want this to make sense. And then, this creature's shoulders, for lack of a better word or a better way to explain this, seemed to just grow into these huge wings. Then this dark figure jumped off the branch and flew off. I knew what I was seeing was real, because when that happened, we all ran into the car without talking, just screaming as fast as possible, and we sped away from there. We were all freaking out, trying to find any logical reason that could explain what we had just witnessed, but there was none. Needless to say, no one slept that night. We were all too terrified that maybe that thing would follow us back to my friend's house. I should also mention that this was back in 2010, so there were no good camera phones to capture whatever we saw back then. My grandpa was born in the last years of the 19th century and spent his entire life living in rural Idaho as a farmer and rancher. He had tons of old cowboy stories he would tell us grandkids. Most of them were funny, some were cautionary, but a few were downright creepy. When my grandpa was six years old, he, along with his older brother and a gang of kids from nearby farms, decided to go ice skating for the day. At that time, my great-grandpa was working as a ranch hand, and the family lived near Chesterfield, Idaho. It was a bright and sunny January day in 1902, and though the temperature was low, the sun kept things somewhat warm. They had hitched sleighs to their horses and headed down to the Portneuf River to ice skate. There were eight kids altogether, and they were excited to show off their new skates for Christmas. Along with my grandpa and his brother, there were three Robinson kids, Tommy Bayer and Gooch twins. The best spot to skate was next door to the Gooch's ranch. The river was broad and shallow, so the ice tended to be thicker, and if they did fall through, they would just get their legs wet. The kids spent a couple of hours skating when a loud scream came from a willow bush on the riverbank opposite them. The kids could only watch as a giant man covered head to toe in thick black fur, came lumbering out of the bushes. It was carrying a large tree branch and was screaming in rage at the kids. They fled towards the sleighs, trying to scramble up the riverbank in their skates. 
My grandpa, being the youngest, was at the back of the rush. He couldn't get a foothold because of the skates and fell backwards towards the ice. The giant was now crossing the river towards them, screaming and swinging his branch. My grandpa was sure this creature was going to eat him. As my grandpa tells it, Lady Luck smiled down on me that day by the river, because as the giant was midway across the river, the ice gave way. It only submerged its shins, but was slowed down considerably as it tried to get back on top of the ice. This gave my grandpa's brother enough time to jump down and cut the laces off my grandpa's skates. They left the skates and dashed up the riverbank and jumped onto the sleigh. As they looked back, this giant man was cresting the riverbank. To their utter relief, it didn't chase the sleighs. It just stood there hollering at the kids and swinging his tree branch. The kids were able to make it back to the Gooch Ranch, where they told their encounter to John Gooch, the twins' grandfather. Word quickly spread in the tiny farming community, and soon a posse was formed to hunt down the beast. Where the kids had been skating, there were footprints found almost two feet in length. My grandpa's skates were found near the tracks. They had both been bent in half like horseshoes. The tracks headed west into the nearby mountains. The posse followed them as far as they could, but deep snow prevented their travel any farther. The creature was never sighted in that area again. This story captivated the small community, and soon word traveled across the country of the... Idaho wild man. That spring, my grandpa decided to buy a ranch in the Little Lost River Valley farther north in Idaho. My grandpa had many other weird and creepy backwoods stories, but he always said that this encounter frightened him the most. He was sure he would have been killed if that giant hadn't broken through the ice and given his brother a chance to cut his laces. Right around high school graduation, I was sitting in the living room at 1 or 2 a.m. when I saw headlights and heard a thud. I cracked the front door and there was a car outside. It appeared as though they might have hit my truck. As I started to open the door, they sped off. I checked the truck the following morning, but nothing looked obviously damaged. I went to work at my cashier job and my co-workers were talking about an armed robbery and a taxi driver that was killed with a handgun overnight. Pretty scary, I thought. About a month later, one of my mom's friends who happened to work for the county asked me to look at my truck very closely and call her if I found anything. I told her later that after closer inspection, yes, there was a small crack to the plastic rim around the driver's side taillight and I told her about the car that probably did it. She explained to me that the detectives had arrested a group of teenagers while investigating the cabbie murder, and that during the interviews, they mentioned stealing a car and bumping into a truck while joyriding, before robbing a gas station at gunpoint and ending the life of a taxi driver. About two weeks ago, my wife and I had some friends over, and someone mentioned a Facebook story about a cabbie getting robbed at gunpoint. Someone else mentioned the murder, so I shared my story. My wife then added that we both could have died that night because she was the gas station clerk that got robbed. I knew that something bad had happened to her around that time and that she never talks about it much. It's such a scary and odd coincidence to me that before we were even together, we were in the path of that same violent crime spree. This didn't happen to me, but to my parents. My mom going off the deep end on a crazy train isn't that out of character, but my dad doesn't do that ever, and he swears the story is legit. When I was around two-ish, my mom woke up from a nightmare and she woke my dad up. He tried going back to sleep, and she told him not to, because his mom was going to call soon. She was going to tell him that someone they knew had been decapitated in some kind of fashion. My dad, of course, thought this was nonsense, 
but my mom was hysterical over it, so he couldn't sleep. Sure enough, a few minutes later, the phone was ringing. It was his mom letting him know that his friend and his friend's little brother's girlfriend had both died in a car crash, coming home from a party about three miles away from us. My dad's mom and their family were very close, and my grandma and the mother from that family were lifelong friends and died just six months or so apart. Anyway, I later learned that my dad's friend had been decapitated when he lost control in his ragtop Camaro. He hit a tree, flipped the car upside down, and slid a ways down the road. Neither he nor his younger brother's girlfriend were wearing seatbelts. This would have been back in maybe 1981-ish. I worked as a maintenance guy which means at times I gotta be there at odd hours to perform inspections with fire guys. I had a property that was about 60 miles away and needed a fire alarm to go off at 5am prior to tenant arrival. It's the day before, about 5pm. I take my car on the street in front of my house. The weather had recently shifted tempos, so all my tires were reading warning. It's a dual exhaust car and it's running so I can use this piece of shit compressor. Think like cheap Walmart cigarette lighter air pump. It struggles to add 5 PSI. It's taking time. There's a light breeze, but it's only helping to push my car exhaust into my face. This whole time I'm near the pump and tire being inflated, so I spend a lot of time crouched or sat on the curb. I take this time to reiterate that this entire time, I said I was about 20 minutes, but I don't know for sure time got wonky. My car is running and I can smell the exhaust. It stinks but I'm outside. The tires after an eternity are good. I'm ready for my journey in the morning. I'll be leaving at 4am. I set my alarm for 3. I finished the night. It was unremarkable. I conversed with my wife. I got pity for having to wake up stupid early. The usual. So... I've already fucked up, as now in the story, nobody has a clue that I'm walking dead. The alarm goes off at 3am, I fumble with it, stopping it, and in my attempt to get out of bed, I flat out fell, crushing a hamper. While I'm on the floor, my wife wakes to that noise, and all she hears is, ow, and then I get up and stumble to the bathroom. She laughed off my stupidity and went back to sleep. I took a shower and I felt like I was drunk as shit. Must just be tired, I think. I'll shake it off when I start getting going. My memory of all of this gets spotty, so I'm using what I was told as well just for context. I got in the car, backed out the driveway, ran over a trash can. I think, shit, I must not be okay. I pulled back into the garage, closed the door, car off and all that. The trash can out in the street is on its side. I go inside the bed, lay down, and I'm out like a light. My wife assumed that I called in sick when I came back in. Surmised from the fall out of bed thing, I wasn't having a great morning. So a couple of hours go by. She wakes up and leaves for work. I'm still just out. I've worked at this place now for about five years. I have a strong working relationship with my co-workers. We all know each other's spouses and kids' names. I get a text that somehow wakes me from my sleep, and I manage to respond via text to my property manager. She read it and was calling me immediately. I wish I still had the text, but it was basically gibberish with autocorrect lending a hand, and she knew something was off. So she called me. I picked up and we spoke for a second or two, and then she hung up on me. So I'm like, She's mad or something, whatever. Back to sleep I go. I just really wanted to sleep. But now it's probably around 9am. My wife comes back home and tries to wake me up. It's not effective. I got really spotty here, but she basically helped me to the car and I remember her fucking slamming gears. We both drove manuals and she was hammered down. I was calm. 
I just wanted to keep sleeping. So tired. So fucking tired. We got to the ER. No wait for this guy. Straight to a room, oxygen covering my face. IV in. They kept telling me I need to stay awake, but sleep was right there. I dozed off so many times, I was being scolded by the doctors. I remember being confused, like what did I do bro? Stop talking down to me, I'm just trying to take a little nap. I'm not sure exactly how severe it was, but based on the look on their faces, it didn't seem like a sure thing I'd be leaving out the same doors I came in. I remember being concerned and so tired, so very tired. This entire experience carves a gigantic black spot in my memory. I've had to piece it together from broken memory and accounts from my wife. I know had I not been taken to the hospital, I'd still be sleeping. I have my property manager to thank for calling my wife. She would have been gone for another five to six hours that day. I know I would have been in the bed still, with the broken hamper still under my side. If you made it here, Use this account as a warning. Be aware. People said relatives will have the car on in the garage with open doors. To me, now, it's not worth it. If you smell exhaust, you need to shift position, unwind, move. This wasn't a rapid progression. I was coherent after the damage was done, while my body was still replacing oxygen with poison, suffocating myself from the inside. Be safe out here in this crazy place, strangers. I went on a vacation with my family. We stayed in a hotel slash resort right next to the beach. Every night, my family and me went for a drink or an evening stroll on the promenade. The promenade itself was also filled with a lot of people, especially couples enjoying a beautiful evening walk. On the third day, I couldn't sleep. My brother was still awake, but we had a fight earlier, so I didn't ask him to come on my walk. Now, before you think I was being stupid, it was midnight I think, and still the promenade was filled with people, so I put on some loose pants and a shirt, nothing fancy and I went on a walk. Normally, I'm quite aware of my surroundings, especially at night, but since there was a lot of people around, I put in my earphones and listened to some relaxing music. The walk started off great. I was watching the beautiful nightlife on the promenade and the other resorts. After 30 minutes, I went to sit on a bench to tie my shoelaces. In the corner of my eye, I noticed a man stopping and sitting on the second bench away from me. I didn't find it suspicious yet. I got up and started to walk again, and I noticed that the man got up too and was walking about 20 meters behind me. I slowed down my pace and put my earphones in my pocket. I was getting suspicious, but I wanted to know for sure. Again, I stopped and pretended to search for something on my phone. He stopped as well. The problem with the promenade, it is a long line, so I had to pass the creepy man to get back to my hotel. Since I was still surrounded by people, I felt somewhat safe. In my head, I had the most genius plan to go down to the beach and hide behind one of the beach chairs. The beach was pitch black, and in my mind, this was the best solution. I started to speed up. The creepy man didn't match my pace yet. Then a big group of people passed by, and I made a run to the beach and hid. Thirty seconds later, I saw him looking from the promenade in my direction. He was searching for me. I was hoping he'd give up, but he started making his way towards the beach chairs. That moment, I didn't think, and started running on the beach. Once I was far enough, I went back on the promenade and sprinted, completely soaked in sweat. I stopped in front of my hotel and looked back. I had lost the creepy man. I had rushed back to my room. That was the one and only time I went walking alone. I know I should have asked for help from people around me. So just because you're surrounded by people, 
don't think you're safe. This happened to me last summer, and it still gives me chills to think about. That day, I went to the thrift store with my boyfriend, and as we were heading back home, I suggested we pick up some sushi for dinner at our nearby grocery store. As my boyfriend works night shifts, he was already feeling tired, and suggested that I go to the store while he goes back home. We live in the busy part of our city, where the mall, library, city hall, restaurants, major stores, and everything else are all a couple of minutes away from our home. Not to mention, I live in a relatively safe city with little crime, so I was more than alright with going by myself. Now, I truly wish I hadn't. As we parted ways, I was walking through the parking lot of the grocery store when a stocky man, about six foot five, probably in his early to mid forties, approached me. With a white smile and wider eyes, he said, Wow, you are stunning. I simply thanked him and tried walking away. He cut me off, saying, I've never seen someone as beautiful as you before. I was immediately filled with dread. I looked back, hoping my boyfriend was still in sight. No luck. It may seem like an exaggeration to be wary of a person right off the bat, but having read and watched true crime and horror stories for years, coupled with having extreme social anxiety and being a smaller woman with zero fighting skills, I have always sided with caution. Not to mention with his eyes and smile, he honestly reminded me of a buffer Art the Clown from Terrifier, minus the clown costume and lack of talking. The man roped me into a one-sided conversation, asking me my name and how old I was. I gave him a fake name. I told him I was 19. He laughed and said unnaturally excitedly, That's good. That means you're a true woman now. What the actual fuck? My boyfriend later told me I should have lied and said I was under 18, as this may have made the man uninterested. From the red flags I got from this man, I seriously doubt that. He then stuck his phone out, asking for my number. I refused, saying I had a boyfriend. And, I just want to talk to you, he said. I repeated that I had a boyfriend. It was unnerving how his smile never wavered, despite showing that I wasn't interested. I was like he wasn't understanding, or he just didn't care. He sounded confused, but still grinning, he stepped towards me and asked, So you don't want to cheat on your boyfriend? As if to say, what do you mean you don't want to go out with a scary ass man that's double your age? Speechless, I stepped back and gave pleading looks to the people walking in and out of the grocery store. After the last time I refused, his smile suddenly dropped while he placed his hand on my back, saying in a now cold, firm tone, Come on, I have a nice car I can drive you around in. Let's check out one of these restaurants. Seeing a person's entire demeanor change with a flip of a switch was something I only saw in the movies or on TV shows, and seeing it in this situation fucking terrified me. Going into panic mode, I somehow found the courage to push myself off of him and almost shouted, Sorry, I really have to go buy my groceries. Noticing that people were staring at us, his sick smile reappeared and said with a low voice, All right then, I'll see you later. I practically ran into the store with so much relief. I glanced back, hoping to see him get into his car and try getting his license plate number, only to see the man just standing in the middle of the parking lot, leering at me. Shit. I called my boyfriend in the store, but it kept going to voicemail. I figured he was sleeping, and I was seriously scared to walk back home. I managed to calm myself down in the store, figuring the man must be long gone. Yet I was on high alert the entire walk home. It was starting to get dark, but I figured if I just stayed cautious and walked quickly, I would be fine. I couldn't be more wrong. When I was approaching the crosswalk that led to my street, I heard a car pulling up to the sidewalk, 
followed by a sickeningly familiar voice barking, Hey, hi, hey, hi. My heart dropped into my stomach. I glanced sideways at the car, with his unmistakably now malicious looking grin plastered on his face. The man's upper body was leering out of his car window as if he was trying to reach out to me. Oh fuck. Oh fuck. He tauntingly called out, So where's your boyfriend? while cackling. From everything I've learned from true crime and horror stories, I figured it was best to not acknowledge the man. My mind racing while trying to appear composed, I knew I couldn't lead him to my house, and turning back to go to the mall or stores may have given away that I was terrified and trying to escape. Bless whoever designed my neighborhood, as the city's rec center was conveniently right next to my complex. I ignored him and casually crossed the street, quickening my pace as I headed into the rec center. I tried not to look back, scared that I would see the man running up on me with his wide grin. But I made it into the rec center and finally looked behind me. I assumed the man would have followed me in or waited for me in his car. Instead, he sped away down a street opposite from my house. With so much relief, I called my boyfriend who woke up to my call. I was on the verge of breaking down but managed to fill him in on everything. He rushed to the rec center and after he calmed me down, we walked home. My boyfriend asked if I got the man's license plate number, to which I felt like a fucking idiot. Not only was it too dark, but I was too consumed with fear for my own life that it didn't even cross my mind at the time. At the very least, I called the police, giving them a description of the man and the make and model of his car. They said they would do what they could, but I haven't heard back from them. I haven't seen the man since, not in person at least, but I still see that man's smile in my dreams, haunting me for countless nights, plaguing my mind. Thinking about every sadistic, glaring look he had in his car reminds me that he was overjoyed to realize that I was alone and vulnerable, that my seemingly safe city isn't as safe as I thought. At the same time, I felt so grateful that the man never found out where I lived, but for all I know, he could be lurking around, trying to harm other women like he tried to that night he almost trailed me home. For mine and the women in my city's sake, I hope I don't have to find out. While still in the depths of Arctic winter, with the equinox approaching the day slash night cycle becoming more even, my flight to the slope was delayed due to a large blizzard which shut down the dead horse and Kaparuk airstrips. I spent three days waiting in Anchorage until the storm cleared and we were able to fly. Landing at the Kaparuk airstrip, it was evident the blizzard was more severe than we had initially thought. While whiteout blizzards are common, actual snow accumulation is not. This storm, though, was a monster. Snowdrifts several stories tall ran up against the camp housing. Our work trucks and equipment were completely covered in snow and it took a full day of digging to get them out. As soon as the trucks were free, we were off to our first job assignment. No time to rest in the oil field. Traveling anywhere after a storm this size is a nightmare. To get to the work site, we had a bulldozer escort us, breaking up any remaining drifts as we went. The dozer cleared our work area around the well house, and we began to rig up our equipment. It took little time and soon we were back to the normal humdrum life of arctic oil well maintenance. Over the radio, we got a call from the bulldozer operator as he left that he'd seen a giant black animal headed in our direction. He couldn't tell if it was a wolf or a big dog, but it was massive and moving erratically. In the winter, many animals aren't active on the slope. Caribou, musk oxen and foxes or the usual wildlife you'll encounter out in the snow. The animals keep to themselves for the most part, but you learn very quickly to never look the animals in the eyes if they approach you. 
This goes doubly for the white foxes, and I advise you to do the same. The grizzlies are hibernating, male polar bears are hunting on the sea ice, while the females are denned up with new cubs. Wolves aren't unheard of, but rarely leave the Brooks Range Mountains a couple hundred miles to the south. Whatever the operators saw, we would keep watch, but it wasn't our problem. It was a problem for the bear police. We went about our work, albeit cautiously. It's interesting to note that oil companies on the slope have private security officers who, besides being private law enforcement, also try to minimize encounters with wildlife. We refer to them as the Bear Police, which is a cute name for a rather dangerous part of their job. These security officers are the only personnel on the North Slope that carry firearms, outside of regular law enforcement, of course. Their primary job when encountering large predators is to harass them until they leave. This is done with beanbag guns or loud noises at first. When that fails, or the animal is unusually aggressive, lethal force is needed. We had settled into our work and forgot about the wolf or dog or whatever it was. I needed to take a leak. I got out of the truck and walked behind the well house to take care of business. My crewmate came over the radio telling me to get back into the truck. There was a wolf coming out from behind the well house where I'd just been and he was pacing after me. I didn't look behind me. I just ran back and jumped into the truck. I'm not taking my chances, even if it was a crewmate practical joke. Once inside, I looked out, and sure enough, trotting towards the truck was a large, black, male wolf. He approached our trucks and sat down in the snow in front of us. This wolf looked rough, even by wild animal standards. The right side of his face was mutilated and deformed, missing his right eye and most of his skin and lips on that side of his head. The wound exposed large, white teeth, giving him the appearance of a wide, crooked smile. He didn't appear aggressive, but he didn't take his good eye off us. That one good eye was bright red in appearance. It was eerie. The way he sat there, staring, watching, waiting. We radioed the security officers for help, and like a speeding bullet, they showed up 40 minutes later. That whole time waiting there, the wolf never diverted his attention from us. If I hadn't seen him breathing, I would have assumed it was a statue. The security officers arrived and took some pictures for their reports. Then they began the process of driving the animal back out into the tundra. Truck horns didn't startle him. He didn't even flinch. Charging him with their truck did nothing either. They took aim with their beanbag gun and hit him square in the ribs. The wolf let out a yelp, but didn't get up or move from his spot. The next beanbag hit him in the head, and that jolted him enough to get up and leave. Security told us to call back if we saw the wolf again. They seemed confident he would move on and not be a bother anymore. The sun was setting and our job was still hours from wrapping up. Working a 13 to 15 hour day isn't unusual. You either get used to the long hours or you find another line of work pretty quick. I was running the computer equipment inside the truck and weird data was coming back from the tools down in the well. They were blanking out and losing signal or they were reporting data backwards but diagnostics wasn't indicating any issues. To the computer systems, everything was operating normally. I tried a few different things to fix the issue, but it persisted. One of the workers went out to the wellhead to check the gauges and cables, trying to isolate the problem from there. He was outside for not more than five minutes before the night was pierced by a long, bellowing howl. This was immediately followed by the high-pitched shriek of our crewmate. Throwing the door open, I was able to catch a fleeting glimpse of a large, dark figure running behind the well house. Our crewmate ran past us and jumped inside, pale, sweating, and full of adrenaline. He tried to relate what just happened. Through his panting, he said he was in the well house checking the cables when someone walked up behind him. Thinking it was one of us, he started a conversation with his back turned. When he got no reply, he turned and was met face to face 
with a seven foot tall black wolf standing on his hind legs. It stood between him and the door, growling. Without thinking, he flung his pipe wrench at the beast and struck him hard in the chest. That's when it let out a howl and ran off. Our crewmate was adamant that it was the same wolf from earlier because its face was mangled in that crooked half smile and one fiery red eye. Myself and the others on the crew had a hard time believing he saw a giant wolf man. We had no doubt he saw the wolf, but we reasoned that in his panic, he hallucinated that it was upright like a man. But we'd all encountered enough weird things on the slope to never count out the impossible. We radioed the security officers and told them the wolf had returned and waited inside the truck. What else could we do but wait? I wasn't about to go there and fight Satan's guard dog with a clipboard and mouse pad. Every time we felt like things settled down outside, we would hear a growl or something would push against the truck. Periodically, we could see something pacing in the dark just beyond the reach of the work lights. Even though we were inside a locked truck cabin, it was still a very vulnerable feeling. We were very much trapped. I'm sure it felt similar to what divers experience inside a shark cage far out at sea. All of this went on for an hour while we waited for someone to show up. Finally, coming up the road we could see headlights of three approaching vehicles. The security team had showed up, this time with actual rifles. Over the radio we told them what had been going on. You could feel their disbelief and eyes rolling through the radio. The sass and disbelief soon faded when we explored the work site and found it covered in fresh, large wolf tracks. The security team split up with two trucks headed out to search for the wolf while the last one remained with us as we loaded our equipment and finished our job. We didn't hear or see anything else that night as we cleaned up, but we sure did keep our heads on a swivel. The security officers didn't find the wolf that night a set of tracks left off the work site and out into the open tundra. The officers commented that the tracks looked weird. This was due to them only seeing the back paw prints in the snow. The last security truck escorted us back to the main camp, while the others continued their search into the night. For the following week, various reports came in across the oil field of people seeing this mangled black wolf during the day. And at night, Reports kept coming in of a black beast walking upright and harassing or cornering workers. Security seemed to always show up minutes too late. During this time frame, many of the Alaskan native workers were getting nervous. One of our friends in the camp workshop was from Nuiqsut, a small Inupiat village just west of the oil field. He told us it sounded exactly like a... Ijira a shape-shifting creature that can take the form of any arctic animal while it hunts. He said it was obvious as the wolf was a normal animal in the daylight, but transformed into an upright monster after nightfall. The Ijirak are thought to be Inuit hunters that traveled too far north and became stuck between the world of the living and the dead. They transformed into evil, deformed men with sideways mouths and eyes. They used their power of shape-shifting to hunt other Inuit, especially children. The Inupiat are very wary of wild animals for this very reason. A week following our encounter, the security team was able to corner the wolf on a remote work site. It had attacked and trapped two welders in their truck. Both workers had superficial cuts through their snowsuits, but were otherwise fine. Having no other choice, the wolf was euthanized on the spot. Security shot the wolf once, and instead of dropping dead, it charged the officer that shot it. The wolf took three more high-powered rifle shots before it eventually collapsed at the feet of the officer. Even then, paralyzed in the now crimson snow, the wolf was still growling through its crooked, wide smile. After several minutes, it finally succumbed to its wounds. The wolf's body was taken to the University of Alaska Fairbanks for dissection and examination. Outside of the facial deformities and gnarled appearance, the biologist concluded it was an ordinary wolf from the Brooks Range Mountains. How it got hundreds of miles from home, and why it stayed on the tundra, is a complete 
mystery. This happened back in 2016 on Christmas Eve night. We'd just gotten back from my sister's and we were sitting in the car for a few. It was fairly cold. Also, side note, we had a bunch of cats, so at first we hadn't thought anything of it. We sat there for about ten minutes and we heard rustling. Not thinking anything about it because of the cats, we blew it off. Not even a minute later, we heard it again. My mom just so happened to look up and there was a bald man in a wife-beater tank top and shorts. My mom and I both had that uneasy feeling because of his choice of clothing. It was 32 degrees and he's in summer clothes. Weird. My mom has her window cracked and he was barely a foot from our car. My mom yelled out to him and said to back away from our car, which surprise he didn't. He continued to stand there and stare at us. My mom decided to try and scare him. She yelled out to him that she had a gun and would blow his shit away. She didn't have a gun on her, but she definitely made sure he thought she did. He threw his hands up, but continued to get closer to our car, so my mom threw her phone at me and I was told to dial 911. I told the dispatcher what was going on, and she said she'd have the police there right away. My mother proceeded to try and run him down, because he went between two porches, but our car wouldn't fit because of how close the porches were to each other. Finally, after half a fucking hour later, the cops finally showed up and took our statements. The station was literally right down the road from us, and if he had actually tried something, I felt as if it would have been too late. If he hadn't run, I wouldn't have thought he had ill intentions, but he ran, so I was very pissed off that it took so long for the cops to show up. The cops stayed and looked everywhere for him, but came up empty. My mom nor I slept that night or finished opening presents because of fear that he would come back. The police thought that maybe he wanted to steal the gifts that were in the car, but we may never know. The scariest part is, months later it came to light that he'd escaped jail. He was put in for assault, so who knows what he would have done to me and my mom. Around 2006-ish, I was driving flatbed, picked up a load of construction material in rural Tennessee. My memory is foggy now, but I want to say between Memphis and Nashville, but closer to the intersection of the Mississippi, Alabama, and Tennessee state lines. A tarp was required, so I strapped everything down, tarped the load, and left the shipper. About five miles down the road, in the middle of nowhere, in woods on a second lane road, I noticed my tarp flapping in the wind. I found a white shoulder and pulled over to fix it. I realized that I flat just did a shitty job tarping this load and decided to redo it on the side of the road. I undo all the bungee straps, drag the tarps off, roll them back up, climb up on the ladder and start unrolling the tarps again. And I see a guy walking down the same side of the road I'm on, coming towards my truck. I don't think anything about it other than to keep an eye on it, because I'm in the middle of nowhere, and I continue what I'm doing. About the time I have the tarp set in place, and I'm climbing down to start hooking the bungee straps back on, this guy's getting close enough that I'm now paying more attention to him than I am to tarping my load. I grab my winch bar and set it on the trailer where I'm working, just in case. The guy gets to me, and the first thing I notice is his hair. It's like a mullet, but it's patchy as hell. It was like he tried to cut his own hair and had a seizure in the process, and said, fuck it, good enough to party. The next thing I notice were his eyes, which I can only describe as off, like they were clear. I didn't think he was drunk or high or anything, but it also gave me the distinct impression that the elevator didn't go all the way up. 
His clothes were dirty and not well maintained, and with dirty white tennis shoes. I remember he didn't have any laces on one shoe, and the tongue was noticeably out of place. He stops by me, waits till I acknowledge him, and just says, I've got a long walk. I'm like, yeah man, you do. We're in the middle of nowhere, making it clear there's no right to be had here. He nods, starts walking by me, continuing on his way, stops at about the driver door on my truck and turns around. He comes back to me and repeats himself. I've got a long walk. At this point, I explain to him that I can't give him a ride, insurance and all that. I apologize for not being able to help him out, and he seems to accept this, turns around and leaves. I wait for him to get a little ways away from my truck and start working on finishing the tarp job. I still keep an eye on him, and he's moving away from me. As I'm putting on the last of the bungee straps, I look over to check where he's at, and he's turned around, heading back towards me, now about a hundred yards in front of my truck and coming back my way. It looks like he's talking on a cell phone. He has his hand up to his face, and I can barely make out his moving mouth, his other hand waving like he's having a conversation with someone. I finish with his straps, grab my winch bar, and I'm climbing into my truck as he's about ten yards away now. As soon as I'm in the cab, I lock the doors. I set the winch bar on the passenger seat just in case. I look at the guy and realize he's not talking on a phone. He's talking to his hand. And now I'm nervous because he doesn't look like he's having a nice, pleasant chat. It looks more like an angry conversation. I crank the truck up, put it into gear, and just pull out. I didn't look for traffic or anything. As I pass him, he's just looking at me, still holding his hand to his face with this dead-ass look on it, just staring at me. It gave me the creeps. About the time I hit fifth or sixth gear, I look in the mirror, and there's no one there. So for a bit of background, I am from Spain, with family from Italy. This story is 100% true. My dad, my brother and I are all familiar with camping and nature and all that stuff. We don't get scared easily, and we aren't really superstitious or whatever. This happened in 2010, I believe. I was 8 years old then, and we were on summer vacation in Italy, in the region of Tuscany, where some of our family is from. We were hiking in the country, far away from any towns or any other form of big civilization. We were not very familiar with this route though. All of a sudden, we stumble across what looks like an abandoned Tuscan farmhouse. Not very big though. We all look around and yell, asking whether there was someone. It looked very abandoned. The door was missing, plants growing all over the place. Safe to say, no one lived there. So, since we love adventure, and it didn't seem like a bad plan to do with two children, we decide to take a look at the place. As we're going to enter the house, out of nowhere comes a barn owl flying out of the house. So we had a quick scare, but nothing too bad. It's just an owl, right? We enter the house, and we just find the typical stuff you would imagine to find when you're in an abandoned house. Cutlery and plates on the ground, a candle, some old paintings, nothing really valuable though. We see an old wooden ladder that leads up to a hole in the ceiling. It was not a very big hole. My father couldn't fit, and so since I was the oldest of the two kids, I would go up and tell them what I saw upstairs. I went up the ladder and was in a room where I could barely see because the windows were covered with wooden boards. I could make out some things by a few sun rays that would get in through the gaps. I could see graffiti signs, and I saw another room, so I told my father and brother that I would advance and see what was up. 
As I opened the rotten wooden door, I immediately stood still. A disgusting, rotten smell penetrated my nose. I almost had to throw up. I wanted to know what caused this bad smell. Then, in the corner of the room, I could make out a silhouette. I got closer to investigate what it could be, and I could barely make out that it was the lifeless body of a dog. A big dog. And, spicy detail, the body was skinned. No fur. Nothing. Just pure, rotting flesh in the shape of a big dog. I don't remember how long I just stood there, frozen, but I woke up from my shock with the screams of my brother because apparently the barn owl had gotten back inside the house and it almost hit him. So my dad yelled at me to come back and I gladly obeyed. When I got back downstairs, I told him what I had seen and the look he gave me was that of a man who is scared shitless but doesn't want to admit it in order to not scare his young kids. He just got close to my ear and whispered to run. We ran out of that place and never got back or even close to the route leading to it. I was hiking in the Catskills. I live in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, but I come up to the Catskills fairly regularly throughout the year because sometimes the Poconos just get a little boring. I started at the trailhead parking lot where I parked my car and began walking up the same trail that I've walked up a thousand times. About an hour later, I started to feel kind of weird. It felt like the woods were a little bit quieter than they usually were when I'd come up here before, but I wasn't initially very concerned about it. After I sat down to have breakfast, I started hearing rustling above me, and some sticks fell right down behind me. I wasn't really worried about this either, as I just assumed it was some squirrels running around or some chipmunks throwing things at me. This has happened to me before. I finished my breakfast without incident and kept walking towards the summit. This was fairly early in the morning, so I would think there would be a lot of birds chirping and a lot of other activity, but things just kept getting quieter and quieter as I ascended. This definitely creeped me out, but I tried to push it out of my mind because I've already been hiking for a while at this point, and I'm definitely not turning around. Eventually, more sticks fell to my right, somewhat close to me, and they sounded heavier. These were not the kind of small twigs that would generally fall from squirrel activity. I went over and checked them, and these were fairly substantial. This continued to happen in a higher frequency until I finally reached the end of the trail. On my way back, it happened continuously increasing in frequency as I descended, until suddenly it just kind of stopped when I was about a mile from the car. When I finally returned to my car, I found all of the doors open, and it seemed like a lot of my stuff had been violently rummaged through. I had a bag in there with some of my clothes in it, and this had been torn up. A lot of my clothes were outside of the car, leading back into the woods. I thought about calling the police, but I live in Philadelphia, so I knew there wasn't really anything that was going to happen. To this day, I still get freaked out when I think about it. I don't necessarily think it was connected, but I do feel really uneasy about both of these things happening at the same time. Then again, maybe I was just robbed. This story happened recently, and for some context, me and my friends are teens that like to explore and do stupid stuff, like normal teenagers do. We found this tunnel that was a drain under a busy road. We had to crouch and sit on our skateboards to explore it, since the height of the tunnel was short. As we were going deeper into the tunnel, it gets pitch black 
and the flashlights from our phones can only reach about five feet in front of us, so we were blind to what we could come across until we were very close to it. In the tunnel, I remember the wall was painted in all red and had sheets of metal with white handprints connected to clothespins. We decided to keep going until we reached what we thought was a dead end. It was not. On the left was a more square tunnel compared to the rectangle shape we were in. In the distance of the connected tunnel, there was a bright light coming from the outside, shining from above onto a red shopping cart with belongings in it. We slowly inched towards the light where the shopping cart was. The light turned out to be a big hole in the ground that we could crawl out of if we needed an escape. As we were about to pass the shopping cart, my friend who was in the lead was too afraid to go forward anymore. It was pitch black five feet from where we were. I decided to take the lead and keep going. I stepped past the shopping cart and stopped. I don't know what it was, but I was afraid. I had a gut feeling something was back there. I slowly moved back. I stopped. I swear I saw something move from the deep dark of the tunnel. Before I could put everything together, a loud echo of someone pounding an object on the walls of the tunnel struck me back, causing everybody to freak out and crawl out of the escape hole. Once we got out, a homeless man ran to us asking what we were doing in there. We told him we were just exploring. He explained to us that there's a man that lives underground in that tunnel, and he would have killed us if we went further. The man was apparently crazy and threw a rock at the poor guy's head before. Luckily nobody was hurt, but even though it was scary and dangerous, it was fun. And I'm glad I experienced it. Now this is something I really want to talk about to be sure that everyone is cautious and stays level-headed at all times. Now, for context, I lived in the middle of nowhere in Canada. It was an old town that had quite a few abandoned buildings due to absence of residents. Me and many friends were tired of the lack of entertainment options for us, so what we did was explore these abandoned buildings. Prior to the experience I'm about to talk about, we never had anything too crazy happen to us. Occasionally, we'd see a small bit of blood-like liquid, and we did see a pentagram on the ground from someone who went to a house previously, but nothing too bad. Until the last time I'd gone exploring abandoned buildings. Now, when I was younger, I used to go to a daycare that was part mental hospital. Weird combination, I know. It closed down due to lack of patience and lack of children at the daycare. I decided to go back there with my friends a few years ago. For context, I was 15 when this happened. Most of my friends were the same age. When we did get there, it was rather cliche. There was fog, it was rather dark, and there was a light drizzle of rain. We went to the main gate, which was padlocked shut. We decided to help each other hop over it and made a ton of noise. We were laughing and giggling the whole time unsuspecting of what was to come. We looked around the small play place slash park with flashlights we had on our persons. Even with our somewhat powerful flashlights, our visibility was rather limited. We decided to enter the decaying building. Glass and dirt crunched under our feet as we stepped into the daycare section of the complex. There were still old Legos, wood chips from previous furniture, old torn dolls and toys strewn about. The further we walked around the daycare section, we naturally became more and more silent, until all we could hear was the crunch of the dirt under our feet. I found some crayons in a plastic container in the corner of the room. I walked over to pick them up, when all of a sudden we heard a loud crash coming from behind a metal door, leading to the psych ward part of the building. My friends and I all looked at each other. As a whole, we were a group of five. Most of them were very bold and cocky. We all looked at each other when my friend Brian suggested we go and look to see where the sound came from. Personally, I was not fond of the idea. 
but with my group of friends, there was no way anyone was going to decline such a thing. We all stacked up on the door and opened it. It was rusted to the floor and we heaved to get it open. As we walked in, the metallic smells and must became stronger, with a hint of something else which I couldn't put my finger on at that moment. We walked in, our flashlights pointed in every direction with Brian leading the group. The hallways were tight, and to the left and right were the occasional metal doorway, some with doors open. I felt slightly claustrophobic, and it felt a little hard to breathe. As we continued, Brian shone his flashlight into a room and recoiled. We all stopped walking as Brian slowly entered the room. What is it? I asked him. I thought I saw someone here. It seems all fine now. To be honest, I thought he was just messing with us to increase our anxiety. But looking back, I think he was completely honest. He backed out of the room and we continued walking deeper into the psych ward when another friend swiftly told us to stop. We came to a halt and all listened. In the distance ahead of us, we heard the subtle pitter-patter of footsteps echo through the hallway. We all looked at each other, fear in each of our eyes. Brian continued walking towards the sounds. We considered turning back for a second without Brian, wondering if some ghost or something was in the building, but we couldn't do that to him. The closer we got, the more I felt like I was being watched. When finally we entered a room on the right, which had the smell of rotting meat, in front of us was a dead deer. Its innards were spilled all over the floor, staining the concrete. A friend of mine had a very weak stomach and vomited all over the floor. That's when we heard whispering from somewhere. Brian shone his flashlight to the corner of the room where a man with short hair was standing with his head down. He wore a bright green t-shirt stained with what I assume was blood and torn beige pants. He did not have any socks on and his feet seemed damaged. He was twitching sporadically and continued to mumble even after we saw him. We stared at him for a solid 30 seconds before he made his first true movement. He looked up at us with a haunting grin that sent shivers down our spine. You guys here for the feast, he said. Each word with varying inflection and energy. This kicked us over the edge and we bolted out of that room, all the way back to the daycare center. The door was still open and we decided to try and slam it shut, but the rust and pure weight of the door almost kept it open. It took three of us pulling with all of our strength to close it. And just before we did, I could see the silhouette of the man watching us, his white teeth being the only other human feature I could see. As we sat behind the metal door, catching our breath for a second, all looking at each other for confirmation that we all saw the same thing. After a little bit of labored breathing from each of us, we heard a light tapping on the door. That's when we decided that it was time to leave. We booked it out of the vicinity completely and ran home. A year after we visited that spot, police went to do a routine search of the area and found the man. It was stated that this guy used to go to the psych ward before it closed down. He escaped the facility he was transferred to and lived off of the wildlife around the complex. When the cops brought him in, he had a series of diseases and sicknesses from eating raw meat. His mental condition was much worse than before. There were rumors that he did kill someone in the forest while searching for food, but nothing has been confirmed. In the end, guys, be careful, especially in dangerous areas such as abandoned buildings. And creepy guy, let's not meet. This took place last year at the beginning of summer. I was with my mom headed down to my Nana's farm to visit for a weekend. For some context, she lives on a farm way back in the country right at the foot of a mountain in rural South Carolina. 
it's a very rural, secluded area, so the roads are badly maintained and barely wide enough for two cars to pass one another. The houses are also spread out and set far back into the tree line from the road, so there's very little ambient light besides the headlights of a car. So my mom and I are driving along, her in the driver's seat and me in the passenger's. It was around 11pm and we're 15 minutes out from Nana's, deep in the woods with the radio down almost to silent. We come onto this straight stretch of the road in a heavily wooded area, and suddenly this blur of a creature darts out across the road, right at the edge of our headlights. It was moving pretty good, but both me and my mom were able to get a good look at it, and both agreed on what we saw. It was a fairly large creature, roughly the size of a person, or maybe larger. Neither of us could make out the head, but we both remember it appearing to have a segmented body, as if it were emaciated and its ribcage was poking out. The reflection of light made it hard for me to tell color, but my mom said she remembered it to be dark and she didn't see fur or hair. It had long limbs and as it moved across the road, it didn't run the way a dog or horse would, with all four legs. The best word to describe it would be lopping, using its front limbs to pull itself along, and it was moving considerably fast. We both said something along the lines of, What the hell is that? as it crossed in front of us. As we got up to where it had crossed, I turned to look at it just as it reached the other side of the road and out of our headlights, and I swear on my life, it stood up and ran. Not like a dog rearing on its hind legs, it was definitely bipedal. I immediately yelled that it had stood up and we both started getting nervous. I honestly would have thought I was going insane had I not had another person in the car with me. My mom has always been a pretty level-headed person and not superstitious, but she was very nervous and made me agree to not tell my nana about it to avoid scaring her, which made me recognize how serious this was. I should also mention that there had apparently been a series of attacks on livestock and horses in the area around the time this happened. People were saying they found wire fences ripped through and their animals attacked. There have been a few other strange instances in the area, but that was my personal experience. I wanted to share an experience I had back in the spring of 2018. I have had a few of what could be considered paranormal experiences in my life, but this was the most recent and unnerving. I am an avid outdoorsman and love to hunt and camp around the Francis Marion and Sumter National Forest. Back in 2018, I took my young son and dog out to a remote area in the National Forest to test out a new camper shell on my recently purchased truck. We found a secluded area off a dirt road, made dinner, and then packed it in for the night as soon as it got dark. Around 11pm at night, I sat up and looked out the back of the truck due to my dog growling. In the distance, I saw what looked like hundreds of small white balls of light darting around, then hovering for a few seconds and slowly converging on our campsite. They looked just like the dust orbs you see on videos, but these were producing light in a completely dark forest. They soon surrounded my truck. It seemed like there were hundreds of them. They were a soft white light, and they didn't blink. After 30 minutes of them floating around and concentrating around us, I finally worked up the nerve to open the truck and lit a lantern, and they promptly disappeared. After turning off the lights and locking back up, they came back. My son was fast asleep, thank goodness. I watched them until I finally fell asleep at around 1am. The next morning, when we tried to leave, the battery was dead on the new truck. There weren't any lights in the back cab where we would have used any power. A week later, I had to replace the electric control module, but I'm not sure if it's connected. 
Has anyone had a similar experience? Just thinking about them again makes the hair stand up on my neck. About five years ago, I was taking a solo motorcycle trip from Utah to Wisconsin and back, two days riding there, two days back, with about a week between. When I left on the very first day, my plan was to get somewhere in Nebraska, grab a hotel room, and continue on the next day. I didn't make any hotel reservations or anything, more of a, I'll figure it out when I'm tired kind of deal. First mistake right there. By the time I was actually tired, every highway-adjacent hotel I could find was booked full. I guess this was because Sturgis had just ended and people were heading home. This is what one of the desk managers at one hotel claimed, so who knows. To give you an idea, I was just barely over the Wyoming-Nebraska border when I got tired. I had waited out a storm in Wyoming for a few hours. Going on about 1.30am, I'm still riding through Nebraska just taking every exit with a hotel to find an open one and stopping at a bunch of gas stations to stay awake. It was really only me and semi-trucks on the road. I leave a fairly large truck stop at the same time as some car that I wasn't really paying attention to. We both got on the highway, the car behind me. I get up to cruising speed, right around 7 over the speed limit, and this car just stays behind me. Cut to about 20 miles later, this car is still behind me, but uncomfortably close. Had I needed to hit the brakes for anything major, deer running across the road for example, he'd hit me for sure. So I let off the gas, figuring he'll just go around me and go on his way. No dice. I slowed all the way down to about 60 miles per hour, and he just held it there for a while. He stayed right behind me. At this point, I wasn't really sure what to do about it, so I just sped back up to highway speed and kept going. It was at this time I figured he might just be a cop. Being as nervous as I was, I really wanted to find out. I decided I could afford a speeding ticket, so I got up to about 12 to 15 over the limit for a few miles. Still nothing. Just a car staying right behind me maybe 50 feet back on a more or less deserted highway. We were still passing the occasional truck. Sometime later, I'm down to about a half a tank, and at almost 3 a.m., I decide that at the next gas station, I'll take a long break. I see a sign for gas and take the exit. Guys, this gas station, no joke, has two pumps and one overhead light. It's like straight out of a horror movie. The car followed me to the gas station. I noped out of there back to the highway. Less than a quarter of a mile. That car followed me the whole time, into the parking lot, and then right back out. The next gas station wasn't too far away. Maybe 10 to 15 miles. A big truck stop type of deal. The car follows me off the exit and goes around to the other side of the main building somewhere. I stop there anyway. Go into the small diner and sit in a spot on the other side of the window as my bike. I grab a bit of food. I call ahead to the next few hotels available, and luckily one had a room. I reserved it, went back out to the bike, and went on toward the highway. No car in sight. I got to the hotel around 4am with no other problems, and finally got some sleep. I still have absolutely no idea who was in the car or what they were doing, but it sure had freaked me out. This just happened. So my boyfriend and I are currently hiking the Pacific Crest Trail in California. It's extremely common to get hitches along the trail, and most people who live in towns bordering the trail are fairly kind, self-seeming folk. Emphasis on seeming. Well, today, we found ourselves a bit lost after trying to take a less traveled alternative trail. After lots of struggling and practically bushwhacking, 
We made our way down the hill and ended up accidentally on someone's property. This property is big. It's a large ranch with a few different buildings. We tried to skedaddle as fast as possible off the property, but one of the ranch dogs saw us and the owner came up in a golf cart. I explained that we accidentally got lost hiking and apologized, and he said it happens often and he was really understanding. He asked if we wanted a ride into town since he was about to leave anyway. Given how common hitchhiking is on trail and how nice he was, we accepted and he drove us to town. On the ride there, he told us he used to be in the DEA and had participated in more shootouts than people fighting in the army. Weird, but okay. I didn't think much of it. I noticed my boyfriend was really quiet though and I thought it was odd. As soon as we hop out of the car, my boyfriend grabs our backpacks and tells me to check my phone. He had sent me an article about the guy we just got a ride from and how this guy was involved in his girlfriend's disappearance and a suspicious death on the ranch property not too long after. Apparently, his girlfriend went missing after signing property transfers of her ranch over to him. She was never found and the suspicious death on the ranch was a worker who got killed by an ATV. But toxicology showed a meth overdose. Given his DEA background, I found that part specifically suspicious. Also, he's on the sex offender registry for groping two women on a snowmobile tour. My boyfriend and I are 100% okay, but we're just shaken up that we got a hitch from a possible murderer. Be careful who you get hitches from, even if they're friendly. I came here hoping anyone could share similar experiences or give insight. I took a trip to stay in a cabin in the middle of the woods, high up in the mountains of the city of Ranger, Georgia, USA. This neighborhood was 30 minutes up in the mountains, away from civilization, and even the cabins were spread far apart. The front deck of the cabin was completely exposed to the woods, so I acknowledged that any animals could stroll along if they pleased, but I stayed there for about a week, and me and my boyfriend sat outside on the front deck every night, very late, and at no point felt in danger. It was peaceful with fireflies out and sounds of crickets every night. Until the fifth night. It was eerily dark too. The moon was covered heavily. It was about midnight and all of a sudden I didn't feel peace like I did those other nights. The forest went completely quiet and I felt a horrible sense of dread. I genuinely feared for my life. I sat there in my chair, looking out into the dark forest, trying to rationalize and calm myself down that it was my mind playing tricks. But all of a sudden, my boyfriend said out loud that he felt unsafe. I told him I felt the same and we ran inside. The cabin has three floors and we were able to climb out the window and sit on the roof because we still wanted to be outside and relax. It didn't matter how high up I was, I felt something truly evil and stayed inside. The only other time I felt something so evil or like someone was watching was when I had a few paranormal experiences at a haunted house. Georgia doesn't really get mountain lions, maybe a bear, but it didn't feel that way at all. This happened years ago when I was around the age of 19 or 20 and worked retail part-time at the mall. I was the closing shift that night and left around 10.30pm to head home. I often took the inside streets versus the freeway, which included a small stretch of back road that was usually pretty empty, especially during that time of night. This particular night, I noticed a car about 10 minutes into my 30-minute drive going the same way as me, 
but I didn't think much of it. As we were approaching the stretch of back road that's usually deserted at that time, the driver behind me starts flashing their high beams and slowing down and speeding up while tailgating me. I remember feeling panic that they might hit my car. Eventually the car pulls up beside me, and I can now see a middle-aged man who's pointing towards the back of my car and then motioning for me to roll down my window. I roll my window down about halfway, and he says something about how my tire looks like it's flattening and I'm going to damage the rim if I don't pull over soon. I tell him I don't know how to change a tire, but I'm not too far from home so I should be fine. But he's pretty insistent about how it will only take a few minutes, and he's happy to help. I know something is off, because my car seems to be driving fine. I politely say I'm fine, but thanks anyway, and I roll my window up. He drives next to me for what feels like forever, but it couldn't have been more than a minute or two. At this point, something feels so off that I'm afraid to even physically look in his direction. I focus on the road the best I can, and eventually he slows down and moves behind me again. After a few minutes, we reach a more populated, well-lit part of town, and I see him make a U-turn. I get home and take a look, and my tire is perfectly fine. I have no idea if he followed me from the mall or what that man's intentions were, but I think it's safe to say they weren't anything good. I even had my dad check all my tires the next morning, and the tire pressure on them was in the normal range. I still think of this night from time to time, and it makes me nauseous to think about how differently things might be today if I had decided to pull over that night. I was working night shift in a gas station slash truck stop in Tucumcari, New Mexico back in the mid-90s. I had another guy working with me who ran the diesel side while I worked the gas side. We had a guy come in around 1 or 2 a.m. and just looked at stuff in the aisles for a while before he left. I didn't really think twice about him. Later, at about 6 a.m., when I got off, I drove home past a convenience store named Alsup's. They're big in the southwest. There had to have been 30 cop cars in the parking lot. There aren't even 30 cop cars in Tucumcari, so where they came from I have no idea. I come to find out that sometime during the night, the Allsups had been robbed and the clerk had been taken into the cooler, tied up, and beheaded. I found that out when I was awoken by the state police a few hours later and asked if I'd seen anything suspicious during the night. That guy who came in and left was the only thing I could think of. The police took a copy of our security footage, which led them to a suspect who was later convicted for the murder. I can't even begin to tell you how hard it was to go to work the next day. We kind of assumed that the guy was going to rob us first, but didn't want to deal with two clerks. So he left and hid all subs instead. On the first day of moving into my new house back in April of 2015, my neighbor came to introduce himself, and it wasn't long before I deduced that he was in the drug dealing business. I initially thought that wasn't so bad. I like a smoke from time to time, and having him next door could be useful. Even if I went back in time right now to warn myself, there's no way I could convey how wrong I was. Now. 2015 was otherwise known as the worst year of my life. It certainly wasn't what Back to the Future had led me to expect. After losing my dad to cancer, my sister having a miscarriage, and my barbecue exploding on my birthday gathering, I was beginning to think my luck would have to turn soon. It was August, the summer was ending, and nothing bad had happened for two whole months. I'd been up late watching It Follows, and not being much of a horror fan, I was suitably creeped out, and slightly high. My girlfriend had to come home from a late work function and had gone straight to bed, and at about 12.30am, I went up there too. 
It's probably worth explaining that this house has three floors. The ground floor has an entrance, spare room and stairs. The first floor is the kitchen and living room, and the top floor is the bedroom and bathroom. It's one of three houses in a little muse in a leafy Sussex village. I went to bed and was soon drifting off. About 15 minutes later, I heard some banging. I didn't pay it much mind, assuming that watching a horror movie before bed had made me oversensitive. So I started to go back to sleep. The next memory I have is of shouting, lots of shouting. The bedroom door burst open, and a group of large figures stormed in, brandishing crowbars. I remember screaming in that way you try to in a dream, when nothing comes out. I also recall spinning around slightly so as to block my girlfriend, an incredibly sweet and innocent creature who had barely witnessed a crime in her life. I thrust out my legs, kicking one of them in the crown jewels firmly. This led the ringleader to crack me on the legs with a crowbar, telling me in no uncertain terms to not do that again. So now there are at least four men lined up alongside my side of the bed, maybe five. It was hard to tell, I didn't put my glasses on. My girlfriend is screaming, they're all shouting and I'm incredibly confused. The ringleader then demands that I give him the bag of money. What money? I asked. Give us the fucking bag of money. We know you've got the bag of money. The ringleader repeats several times. I don't have a bag of money, I explained. It's hard to remember the order of events, but I do know one thing for sure. Tom Cruise popped into my head. The previous night, I was watching Mission Impossible 3. I do like that film, and I had it on in the background while I was doing the washing up. I remember pondering the scene where Ethan Hunt's wife has a gun to her head. I want to give you what you want, but you've got to do what's right, exclaimed Hunt. Huh. I wonder if the screenwriter had researched this dialogue. Is this what you're supposed to say in a hostage crisis? Well, it apparently sowed a seed, because I found myself repeating those words. I don't have a bag of money. I want to get you what you want but you have to do what's right and leave this poor girl alone, are the words that came, strangely confidently, out of my mouth. Yeah, well we know you sold drugs to my daughter, said the one I considered to be the sidekick. Nah, 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 it was my sister, said the ringleader in correction. This exchange told me two things. One, they did not have a particularly good grasp of what their plan was, and two, they were after my neighbor. For my neighbor is a drug-dealing maniac, a weird guy from Essex. He's in his mid-thirties, about five foot eight, with light blonde hair and eyebrows to match. He's skinny and zany, usually hopping from one foot to the other as he tries to keep his excessive energy in check. He smokes weed from 7 a.m. and boxes on his outdoor punch bag whenever the weed isn't enough to keep his energy in check. Sometimes he can be seen in the communal car park making things, or he juggles balls with his dogs, or he shadow boxes. You know, the usual things you expect to see your neighbor doing at literally any hour of the day or night. Still, realizing that the intruders were in the wrong house, I wasn't entirely keen on sending them next door. As much as I disliked my neighbor, I didn't think he deserved a group of masked men storming in so I continued to try and talk these people out of my house. I'm not a drug dealer, so I've no idea what you're talking about. There's a couple of MacBooks downstairs, 60 quid in my wallet, an iMac, whatever you want, just take it and go, mate. Hearing this offer, the ringleader realized I was being compliant, and if I was willing to give up a few grand's worth of computers, why wouldn't I just give him the bag of money he was seeking? Slowly, the cocks turned. Is this number 27? He demanded to know. The whole area is. Yeah, but is this number 2, 27 Acacia Avenue? No, it's number 1, I replied. We've got the wrong house, he exclaimed. The realization was startling. They all shouted. 
One guy had been searching every room covered in drawer. He'd already given up. One or two of the others went downstairs to get him, leaving me and my girlfriend with the ringleader and his sidekick. The guy I suspected was far darker in soul than the guy doing all the talking. Right. You can't call the cops or we'll come back. We know where you live, the sidekick said. Emboldened by the realization that these guys were morons, I laughed. You seriously think I won't call the cops? Best I can do is give you a 30 second head start. He didn't like that so he took my phone. Good, I thought. I'll track that fuck. Sadly, I later discovered he threw it behind my sofa on his way out of the house. The ringleader then apologized. He said they were looking for someone else and there had been a mix-up. I said something along the lines of, well, I'm glad we sorted that out. At which point he shook my hand, told me he hoped my girlfriend would be okay and forced the sidekick to leave with him. I picked up the bed and jammed it against the door, and enveloped my traumatized girlfriend in a big hug, and told her it was over, which it almost was. Little did we know, the morons had decided to try again, this time knocking my neighbor's door in and storming his house, but he was in the kitchen, so they went flying past him, then up to the bedroom where they found his girlfriend. My neighbor, being the type of guy he is, then jumped out of the window, abandoned his girlfriend, ran to my front door and stormed into my home. Chris, Chris, there are people in my house, he screamed. No shit, I responded. Why do you think my fucking door is wide open? I went out to meet him while talking to the police on my girlfriend's phone. He grabbed a knife from my kitchen, the phone from my hand, and then went after them. I decided I was done. I went back to enjoy the barricade of the bedroom. It took the police a while to turn up, because the genius neighbor of mine told them they had guns, so we had to wait for armed response. Eventually, my girlfriend and I cautiously walked down to the living room. The police eventually arrived, but they knew it was too late so they stood outside our houses having a chat and a bit of a laugh. It's likely to be the only time I tell four men with machine guns to shut the fuck up. The rest of the night was a mess of police as they took statements, searched for evidence and quizzed my neighbor about, yes, the bag of money. They were convinced they could bust him for something as they had wanted to for some time. Turns out he had broken his foot when he leapt out from the window and so he was carted off in an ambulance. As the stretcher went past me in the car park, he tried to talk to me. Chris, I just want to say one thing, mate. I just want to say one thing, he screamed. You're not physically capable of saying just one thing, I told him. The police, who knew him all too well, erupted in laughter. This humiliation would haunt him for some time, Eventually I heard that my neighbor had claimed it was because of an Instagram picture he'd posted on Facebook, and he thought he knew the ringleader, a scumbag he'd recently connected with on Facebook. He gave the police two weeks to charge the guy. To the credit of the police, they arrested him but didn't have the evidence to charge him. About a month later, my neighbor beckoned me into his garage, where he remonstrated with me for blaming him for the ordeal. They terrorized us too, he said. He then told me he'd taken matters into his own hands, dealing with the ringleader himself, putting him in some sort of box and, I presume, torturing him. He tried to show me some sort of video evidence, but I refused to look at it. We have to look after our women, he said. He then said that he was aware I had reacted like a coward when the guys got into my room. A bit bemused by this, I asked him if it was more gutless to scream or to jump out of a window and leave my partner behind. This enraged him, and we haven't spoken a single word to each other since. The only stuff that was stolen was money from our wallets and my Leatherman. Nobody was ever charged with the break-in, and eventually life went back to normal, albeit with a very expensive new front door.
I moved house this year, so I can only hope I never have to see my neighbor's face again. I know some people find this story entirely unbelievable, but it would appear I've got backup on that front, as one of the responding officers is on Reddit and confirmed the story's validity on my post. The police called it a scum-on-scum scum attack, and when those inadvertently mess with innocent bystanders, the scumbags are usually apologetic. They even said, don't be surprised if you get an anonymous bunch of flowers. We didn't, but judging by some of the messages I've received on Reddit, it really is something that happens. So I'm going to tell you the story of my brief encounter with a man called Happy. In 2003, I was working at a cannabis dispensary in Venice Beach, a block from the boardwalk. A good 35% of our patrons were unhoused people. Occasionally someone experiencing severe psychosis would try to come in, but if they were screaming or unintelligible, security would not let them in. If they had and presented the holy trinity of medical papers, ID, and cash, then we were good to go. We had a compassion program where we'd bag up grams of shake left over from the bottom of jars and give them completely free. One per person per day to anyone who asked. Word about this spread quickly on the boardwalk. Generally, these people would be the nicest, most polite and considerate customers even if they did smell a bit stinky and their money got pulled out of a sweaty sock. No one working there would bat an eye if someone came in smelling like they'd slept on the beach for a week next to a bottle of vodka, as long as they just calmly buy their weed and be on their way like any other customer. It's a foggy, chilly day around the holidays, sometime between Thanksgiving and Christmas. Someone called out, so I was the only person in the back, bud-tending. There was another employee at reception and the security guard at the front door. I'm alone in the back room. There are cameras, but no one is actively watching them. This guy walks in after being checked in at the front. He's the only customer at the moment, and I swear, the whole room gets colder as he walks in. He's wearing a very worn-in, deep-faded, wrinkled, conformed to his body, floor-length leather duster jacket and similarly beaten up, wide-brimmed leather cowboy hat. It looked like he'd lived and slept in the same clothes for years. We did not allow hats, hoods, or sunglasses in the store, so I'm surprised that security didn't make him take off his hat. This man is at least six foot five and built like a boulder. Not obese kind of large, pick you up and toss you like a ragdoll large. The stench that comes with him is unlike anything I've ever smelt before or since. It was beyond B.O., beyond piss or anything else. It smelled like actual death, as if he had a raw, rotting carcass tucked under his thick, long leather coat. I thought I'd been hardened by plenty of nasty body stink before, but this was absolutely revolting far beyond anyone who hadn't showered lately or pissed their pants. I'm trying not to inhale very deeply, and I say, Hi sir, excuse me, I'm sorry. Would you mind taking off your hat? It's just store policy. Big customer service smile, I ask. What are you looking for today? He grunts deeply. He's walking very slow, shuffling and dragging his feet. His voice sounds like he gargles with gravel. Rough and wet, raw and angry. I don't take off my hat. At this point, I'm not trying to argue with this man about his hat either. Let's just get him in and out. I glance down and see he's not wearing any shoes. The bit I can see from under his coat, one of his ankles is massively purple and black and swollen, melon-sized. The bottoms of both of his feet are bloody and torn up. I realize he's leaving a slight trail of blood as he drags his ragged feet across the concrete floor of the shop. My first thought is how and why the fuck did security let this guy come in? Second is, this guy is obviously seriously injured, and that is concerning as a human being. 
I'm making sure to keep the display shelf between me and this guy, but that's only about a foot of space, like a bar. He gets to me, and the stench gets stronger. I meekly but sincerely ask, Are you alright, sir? His eyes flare at me. What do you care? And I'm like, Well, I tried. Not my chair, not my problem. Great, what can I get for you? I ask. He pulls up one of his sleeves to expose his forearm. It's covered in large round burns, like from a cigar. Some old, healed, and some fresh, pussy and infected. They're not track marks, they're burns. He also has a jagged, homemade looking stick and poke tattoo of a smiley face, a crooked circle, two lines for the eyes, and scabbed up curve of a smile. He points at this tattoo. Happy. My name is Happy. The rotting stink was so strong. I needed to breathe in little gasps, the least possible. I walked here. I walked all the way here from Pasadena. Well, sir, that's a very long walk, I say. Anyway, what are you looking for today? Just for you. His eyes are dark and menacing. He's smeared with a layer of grime, like he lives in the woods dirty. He doesn't look like the average crust punk or disabled veteran you generally see living on the beach. It was hard to guess his age, but he wasn't that old or young, somewhere between 30 and 50. He looked like he dragged himself here from his log cabin, like what would happen if you entangled some quantum mechanics poorly and mixed Ed Gein with an 1800s homesteader, then transported him to 2013 Venice Beach. I, of course, had never seen this man before. Once was more than enough to make him unforgettable. He keeps staring at me, and I move as far back as I can to the wall, hopefully out of his grasp if he lunged. I would need to walk out from behind the case and around him to get to the security guard. I'm weighing my options. I decide to grab a bunch of compassion grams and then weigh out an eighth and mark it down that I'd pay for it later and he's just leering at me, wheezing, heavy, stinking breaths. We actually have a special today, only for people who've walked more than 10 miles to get here. This is all for you, on the house. Thank you for stopping by. He accepts the bag, but continues to just stand there and stare at me. Thank you, happy, I say. It works. He grunts a guttural noise that's not a word, and slowly turns to shuffle back towards the door. At the door, he turns back towards me and says, I'll see you later. He finally walks out, leaving plenty of his residual stench of death behind. Thank any and all of the gods, I did not see happy later, or ever again. When I asked security why the fuck did they let him in, he said that when he had noticed his bloody feet and said, Hey bro, you all good? That looks like it hurts. Happy had stepped up to his face and threatened to choke him out and threw in some racial slurs too. And since it was just him and two 22-year-old 130-pound girls, he wasn't trying to die tonight and figured hopefully Happy could just get his stuff and leave. He was watching the cameras in the back ready to call the police and owners if anything got weird. Apparently we had different definitions of weird, but I understood his reaction, and ultimately we're all fine. Just spooked and creeped out. And now needing to clean the blood off the floor with bleach and gloves, and texting our boss that he owed us free weed about it, he agreed, and we all lived happily ever after. Really not the way I wanted to spend my Saturday morning, but sadly, here we are. I'm writing this as I sit down, more scared and anxious than I ever have been, beyond belief. I'm a female who was at my friend's flat. We were with her sister and also another female friend. Lots of good vibes and laughs, just normal girly time. 
At some point, uh, a trusted nice guy and a bit of a simp, but someone we wouldn't feel uncomfortable around, arrived. Women know what I mean, especially about the nice best friend to girl guy. Anyway, he was very approachable at first, very polite and sweet, but I was always told never to trust anyone who is nice on first appearance. It's usually overcompensation for something, or to hide something evidently darker, as I found out later on. He slowly became more argumentative, and had a very patronizing, condescending tone, which would rise for no reason. He acted like he was being completely normal, despite being passive-aggressive. It was a quick turn. Moving on, he attempted to take my water bottle and insisted to everyone for no reason when I took it back out of his pocket, which is weird anyway. Who put someone else's Evian bottle in their pocket? He then insisted it was his and that he brought it with him and genuinely seemed to believe it was his. This was when I got a weird gut feeling something was just not quite right. We then proceeded to have a back and forth. Nothing harsh said, but I told him he thinks he's the smartest person in the room, and I could see right through him. Quite an assumption to make about someone, but as a human, we can sense danger. Then, to top this already slightly alarming experience, he started pulling very vulgar sex faces and hand motions, not even in a jokey way between friends. He did it every time he got the chance. He was pretending to do some weird sex motion, Needless to say, I was very disgusted, as I barely even knew him, and it wasn't in a banter-type way where it was laughed off as a little one-off, but he repeatedly did it. He did this to me as no one was looking, and stood slightly behind my friend who was talking, so he could make these ugly gestures to me. He kept asking me to come back to his, and told me he wants to take me abroad, as he needs someone to look after him when drunk. I told him I'm not a babysitter in a bit of a joke way, and he straight away went very stiff and defensive. Slightest things seemed to trigger him. After being in a high alert, abusive situation for many years, sadly you recognize even more so that something in the air just isn't right. Even if you're not 100% of your gut feeling, always follow it, because it's there for a reason. There's absolutely no need for taking chances. Sadly, this world is too unkind. Anyway, my friend had gone to bed. My friend's sister was getting ready to leave, but I was very reluctant to be left alone with him for obvious reasons. She ordered a taxi and asked him to walk her out to it. He agreed, and I told him very bluntly I'm locking him out, and his immediate response in a very nonchalant manner was, Yeah, I would. That for some reason was what made me double down wholeheartedly on making sure I locked him out. Despite my friends maybe getting upset I've locked another friend out, I wasn't too concerned about what they would say, as I knew in my heart this man had ill intentions. I got the vibe he was pre-warning me, a bit like an animal playing with his food before eating. He was enjoying being weird and making me uncomfortable. As he walked out the door with my friend, I immediately locked the door, and thank you, God and Jesus above, that I locked the door, as usually I would forget. But in this instance, I am forever grateful I turned the lock. Thinking I was free of this weird creep, I heard talking at the door, and someone trying to slightly push it open. I told him I was feeling scared and don't feel comfortable at all in his presence. I called him a weirdo and a creep, and his response was, I'm not that weird. But he said it in an inquisitive way, like he was trying to convince himself, and not at any point did he take offense to my dramatic accusations and labels. I told him he had suppressed sexual urges, and that he won't be taking them out on me. He then proceeded to say, Oh, but not in a cute way. It was in a very apathetic, weird tone. Even in these interactions, I was panicking more, because instead of just thinking he was a run-around normal creep, I was digging into something much weirder and darker. He proceeded to attempt to open the door again, 
begging just to talk to me for two minutes, and weirdly enough, I couldn't make out if it was actually him through the door, as I had bad eyes, but I knew it was him, obviously due to the conversation we had. He stood outside for 15 minutes, pretending to book a taxi, and he kept repeating that our mutual friend was gone. He then left, and I was on high alert. I was standing by the door, and out of nowhere, I saw a white guy. The original guy was not white, so I noticed it wasn't the same person. He walked straight over to the door and covered the peephole with his thumb. This made my heart literally quiver. I was genuinely scared for my safety in a way that was very unsettling, and I hope no one else feels that fear. But those that know, your heart just sinks in this horrible way. The door was the only thing separating me from this utter evil predator. What made it so weird is that he was attempting to get a friend to come round and that we should all go out to the town. It's weird as no one was dressed for such outings. But looking back, that second guy who came to the door ever so randomly and covered the peephole looked like he left something on the floor. But I'm obviously not going outside to check as I panicked so bad, I don't remember if I saw him leave the little hallway or communal entrance, but I'm not sure if he did. I woke my friend to tell her. She could see I was so scared. I told her what happened, and she said she's never had anything like this happen, and how she doesn't know an older white guy, saying that she's a 24-year-old Jamaican woman and just doesn't happen to know any middle-aged white guys. It wouldn't have been so scary, but the way he just came right to the door and immediately covered the peephole, it was like he knew someone would be looking through there. I believe maybe this was connected, because what are the odds of this happening so close to each other in about a ten minute difference and not have some form of connection? Either way, please remember to lock your doors. It saves lives as simple as it is. If that door had opened when he attempted, due to being unlocked, who knows what I would have endured. I've never had anything this creepy happen, and I live in a big city, and I have a slightly unconventional lifestyle, so I have seen it all. People are very dangerous. Please be aware, if you feel something isn't right, it's not. We've all had bad dates, right? This is the only date I've had to date that rang every alarm bell and waved every red flag. I'll start this by saying I don't go on many dates, but when I do, I make sure I follow safety protocol by only meeting my date in public spaces. I let either family or friends know where I'm going, and I park in a populated place close by to wherever we meet. Anyway, this date initially suggested we meet at his house to watch a movie and have a few drinks. I said no, I don't feel comfortable with that. I only want to meet in public. He seemed okay with this, but then brought it up a few more times and said if money was an issue, we could meet up another time or forget about it altogether. But my date backtracked and went with my idea of meeting at a cafe that I chose. Anyway, he turns up in a two-door car and goes into the cafe and I follow behind and introduce myself. After a polite introduction, things begin to get a bit weird. I order a Coke and he says, Don't you want a drink? I was going to pop into a bar and get one. I say no, I'm not drinking, and he looks at me confused, as if I'm being unreasonable. I already explained in messages I don't drink as I'm on medication, so having to re-explain it again pissed me off. He seemed to disappear and goes to order a cider from the bar while I get a table. Anyway, we sit down with our drinks and the date immediately goes on about going back to his place, even though the original plan was to stay here and order food, and I already stated that was not happening. He says something along the lines of having a few drinks and eating in his place, and I said we don't have to eat, we can just have drinks and leave. 
He gets defensive and says he has money, but prefers it if we go back to his place. I make a joke and say, you're not a killer, are you? And instead of laughing it off, he stares at me uncannily and says, you don't think I would hurt you, do you? I laugh uncomfortably and say of course not, but really I'm relieved this date won't be going any further. My date suddenly says, are you going to follow me in your car? Because that wouldn't make much sense. How about we go into my car? But I've got packages in the front, so you'll have to squeeze in the back, and I'll drop you off back to your car after. In reality, that made less sense than me following in my car and driving home from his house. The fact it was completely illogical made it even more creepy in my mind. Every alarm bell was going off at this point. I said, look, I don't want to go to yours, and your insistence is giving me the creeps. My date looks shocked, mumbles something about needing the toilet, and excuses himself from the table. A few moments later, I see him through the cafe window getting into his car and driving off. Massive bullet dodged in my opinion. Also, the fact his car didn't have back doors made it even more sinister. Because imagine if something happened in the car and I couldn't escape. This isn't an entirely too creepy story, but it is one that freaked me out. For context, I live in a university-owned dorm about a mile from main campus, and they have a shuttle service that takes you to and from campus and this particular dorm. I got together with some friends on Labor Day for a barbecue and had a little too much to drink. I was still pretty coherent, but it would be obvious to anyone that I wasn't totally with it. Around 10.30pm, my friend walked me to the shuttle stop and waited for me to get on before heading back to her dorm. As I was on the shuttle, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched, but there were about four other people on the shuttle, so I assumed I was just being paranoid as well as drunk. However, that changed when I noticed a guy who was in his 20s sitting on the other side of the bus about two seats ahead of me who kept looking at me. I was uncomfortable but ignored it because I would be home and in my dorm soon. The shuttle drops us off and we all get into the elevator, myself first and the guy second. I push the button for my floor and he looks but doesn't press a number, which freaks me out, but I'm still hoping for the best and tell myself he just lives on the same floor. Of course, the other two people in the elevator get off before myself and this guy, and my dorm is the last room on my floor. We both get off on my floor, and I start walking. I look back, and he's deadlocked on me, so I start to panic and walk faster, and so does he. Finally, I pulled my keycard out and practically sprinted to my door as he also began to sprint. I got in and slammed the door behind me and locked it. After giving myself a minute, I look out the peephole, and he's sitting across the hall from my door, just staring at my door. He did this for a good seven to ten minutes, before muttering something to himself and leaving. I ended up calling one of my male friends to come over to my room and make sure he wasn't still lurking in the hall somewhere. Again, not entirely too creepy or exciting, but definitely scary at night, alone. This happened four years ago after a concert, and yes, full disclosure, I'm a total moron. I lived in a really sketchy town, and the venue was in a moderately safe part of my town, bordering on the less than ideal parts. I'd like to note that this happened around 11pm, and so all the public transit was out of service for the night. We also did not drive downtown. I was with my boyfriend at the time, Marvin. 
neither of us really wanted to download the Uber app, so he decided he wanted to call a taxi for some ungodly reason. I was tired and didn't question him. I remember him explicitly telling the guy on the phone we wanted to pay with card, so they said it would be about 15 to 20 minutes for them to arrive. We waited about a half hour, and then a taxi with the same logo of the company we called shows up. Marvin asks if the driver is ours, and he says, yeah, get in, and we followed suit. We explained to him that we're only able to pay with card because neither of us carry cash. The driver seemed pissed off and told us he'd drive us to an ATM. We explained that we talked to the company over the phone and told them we'd only be paying with card. He told us it was too late because the meter was already running and he wouldn't let us out. I started freaking out especially when he drove the opposite direction he was supposed to. I kindly let him know he was going the wrong way, since he seemed to have no idea where he was going. He kept asking me where I lived and what exit he should get off of, and when I offered to route him, he got angry and ignored me. I tried to get his information, but he didn't have his taxi license on display like he was supposed to. I was too afraid to talk back to this guy, because he had such a brash demeanor, so I sent my location to my friends and told them what was going on and took a photo of the driver when he wasn't paying attention. Before you say anything, I know I'm an idiot, especially since I have a lot of experience living in the city and taking taxis. Anyway, we finally arrived to my apartment in one piece, but the meter was almost at $30 at this point, so he demands we go to an ATM even though I wasn't sure if my campus had one, and my boyfriend decided to go look for some reason, so I was left with this asshole taxi driver. So, I was just playing on my phone trying to ignore my gnawing anxiety attack. I asked if he'd rolled down the window, and he says, no. The doors were also locked inside, and when he moved up to another parking place, I almost knocked his ass out and ran away thinking he was trying to kidnap me. But of course, this only gets worse. He starts by asking me pretty general questions and actually isn't an asshole for once. He asks how long I've been in school, what I study, you know, the usual stuff. Then he asks if my boyfriend and I live together. I laugh and just answer, no, since he didn't even live in the same city as me. He asks me if I want to marry my boyfriend to which I give him a gentle, no. Then he started asking if we were having sex before marriage, and I straight up wanted to kill this guy. He proceeded to ask me if I had any experience and how many boyfriends I've had, and he tells me I'm very pretty, along with other highly suggestive questions. Finally, Marvin comes back with money. The fare is almost up to $40, and my boyfriend just gives him two twenties. The driver finally lets me out, but then has the audacity to demand a tip. And of course, my ever so classy ex says, here's your tip, you greedy bastard, and flips him off, and proceeds to cuss him out while I'm literally having a full-blown panic attack. We're both fairly certain that he would have robbed us if we had cash. Also, as a note, we called the taxi place and asked what happened. They said our driver reported that we never showed up. He ended up sitting outside my building for two hours while I was literally freaking out. I'm just glad I live in a high security apartment building. This happened about 10 years ago. I must have been 27. My partner at the time was in a band, and we stayed in this converted garage. It was on a service lane. It's like a street that has businesses down it and the back of houses. My partner had come home very early that morning and gone to bed. His bandmate was living in a bus at the time, which was parked out the front as they stored the gear next to our flat in another garage. I woke up at around 5am, hearing screams, mainly from a woman but also very aggressive shouting from a man, saying, I'm going to kill you, and so on. The area we were in is not the nicest, although now the area is very hot property, 
Not far from the beach, boutique shops, that kind of thing. But this was coming from a house that I thought was condemned. Two stories, dilapidated, torn curtains, rotten wood, about five broken down cars out in the front that had been picked apart. Turns out someone was living there. I woke up and went straight to the front door. I saw a man stomping around a parked car on the side of the road, chasing a lady in her pajamas around it, threatening to kill her. She was screaming and crying. Out of instinct, I screamed something like, Oi, what the fuck is going on? I'm calling the cops. They both stopped and looked at me, in my pajamas, standing near my door, barefoot. The man had full leather jacket, pants and boots, half a face tattoo, a tomoko, and even though he was across the street, I could see the whites of his eyes. He was obviously on something and furious. I'm going to kill you, he shouted at me, and motion cutting of his neck with his thumb. When he turned to me, the woman escaped to the abandoned looking house and locked the door. I, being brave and stupid, replied, come on then and grabbed a large plank of 2 by 4 I kept behind the door. I walked outside in my pajamas and leopard print robe with the wood over my shoulder, on the phone to the police. I'm not the smallest woman in the world. I must have been around 80 kilograms and 5 foot 10, but he would have taken me out if he wanted. I think the idea of the police made him second guess. He got the hint and took off down a street. My partner, nor the other bandmate in the bus, got up. I was pretty angry at both of them. I seemed to be the only one who had the balls to do anything about it. Another lady across the road came out also, and we talked about our menfolk not doing anything about it. Anyway, later on that week, a lady came to my house thanking me for helping her niece, that he was some crazy cracked out guy that had fallen in love with her and wouldn't take no for an answer. He had come to her house without invitation, expecting that she would welcome his drunk, cracked out ass with open arms only to get rejected, which threw him into a rage, to which he proceeded to kick and beat her and chase her around the street. About another week later, I was told he was arrested and taken away on my street. He was led away by police, handcuffed with a cigarette hanging out of his mouth. I was glad to hear it as I was terrified that he would come back when I was alone. The year is 2018. Three friends and I decided to travel to Bali for about a week, since it was cheap and we had some time, so why not? Our itinerary included sightseeing, trying local foods, mountain climbing, visiting bars at a beach, basically a typical vacation in Indonesia. It was honestly quite a surreal experience. The country is absolutely beautiful, and the food was amazing. The only issue I had about the trip were the locals. Drugs were really prominent there, especially mushrooms. The streets were filled with druggies dying to sell us their drugs. I'm not exaggerating when I say this. One guy even grabbed my arm because I ignored his two-for-one deal for a one-way trip to meet Jesus. I shrugged him off while my friends laughed it off, suggesting that I may be passing up a chance to meet our Lord and Savior. He looked rabid and frantic, like he was about to pounce onto me like a dog diagnosed with rabies. I didn't feel too afraid as we were confident that we could handle them, since half of them were not even sober. However, that is only the tip of the iceberg. The horror starts when we went back to our Airbnb for the night. We had an early day the next morning and were exhausted. The place was extremely cheap and it didn't even have a proper locking mechanism for the door. It had two wooden doors which swing inwards and the only way to lock them was to wedge a wooden block through the holes mounted on the door. It was quite a primitive lock, but it gets the job done, I guess. Everything was going well until the last night of our trip when we realized that the wooden block was missing. We looked everywhere for it, but to no avail. I just figured that one of us must have misplaced it somewhere. 
we settled for using a selfie stick. I know, I know. It sounds like a horrible idea, but we didn't have anything else that fit the holes to which the door closed. We turned in for the night, seemingly not expecting anything since we'd already stayed there for six days with no issues. I woke up to strange clicking sounds in the dead of night. I got out of my bed, and I thought that maybe it was one of the guys, so I nonchalantly approached the noise. My friends were all sleeping, so I decided to investigate the cause of the noise. The ruckus seemed to be coming from the door, so I headed towards them feeling extremely confused. Who could be at our doorstep at this time of night, I pondered. I noticed the doors were slightly opened, and the selfie stick was horribly deformed. I took a peek outside, and I saw three people staring through the gap between the doors. They were really close to the entrance, and were attempting to push the doors open. I yelled at them, questioning their intentions, as I noticed one of them was holding the wooden block. I was shocked and puzzled at the situation, as I recognized one of the men. He did the overall cleaning for the Airbnbs and pathways during the day, so there was no reason for him to be there at 3am. The other guy asked if the wooden block belonged to us, as they allegedly found it outside of our Airbnb. I definitely smelled bullshit, as there was absolutely no reason to do that at 3am. I called for my guys and the three men immediately ran for it. I clue in the guys on the circumstances, and we stayed up until morning came, in case they tried anything funny. We decided to report to the reception about their employee, but the description I gave them were not synonymous with theirs. They told me the housekeepers they hired consisted of only females in their late thirties and forties. This sent shivers down our spines as we came to realize that we had let a complete imposter in and out of our rooms while we were out. Luckily, nothing important was lost, and we got out of the situation safely. I can't imagine what would have happened if I didn't wake up on that fateful night, as the doors were close to being opened. I was just grateful that it was our last night there. For starters, my parents have always taught me how to be independent. I live 30-ish minutes away from New York City by train, so I was taught not to be afraid of the subway systems. I quickly learned how to find my way around New York City and my town in Jersey via public transportation and was always checking in with my parents whether I was going to practice or a movie with my friends, so it was never a big deal. Anyway, a few weeks prior to the incident, the internet in our house wasn't working, and I needed the computer to finish some research paper. Since the library was closed, my brother took me to this internet cafe a few blocks away from our house. While there, my brother was talking to his friend Charles, and introduced us both. Little did I know, this Charles was about to save my life. Oh, I almost forgot an important detail. This cafe was on the main street of my town, and there was a bus stop a block away from the cafe. A few weekends after meeting Charles, my friends invited me to go bowling in the city. My parents said okay. I was 14, so obviously I had to ask for permission, and I was on my way around noon. We bowled, got pizza, talked about my friend's new puppy. Typical girl things. Everything was fine until I was making my way back home. 3 p.m. There are delays with the subway system. Instead of waiting it out, I decided I could just take another subway home. It would drop me off at the Newark Penn Station, and I would be one bus ride away from home. No problem. 3.15 p.m. I'm on the subway, and I notice that this older man is staring at me. It creeps me out, but it's nothing new in New York City. I ignore him. 3.50 p.m. I arrived at Newark Penn Station, and this man sees me get up to go. He makes eye contact, smiles. He hurries behind me. Mind you, 
I'm a young, small girl at the time, so I'm an easy target. He's creepy, so I decided to walk fast and get lost in the crowds. Doors open, I speed walk through people. This guy must have had 20-20 vision, because as soon as I arrived at my bus stop, he was right behind me. Around 4pm-ish, I'm sitting next to an elderly looking lady at the bus stop. The creepy guy is pacing back and forth less than 10 feet away from me. He's looking at me, smiling, pacing the floor. Every part of my young body is saying, run, now. He's bad news, but there's nowhere to go. And somehow sitting next to this older lady made me feel safer. I take my phone out to text my mom. It's dead. Wonderful. Thankfully, more people have arrived at this bus stop, and I feel better. There are witnesses around. He can't do anything, but he's still staring and pacing back and forth. 4.15 p.m. The bus arrives, finally. I quickly get in and sit as close as possible to the driver. I don't know why I didn't tell the bus driver what was happening. I was young, scared, naive, and didn't want to burden the driver. Stupid, I know now. My stop is the very last one, so I thought, the creepy guy has to get off the bus before me. There's no way he's going to stay until the end. Many, many bus stops later, this guy is still on the bus. He did this creepy thing. Whenever the bus stopped, he would get up with everyone else, and instead of getting off the bus, he would sit closer and closer to the front. There are fewer and fewer people on the bus, so I realize this guy is getting off whenever I get off the bus. This means, if I get off at my stop, he can follow me home, find out where I live, or maybe I'll never get home. 5 p.m.-ish, there were only two bus stops separating me and my house. This guy, a lady, and I are the last ones inside the bus at this point. I decide I'm getting off early because I'm not having this guy know where I live. I get off a bus stop early. He sees me and follows me. I pick up speed. He picks up speed. Fuck it. I run. And now he's running after me. In mid-panic, I remember the cafe. It closes soon. I'm a block away. I run for my life to the cafe, and this guy is right behind me. As I'm approaching the cafe, I see Charles outside, locking up the place. He sees me and knows there's something wrong. I guess he sees the fear in my face, and this older guy running after young me. I get to him and Charles immediately pushes me inside the cafe and locks the door behind us, therefore locking the creep outside. My heart is pounding. I quickly tell Charles that this random guy's been following me across three towns and that I was scared. He calls the cops. The guy is staring inside the cafe, and I'm staring back at him, protected by the locked, yet clear glass door. I had to remember him. The creepy guy smiles and walks away as if nothing had just happened. Little did I know that Charles' uncle is a cop in our town. A few minutes later, the cops show up. After describing him in vivid details, it takes them minutes to catch this creep still walking down the main street. We later find out that this creepy guy had a warrant out for his arrest for armed robbery and he had prior accounts of sexual assault. Had it not been for Charles, I don't know what would have happened to me that day. Thanks for saving my life. And no, this did not deter me from public transportation or from exploring the city alone. My parents did freak out and got me mace though. As an adult, I traveled all over the world, sometimes alone but I'm hyper aware of my surroundings because of what happened at 14. Years back when I was 20, 
I was walking back to my car from the library in the city. I was on a side street. It was about 10 p.m. I had my backpack on. It was full and I had my laptop in it. So, I'm on a pretty dark street. There are street lights, but they are very far apart, so it gets very dark in between them. I come across this man walking his big pit. He came off as really nice at first, smiled and wanted to chat. I stopped, and we're talking all normal, and I'm asking about his dog. So after 30 seconds or so, he sort of steers us into a dark spot under a tree without the street light. I thought strange, but okay, maybe for his dog. Then he moves so he and his dog are both in front of me, and I'm cornered into the house behind me. I start to get this bad feeling. This whole time he's being friendly and smiling, but at certain points he would get serious, almost like he was thinking of his next move, and moving closer, also while fidgeting with his other hand in his pocket. So he's very close to me at this point. I had nowhere to go. My back is against the angled window. I'm literally in the corner, backed on all sides by him and his dog, and the house behind me. So my internal siren is blaring at this point. I'm a very nervous person anyway, but I'm shaking at this point and feel that I'm cornered. It's pitch black under the shade. I decide to spring out from being cornered against the house into the street. He looked surprised, almost like, where'd you go? He begins walking towards me, and as I get to the middle of the street, I took my backpack off one shoulder and grabbed my apple carving knife and he stopped walking towards me. So I get to a more busy area with people and hop in a cab, and the cab driver notices that I'm shaking. I told him I was just about to get robbed, and asked him to tell the police. Once I got to my car, I drove near where I was, and saw three police SUVs with their sirens on going towards that area. Later on, I heard there were a bunch of robberies that happened in that part of the city. This happened back in 2010 when I was 21. My best friend and I had blown off any sort of responsibility for the whole summer and chose to just party instead. It's probably no surprise that by the end of the summer, we were both evicted and now condemned to our parents' houses until we got our shit together again. One night, we were at my mom's place playing Left for Dead until about 2 a.m., when Cam decided to call a cab and head back to his mom's place. He had to use my phone to call the cab company because he forgot to pay his bill. This was also the days before Uber and Lyft, so you'd have to call the station and they'd send a cab. About 15 minutes later, we could see the cab waiting outside and he got in and left. About 10 minutes later, I got a call on my cell phone from the cab company. I knew the number by heart so I knew it was coming from the central station. When I answered, there was a woman on the line whose voice immediately sent shivers through my body. This is Badger Cab calling for Cameron. His cab has arrived. I was confused and responded with something like, Uh, what? She said, Tell Cameron to come outside. The voice was echoey and distant like it was an auditory house of mirrors bouncing around a fog-drenched void. I wasn't sure why the voice was creeping me out so much, so I tried pushing it aside and just told her that he already left like ten minutes ago. I glanced out the window and saw a car idling outside on the street. It was parked a bit to the right of my house, so all I could see were the brake lights. I figured dispatch probably sent an extra cab on accident, but the woman responded almost like she didn't hear me the first time. Tell him to come outside, she repeated, but this time with a rigid bite in her tone. He was already picked up, I repeated. There were a few weird noises for a second, like the wind was blowing into the microphone, and then the call dropped. I redialed the number to the cab company, and a man answered. I told him what had just happened, and let him know that they must have sent two cabs on accident. I don't have any female cab drivers out tonight, the dispatcher told me. I thought to myself, 
Maybe it was a guy with a high-pitched voice. The dispatcher told me that the driver picked up my friend just fine a while ago, and that a cab driver wouldn't be calling through their landline like that anyway. When I told him there was a car idling outside, and reiterated that there was 100% a woman calling, telling my friend to come outside and get in her car, he started getting very creeped out and worried. We both figured that someone had to have spoofed the cab company's phone number. It's pretty easy to do, but that didn't leave us with any comfort. Why was someone spoofing a cab company's phone number and waiting outside their customer's pickup location? How did she even know that Cameron had called for a cab? The dispatcher radioed his driver and made sure he had Cameron and that everything was fine. Then he let me know that he was safe and almost to his destination. The dispatcher and I talked on the phone for a couple of minutes, brainstorming what the fuck could possibly be happening. From his perspective, it's almost like someone is following and trying to lure a customer into their car, which is probably not good for business. After Cam made it to his mom's crib, he called me on the landline there to ask what was going on. The only logical explanation he could think of was that it was this stalker he's been dealing with for several years. He had a restraining order on her because she would follow him, break into his apartment, and wait for him to come home. She would do all sorts of weird, creepy shit like that. I'm not totally convinced that's what was happening though. How would she have known he just called for a cab on my phone? How would she have known where I was living with my mom? If he were leaving my actual place or the place of one of our close friends, then that would be plausible. But we were pretty tucked away on the outskirts of town in a suburb, and my mom has a different last name than I do, so she couldn't have googled it. But it's the most logical explanation either of us could come up with, so it's the one I'm betting on, until someone throws out a better theory. Recently, I was living in a women's shelter, and I made some really good friends there. We used to sit at this park across from a temple at night and drink and smoke whatever. We'd be there for hours listening to my music, just having fun and talking about our lives. We were all quite young in the group, early 20s. I should say we were all there due to an unfair amount of trauma in our lives, and we connected through that a lot. One night my friends and I went to a party in the city where we'd been drinking for hours. We weren't tired when it was over. So when me and my closest friend there got back to the shelter, we decided to go sit in the park and watch the sunrise and drink a bit more. We're there for a little while, and we suddenly hear R&B and rap music coming from the temple across the street. I might add that we're both mixed black girls, and we were very tipsy so we thought it would be a strange adventure to go over there to see who was playing my favorite song so loud in the morning. Could it be a potential friend? Or maybe we'd learn about the place. It was a beautiful temple. We walk over and the gates were locked. We were disappointed, but a man comes out to greet us and said we could come in to see the temple. He said it was his music, and he loves that we like the same music. We go in and he shows us around the temple. It's beautiful in the bottom, but we notice a lot of rooms with beds, and he tells us if we ever wanted to rent rooms, we could for unbelievably cheap. We thought, being homeless girls with not much work, that it was an amazing opportunity, almost too good to be true. At first I felt nothing but positive vibes. He showed us his computer that's playing the music and asks what songs we would want to hear. I get comfortable with this guy. He was funny and we all got along well. Anyway, we're talking about recreational activities. We had some and we offered it to him because he was just so cool and chill. He says he will pack ours with our stuff. That will be important later. I should add that he was constantly complimenting me specifically. My hair, my skin color, and he was saying really forward compliments that made me uncomfortable. He started asking if I liked Asian men, and if I'd ever been with one. He then went on to ask more questions about my sexual preferences. 
and then told us he would give very bad drugs to girls to smoke, and then do stuff with them. Drugs no one should ever do. He said he sees us sitting at the park sometimes through his window. All of that was becoming a pile of red flags. He then said as we were smoking that if we have another friend, we can also take his room because he's moving soon. That was when I got a weird feeling, so I decided to ask him why he was leaving if the rent was so cheap. He wouldn't answer, just dodging the question, and my intuition was telling me something was wrong. It's ridiculous it took so long. I asked if I could get some water, and he said to get one out of the fridge. I went out, and there was another guy there, and he was nice and offering me the water, but I decided to get a glass and use the tap. He runs out the room my friend was in and says, No, the one from the fridge. And I say I'm fine with this. He walks me back to the room, and I sit back down next to my friend. He then went on to say, I'm moving because I hear people screaming and having orgies at night, noises banging on my door, sounds of people being tortured and hurt, and it disturbs my sleep. I was so alarmed. It was almost like it accidentally slipped out what he had just said. I almost thought it was a joke. I asked him if it was nightmares, ghosts, or even real people that are making these noises at night, and he continued to dodge my questions. I asked why on earth he didn't tell us this earlier. We were honestly in disbelief, and he continued to ignore what we were saying and acting strange. I then noticed he had closed the door when I came back in earlier. I started to think we needed to get the hell out of there. He then said, You have to listen to this song. You'll love it. It gets worse. He puts on this terrifying chant or Viking-like song and plays it loud, too loud. And he's chanting this song so loud, we're yelling at him to turn it off, but he doesn't listen. The video is Viking-like people killing others, as we're begging him to turn it off because it's scary, and why would he or anyone like that music? He turns his face to us fast and screams maniacally with his teeth showing his tongue out and his eyes wide. It was the most distorted face I've seen in real life. He didn't look human. No sane person would act this way. My fight or flight response isn't really good, so I sat there laughing it off, frozen in fear. My friend, on the other hand, was in fight mode. She threatened to beat his ass if he didn't let us out right now. I ran to the door, and he ran at me. So I froze in front of him, and he went to open the door because it was locked. We started running out of the house while he laughs maniacally, speed walking behind us. We bolted out, and mind you, I'm still trying to laugh it off, but it was the beginning of the worst panic attack I've ever experienced. If my friend wasn't there in fight mode, I genuinely don't know what would have happened to us. I know it probably doesn't sound that scary, but this terrified me to my core. The way he changed so quickly, his movements and mannerisms, the way his face just didn't look human anymore, and how naive we were to go in there in the first place, because it seemed like an innocent temple. We didn't get many answers from the situation, because we were too scared to go back or cause any problems, which is stupid. We don't know if he was truly troubled, or if there were actually people there getting hurt, killed, tortured, or having orgies. It scared me as well to think about the fact he knew we were homeless, vulnerable girls at the time, that he may have lured us in with the music he hears us play. We also were completely tripping balls because he laced our stuff. I don't think I can say on here what my friend believed it was, but it was the worst experience ever, and I highly doubt those girls he spoke about in the beginning were there consensually.
For some context, I live in a major city and currently don't do a lot of driving due to ongoing issues with my car, and the pandemic has made me turn to more delivery apps in general. So the other day, around 1pm, I decided to order some lunch after doing a lot of cleaning. I placed the Uber Eats order and found something to watch while I waited for the food. Within a few minutes, a driver accepted the order and I noticed right away that the driver, Anthony, was on a bike, didn't have a profile picture or any deliveries on record. At first, I wasn't alarmed at all. I was almost amused, like, oh wow, guess I'm this person's first ever customer. But then a full 30 minutes passes with no driver movement on the app, and at this point, I'm thinking maybe something is glitching out or the driver is stuck. I contact support via the chat option, and they end up assigning a new driver because they couldn't reach the first one. Odd, but whatever. Now is when it starts getting a little weirder. The new driver assigned is in the exact same spot as the original driver was. They're also on a bike, also have no profile picture, and have no prior deliveries as well. And this driver's name was... Laurie. I let another 20 minutes pass with no driver movement before I message them myself and say, Hi there, are there any issues with the order? The app shows that the driver saw the message, but there was no response. All this time, I'm checking to see if Uber Eats is maybe experiencing some issues, and at this point, while I'm definitely weirded out, I'm mostly just hungry, so I contact support again to request some assistance. They reassign the driver again and apologize for the inconvenience. Finally, the third driver assigned is the exact same scenario. Same spot, on a bike, no profile picture, no prior deliveries. Only this time the name is Robert. And before I can react and go about canceling the order at this point because I'm tired of dealing with this, he suddenly has my food and immediately messages me the following. Hello, have your food. What's your phone number? I responded right away with, I'm not really comfortable giving my phone number out when you can just message me here. And he responded with, What's your number? Be there in 10. How old are you? And at this point the alarm bells are going off. I contact support immediately to have the order cancelled and get further assistance. I get connected to Uber's safety team, who informs me that the order has been cancelled. I'll be refunded. They start taking down the details of the strange interactions. As I'm giving the woman on the phone the information she needs, I'm starting to calm down, thinking this was just some creep or something. And that's when I hear a man's voice at the door. Miss Joanna, I have your food, and I can't even describe the chill that went down my spine because of the way he said it. Making things even worse, the uber safety woman on the phone with me heard him as well and says, Is that him? We cancelled the order. I poked my head around the door. The main heavy door was open, the metal screen door was closed and locked, but it did allow us to see each other. I got a look at him, and when he saw me on the phone, he went from smiling to looking furious. He suddenly got right up against the door and kept asking who I was on the phone with. And at this point, I started asking him to leave because he was making me uncomfortable and he's getting more and more angry. He starts pounding on my door and grabbing the doorknob while shouting to be let in. The woman on the phone is asking if I'm okay. The man is still shouting. So basically, I'm in full meltdown mode at this point and hurriedly close the heavy door to lock it. The man is becoming borderline belligerent as he kicks my door and the woman tells me to call the police. He ended up walking away from my house about a minute after that and back up to the sidewalk. And for a moment, I thought he fucked off. So I finished my conversation with the Uber safety woman so she could submit the report. Once she submitted it, I called the police and told them what happened. 
They told me if he came back to call again and they would send out an officer. I did end up having to call them again and give a full report and description of the man since he didn't end up leaving right away. He stayed in the neighborhood for almost 20 minutes. According to one of my neighbors, after she heard the yelling, she saw the man I described walk back up from my house to the sidewalk and hop into a truck with another man in the passenger seat, and they apparently just sat there staring at people walking by and being incredibly sketchy. And that's when she walked back towards my house and asked me what happened. Luckily, she was able to give myself and the cop a description of the vehicle and the other man as well. So basically, there was a very bizarre and uncomfortable experience, and I wanted to share it to maybe see if anyone has ever experienced anything like this. Because honestly, I'm still pretty shaken up, and I will be avoiding delivery apps for quite a while. So, strange Uber Eats driver who asked me for personal information and then proceeded to try and break in. Please... Let's not meet. I was backpacking with my dog and about 12 miles from the road and trailhead. So pretty far from people, though popular enough that other hikers might be around. Though we saw no one all day. About 2 a.m., my dog started this really deep growl and wakes me up. I turn on my headlamp and see his teeth showing, and he's right on top of me. I hear heavy footsteps near the tent. Maybe a black bear or a moose. I leash my dog so he doesn't tear through the tent, and the footsteps move further away, but keep circling my tent. All of my food and toiletries are hung in a tree in a bear bag. There's nothing in the tent to draw a bear's attention. I clap my hands. Something is still slowly circling. Not something a moose would do. And a bear might if he wanted food. But I've got nothing and a really big dog with me. I decide to step out of the tent with the leash in one hand and bear spray in the other. Yelling, Hey bear. The footsteps stop. My dog's nose is in the air telling me to look right but there's nothing in the light of my headlamp that I can see. I didn't hear anything run off, but it's quiet. I give it five minutes or so, get back in the tent, and it starts up again, slowly circling maybe 50 feet from me. Maybe an hour later, I hear the footsteps wander off into the woods. At dawn, I take the dog and bear spray, and I start looking for tracks. I find a clear path in the leaves that have been trampled, but no tracks. The dog's nose is on the ground, and I follow his lead, and he follows the loop around our campsite. We finally see a few human footprints. Not shoe tracks, a regular sized bare human foot. And we also found that he used the toilet and some toilet paper. Some asshole was wandering around the middle of nowhere near the tent and circling my tent for an hour or more, and used the bathroom for me to find. In August 2012, five friends and I rented a penthouse and stayed in San Jose del Cabo for a month. On our second day there, we rented a speedboat for our much-anticipated wakeboarding excursion. The majority of the ride was fantastic, dolphins and whatnot. We had a blast. We followed the shoreline from San Jose del Cabo to Cabo San Lucas. Midpoint in our trip, we went to flip a U in a harbor close to the Holiday Inn. Then, all hell broke loose. At the apex of our turn, we lost power. This means the front end of our boat was facing the beach, the back was facing the ocean. Now, if you're not familiar with the Mexican undercurrent, it's fast, and the water deepens very quickly. The tide pulled us into the waves. With every surge, the water pushed the tail of the boat up while tilting the nose down. 
and as soon as I noticed that tilt, I knew impending doom was coming. Surely enough, the next push of water tilted the nose far enough down to be caught by the undercurrent, thus throwing me straight up into the air. At this point, the boat hadn't flipped yet. When the receding wave brought the boat back level, gravity returned me to my seat on the boat. I landed on my feet, but felt a shock up my back and an immediate, smashing warmth in my spine. Then bam, I fell forward in between the seats and couldn't feel a fucking thing below my chest. Meanwhile, the boat is on the verge of being flipped vertically. My friend Katie jumps on top of me and holds onto the railing with all of her strength so I don't fly off or get dragged away. Another wave pounds. This time, water slams into the boat, smacking Katie in the back. The force of the water pounds her nose right into the back of my head, breaking her nose. When this happened, I think I blacked out for a second. I'm a very strong swimmer, so when I finally felt the boat getting sucked out from under us, I remember thinking, I have to swim as hard as I can or I'm going to die, so I did. A local surfer, Juan, saw it all happen and swam out with his boat and helped me to the shore. My friend lost her wallet, I lost my re-entry visa, I lost my favorite dress in that damned accident too. I spent the rest of the month and my budget for what would have been fishing, golfing, drinking, stuff with my friends, on food, tequila, hour-long massages, and Mexican over-the-counter pain pills. The doctors there were fantastic. I had a T5-7 to compression injury with bruising in my lumbar. He said I was extremely close to a serious injury. I still feel it five years later. I have PTSD from the accident for sure. Boats make me sweaty. This happened to me around six years ago. My family owns a flower slash produce shop, and we travel to farmer's markets sometimes. Most of the family are not well enough to pick in the garden or do heavy loading, so we often hire people for the summers. My uncle hired this guy, Kevin. Kevin was in his late 30s, maybe early 40s. He was down on his luck. He was going through a divorce and needed some extra income. He was very nice. Almost too nice. He was actually camping on our land because his ex-wife-to-be was to have their house. At this time, I was 16 to 17 years old. Well, one day, he found me in an alcove-type spot where no one else was around and gave me his card with his personal number, in case I wanted to ever hang out. He was very insistent that we should do it that day after work, and kept pestering me for my phone number. I was immediately creeped out by this, and politely told him we would see, just to get him away from me. I immediately told my mom, who kind of brushed it off, but he gave me off vibes. A few days after this, he didn't show up to work. He was called a few times. After no contact whatsoever, we read in the newspaper a day or two later that he crashed his ex-wife's birthday celebration and tried to kill her. She drove to the nearest police station and he gave chase. Actually crashing into parked police cars in his haste, he's still in prison and I'm just really glad I did not have to hang out with him. Back in 2020, I was living with my ex, and we lived in a shitty apartment. But later that year, he achieved his dream of being a homeowner, and we began the process of moving into the house. Well, one night he came home from work, and decided he was done with the apartment, and we should pack what we had left and just move into the new house. So we packed up our pets and the rest of our stuff, and then moved in. This is where it gets creepy. It was probably about 9pm or so. My ex was inside the new house setting up the internet and I went out to the trunk of the car to get some stuff. 
when I heard a woman screaming and calling a name. At first I thought she lost her dog, but as she got closer, it sounded more like a kid's name. She was also frantic and then said the words, come to mommy. So that's when it hit me, she had lost her kid. As she finally got into my view, I could see she was a woman with blonde hair. She was carrying a lawn chair and she was crying. At this point I was making no attempt to conceal myself from the driveway and instead stared straight at her. I expected her to ask me for help since her kid was lost and that's what I would do, but she didn't. She looked at me for a moment, then kept walking down the street, still crying and calling his name. I ran inside and told my boyfriend what happened. Apparently he could hear her from all the way inside and he called the police. The cop wasted no time in getting there, but still, she walked fast, and by the time we saw the cop car, we couldn't hear her anymore. I don't know what happened after that. It was a strange welcoming to our new home, and it never happened again. I'm still not sure if she was really missing a kid or was just crazy, but her panic seemed genuine. What really creeps me out is how she didn't ask for my help. She just walked past me like I wasn't there. If you lost your kid, wouldn't you be asking someone to call the police at least? I do wish I knew what happened. Hopefully she got her kid back or got the help she needed. Growing up, we lived in the projects. Our grandmother lived in the project's area, probably about a mile away from us. My younger brother and I went to take something to her, and then when we were on our way back home, it had started getting dark. We decided to take a shortcut, which meant walking through a dirt road, with a factory on the right and a wooded area on the left. There was almost no light in the area, so imagine an 11 to 12 year old boy and his 9 to 10 year old brother working up the courage to walk through the darkness to get to the main road. We started off walking quickly to make it through there, and I was pretty much holding my breath the entire time, because I didn't want to make noise. I didn't want whatever was out there to hear us. Finally, we made it out of the wooded dirt road and we turned right onto the sidewalk of the main road. We make it about ten feet, and suddenly we hear something behind us. I look back, and my brother does too. We see someone come out of the same dirt road we just come out of. We turn around, my heart pounding, and I say to my brother, They're following us. We need to hurry up. We still had a way to go to get home, and the only street light that we could see was down the road. I say to my brother while holding his hand, Walk faster. We hear the footsteps behind us start picking up speed as we are practically running. Once we notice this, I whisper, We're gonna run. Are you ready? Okay. Ready. Run. And I start running, almost dragging my brother behind me. It's probably all in my head, but I swear I hear the person behind us running too. We run past two cross streets and run up a little hill and make it to the traffic light. We stop and look back quickly. It's so dark, we don't see anything. We still think we're in danger, so we run across the street and have one more street to cross, and the project's area would be in front of us. We run the remainder of the way home. We don't want to be told we can't go anywhere again, so we don't say anything about being frightened and running all the way home. Thinking back to that time, our imaginations probably got the best of us, or maybe we did escape. We'll never know. Okay, so this happened about 15 years ago. My sister-in-law Rose and her husband Bob had been married for around 17 years. They had two sons, Stuart and Michael. They lived in one of Scotland's new towns. One September day, I got news that Bob had died. It was sudden and totally unexpected. 
Of course there was the funeral. Then things settled down and we all got on with things. But this is where it gets strange. I was in bed one dark winter's night. There are pitch black dark at that time of year in Scotland, and sometime between 1 and 2 a.m. I woke up. As clear as day, Bob was standing next to the bed, short sleeve check shirt and all. He often wore these. Anyway, I looked at him and he looked at me and said, I don't want to be here. Then he shrugged his shoulders. He then said, Tell Rose I love her. Tell the boys, too. I never saw him vanish into thin air or anything like that. He simply wasn't there after he said it. I never did tell her or give her the message, because she would have thought I was mad. The thing is, that was the third time something similar had happened. Weird, right? Was it really him, his ghost, or was it my mind playing tricks? For me personally, it was very, very real. This was a couple of years ago. I think I was 19 at the time. I was a cashier in a small grocery store. It was late, about 30 minutes until we closed, and there were only three other employees besides me. I was alone on the front end register, and this younger guy comes in and buys some produce. This guy is the only customer in the entire store, and I have no clue where my co-workers were. He ends up hanging around my register and eats some of his produce while he makes small talk with me. At first, I thought he was kind of funny, just a weird guy, but then he asked me if I had social media. I said no, because I'm not going to give this guy my contact information. He was like, why are you lying, and giggling a bit. I told him I wasn't, and then immediately his face grew stern and he said, why are you fucking lying, Jessica? It made me so uncomfortable. He was so aggressive about it. I just said I wasn't, and then he changed the topic. He started talking about being in a criminal organization in some South American country. I can't recall which, but he talked about smuggling drunks and people. And then he went into detail about how they would chop people's hands and fingers off. By this point, he was back to being giggly. I had an awful gut feeling, and I felt so scared. He kept getting closer and closer to me as he talked, and eventually he was on my side of the register, and I had moved away from where I was originally standing. He kept talking to me for about 30 minutes, and the entire time I was completely alone. No other customers came in, and my co-workers were not on the floor. I tried making an excuse to call my manager to come down to me, but he literally told me he was busy and hung up on me. This guy was so creepy and he kept trying to get personal information from me and wouldn't leave me alone. I was so afraid to say anything that would make him notice I was uncomfortable because I don't know what his intentions were or how he would react because he was clearly unstable. Finally, after what felt like forever, my manager came down to close the store and I ran so fast upstairs and just started sobbing because I was so scared. I never saw him again, thank God, but I had a bad gut feeling that his intentions were not good. The way he was trying to corner me, pry for information, and weirdly gloat about violent crime he partakes in. A few years ago, I was finishing up my masters. One night, before a particularly horrid evening class, a friend from school and I decided we would grab some ice cream beforehand to help us get through the class. I picked her up from her apartment, and we went to a cold stone just down the street from the building where our class was. It was a busy, albeit small, strip of shops. We got our ice cream and came out to sit in my car to eat it as there was nowhere to sit outside. As we're walking back to the car, we hear a man call out from behind us and say, Excuse me, in a somewhat panicked voice. We turn around and it's a man in a suit, 
He's probably in his forties. The suit doesn't look like it fits him very well. He had no backpack or laptop bag, and he looks panicked and hurried, but he was clear-eyed and fully aware of his surroundings. He says, Do you girls know where the train station is? I'm supposed to catch this train in 20 minutes. We tell him yes, the train station is about a 10 minute walk from where we were, and we gave him directions. Now, mind you, we're in a very busy area, full of Ubers, Lyfts, and cabs, and we're in a busy parking lot where tons of people are coming and going. His walk, at a leisurely pace, would be 10 minutes, so he's got plenty of time to get over there, and he wasn't out of shape at all. We turn around and start walking to the car again, and he said thanks, and it seemed like the conversation was over. The next thing we know, he's following us to the car, and when we turn around to see if he's still there, he says, Could you girls do me a favor? If I promise to be nothing but an upstanding gentleman, could you take me to the train station so I don't miss my train? Now, a few things don't add up here. This area we are in is known for all types of white collar business, but everyone has a bag of some sort, especially if they're taking mass transit. Also, he looked out of place in the suit, and the way he asked us for the ride made our red flags go up. Why do you need to preface that you'll promise to be an upstanding gentleman if you are one? While he's asking us about the train station and for the ride, Several single men walked to their cars, got in and left, including one of the cars next to ours where we were standing. Why didn't he approach one of them? The whole situation felt off. My friend and I were definitely on the same page, and unlucky for this guy, we're both master students in forensic psychology, so we're about to go to a class where we talk about people, mostly men, luring, assaulting, torturing, and killing people in attempts for us, the student, to better understand their psychological mindset. So, even more so than the average person, we're gonna have our guard up about strangers approaching us. We unsurprisingly told him that sorry, we couldn't help. We had to get to class and that he could grab an Uber, Lyft, or cab pretty quickly or walk and we'd hoped he'd make it. Instead of saying thanks and walking off, he hung his head very dramatically in defeat and said, I shouldn't know. If you were my daughters, I wouldn't have wanted you to give me a ride. And he walked off in the opposite direction of where we told him the train was. I often think about this whole scenario. Maybe he was just late and panicked asked the first people he saw got nervous about asking us, and therefore asked poorly, but so many red flags piled on, and my friend and I both independently thought the situation was very odd when we talked about it afterwards. If he was up to some shady behavior, the audacity to try for two women at once in a busy parking lot in broad daylight was disturbing to say the least. This story happened to me back when I still lived at my parents' house. I was commuting to college at the time and had three siblings that also lived at home. My brother and two sisters. For some context, we lived on five acres in rural Ohio, surrounded on both sides by woods and farm fields. Additionally, during the week, my dad normally left for work at 2 a.m., so I always felt like it was my job to be the man of the house because he was gone during the times when he would imagine something sketchy happening. However, on this night, because it was a weekend, my dad was home. I woke up to the sound of my brother's voice trying to get my attention. We had separate rooms upstairs and coming out from our rooms, he could look down over the banister and see our front door. When I woke up, 
It took a few moments to get out of the haze and realize what was going on. I looked at the clock, and it was around 2.30 a.m., and my brother told me there were two men at our front door. Of course, now this is a real wake-up call. We quietly walk out of my room and peek over to look down at the front door. When we looked down, there was no one at the door, but I noticed my parents off to the side, out of view of the glass on the front door. I whispered down to my dad, and he told me there were two guys who'd been talking to each other and knocking on the door. Hearing my dad say this freaked me out even more. I went back into my room and grabbed my pistol, quickly shuffling down the stairs after looking to make sure they weren't at the door. If they had been, they would have easily seen me coming down the stairs, as it is in direct view of the door. My brother is right behind me as we head over to where my parents are, whispering to try and find out what is going on. My parents had woken up to our dog barking and come out to see these two men knocking loudly at the door. At this point, we see the men return and they begin knocking again, despite the fact that no one had come to the door and our dog is still actively barking. The fact that they were there at this time, in a location where houses are spread out hundreds of yards and still knocking while the dog was barking, made the situation even more terrifying. After a couple of minutes, the men walk away, and we all shuffle across the kitchen into the family room to peek out of the windows into our driveway, which is lit up by our outside light. There was a black Cadillac sitting there, but no one was inside from what we could see. Immediately the question was, where did those guys go? They weren't in their car, and they were no longer at the front door. Unfortunately, we figured out the answer when the handles on our back French doors started jiggling. They were actively trying to enter the back of our house, which enters the kitchen. At this point, I just remember my mom frantically saying, David, as pure terror overwhelmed her. At this point, two things happened. Adrenaline filled my body as I prepared my handgun, horrified at the very real possibility that I might have to shoot these men. Secondly, my dad finally grabbed the phone, called the police, and calmly told them what was happening. Thankfully, after a minute of jiggling, they stopped at the back door and disappeared again, only to return knocking at the front door. However, at this point, several minutes had gone by, and suddenly we saw the local police fly up in multiple cruisers with their lights on. As they whipped into our driveway and front yard, the two men bolted away, attempting to run the long way around the house across the driveway. One of them disappeared out of our view, but the other one was intercepted by an officer yelling for him to get on the ground. He didn't, and he was immediately tased and then proceeded to fall on the ground. Some of the officers went around the house after the other guy, and one of them came to talk to my dad and I as we came out the front. They ended up finding the other man hiding in my sister's little playhouse in the backyard. It appears both of them were drunk and or high, as one of them had cocaine on him. While they were both arrested that night, we never did find out what they were charged with or what happened to them. Needless to say, the whole experience wasn't fun. So random men at our door in the middle of the night. Let's not meet again. I used to be a district court prosecutor in my rural county. Sometimes it's stressful, but almost always entertaining. To set the scene, on a normal court day, I would call 40 or so scheduled cases before the judge for things like charges of plea, sentencing, probation, violations, and other matters. With 40 defendants, onlookers, police, court personnel, and a gaggle of lawyers, 
It was always barely controlled chaos. I always try to make it as efficient as possible by calling cases that would take the least time first. Occasionally an attorney would whisper in my ear that their client needed to be called quickly. If they didn't abuse the privilege, I would accommodate. Usually their client had health issues, needed to pick up kids, and that kind of thing. The day in question, I was at the start of the docket, and I heard a ruckus through the doors to the hallway. Not common, but also not unheard of. A lawyer comes up and says his client's case needs to be handled right away. No other explanation. Enter the meth addict. I've been doing the job long enough to recognize the signs of its use. This guy had all of them. Scrawny guy with small open wounds on his face, sunken cheeks, darting eyes, the whole enchilada. I called his case. The guy's obviously physically tense, extremely agitated and overly loud. Great. He's on meth right now. Flashback. Unbeknownst to me, he'd been wandering around the building with no shirt on, shouting nonsense to inmates behind the security windows. The security deputies knew he was a problem, so Deputy X escorted him into the courtroom. The scene of the crime. Deputy X stations himself between the addict and the judge's bench. The addict starts shouting and cursing, and the newly elected judge is having trouble keeping order. The shouting continues, and he starts telling the judge, Fuck you. Fuck the police. While coming around the table. Deputy X is 220 pounds of middle-aged country boy. Body armor. Weapons and gear. This isn't his first rodeo. He tells the guy to step back and shut up. He complies, then strangely calmly pours himself a glass of water from the table. We talk about his case a little more, and he ramps back up in agitation and comes around the table again. Deputy X steps up to him, and the addict throws a glass of water in Deputy X's face. Deputy X looks like a bear that had just been poked with a stick. True to form, he bear hugs the water assailant and gets him cuffed surprisingly quickly, considering the thrashing and yelling. He begins manhandling the guy out of jail for felony assault on an LEO and calls for backup. Deputy X and Deputy Y get him out of the courtroom, and I continue on with another day in courtroom 2. The attempted swan dive onto Marble. This part was later relayed to me by Deputy Y. After getting him out of the courtroom, Deputy X and Y are dragging the guy past the balcony that overlooks a 20-foot drop onto a wide marble staircase. He rears up and attempts to flip all three of them off the balcony. It's 130 pounds of meth-fueled rage against 400 pounds of deputies that don't feel like having their heads bashed in after a swan dive into marble. Deputy Y sweeps the guy's legs, and he does his best impression of a pancake with 400 pounds of pissed-off deputy on top of him. It's honestly amazing no bones were broken. Then they escort him to booking. And here's the aftermath. After two weeks in big boy timeout, thinking about what a naughty boy he's been, the guy returns to court under the watchful eye of Deputy X. He'd already been charged in superior court for felony assault on an LEO. The bailiff had thoughtfully removed the water pitcher from the table. The guy is much better behaved this time. As I talk to the judge about his case, I casually pour a glass of water on my separate table and gently nudge it in the direction of the attic, but it's well out of his reach. I lock eyes with Deputy X, and with a stone face, he gently shakes his head. No. After court, Deputy X in private says, You asshole. With a laugh. Innocent is plausible, I said. What? You look thirsty. In the end, the guy pled down the felony assault to a misdemeanor and did some time for it. As far as I know, he's still out there doing shirtless things. Thanks for listening. I hoped you enjoyed a little slice of my life as a rural prosecutor.
A few years ago, I was house-sitting, well, farm-sitting, for the family of a friend of mine who's one year younger than me. She was moving to college at the north end of the state, and the whole family was going to move her into her new dorm. The family is mom, dad, her, and five younger siblings, so this relatively small farm is usually well-staffed. They easily have eight to ten acres of usable land in southeastern Indiana, with horses, a large garden, chickens, goats, rabbits, and whatnot. Oh, and like four dogs, one of which is a huge mastiff mix or something like that. This dog is huge, like literally the size of a full-grown bear. It's the same color and isn't friendly with most people because he's very protective of the land. Herein lies part of the reason I was watching their house. For whatever reason, this dog loved me, and I was willing to come out to their place a day early to learn all of the daily chores that I would need to do. To help develop an image of this place, you can see the house of their nearest neighbor from their front porch, but it's across the horse pasture up the gravel road you come in on, and easily a kilometer or two away. I think it would probably take a solid 15 to 20 minutes to diligently walk there. Anyway, so I spent one night there with them after spending a day learning the do's and do nots, and that was fine. They left early the next morning, and I got to work, which took about two hours on my own. The job was honestly really easy once the daily chores were finished. Pretty much just sit around and relax, accompany the dogs, bring in the mail and whatnot. The first night came quickly, and I'd heard their drive went well, so I spent the evening on the couch watching TV with the dogs. My sleeping arrangements were also in the living room on a futon, so I was half sleepily lounging around and, at some point, I must have dozed off. I woke up to the beast of a dog laying his head on my chest at about 3am in the pitch black dead of night. My first thought was he needed to go outside so I got up and put on my shoes, but that's when I noticed he'd gone from my side to cowering and whining in the corner of the house opposite the front door. I stood up to check on him and then realized it was really cold, especially for a college-aged guy my size wearing pajama pants and a t-shirt in early August. This chill was accompanied by the most eerie feeling of dread that I've probably ever experienced to this day. I found it physically difficult to walk, as it felt like time was moving slowly. However, I eventually made it to the dog and pet him a few times to try and calm him down, but he seemed inconsolable. I walked to the thermostat in the hallway and read 37 degrees Fahrenheit inside, even though the outside temperature was easily still in the 70s. I moved towards the front door and peeked outside through a window but there was a light cloud cover and it was so dark that I couldn't see anything. So I flipped on the porch light. The light wasn't enough to see very far into the pasture, so I wasn't too concerned that I couldn't see the horses. But I could see much of the driveway area and right in the midst of it stood a cloaked humanoid figure that seemed completely unfazed by the porch light. I froze. Whatever it was didn't seem aggressive and wasn't carrying any obvious weapons, but I'm thoroughly convinced after staring at it for five or ten seconds that this thing was not human. The father of my friend is low-key one of those doomsday preppers, but more realistic in that he prepares for things like EMPs, nukes, solar flares, and whatever else. Nonetheless, he has a shit ton of firearms around the house, all thoroughly locked up outside of my use, except one fully loaded 9mm pistol in the master bedroom that he gave me the key for and told me it was for emergencies only. I ran to the room as fast as I could and got the pistol, but by the time I returned to the door, the figure was gone. I saw that the dog was still in the corner, but he'd stopped whimpering for the time being, I turned on a bunch of lights in the house, still carrying the pistol, and returned to the couch where the dog had moved to while I was walking around. I was still shaking and completely unsure of what to expect next. But then, 
just as suddenly as everything else happened, the feeling of dread subsided. The dog wagged his tail a couple of times and licked my hand, and the thermostat now read a comfortable 72 degrees Fahrenheit, even though the heater had never kicked on. I managed to gather my thoughts and lay down again after about 20 to 30 minutes of deep breathing. I eventually fell asleep again. I woke up to my alarm at something like 8am and realized what I hoped to be a dream couldn't have been because all the lights were still on and the pistol was sitting on the coffee table with the safety off. I eventually worked up the courage to step outside and start my chores, but I couldn't help to investigate the driveway a bit. Near the place I thought the thing would have been standing, I found the shape of two bare feet with no footprints leading to or from it, and no other marks one would expect in a footprint. I have no idea to this day what it was that stood outside the door that night, nor do I have any explanation for the entire event. All I know is it spooked me enough that I invited my brother to come spend the subsequent and final night with me, where luckily nothing happened. I never told my friend or her parents because I thought for sure they'd think I was crazy and stop associating with me. Unfortunately, I've sort of lost contact with them now anyway. Maybe I'll reach out to them sometime, but I don't know. I really discovered a love for walking over lockdown. There were days where I could spend hours out traveling the country roads, across fields and through the woods. I lived on the outskirts of a small town in Ireland, so the walks were a great form of exercise without using a gym. It started with me and my dad going out for about an hour every day, but he knew I wanted more and told me to go on my own if he wasn't up for it or if I wanted to go further than usual. It was around July of 2021. I was 14 at the time, and even though lockdown was starting to ease, I still went walking. I decided to walk through the fields instead of the roads, because having to stop for cars really irks me. I came to a plot of land with trees planted and decided to splash the boots before turning back. I was almost finished when I started hearing laughter from behind me. I pulled up my zip and buckled my belt to face whoever was there. I was surprised to see five people. None of them could have been much older than me. One of them waved and I walked towards them. They were between me and my way back home, so I sort of had to. The group had been talking amongst themselves, but stopped when I met them. There were three boys and two girls. They all had bags or backpacks and were all similarly dressed in dark graphic t-shirts and black cargos with funny looking keychains. A bit of a weird sight considering things like skate culture aren't really big where I'm from and anyone who's ever owned a nice piece of clothing wouldn't wear it out in a place where they could trip up and cowpat. The guy with the thrasher t-shirt smiled and asked, what are you doing out here? I realized it must have been a bit weird to meet a stranger in the absolute asshole of nowhere, so I just said, I'm taking a shortcut through the back road. Another boy chimes in and said, don't lie, Colchi. I saw you taking a piss in the woods. It dawned on me that they were both too well-spoken to be anyone local. I felt a bit intimidated, so I just told him, Nature was calling, as jokingly as I could, to which they all laughed. I wasn't sure if it was my accent that they found funny, or the fact that they'd caught me, and I was made visibly embarrassed. One of the two girls breaks from the laughter and pulls a face of disgust. Oh, for fuck's sake, what are you doing with that necklace? Referring to the cross necklace I was wearing. It didn't really scan with me how serious she was, so I just let out a chuckle, but the four others stopped laughing. The girl who spoke pulled out a book from the tote bag she'd worn over her shoulder, and she said, You've probably already ruined this by pissing on the ground too, as if I was supposed to know what 
This was. The five of them all genuinely looked gutted, as if I genuinely ruined their day. I just responded with, I don't really know what you mean, and a bleeding noise came out from the thrasher guy's bag. I looked at him, and the group starts to act skittish. The girl with the book says, let's just look for a good spot, and they walk past me. I turn and see the thrasher guy's backpack look sort of lumpy. At the time, I really didn't know what was in there, but as I was nearly home, I walked past a field with sheep and I realized they stole an animal from one of the farms. I told my parents later that day I was away cycling. I took the bike as far as I could and jogged to where I last saw the group disappear into the trees. I looked around. There was a dead lamb with several shallow gashes all over it, with some of its wool almost pulled out. The number five in blue spray paint was still partially visible, I'm guessing that they left it there after cutting it, and it bled out and died. I don't believe in that satanic, panic antichrist thing, but I know they were probably sacrificing the lamb for some reason or the other. I was helping my friend, who I told this story to, with farmhand work the week after, and all of his livestock were accounted for, meaning I have a rough idea of which field they got the lamb but I didn't want to ask the owner, in case he thought I had something to do with it disappearing. Me and my friend went back to the wooded area because I didn't want him to think I was messing with them, but I haven't gone back since. We were leaving a wedding we had attended that was held about three hours from home. My boyfriend had stayed sober in order to drive us home. I was pretty drunk. As we were driving the dark country back roads to get back to the city, I was half dozing and remember squinting because there seemed to be bright headlights washing over us. And then my boyfriend, who was driving, started screaming. Like full on screaming, I've never heard him do so before or since. It wasn't a loud, high-pitched screaming, but a deep-in-the-throat screaming that broke in and out and that left him hoarse. He swerved our car sharply to the side of the road, nearly into a ditch. I fully woke up and asked, What? Are you okay? He said that he saw a truck coming full bore towards us in the dark and honestly thought we were going to die. I looked behind us. A long straight road with no houses or street lights. There was no sign of a truck or any kind of vehicle. No rear headlights on the road or any light from a truck's headlights, which we would have seen. No sound of truck or car or anything. But he was shaking. And I initially brushed it off as him maybe falling asleep at the wheel, which is already scary in and of itself. We were on a narrow country road. There was no way a massive truck could have gone by us without hitting our car for one. And I don't remember feeling the rumble and vibrating of our car. That would have happened if a truck had narrowly missed us. So I dismissed it. He still swears that he saw a massive truck coming towards us. However, I do remember a flood of headlights hurting my half-closed eyes just before my boyfriend freaked out. This happened when I was in downtown LA. I was crossing the street and just came up onto the sidewalk. Some guy in a Ferrari steps out of the car, walks up to me, and tries to swing on me in broad daylight. I sidestep the guy, and he spun around to try and hit me again, calling me a motherfucker and not to dodge. I caught him with a nut shot with my foot and doubled him over. His buddy hops out of the car, and another of his buddies gets up from the side of the sidewalk and are both yelling at me. I'm like, oh fuck, I'm not ready for this. These absolute legends who had been watching all this shit go down just appear out of nowhere and jump these guys for me, 
like six different people from out of the wet work. Nutshot and Scrub, the Ferrari guys, hop in the car and just take off, scraping the car and taking the right side view mirror off. Their other homeboy gets left behind, but he tries to stumble fuck his ass away after having taken a couple hits to the head. One of the guys who helped me jogs up and punts this guy in the side, right after he falls over, doubling him over. Meanwhile, everybody else is checking on me and making sure I'm good. The cops show up, detain us, figure out what's going on, let us go and arrest the guy that couldn't get away. I come to find out that these guys had been doing this for weeks, and the people who'd helped me were local residents who'd been on the lookout for Nutshot. The guy that was arrested later squealed, and all the guys involved got a couple of years for aggravated assault. This happened around summer 2000 in Midwest USA, and I was a 12-year-old boy. I was shy and never did well with confrontation. Anytime I was scared, I'd feel myself shaking. One day, my dad and cousin were weightlifting in the garage and it was open. I then decided to grab my bicycle out of the garage and ride it up and down the street while my dad and cousin lifted. As I'm pedaling away from my house, I see another kid riding his bike probably five to six houses down from mine, but he's just kind of going in circles. I maybe get like 20 feet near him, but that's it. No words were exchanged, not even a wave or a nod. I just kept my head down and kept pedaling. On my next circle back down the street, that's when things got weird. I get near the area where the kid had been riding, and he's not around anymore so I guessed he went inside wherever he lived. Right as I'm about to turn around and head towards my house, which is probably 80 to 100 yards away, I hear a man yell, Hey! in an unsettling tone. I look up, and a man is standing in his front doorway, probably 25 feet away from me. As I'm paused on the street with my bike, he's one of the creepiest looking guys I've ever seen in my life. He has on a ball cap, and he's wearing these thick, Jeffrey Dahmer-looking glasses. Tan, burnt orange, dirty-looking wrinkled skin, and he had to be in his 40s probably. He looked straight out of a horror movie, and he just had this sinister, angry look on his face. He then says, If you say anything to my son again, I'm going to run your ass over. At this point, I was crying and frozen with fear, but then I started biking home faster than ever. I'd never been in a situation like this in my life. I couldn't believe what happened because I never said anything to that boy. So I get to the open garage where my dad and cousin are still lifting. I tell them the story, and they decide to go to this guy's house and address the situation that just occurred. My dad and cousin had a few beers and are pretty jacked, so they were ready to tussle if needed. My dad goes straight to this guy's door with my cousin behind him, and knocks loudly. The man opens the door and has this huge Rottweiler by his side, barking and going crazy at my dad and cousin. He threatens to let the dog loose, but my dad and cousin aren't cowering one bit. After a bit of bickering for a minute, the guy goes inside his house and shuts the door. Nothing else happens that night, and we walk back home. A few days pass, and now I'm about to get to the creepiest part. During the summer, when my parents worked during the day, my grandma would come over and babysit my little brother and I. We were about 10 minutes from downtown, and my grandma was going to take us there to grab food at Sonic. We get in her car and start driving down the road towards that creepy guy's house. This made me feel uneasy, but that's the direction we had to go. As we get closer to the house, the hair on my neck starts to stand up again. As we go by the house, I see him. He's sitting in a red truck in his driveway, facing the road like he's about to pull out. I don't remember well, but I think he might have even had a grin on his face when we drove by. We pass the house, and he pulls out behind us. I start freaking out a bit, so I tell my grandma the story about the man driving behind us. At first my grandma was chill about it, 
but then I noticed she seemed a bit shaken. This is because she'd made about six to seven turns to throw him off our trail, but he kept following us. Every little turn. At this point, me and my brother are in the back seat with our heads down as he follows us, but luckily we made it downtown where it was quite busy. We're close to the police station, I believe, and take another turn. Then he finally just passes on by. I never saw that man again. My mom and dad split up, and we left that neighborhood two years later with my mom to move to the country. My dad still lives at the same house, and I wonder if that guy stuck around for a while, or even still lives at that same house. What was his intent? Was it just a coincidence? Or did he plan on following us? It was so weird how it looked like he was just waiting in his driveway for us to pass by. So the other night I was working this post that was pretty much shut down with roadblocks up to check any and all personnel that do try to enter the facility. Both roads that lead to my gate were blocked off less than half a mile just north of me, and another a little over two miles to my southwest, around a bend that was completely out of sight. Well, the one just north of me, when people do pull up to it late at night, the headlights will just be visible down by me on my cameras. I was sitting there drinking some coffee, and trying to keep myself awake. I'd hardly seen anybody. My sight was inactive due to what we call a hard down, with only essential personnel being granted entry. A truck had just come pulling up to the guard shack just north of me as I watched on camera, and as the truck is pulling up and coming to a stop, I see a reflection in the camera that I thought was just the lights of the truck until I opened my eyes a bit wider to focus. I saw it move. What it looked like was a complete silhouette of a person, and I thought maybe somebody was walking up to my gate in the dark, and it made me jump out of my seat to look out the front window to confirm a visual. As I'm looking out, I see absolutely nothing, and I look back to the monitor, and there it is on screen. The silhouette of a man that looks to be wearing a hazmat suit, I kept looking back and forth from the window to the camera, and as I'm doing this in live time, I'm just catching glimpses of what the camera is picking up. I radio the other two guards, asking if they'd let any personnel get through their checkpoints. I get a negative response back, asking me what's up. I told them to stand by as I review what I just saw on the recordings. To my absolute disbelief, I watched, stunned. As the truck comes pulling to the north guard shack, its lights shine on some movement. What I could make out was a silhouette figure of a man wearing a hazmat suit walking. When the truck comes to a stop, the man also stops. The man looks towards the truck, does a double take from me to the truck, and just walks across the road and disappears. I thought I was going crazy and maybe seeing things because of my lack of sleep. I clipped and saved that portion of the video and waited till shift change to show the other guards I worked with over the night and the ones coming to relieve us. I never said anything about that night or anything to the guards coming on shift and I played the clip for them. Everybody's jaw dropped and saw exactly what I did without me pointing anything out. This is a regular occurrence. Out here, most of the guards that have been here a while have seen things and have stories. I just got what I've been waiting for. Solid proof for myself. I work at a jewelry store in a small mall somewhere remote in Canada. It's a fun job. I love my co-workers, love the customers, and love the fixed schedule working in a mall gives me. It's nice to know I'll be off by 6pm every night. Gives me plenty of time to socialize and study outside of work. 
The mall is a single loop with probably around 50 stores operating on average. They employ a staff of about 30 people to keep the mall operating. Half of this staff works admin, the other 15 or so work security. As a regular 40 hour a week employee, I've had my fair share of interactions with security. Having them escort me to the bus stop, on the occasional night inventory had me working late, or calling them into the store to help me deal with an irate customer. Over the years, I became acquainted with a few of the security guards. My favorites were Will, April, and Mark. Will was the friendliest. He'll pop his head into my store and say good morning to me when I'm opening. April was the most, by the books, security guard. She usually helped me deal with difficult customers. Mark was one of the evening security guards, so my only interactions with him were escorts late at night to the bus, during which he was quiet but polite. A schedule shuffle last year put Will on parking lot patrols, April mostly on evening shifts, and put Mark on day duty. Not the end of the world, just kind of sucked no longer having a friendly conversation with Will as I opened the store, and not having badass April around to step in when customers get unruly. Mark was a lot more quiet than his two counterparts, and just wasn't quite as friendly. I didn't interact with him much for the first few months after this new schedule started. I'd give him a smile as he walked by my store, and it helped him out a few times with shoplifters. But beyond that, nada. No great friendship blossoming out of the schedule rotation or anything. About two months after the schedule had changed, I had my first bad encounter with Mark. I was walking through one of the mall staff hallways to take a washroom break. Mark happened to be walking just ahead of me, also going to the washroom. When we reached the doors, he looked me up and down and then remarked, This is gonna be hard. I got a bit of a chill when he said that, but assumed there was an issue in the men's washroom. Someone passed out in a stall or something, so I asked him, Oh no, why? Because I'm nosy, and was excited to have a bit of mall gossip to share with my co-workers. He got a cold, distant look in his eyes and said, My doctor advised against heavy lifting, and then he winked at me. I ran into the girls' washroom and texted my manager, freaking out about what he just said knowing full well what he implied with that remark. Mark is a 45-year-old man with graying hair and a bit of a beer gut. He stands around 6 foot 2. I'm a tiny 5 foot 7 girl who was about 20 at the time of this. It creeped me out so much that I reported it to April, my next shift, who promised me she would handle it. I stopped seeing Mark doing patrols and assumed he'd been switched back off of day shift. For about two weeks, I'd heard nothing from him or any of the other security guards. I was just about to end my shift one evening, with about 15 minutes left before we closed for the day. I hear someone enter my store and look up to see Mark walking towards me, with just a look of pure hate on his face. I wasn't working alone, so I stepped into the back room to avoid dealing with him. It didn't work. Mark threw the door to my back room open and stood there, screaming his lungs out at me. How it was my fault he'd lost his job, how I'd ruined his life, and how I was going to pay for my mistake. He viewed the sexual comment he made as a joke and thought I was a bitch straight from hell for reporting him. He screamed for a few minutes, and the second he paused for breath, I calmly told him to get out of my store because I was calling the cops and security. He ran out of the store, and a moment later, Will sprinted in. He just screamed at me, Where the fuck did he go? And I pointed as I started to cry. I was shaking from the confrontation as I gave my statements to the police and mall security. Mark had been fired after my report, but security was adamant that it wasn't my fault. Mark had racked up a bunch of complaints over his years, and it was just the straw that broke the camel's back. He was banned from mall premises the day he got fired and criminally trespassed when he came in to scream at me. Authorities issued a warrant for him, 
and it took weeks for him to reappear and be arrested. During those weeks, I was very scared. Mark knew what bus I take. Mark knew my work schedule. Mark hated me. Every time I turned a corner, I was scared he'd be there. I believe he's out of jail now. A few days ago, my girlfriend and I were on the home stretch of a big road trip with our dog. As it had been a while since we last stopped, we pulled into a rest stop off the freeway to stretch our legs and let the dog go to the bathroom. When we pulled into the rest stop, there were no cars and three big semi-trucks parked in a line. Immediately my girlfriend got out to go to the restroom. I leashed up the dog and stood next to the car and as she was walking towards the entry door, I thought I heard someone yell behind me. To my surprise, it was a trucker in the driver's seat of his truck with a window rolled down, trying to get my attention. Now, I'm generally pretty friendly towards old people, whether they seem shady or not, generally willing to help a hand. Behind me in the truck was an older gentleman, large, with gray hair and sunglasses, his truck was so loud, I couldn't hear what he was yelling, so I yelled back, What? The trucker yelled something inaudible three more times as I asked him, What? While shaking my head and holding up my hands to inform him, I couldn't hear him. At this point, he seemed visually annoyed that I said, What? Four times. Okay, understandable. I wanted to see what the deal with this guy was, so I walked between the car and the passenger side of his truck. What did you say? I asked. Can you help me look for my phone? I lost it somewhere, the trucker said. At this point, I was caught off guard, as this had all unfolded within 20 to 30 seconds that we parked at the rest stop. To me, it was weird that a trucker was asking a random passenger stopping at a rest stop to help look for their phone, but maybe he just wanted me to call it. Where did you lose it at? I asked. I lost it in my truck. Can you come up here and help me look for it? The trucker replied in an unnerving tone. In that moment, I was sketched the fuck out. I thought I was about to be abducted. Phone call I could do, but there was no way I was about to get into this trucker's cab to look for his phone. Yeah, no, I said sternly, but half-heartedly, as I almost thought this guy was joking with me. After a few moments, the trucker then says, You won't help me look for it. My adrenaline was pumping, so I yelled back, Get out of here, in a threatening tone, knowing damn well I had nothing to defend us should something go wrong. I put the dog back into the car and pulled out my phone to pretend I was calling the cops while he slowly drove and stopped again to ask if I was going to help. I then screamed again, No, get the fuck out of here, I'm calling the cops. After that reply, he stepped on the gas and exited to the freeway. I stood and watched. When finally my girlfriend exited the rest stop, Wondering why I looked like I just saw a ghost. I don't know if it was an overreaction, but it sketched me the fuck out that he asked me to get into the truck. When I was nine, we were traveling from our cabin back to town with an open boat. This was right before Easter about a 45 minute trip. The seas were rough and the boat had a built in flaw that caused it to break into two pieces due to the pounding on the waves. I sat face towards the back so I didn't see it break. There was just suddenly water up to my waist. When I turned around, the nose was floating a couple of meters away from the boat. My mom's husband at the time just said, jump, and so we did into the black two-degree water of the North Sea, as far away from the boat as possible. 
This was by far the scariest moment. Her husband managed to launch two emergency rockets before the boat vanished below him. He was a very poor swimmer, and even though we tried to hold on to him, he was separated from us due to the large waves constantly covering us. After that, it was about 10 minutes of trying to swim to the shore, which was about 400 meters away, before realizing we were never going to make it. After that, we basically dodged waves and made bad taste jokes. We saw people on the shore, cars stopped on the highway. The last thing I remember before blacking out is a boat approaching. Then I woke up in the hospital, basically thrashing around from the cramps of my body trying to warm up. Apparently I had a temperature of 27 degrees when they brought me in. My mom was awake the whole time. She lost control of her limbs right after I blacked out and gripped a rope from my life vest with her teeth so I wouldn't float away. Even though this was scary to me, there are some awesome elements to it. An old fisherman in a house by the shore saw the whole thing. He was desperately trying to get a hold of rescue services, but no one was where they were supposed to be. His wife, having lost both her previous husband and a son at sea, had some kind of health issue while watching us swim around, so he had to take care of her and try to get us some help. The most badass part of the story is how we got rescued. One of my mom's husband's friend got a call about what was happening. He got in his boat with his eight-month pregnant wife and went full speed to our location. The boat he had was not designed for high seas. It was a summer-type cab cruiser, so he had to steer it towards the waves at all times. His wife then proceeded to pull three fully clothed people back up to safety, including an unconscious me. If anyone has ever tried to pull someone out of the water, you know how difficult it is. We all survived. I was totally fine, aside from my ball swelling up to three times the normal size for a couple of days. My mom tore a bunch of stuff in her back, and her husband swallowed about four liters of salt water and was sick for about a week. I lost my mom to cancer a couple of years back. Well, a couple of years after, my brothers and I were visiting my dad in their house over the December holidays. It's a small place, so since there wasn't much sleeping room, I was to sleep in the lounge area. The front of the apartment was open plan and connected to the kitchen, and in the kitchen, on the fridge, was this little Pikachu fridge magnet, which is still there and when pressed on its belly, it would say Pikachu. It's more than 15 years old, but still working. I was a Pokemon fanatic as a kid, so, in the middle of the night, with everyone asleep, this thing starts going off like crazy. At first, I thought it had to be my brothers playing some stupid trick on me, so I sit up straight and look over to the fridge, but there's nobody even near it. I get up to go check it out, but as I get closer, it stops. I'm still groggy, so I'm like, whatever, and I head back to bed. I fall asleep again, and a while after, I'm woken up by the sound again. This time, though, as I sit up, there's the figure of a woman wearing a nightgown standing at the foot of my bed, one just like my mom had, and there was an icy cold hanging in the air like almost burning my face cold. She looks at me and in a confused voice says, This is my house, right? Which makes sense, because she was very confused during her last couple of months. Her personality deteriorated very fast. I completely froze. But at that moment, I hear footsteps from the hallway side, and she vanishes. As I'm sitting there trying to process what just happened, my brother walks into the room, turns on the light, and sees me pale as the ghost I just saw. I apparently asked him if him and his wife were trolling me or something, but he actually got up to investigate the sound too. His wife was fast asleep. Now, being the logical guy I am, I did kind of figure out a scientific explanation for what happened. See... 
My older brother's kids had been over that day too, and they played around with the Pikachu. Also, all this went down in the summer, while it was very hot outside during the day. But when the sound started at night, it was cold as hell, so maybe the Pikachu's belly expanded during the day, and then shrunk to a point where some switch inside was making contact. As for my mother, we were spring cleaning that day and put up our favorite curtains that I remembered from when I was a kid. We also went through a couple of her heirlooms, so there's no doubt she was in my mind a lot, and I might have just been very groggy. But you know what? It just doesn't feel like one big coincidence. So last year, I was working as a line cook at a popular chain restaurant. I used to be done with my shift at around midnight, and I would promptly walk home because I only lived 20 minutes from my job. I live in Canada, so it's generally been no issue if I walk home by myself at night. So I'd been walking home by myself for two months, when one night I decided to go to the grocery store near my work. As I was walking there, a homeless man was hovering around me when I was waiting for the light to turn. He was close to me, but thankfully he kept walking in a direction opposite to where I was going. Unfortunately, when he was hovering around me, I was talking to my boyfriend and telling him I'm going to the grocery store. I got to the grocery store and didn't see him. After I finished my shopping, I see the man from earlier hovering around the grocery store entrance. He didn't go in, but he was waiting outside in the rain. When I looked at him, he stared back at me, so I decided to take an Uber instead of walking. As I waited for my Uber, I tried to hide behind some soil bags in the grocery store entrance, but then he found me and started to stare at me again. Finally, my Uber showed up and I got in. After that, I was too scared to walk home alone, so I got my boyfriend to walk me, or I would get a manager to drive me home. A few days later, my boyfriend and I are walking home and we're leaving my workplace's parking lot. There was one big black van parked perpendicularly in the path I usually walk through. No other cars around. We see a man hovering around this car, and his side sliding door to his van is open. He's hovering around the door, so I found this weird. I make my boyfriend walk with me over to the sidewalk of one of the big stores. When we have our backs turned, he starts to follow us. I see this, and I tell my boyfriend we need to run. We managed to run some lights, and I didn't see him follow us. After that, I started taking Ubers or getting my managers to drive me home. Every Saturday night for five weeks, I would see a black van parked near my work, and it would leave when it saw me leave with my manager. It would also leave when it realized that I saw it. For example, I was helping the bartender clean, and I decided to look out one of the windows when I saw that damn van again. When it saw me staring back at it, it left, thankfully. This scared me a lot, so my manager started to give me the morning shifts, and when I had to go back to university and take late shifts again, I didn't see it anymore. Next time I do, I plan to go to the police. Not only that, I was already on high alert because one of my ex-co-workers had been showing up outside of my work. When I worked with him, he would blatantly stare at me and at one point brushed his waist against my arm when we had to work together on purpose. He would also stand very close to me at some points, almost touching me. I wasn't that worried about him because he's almost a decade younger than me and mostly just watched me. However, he was why I was paying more attention to my surroundings. Hence, it helped me look out for the other creeps. I grew up in southern New Hampshire. I had some interesting times in East Derry. I grew up on a cul-de-sac with a police captain and a detective as my neighbors. A lot of weird and strange things happened while living there, most connected to the house itself. 
I had a type of shadow person. It would take the shape of my family members, and years after moving from that house, my older brother would tell me, whatever it was liked you. Which brings us to one of my many stories. My best friend lived five houses from me, and her parents owned a pop-up camper. It was located to the side of their porch, which had the door that the family used as a main entrance. Being the young 12 to 14 year olds we were, we had many sleepovers in it with other kids in the neighborhood. We had a few experiences, and I will tell you the most haunting one of them. This night it was just her and I. We're both girls and at that age where we would bicker over the dumbest things. This night it was her throwing a piece of gum to me and it getting lost between one of the mattresses and the lining of the camper. She wasn't willing to give me another piece, which led us to butting heads. We were bickering back and forth about her giving me another piece when we both went dead quiet. All of a sudden, we both heard what sounded like footsteps walking around the camper. Then came the talking. I don't know how to describe it other than being right there, like a whisper but sounding so distant. It was a male, and we could not make out what it was he was saying. Whatever it was was in another language. We looked at each other with concern and I remember her taking off her socks and us just making that 15-foot sprint to that side door, inside, and up the stairs to her room while grabbing the house phone on the way. Her parents were drunks, so we didn't wake them. Instead, we did the only rational thing and called my house. My mom ended up driving around the neighborhood two times, only to call us back and tell us she saw nothing. We were so freaked out that we slept on the floor next to each other. Where we slept was under the window that overlooked her front yard. I'm not sure when we fell asleep, but before we did, we both remember hearing the sound of raking and digging. This is a story going on almost 20 years ago now. I am, to this day, still friends with my childhood best friend. A lot of weird stuff takes place in Derry. I live in the deep woods in southern Missouri. The nearest civilization outside a trailer house down the road is a gas station town a couple of miles away. I've lived here since I was six months old and spent my days in the woods. I don't remember a time where I didn't know the winding paths and clearings like the back of my hand. There were always stories of something in the woods. A local tribesman told the tale of a spirit that wandered the woods at night. I was deeply invested in stories of ghosts and monsters and that sort of stuff, so the tribesman's tale was pretty run-of-the-mill. I didn't think much of it until a few years ago. One night in 2010, I was walking the usual trail and got a feeling that something wasn't right. It was like I was walking three feet behind my body. It was the sound of a snapping branch that brought my body and mind back together. But it wasn't a twig or small limb. It was a large oak branch about as wide as me. It hit the ground with a hard thud. After that, the woods became completely silent. No owls or coyotes howling not even the night breeze. The only sound was my own stunned breathing. Out of the darkness, two glowing yellow eyes looked directly at me from the shadows. They were several yards down the trail, yet still seemed several feet off the ground. A low thundering growl came from the same direction. It was like the growl of a tiger mixed with a bear. I wanted to run back home, but my legs wouldn't budge. My breathing picked up and became more and more like gasping for air. The growling stopped as the creature started to turn around and go deeper into the woods, showing me its form in the moonlight. It didn't seem of this world. I can only describe it as a black mountain lion with a head and body the size of a grizzly bear. It looked like it hadn't eaten in a month and was nothing more than skin and bones. Only when I was alone again in the woods would my legs let me sprint back home 
and lock myself in my room with a survival knife. Occasionally, on the quietest nights of the year, I can hear it outside my window, and the same eyes from that night appear out of the darkness. I never go outside without my knife anymore, even during the day. I've had several friends that have come over for the day go home that night and tell me how they feel like they're being watched from outside. I went to college in a historic, mid-sized city in Florida, and at the time lived in a duplex town, maybe three blocks from campus. The city is known to be pretty safe, and I lived in a pretty decent area with large, historic homes near me. This all happened around five years ago, for a bit of backstory that will become relevant. The duplex I lived in had a front door that locked and then both the upstairs and downstairs units had their own locking door. I lived downstairs and had two roommates, but this specific night, only one of my roommates was home. We knew the girls that lived upstairs, but only really spoke to them in passing. When they moved in, we emphasized how important it was to us for them to keep the main door locked, and they did a good job of doing so. So me and my flatmate are in for the night, knowing the front door is locked, and we smoked a few joints. At some point, we hear a knock at the front door, and quickly realize the girls upstairs had ordered a pizza. Later on, it becomes evident that they never locked the front door after receiving their pizza. So we finally go to sleep in our rooms, and since I had a queen bed, I would often sleep with my phone and laptop next to me in my bed. A couple of hours after I fell asleep, I woke up to a man standing over my bed. As soon as I realized I wasn't dreaming, I noticed that he's quickly moving my phone and computer out of my bed and moving my comforter, trying to get into my bed. I start to ask him who he is, what he's doing there, and just generally confused, as I was still slightly high from before I went to sleep. The only thing he said to me was that he was just trying to get into bed. At this point I begin to panic, as my mind obviously goes to the worst. I was hoping that maybe my roommate had invited some random tinder guy over, and that he'd gone to the wrong room. But the more I questioned him, all he had to say was, I'm just trying to get in bed. I own pepper spray and a stun gun, but I'd accidentally left them on a shelf that the guy was standing in front of, so there was no way I would be able to grab them without escalating the situation. Realizing I needed to do something quickly, I blurted out, There are five people who live in this house, and if you don't get out of here now, I will scream, and they will be here within seconds. Luckily that was all it took to scare him off. I don't know if he'd brought something with him, or if he stole something from me, but I saw him grab something in the dark and run out of my room. As soon as he left my room, I shut the door and locked it. I tried to find my phone. I couldn't find it anywhere, but then quickly realized that between my room and the front door is the room of my friend that was home. As scared as I was, I was terrified that the guy had maybe gone into a room, so I grabbed my stun gun and a pocket knife, counted to three, and ripped open my door. I ran into my roommate's room, and she was fast asleep. There was no evidence of the guy. I told her what happened, and she asked me if I was sure I wasn't dreaming. I began to question myself, until I walked out of her room and saw that our front door was wide open. I went to my room to search for my phone, and finally found it hidden under a pile of clothes across the room from where I'd left it. That sent a chill up my spine as I immediately knew for a fact someone had been in my house and room while I was sleeping, and long enough to hide my phone, which only worsened my suspicions of his intentions. I ran back to my roommate's room, who at that point believed me. We barricaded ourselves into the room and called 911. 
Within minutes, there were police cars swarming our street and yard. They yelled for us to quickly leave the residence and run towards them. At least a dozen police officers came running in and searched every inch of our apartment. They woke up the girls upstairs and searched their apartment to ensure the man had left. The officers then had me write a statement and I gave them a description of the man. And to this day, I haven't heard a single thing about the case. I feel incredibly lucky with the outcome of the situation, but the thought of his intentions terrifies me, and additionally the fact that he was never caught scares me, as I would hate for anyone to have to go through the pure fear that I did. I will add, there is a chance that he was on drugs or mentally ill, and had no bad intentions. However, because he was never caught, I will never know, and my mind will always assume the worst. I've worked in restaurants for almost 10 years. I'm accustomed to getting out late. One night after finishing a double shift at a ramen spot, I had my usual beer and decided to get an Uber home. My Uber arrived, I checked the plate and all, and the gentleman even confirmed my name. I spent half of the ride almost dozing off. As the ride progressed, I noticed the driver kept staring at me through the mirror. He never said a single word, no expression, it was just a blank stare. I figured exhaustion and the beer had gotten the best of me and he was probably staring because he thought I was drunk. Later on, I also noticed that he had taken a different highway and that we were making our way through Rikers Island. It was a route I wasn't accustomed to, but he had his way zap open and I figured he was trying to take some sort of shortcut. We kept getting further into Rikers Island and the area had become full of trees and construction machines, neon cones and cracked cement. He came to a sudden stop. My car just broke. Get out and call a new Uber. I was confused. There hadn't been any indication that a tire had popped or that it had ran out of gas. I got out and before I asked anything, he stepped on the gas and sped off. The car was perfectly fine. Alone by a construction zone, I started freaking out and called another Uber. When he arrived, his first question was why I was in the middle of nowhere, especially so late. I told him about the other Uber driver, and he urged me to report it. I reported it, checked the profile. 4.8 stars, same license plate, but it was not the same man in the picture. The report never really got anywhere. I can't help but feel I encountered something nefarious. This happened to me eight years ago. It was my first month on the job and I worked night security at this pretty interesting place. For the record, I still work there and have more strange stories possibly to tell in the future. I am a 38-year-old male. I've worked security jobs most of my life and the graveyard shift. I was an event security guard for various well-known concert venues for years. So... I've seen my fair share of strange things and crazy people. In other words, I don't scare easily and hardly ever go into panic mode when a crisis comes up. The place I currently work at is a resort-style apartment complex. To get the layout, there are three floors of apartment with 50 units on each floor. This place takes up one city block with a golf course in back, indoor swimming pools, hot tubs, and a small movie theater. You name it, this place has it. Most of the residents are retired doctors, lawyers, and otherwise rich. There are some younger people that live here as well, stockbrokers and real estate agents, and so on. Some just use their apartment in the summer and leave as soon as the snow falls. It's located in a well-known tourist town in the US. The building itself has 12 exits on the first floor, 
The doors are locked at 11 p.m. You can exit, but you can't get back in unless you go to the front of the building and ask to be buzzed in, or pick up the call box phone next to whatever exit you're at. It will ring the company's cell phone, and I answer and come let you in. The front lobby is set up much like a hotel, with sliding glass doors which I lock when I start my shift. In the middle of the building on the first floor are two big slider doors which I also lock. They lead to the private parking lot. The parking lot itself is gated and you need a coat to get in. This was midsummer, and while it's not really hot here, tonight was an exception. It was still very warm after the sun had set. I came in 10 minutes to 11 to start my shift. We have a routine to hand off keys, event log, and phone to the next person on duty. Despite its size, I'm the only security person here at night. My co-worker, who is leaving, told me the side iron gates that lead to the parking lot are open on one side, because they're stuck. This is nothing new, they do often get jammed. She told me the repair would be tomorrow sometime to fix them, but to just do some extra patrol out there that night. This place sits across the road from a public park, and while the area is pretty decent, the park tends to breed druggies and homeless at night, who sometimes like to try and wander on the property or cause trouble. My night started out as uneventful. As a security guard in this place, we only have pepper spray, a large flashlight, keys and a company cell phone to call 911 if need be. We are told not to confront with bodily harm, nor can we detain anyone. We're simply eyes and ears, and to call the police if something comes up. Of course you can defend yourself if you need to, but in all cases, if you're in danger, call the police is the company policy. Basically, I'm to walk the grounds and floors for anyone suspicious watch the cameras in the security office, which is in the lobby, and otherwise try to stay alert. If a resident calls for a maintenance request, I would take the information down in the computer for day shift, or if a resident called with a security issue, I would attend to it. Pretty easy enough job, I thought. I locked the doors to the parking lot and the lobby doors. I did a sweep of all the floors and then found myself back at the desk, it was really quiet and it rolled around to 3 a.m. I had just sat down to eat my lunch when the company's cell phone rang. The caller ID let me know it was from one of our outside call box phones. I picked it up and said, Thanks for calling Bluestone. This is Security Officer James. How can I help you? All I heard was someone breathing heavy. I glanced at the cameras and could see the shadow of a figure standing just out of arm reach from the door and camera view. All I could see is the open call box and the metal cord from the phone. I again asked, how can I help you? The man started to breathe heavier and laugh, and in silence. It was one of those laughs you hear in a movie where the lunatic is about to do something terrible. I got up from my chair and started to walk out of the office and to the door he was at when it rang again, this time from call box number two, which was further down. I quickly looked at the camera and saw this large figure in a hooded jacket. I knew this was strange as it was very warm outside. He was holding a black bag in his hands but had his back to the camera. I'm coming for you and you're gonna die, the voice said in a raspy, deep tone. He hung up before I had the chance to say anything. The phone rang again. This time I picked it up, and before he could speak, I let him know that the cops were on their way, and to leave the property now as he's on camera. He tried the doors and both were locked. This time he was at yet another call box. This guy had to be running at top speed to make it to the next and the next call box, as they're a good distance between doors on the outside. I can see you. Are you ready to die? The cops won't make it here in time, the guy said. I spoke loud and pretended like I was talking to another security officer, 
and asked him to send three other security guards to such and such location, and that police are dispatched. The guy slammed the phone down loud against the call box receiver, and I watched him on camera take off into the darkness to the park area. I figured it scared him off. I was going to call the police, but honestly, the location of this place, it would take them at least 15 minutes to get here, and I figured this guy was just some tweaker from the park. I scanned the cameras and walked to the back lot, just to be sure no one was there. I had my pepper spray in my hands just in case, but no one was out there. I returned to my desk and wrote what happened in the incident log. About a half hour passed. I had finished lunch and just was about to do rounds when the phone rang again. This time it was from an unknown number. I thought it would be a resident calling for a repair issue or something. I picked it up and said my normal line. Where are the cops? I don't see them, but I see you. The voice said. Fuck. It was that guy again. I scanned the cameras and didn't see anything. I went to the front door to look out, and there was nothing but darkness and a few floodlights on. I know you're alone, and you're going to die soon, he said. I basically told him to get fucked and hung up. I called the non-emergency number to 911 and let them know what was going on. The dispatcher said she would send out a car to check the area and make contact with me. Next thing I hear is a loud thud against the glass windows to the day manager's office, which sits across from the security room. Another three loud bangs. I run to the door and unlock it. I pull up the shades and shine my flashlight through the window into the darkness. I catch the face of this hooded man. He looked to be about 40, with long stringy hair poking down and these wild eyes. He looked right at me and grinned before slamming his head into the window to try and break it. I started yelling at him and told him the cops are coming and to get out of here. That's when he pulled the biggest damn butcher knife I've ever seen and made a slicing motion like he would use it to cut my throat. The guy was crazy and probably on drugs. He continued slamming his body against the glass, trying to break it. He used his head to try and break the window, but managed to bust his head open so the window now has blood all over it. I backed out of the office and locked the door to it. I then decided to wait for the cops as this guy was out of control and my pepper spray wasn't going to stop him. And the last thing I wanted was to handle a bloody crazy person. He then ran to the nearest side door and took the call box phone off the hook. He then ran to each call box and removed all the phones which caused my company's cell phone to ring and jam up the line. This guy had to be on meth or something, because he ran as fast as I could imagine. I watched the camera and noticed to my horror, the sliding door to the garage was open. Now it was common for residents to go out to their cars and unlock the doors themselves. It's just a sliding lock like the kind in department stores. But this is the last thing I need with this nut job running around. I sprinted across the building and took a shortcut through a couple banquet rooms to make it to the garage. As I was doing so, I saw that crazy guy running up the garage pathway. I slid that door as fast as I could and locked it before he got to the entryway. He then slammed his body into the glass over and over, but the door did not move. I locked the second set of doors in case he got through the outside ones. He would at least be trapped or it would slow him down. I reached for my pepper spray, thinking maybe he would just leave and yelled the cops are here. He started to laugh and howl and then held up that knife again before running into the darkness of the parking garages. I called the cops on my personal cell phone to let them know that the man has a knife. The dispatcher told me the cops will be there shortly, and I let her know what happened. 
I made my way to the front again and locked myself in the security office. At least this place had no windows, and I could watch on camera. I heard another loud thud and bang, and realized he was at the front lobby doors trying to get in. I was hoping the cops would roll up any minute, but they didn't. And while it probably didn't take them long, it felt like forever at this point. The guy was standing at the lobby doors with a knife in hand. He faced the camera, and by this time, his hood had fallen back. He was bald-headed, with wild, long, stringy and crazy hair on the sides of his head. His eyes were huge, and I will never forget that grin on his face as he mouthed to the camera, Die. Die. While making stabbing motions with that knife blood running across his face from slamming into the glass, he then ran out into the darkness. About five minutes later, the cops show up. They sent one officer. He asked me what the guy looked like, and I told him I had camera footage. He drove through the area first and shined a spotlight. The cop returned to tell me he couldn't find anyone, and he'd driven around the entire block and back area behind the golf course. I showed him the footage and printed out a picture from the camera. The cop said he didn't see any sign of the guy and that he would patrol the area and to call back if the guy came again. It was now nearly 5 a.m. when the cop left. I waited until 6 a.m. when it was broad daylight and people were starting to get out and about before I walked around and hung up all the phones from the call boxes. The guy literally took all 12 phones off the hook. When my manager came in during the morning shift at 8am, I told her what happened, and she said they would keep an eye out and have a meeting to let everyone who worked here know and to be aware. They had an extra security guard on my shift for two weeks after, but the guy never returned. The cops never found the guy or found out who he was. Sophomore year in high school is when it started. That would be 2003, I believe. His name was Michael D., but he was called Blueberry by our circle of friends. I have long forgotten the story behind the moniker, but I imagine that it was selected mostly to distinguish from the many other Michaels around. He was a tall, gawky, acne-afflicted junior who had a hands-in-his-pocket angry walk, a deep dimple in the middle of his chin, and an absolutely unintelligible manner of speaking. Unintelligible to the point where his second nickname was Michael Mumble. I don't remember anything particular about that meeting really, just a few passing words, a mutual friend stepping in to wave an introductory hand back and forth while repeating our names to the other in quick bursts like a sneeze on a rifle. Gracie, Michael, but we call him Blueberry. Blueberry Mike, Gracie. I was a spunky 15-year-old discovering a whole new diverse world out there, and in retrospect, I see how my giddy naivete left a door wide open for Blueberry to step through. He would talk, well, more like mumble to me before first period. I struggled to understand what was said behind his tight lips that hardly moved, so our interactions were usually brief and consisted mostly of me smiling brightly and nodding along before politely excusing myself. I often picked up on his awkward anger and aggression, stuffed so deep and snug inside his six foot three frame. All teenagers are angry. Hell, even spunky me had my moody sprees, but Blueberry's anger was different. It was a warped, twisted, stubborn, narcissistic, permeating, calm kind of anger. I remember thinking to myself that it just burned the air around him. Being fifteen, I had no car, so I took my lunches at the subway that sat two blocks away from school. Sometimes I went with friends, but more often I went by myself. I liked the quiet and chance to regroup from school's chaos. He appeared one day, mumbling away across from me in a booth while I pasted on a slightly puzzled smile. 
lips tight over my mouthful of food, wondering what on earth he was saying. Then the letters came. My best friend, Christy, and I wrote tomes of notes during our class periods to fold up into neat squares and swap with each other in the halls. This was how we plotted and schemed before the advent of text messaging. We had designated hallways where we would hand off our paper squares. One of these hallways was where I would also see Blueberry. One day, I just slyly palmed Christy's note in my hand when I suddenly felt a tap on my shoulder and paper slid into my other hand. It was Blueberry, staring fixedly at me with a slight smile. With a surprised chuckle and nod of acknowledgement, I took Blueberry's note into my purse along with Christie's. I soon found out that not only was he Michael Mumble, he was Michael Muddled. While his handwriting was neat and printed, and I was far from illiterate, I could not make head or tail out of his train of thought. He wrote as he spoke, in a mashed, inverted manner, where the subject matter was vague at best. All I could make out of the letters he would give me from that day on was that I was part of the subject matter, something about my considerations or me not seeing. Filling up the paper margins were badly drawn frogs, babblings about druids, and more frogs. I got these letters often, usually daily. I probably wrote a short note back to him once, maybe twice at most, but they came steadily as ever. As spring wound down, I began to get more than uneasy around him. To the group, Blueberry was Blueberry, just a normal oddball in the background. I began to avoid him, but he seemed blind to that. In retrospect, at the age of 25, I can safely say people pick up when you're avoiding them, but not Blueberry. The lunchtime interceptions and notes continued when he could manage it. And then came the gifts. I was a writer back then. I always had notebooks that I constantly filled up with any scribblings that came into my head. I wrote in the cheap, smaller-sized spirals that you can pick up at any drugstore. I knew better than to buy nice, fancy ones. They'd last me a week at best, but it was a fancy, heavy-bound journal that Blueberry gave me one day in the hallway after school. I didn't know what to say. It was an odd gift from someone whom I barely knew. There was something tainted about the journal. It was beautiful. A plush notebook etched with the design of an ancient map of China, and I swear the covers were of suede. It was expensive, enchanting and it gave me the chills. The first ten pages consisted of yet another letter he had penned to me. The first several paragraphs talked of how I was the only one who understood him, and he loved me. I stopped at that point. I could never bring myself to write in it or throw it away. Instead, I tucked it in a keepsafe box that slept underneath my bed, along with all the other notes and trinkets. I told myself I was giving off the wrong signals. I told myself I was being silly and overreacting to someone who was perfectly nice. Christy told me, you're lucky that someone buys you something nice without even trying to sleep with you. Friends told me, ah, Blueberry's just a goof, but he's alright. I was grateful when the summer rolled around. Junior year. When school started back up, I had a boyfriend named Adam brightly dyed red hair and a red car, so Blueberry inevitably faded into the background, whether he liked it or not. He had no driver's license, eschewed the alternative of a bicycle, and walked everywhere. Looking back, I realized that this made it harder for him to intercept me at lunch. When I zipped off to meet my older boyfriend at home for the hour-long break, the only times I would see Blueberry was when I was pulling out of the parking lot and I would see him doing his brisk, frustration-fueled strides in whatever direction. His eyes were always either angrily fixed at a point in the distance, and his chin set in a tight line of frustration, or seemed to be searching the area of high school students flooding the parking lot. Every now and then, he would spy my cherry red Volvo station wagon, which was embarrassingly hard to miss, and he would stare. As a side note, I used to dye my hair red, I loved it. 
Then I read what he put in the first four pages of the second journal he left on my windshield at school. I didn't dye my hair red again until I was 22. For the most part, humans can get a decent read on others. This wasn't the case with Blueberry. I could make neither head or tails of him and his behavior around me. And eventually my teenage hormones finally said, Fuck it. And by fuck it, I mean... I made no more efforts. I decided the best way to fix the situation was to not give a shit. If he talked to me, I would respond with short sentences, then bluntly turn and walk away. I didn't avoid him. Neither did I approach him or wave at him in the hallways like I had the year before. He was just another guy in the background. Let me add that in the meantime, the letters never stopped. The gifts came almost like clockwork. A journal left on my car with the first four pages scribbled with the words that I never bothered to read. A bouquet of daisies or roses given to me in the hallway that I promptly gave to a lonely looking freshman as I turned the next corner. A book of fairy tales on my birthday, also with inscriptions inside. The journals, books, and letters were hardly ever actually read nor used and all found a home in that keepsake box underneath my bed. I could never explain why I felt compelled to tuck them into the keepsake box, but I just did. At times I would feel guilt, and I would look for anything that I was doing to lead this insane boy on. What on earth compelled him to buy things for a girl that just didn't care? But in the end, my teenage psyche always lost interest and went back to scheming over how I was going to work around curfew and catch that wicked show happening at the local music venue on a school night. My junior year of high school wound down much like this. When school let out for summer, I was just happy to be able to be with friends and not worry about Blueberry. I came home one afternoon and sauntered into the kitchen to grab a snack. My father had just come home from work, barely beating me by five minutes as I could tell by how he had already taken off his suit jacket and brought in the mail. He was leaning against the kitchen counter and plucking the bills from my mother's overflow of catalogs when I came up to peck him on the cheek and offer one of the two apples I'd retrieved. Hey there, hun, he mumbled, taking the apple. Whoa, hold up, kid. You've got mail. Lucky you. He flipped a rectangular manila envelope towards me and I took it. Who's sending me snail mail? I think to myself, popping open the sealed flap. Maybe it's grandma. Oh, does it feel like a check in here? I start to hum a Smith song as I pry open the brats that anchor the flaps, girlfriend in coma. I pull the letter out. It's a single page of lined notebook paper. I shake the page. My eyes focus on the first line. I don't really want. Shit, I know that handwriting. Blueberry. I remember yelping in surprise and dropping the letters as if it had burned me. I remember grabbing the envelope and flipping it over to where the address should be, but I don't know why. I already knew it wouldn't make me feel better to see the street numbers I called home, along with my name carefully printed in the center. It did make me feel better, however, to see that a city in Colorado was listed in the top left's return address. Blueberry had left Texas, or so I hoped, because it sure made me sick to see that there was no postage stamp. He had to have hand-delivered it to my home, which he had somehow tracked down. The letter frightened me, in both its contents as well as the fact Blueberry had found out where I lived. I grilled all of our mutual friends, and they all swore that they hadn't been the ones to give out the information. In the letter itself, he sounded almost angry with me, or upset that I hadn't made good on some sort of agreement. Who knows? Thankfully, that was the last I heard of Blueberry. For several years, anyway. Fast forward to spring 2008, where I was living in Albuquerque, New Mexico, but preparing to move back to my hometown to kick a nasty drug habit and get a fresh start on life. I'd taken a break from packing up my apartment and headed to the library to clear my head and check my space. Ah, 2008. There was a friend request waiting for me when I logged in. Yeah, 
the cliché reappearance that the protagonist soon ruse. It was Blueberry. Still, to this day, I have no idea what possessed me to accept the request, but I did. Immediately I got a message from him. It was quite civilized actually. He asked how I was doing and even offered an apology for his behavior in high school. I was pleasantly surprised and appreciated the gesture and sent him a response saying so, along with a brief synopsis of my plans on moving back home. By the time I clicked send, my allotted time on the computer was up, so I logged out and headed back to my place to prepare for the move back home the next day. Three days and one state later, I was back home and finally feeling human as the bumps and bruises of the move subsided. It had been a busy few days, and I gladly sat down in front of my father's laptop to check my email and social media. I logged into MySpace and began to work through the stack of accumulated messages. I opened the reply from Blueberry. It had been sent almost immediately after I'd sent my reply several days ago. Well, that's a coincidence. Blueberry was moving back to our hometown as well. Godspeed to him in all of his endeavors was all I thought of it. I didn't think I would be running into him often, as our old group of friends had long since disbanded to get married, move away, or get locked up. I just picked up a job waiting tables at a 24-hour diner chain, Denny's, and enrolled in a summer college course. Life went on, but not for that long. I had just started the swing shift at work, and I was at the counter, filling up salt and pepper shakers, and setting up the floor before the dinner rush hit, when he walked in. I knew who he was while he was still in my peripheral. He slid into the swivel chair and mumbled what I can only imagine was a hello. Then he put his right hand on mine, which was wrapped around the salt tumbler I'd been refilling. Terror and confusion paint my insides. Another spike in blood pressure as he squeezes down hard, if only for a second before releasing his grip. He stares and he mumbles. I just want to quickly pause for a second. This is the part of the story that I find myself taking the longest time to write because I keep exiting my word program and distracting myself with unimportant busy work to avoid writing about what comes next. You see... This is the part where I left the door wide open for him to step in and catch me off guard. I could have prevented all of this had I just done something different. It's something I'm still angry with myself over. It's never easy to talk about, so I'm probably going to skip out on a lot of details and deliver the bare bones. I've dragged my heels through this story to this point, so use all the details you know about me and Blueberry that I've given so far to put together the big picture. This is going to be the first time I've ever told this story in its entirety, much less the final chapter. I may or may not be able to finish. And now I'll get back to the story. I should have told him to fuck off that day. I should have listened to my gut, which was screaming profanities at my rationalizing everything away brain. I knew that he moved from Colorado back down to our hometown because I was there. I knew that he'd taken my reply on MySpace as a sign of declaring my undying love to him in his twisted mind. I knew deep down that he was the same scary fuck that found out where I lived in high school. But a part of me had truly thought we'd matured past that point and all that wishful thinking. Instead, I smiled politely nodded, and excused myself to do anything but be around him. I ended up in the bathroom dry heaving. Anxiety's a bitch. I was stuck. I was the only waitress on the floor until seven, a good three hours away, and I had a credit card payment due in three days. I couldn't leave the floor. I remember talking to myself like a crazy person. He'd only said one word. I was being ridiculous. Nobody is twisted enough to do that over a girl that's barely spoken to him or returned any affections. Ludicrous. And who knows what he actually said back there or what he meant by touching my hand. He could just be surprised to see me, so who's really the crazy person here? It must be me. But then why had he looked at me as if he was gloating, as if he was hungry? I dry heaved to the porcelain gods again 
dart off to the floor, stay busy, stay away from the counter, and especially stay away from Blueberry. Unbeknownst to me, while I went about avoiding him, Blueberry applied for a position as a dishwasher. He was hired on the spot. I found out the next day as I clocked in and saw him carefully studying the employee schedule. I should have said something then, but I didn't. I was afraid. I didn't have time to think either. I managed to somehow change clothes, tie my apron, dry heave yet again, from anxiety several times, before my shaking legs found their way onto the floor. Like I said before, so much of it is a blur. I'm typing this as fast as I can to get to the end of this nightmare story. I don't remember many specific incidents leading up towards the end. I remember Friday night bar rush when he yelled at a 65-year-old man, a regular of mine that I'd come to think of as grandpa because he thought he was looking at me with pervert eyes. I remember how many times he tried to stop me while I was neck deep in the weeds with drunk and hungry customers, catching my arm to make me stop and look at him. The last time he grabbed me so hard, a bruise bloomed in place of his fingers the next morning. I remember the look of pure hatred and frustration that he gave every one of my male customers, and I remember how he said he would slit them from ear to ear if they ever touched me. I remember when my shift ended, and I held all of it in until I made it to the walk-in freezer. I just let out half a sob when the freezer door swung open, and Blueberry had himself in front of me. I remember the metallic taste of fear as I looked up at him. What next? He was looking forward to the talk we would have after work, he said. Oh, the talk about us. Oh, God, no. I remember wanting to scrub my forehead with lye from where he bent down and kissed me before exiting the walk-in. He made me sick being so close to me. Dirty. I remember the desperate need to leave. I clock out knowing that he won't be off until hours after I am. I can escape. I pull out of the parking lot and stop at a red light two blocks down, find a friend to stay with, figure all this out. God, I need my job. I think to myself. The passenger door opens. Fuck. It's him. When the hell did my passenger door not lock? Fuck. Did he? He broke my lock. He's in my car. I'm numb. He acts like this is a normal thing for us to do. My logic freezes. He gives me directions to his house, telling me how happy he is that I came around after all of these years of denying that what was between us was real. I can't breathe. A part of me is giving up. A part of me is so mad at myself for being so weak and unable to stop all of this. Wait, I'm not completely numb. There's still some anger in me. I'm starting to get angry at this person who repeatedly refused to take no for an answer, who intentionally came back to our town with the narcissistic, presumptuous intent of claiming me now that I had supposedly come around. He came into my job and made sure to move in fast, hard, and aggressively because he knew this is what I would do. The only words I'd ever heard him speak clearly and without any mumbles was a threat to slit my customer's throat from ear to ear. He walked out of his first night on the job just to follow me and got into my car as I was at a stoplight. Fuck that. As I had the opportunity to sit and process the absurdity of the situation, I became temporarily lost in a fugue state of memory, realization, and gritty resolve. We reached his place and I snapped back to reality. Immediately, I saw that the front lawn was teeming with drunken partygoers. His roommate had thrown a keg party that drew enough people to fill a high school stadium. To this day, I consider this the only reason I felt brave enough to do what I did next. There were too many people around to see and hear things. I knew it, and he knew it, and he didn't seem happy with it. I followed him into the house. I let him take me to his room. 
I stood in the open doorway and balked as he tugged on my wrist to pull me into the room, for God knows what reason, and it was like another person was speaking through me. Stay the hell away from me. I have never and will never be interested in you as a friend or anything else. You know what the hell you've been trying to do, and you've been trying to do it since I was fifteen. Don't come near me again. You need professional help, you son of a bitch. Then I realized how quiet it was. I swear to God, everyone in that party stopped and stared at us. It was so quiet, and all the blood in my body was pumping in a war dance of fear disguised as rage. I saw him falter, and we locked eyes. I could tell he was grasping, and then I tried to pull away. He was strong. Then he screamed. God. I'll never forget how angry he looked. He wasn't mumbling. He screamed so clearly. Just fucking lay with me tonight. Why won't you just lay down on the bed, you stew? He lurched forward like a tension-bearing spring to drag me into his room. It was at this point the bodies flew at him. Several of them. They tackled Blueberry to the floor. Beer was flying everywhere. The froth was landing in my hair. My shirt was wet with a faint scent of fresh hops. They were screaming, hands on hands, girl hands, nails digging into Blueberry's iron fingers. I could feel my blood slowing at the pockets where he had me firmly. My arms must be blue, I thought to myself before I saw the girls. Three of them, blonde and red. Run, come on, get away from him, they yell. His fingers are slipping claws but the long solar nails of three women are too much. He flinches with a jerk that forces him to let go. He disappeared under the heaps of bodies. My legs worked again. I ran to my car. I ran the fuck away. I still don't know who the men who tackled him were. Neither do I know the names of the women who scratched their own nails into Blueberry's skin so that he would let go and they could flank me in protection as I ran to my car. Still to this day, I don't think I've ever been faced with a truer definition of solidarity than the act right there. They didn't even know who I was when they all dove in. I don't know what kind of spiritual force is out there roaming the purple evenings with those who are alone, but more nights than not, I say a little thank you to the skies, hoping at least one of them hear me. I owe those strangers a great deal. Now that I've said that, the thing of this part of the story is, it's not over. It hasn't gotten bad yet, not by a long stretch. The final part was the hardest to write, and I still get sick to my stomach thinking about it at times. At this point, I wish I could say it's over. It's not. Stalkers are persistent. They don't think like you and I do. What I had done the night I told Blueberry no was something good and bad. Good in that I had acted loudly enough to become a person to him, not an object. Bad in the sense that I'd set down boundaries that conflicted with his intents. And I had done it in a crowd of people, embarrassing him. I knew that where he had just seen me as a living doll before, he would now see me as someone to be punished. This is what I thought to myself as I stared at the ceiling. I'd barely slept after crashing through my front door and quickly, desperately checking each window and door's lock in my father's house before collapsing in a heap by the bed. My father wasn't home, as he usually stayed over at his new girlfriend's place. I didn't mind. It was nice to see him in love. It took years off of his face, and I didn't want to put those years back on with my predicament. I didn't want to see the look in his eyes if he saw the branches of broken blood vessel blossoms that ran up my arm in dull spirals of pain. I didn't want to see him and Blueberry in the same room. I didn't want him to feel disappointed or upset with me. I'd kicked the habit and worked diligently on my decision-making skills, but my helplessness in dealing with Blueberry seemed to me a return to a life I thought I'd left behind. No better to figure this out myself. He'd spent enough sleepless nights worrying about me. 
I was suddenly thankful for my parents' recent divorce. My mother stayed behind in the house I grew up in, and my father had rented out a lovely house in an adjacent neighborhood. Blueberry couldn't possibly find me here. With that comforting thought, I pulled myself out of the bed and dressed. I remember picking a shirt with sleeves to cover the bruises he'd left. I didn't even care that it was easily a hundred degrees outside. Anything to keep me from seeing and remembering his brand on me. I padded towards the kitchen, stopping at the large glass window panes that faced the open schoolyard across the street. I pulled back the blinds and took in the grassy, sun-drenched view. I liked the house. It was open. I could see anybody coming, but it was quiet for now. In the kitchen, I stepped into the cupboard and plucked a fresh bag of chips. I was starving. I had just started to pull open the bag of chips when the banging started. Boom, boom, boom. They were a parody of polite knocks. I had no idea how he had found me. Still to this day, I still don't, but it doesn't matter how, just that he did. But I knew who was behind the door. Just as that person knew that I was hiding in there somewhere. At the very first echo of Blueberry's fist hitting the front door, my legs turned to dust beneath me. The bag of chips burst as I collided with linoleum. My body's momentum transforms the potato shards into a million traders echoing every move. I was sobbing silently. Hiding behind the fridge and watching the shadows slide along the floor to where I'd just been seconds ago, gazing out the window with that false sense of safety. Boom, 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 again. Then there was silence. My phone buzzed on the counter. I stretched my arm upward and clutched that little electric beacon of freedom. A text from 303 area code, Colorado. Him. The text illuminates the screen. My dear, I know you're in there. Let me in. I have your favorite Subway sandwich for you. And a surprise. Jesus, how did he get my number? My sleeve had been pushed back from the reach for my phone. I see the bruises again. A friendly reminder from Blueberry. Some of them are in the same shade as his name. The knocks have been quiet and there is no more shadow on the wooden floor by the window. I remember that there was a click in my brain at that moment. Something finally connected. My survival instincts are finally triggered and I shift from frozen into overdrive. I am no longer human. I am a gazelle running from the lion. Chips crunch under my shoes as I snap up to my feet, keys and phone in hand, and I run for the sake of everything I love in this world. I hear metal creak behind me back in the kitchen just as I slam the front door open. All that sunlight outside charges every cell in my bruised body. And from the front steps, I dive into my car from through the open passenger side window. I leave a perfect arc of rubber marks on the driveway as I reverse, swivel my head and scan the yard for him. There is nowhere to hide in this wide open neighborhood. Nothing. He is unseen. The gas pedal is one with the floorboard. I'm thankful the students of the elementary school across the street are not out for recess because I would braid them into the sticky tarmac without a second thought if they'd stood between me and safety. That is the level of my fear. I keep driving, blowing through all yields and stops. I wonder if I'm crazy. My phone buzzes with another text from that Colorado number. No, not crazy. Scared. Not of death. Not yet, anyway. I'm scared of what he'll do to make me return to his normalcy. I am a doll to him. What happens when dolls start to speak? When they run like a gazelle away from his playroom rules? What happens if the lion catches the gazelle? I dry heave and sob at once. Oh god, the fear. I feel like he's with me right now, watching. It does occur to me to call the police. 
but what do I tell them? They would look at me like I was crazy, just like everyone else had assured me that Blueberry was fine. Just odd. So very odd. Maybe I still am the crazy one. I'm going 55 in a 25 after all, but I know that I can't be alone at this moment. I pick up my phone, dial the number for Brandon. He lives the closest. I have to redial twice. Blueberry keeps texting, and the alerts make me exit my keypad. His messages tell me about the lack of appreciation for the things he does for me. I dry heave again. I'm still going 55. Finally, I'm able to input all seven digits. Hello? Brandon's voice is an angelic sound. I cry. All that comes out is the name of the street I'm on. He directs me to park a block away from where I am. I see him. He sees me. I leave the keys in the ignition, but turn the car off. I run across the green field to him. I feel like I can't do anything but run for dear life. Brandon catches me, holds me tightly by the arms with two big hands. My bruises hurt under his palms. My lungs are on fire. I can't stop my legs from twitching. I babble. I'm not crazy. I'm not crazy. He found me. Please don't tell him where I am, Brandon. Please. I collapse on the soft grass. Brandon tells me later on that he pieced the story together from what he could hear me say, curled up in a fetal position on the grass, babbling about blueberries, bruises, and being an object. He wasn't sure what to make of it, and admits that he thought I was back on the shit and was having a bad come down. Then he goes to retrieve the keys to my car from the ignition. My phone is on the front seat, still lighting up incessantly with messages from a 303 number. Brandon sees this. He opens my phone and reads several of the 52 messages sent in the last half hour. He said he couldn't bear to read anymore after seeing the one that included a photo of my open underwear drawer. It dawned on Brandon that Blueberry is inside my home and enjoys letting me know. Brandon hugs me and talks to me until Carly and Kate get to the park. Carly and Kate will take me to their house, where we will call the police. Brandon has warrants so he can't be there with us, but before he leaves, he hugs me so fiercely and reminds me that I'm real and not plastic. He whispers into Carly's ear and advises her to check the messages on my phone if she doesn't believe. She makes it to the messages where he tells me that he will shave my red harlot's hair off if I don't come back and be good. My phone rings. Carly answers. It's my father. Kate drives my car home. They stay as I hear what's happened. The next door neighbor had been in her kitchen when she saw me run out of the door and peel out of the driveway. The clue, she said, was how I'd thrown myself into the car through the window as if I couldn't waste a minute without opening a door. She went closer to her window to watch the scene. As my car faded away, she looked at the front door of the house. She saw a tall, thin man coming out of the front door and staring into the direction I'd gone. She said he looked angry and I looked terrified. She called the police. My father, unaware of all of this, Came home soon after the neighbor placed the call. Blueberry was back outside on the porch by then, perched on the step, watching and waiting. My father stared at the strange boy on his steps. He saw the tire tracks and absence of my car. Blueberry calmly looked up at my father, met his gaze, and blankly said that he was thinking about getting me a vanity for my birthday. My father tells me that Blueberry stood up and placed himself between my dad and the door. My father was a criminal defense attorney for 30 years. He's a stoic, tough man who's defended countless killers, thieves, addicts, people who have sexually assaulted, and the truly innocent before a jury of peers. Not much shakes him, yet the tremor in my father's voice is perceptible as he tells me this. He stares Blueberry down and simply says, do you pay for this house, boy? I don't answer to you. Get out of my way. Blueberry moves, 
My father goes inside, disturbed by the boy on the stairs, and glad that I'm not here. In the kitchen, he sees the crushed bag of chips on the floor, the mess in the kitchen. He can see the signs of frantic movement etched in the carpet of chips. He can see that the back door is wide open. I would never leave it like that. He also remembers that the front door had been unlocked. He and I share a paranoia of unlocked doors. And it was then that my father knew something was very wrong. He feels sick. He sprints to the front door. Hey, kid. He roars at Blueberry's retreating back. He'd taken off down the street when he heard the sirens. The police cars called by the neighbor pull up at this point. One patrol goes in pursuit of Blueberry. The other stays to talk to my father, who is calling my phone, and our astute neighbor, who relates what she'd seen through the window. The police ask if I know this man who was on the stairs. Carly gives them my phone as an answer. My father sees over the cop's shoulder, turns pale, and closes his eyes. I see the years go back on his face. I can't stop crying. I can't get a word out. All I can do is lead them all to my bedroom, where Carly holds up the bed skirt as I reach underneath and pull out the three keepsake boxes that I have filled with the last five years' worth of Blueberry's gifts and letters. Carly brings me a yearbook. I cry harder and harder as I open up the page with his class photo on it and point at his full name. I'm crying this hard because it's over. I'm crying this hard because it could have been over long before this point. The officer bags up the contents of the boxes, and the flashes of cameras capture any traces of what had happened that afternoon. I give a short statement once I can speak coherently. They don't find Blueberry, but my father secures protective orders quickly with the connections he has. He looks so tired. It must have been so easy to protect me when I was small. When he could be the barrier between me and the monsters he dealt with on a daily basis. But that time has long since passed. All he could do now was make phone calls and pray to a god he did not believe in. He did not tell me about the journal left on the doorstep until years later. The one that he didn't turn over to the police. The one that had photos of me sleeping. Photos of me naked and fresh out of the shower. Even some of me kissing my ex-boyfriend. Adam's face in these were scratched out and left hollow. All of them taken at times when I had assumed I was alone. I arranged to stay the night with Carly. She tells me the next morning that I'd started screaming in my sleep and did not stop until she crawled into the bed with me and wrapped me in her tiny arms. I'm grateful to her. I think her touch is what kept me from remembering any nightmares I had that night. It felt so good to just sleep. We moved soon afterwards, my father and I. We spoke of the incident only once more when I walked into the kitchen of the new house and saw my father at the table with a tumbler of bourbon in hand, flipping through a mound of papers with the other. They were the letters from Blueberry. He had retrieved them after evidence processed them. He intended to put them in his safety deposit box. I'll never forget the grim reasoning behind his voice as the lawyer in him spoke. Well, if you ever turn up murdered, at least I'll have this and that fucking journal to prove exactly who did it. I haven't seen or heard of Blueberry since that day. It's been five years, and it's taken two weeks of writing to get all of this out. There's so much to this story, and it's so harrowing, yet it's relieving to be able to put this all down together in chronological order, and know that I lived through it. Thanks. I needed this. My story begins summer of 2012. The first encounter happens before I'm leaving to go out of town for a summer study program. At the time, my mom didn't have AC, 
which meant we would leave the front door open as we watched TV before bed. Not smart, but the breeze was nice, and we were naive. My friend was over as she was coming to drop me off, and we fell asleep, with the door open. We both woke up and discussed how we had weird dreams of a large man walking through the house. That's all we remember. Next thing you know, my friend is missing cash and cigarettes. Now, no one in the house smokes, and we destroyed the house searching for both cash and cigarettes. We were terrified to tell my mom that we forgot to shut the door, and my mom felt awful that my friend's cash went missing, so she replaced it, and we just forgot about it. I returned from the program about two months later. I was in my room. It was around 2 a.m., and my mom habitually fell asleep on the living room floor after working a long shift. I was texting a friend about a fight I was having with my boyfriend at the time, and then I hear something odd. My mom has jingles on the back door at this time, because my sister and I at the time would sneak out, and it's how she would catch us. I listen to the jingles start shaking, and I realize that the back door is opening and closing. I start to freeze and text my friend. I think someone just walked into my house. Now, my mom's house is a ranch in a suburb. Small, cozy house, and you learn everyone's footsteps. My mom's are light, quick, and shuffled. The person walking through my house from the back door has heavy steps, and they're trying to be quiet. I hear them open, look through a drawer, and scatter metal in the kitchen. I worry and think to myself, did they just try to search for a knife? I don't have the courage to scream or face the culprit. I text my friend to call 911 immediately. She thinks I'm teasing or being dramatic. I stop texting and listen to the person go into my sister's room. I can see from my window they had flicked on her lights for what felt like forever. Thankfully, she was at her friend's having a sleepover. I began to worry that they were going to open my door and come into my room. They didn't. This whole time, my heart is racing and I'm frozen. They walk over to the living room where my mom is still asleep on the floor, and from what I remember, I think they just watched her. Eventually, they left. I immediately call my mom, who was feet away from me, and ask if she was just walking around. She says, What? I immediately start to have a panic attack, scream for her to run to my room, and frantically explain what happened. Finally, the police department call me because my friend did call them, and they asked if everything was okay. I shout on the phone what happened, and they sent over some police officers. The police did a search around my house and saw footprints in the mud, right outside my bedroom window. They asked if my mom, sister, and I had partners or exes that may want to stalk us. We all hadn't at the time. I did admit to what happened two months prior, and it could have been the same person preying on us. We were all so freaked out about the incident, but it doesn't end there. Months later, my mom again has fallen asleep with the TV on in the living room. By now, we have a paranoid system of making sure the doors and windows are locked. We have thick window curtains too, but sometimes with the sun setting, you forget to put them down. My mom is half awake watching TV when she noticed a reflection in the window. She stares at it and thinks it's the TV glare when it waves at her. All of a sudden, I hear her screaming and stomping out the door. You fucks. Fuck you. I chase after her. She's out the door, chasing a giant white van. The culprit got away. My mom chased them. I had to yell at my mom it was probably not the smartest to number one, not call the police immediately. Number two, open the door to them. And number three, chase after them without any protection. Because who knows? But luckily they left her alone. We never found out who it was, and since then we've never had another incident. That we know of, at least. But whenever I visit home, there's always an eerie, unspoken paranoia.
Back in 2008, I was in a hiking slash sightseeing tour with a well-known rugged travel outfitter. The tour started in New Delhi, India and ended in Kathmandu, Nepal. Halfway through the tour, we meander our way to Varanasi where there were rumors of strikes in Nepal, mainly Lumbini and the Chitwan National Park area. So instead of taking a bus to the border to get to the park in Nepal, we took a plane. Crisis averted, right? We landed in Kathmandu and of course the baggage handlers decided to strike. We had to wait about five hours to get our bags. We stayed about a day at Kathmandu and that's round where the strike ended. We proceeded with the trip to Chitwan National Park and staying at a homestay for a few days. After a few days of getting our fill of elephant riding, hippo watching, and tiger tracking, there were rumors going around in the village about a huge strike happening the next day, with travel on the roads potentially barred with the threat of death. We all decided to head out extremely early so we would not be stuck in Chitwan for potentially days. So around 3 a.m., 11 members of the group, our guide and I and the driver, decide to head out into the dark and on to Kathmandu. It was quiet for about the 15 to 20 minutes of driving in the dark, lots of meandering turns around small villages and lakes. However, that was stopped short. We saw a small minibus torched, fires burning wildly, and soon we were stopped by these masked villagers holding sticks. One of them came to the driver's side and pulled the driver out. They proceeded to repeatedly smack him in his face over and over. Another masked man tried to open our passenger door. Luckily it could only be opened by one side, and luckily it was held tightly closed by a burly Australian member of our group. While this was going on, another masked man broke our back window. This resulted in a few of us crying in fear. My cousin, a few other guys and I were thinking of breaking out of the car and tackling these masked men with skirts. We figured the combined arms of a few Americans, Aussies, and a German would be able to take them down, right? No sooner than we thought of that plan, motorcycles started roaring in close by, carrying Molotov cocktails. Shit. Our guide and the driver started pleading with them, saying that we're tourists, there are women in the bus, and that we will go back in peace. Just let us go. They eventually let us go. They told us to turn around and not to come back until the strike is over. To this day, every time I hear glass break, I cringe and remember these events clearly. Just for context, my boyfriend and I are homeless and we live in our car. There is a road that leads to a quiet beach on the bay near some train tracks, and there's only one road to exit, so not a lot of people come down this way. Unless it's for beach access, people going to work in the industrial plants on the road, going to AA meetings, or if they're sleeping in their cars as well. Nothing in the area was open except maybe a couple of bars, and even those were a good three to four blocks away. Most of the stretch of the road has eight-hour parking signs, so there are usually at least a few other people camped for the night, most of whom we have seen before. But tonight, there weren't as many. There were just a few vehicles taking advantage of the overnight parking. We parked a little further up the road than we normally do, hoping to get better internet connection. It was a little after 12.30 a.m., and we were relaxing, watching YouTube with the dogs, starting to get sleepy when we heard a car pull up behind us with their lights off. We completely cover our windows so nobody can see in, but we can peek out if we move the blanket, and we can see headlights from cars passing or approaching. My boyfriend said it was a van. We didn't think much of it and kept trying to watch our show, annoyed with the spotty Wi-Fi connection. There was a few words exchanged on what sounded like the other side of the street, not behind us where the van pulled up. It sounded like there were three or four people. A little while later, the van drove off. Then we heard a knock on my side of the window. We shut off the volume on the laptop and called out, Yeah? 
There was silence, so we called out, Can we help you? But again, there was nothing. It was then that I realized that my door was unlocked, so I quickly locked it. After about 30 seconds of quiet, I pulled open the cover and no one was there. There are sometimes homeless walking around. They could have thought we were someone else. It was silent for a while. Then we could see in the light of the street lamp through the crack on the sun reflector covering the front windshield the silhouette of someone walking around the front of the car slowly. It was another solid minute after we saw the movement before we heard a quiet tapping on the passenger side window. This time my boyfriend pulled the cover down almost right away and again we didn't see who it was. Right after this there was a knock on my side again. It was right about then we realized that there was still more than one person around the car. There was no time for one person to get from the passenger's side to my side between the second and third knock, and we heard more than one voice prior. I started to think that maybe not everyone had gotten back inside the van before it drove off. So after the third knock, I pulled my window cover down again almost all the way, really annoyed and on edge by now. There was a skinny white guy, probably in his mid-thirties to early forties, holding a flashlight and something else scooped awkwardly in the other hand, almost like he was keeping it under his sweatshirt, but we couldn't make it out. The windows were steamed up from us breathing inside with the windows shut tight, so it was pretty difficult to see outside. He said, hey, I need a jump. Interesting, since there are no stores nearby, there's no reason to be down here at 1am. Sorry, we're just about to take off. We're in a rush. The guy got frustrated and whined. Come on, I've been down here for hours. Okay, if he had been down here for hours, why did he not, A, ask us to help him out about 45 minutes prior when we pulled up, parked, let our dog get out to eat and go to the bathroom, and then got our bed set up, or B, attempt to start the car at any point, we never heard a motor rev up, an attempt to turn the engine on or even the jingling of keys. Another reason that creeped me out is that I could only see him. He said, I need a jump. I have been down here for hours when I could clearly hear that there was more than one person around, but we couldn't see them. For one reason or another, they were standing out of view, not making themselves known. After this, he grumbled and went across the street to a white car with black rims that we had seen before but not associated with. I got this awful feeling in my gut, and even though all the windows were steamed up, I started the car and told my boyfriend to start wiping the windows so I could see, and I just started driving. We could feel that there was something sinister about the whole situation. For one reason or another, they were trying to get us to open a door or window. When that didn't work, they didn't respond because they didn't have a good reason made up yet. So after a couple of attempts to get us to open the door, they gave us the sob story, hoping we would get out of the car so they could either steal the car while we were trying to help them, get to my boyfriend, or they were trying to rob us for the laptop, which I'm sure they could hear and see the glow of the screen. The possibilities are unsettling and endless. Or, maybe he was just a guy who happened to need a jump at 1am, nowhere near any stores or houses, and I'm that asshole that left some poor guy down there on the side of the road, right? Well, we drove to McDonald's to eat something, and parked in the back driveway of someone we knew, so that we weren't right out in the open anymore. The lock on our trunk recently broke, and it's only held together with bungee cords, with most of our belongings inside, so it worries me that it could make us an easier target for thieves. The next morning, we were down there again, and the white car with black rims was still there, only now the back window was busted out, and the man was nowhere in sight. I think it was never his car to begin with. I think all of those people came in the van, and one of them drove off so that the rest of them could rob someone outright. 
or so they could break into the parked cars on the side of the street when no one was in them. It was really stressful, and my boyfriend has been rattled for days. We are nervous to park in the same spot, so we're now looking to rent a residential driveway to park at night, where we won't be so vulnerable. My boyfriend teased the dogs for not barking, but I think it was very intuitive of him, because if we needed to pretend we weren't inside of the car, we would have been able to do so. Maybe it would have scared them right off. I like knowing he will wait and watch me to know what to do in stressful situations. I'm just so relieved that I was not down there by myself. Even the two of us together were pretty nervous, knowing that we were likely outnumbered. But if it were just a 120 pound female like myself in the car alone, I'm worried that they may have been a bit more aggressive about getting the door opened. Sometimes I think I watch too many murder investigation shows and conspiracy theory videos, and that may make me paranoid. Maybe it's the fact that my grandfather was a sex crime and homicide detective for 30 years in the same area, and I grew up with him constantly warning me of the dangers that lurk in the dark and what can happen to a person. He taught me that real monsters are not boogeymen. They are just plain men. A series of events started to happen when I was very young. I was around 8 to 9. There is a chance the series were not connected. My feeling is, it's all connected to one disturbed man. The first event was that the phone started ringing almost every night, between 2 and 2.30 a.m. Being a light sleeper, it woke me constantly. My parents didn't ever appear to be bothered, probably because they were both drunk almost every night and passed out, even when I did complain. They would just respond by saying it was probably the wrong number or something along those lines. It gave me a bad feeling every night hearing that loud rattling landline phone ringing in the kitchen. One night, out of curiosity and frustration, when the phone rang, I decided to answer it. I heard some distant music in the background, and some heavy breathing. Now being older, I can say it sounded like someone was sitting in a bar. Eventually, my parents changed the number. A few months after my parents changed the number, I was awoken again by a different sound. There's something creepy about hearing noises at night in an isolated country house. Every little sound can be heard. Every sound lingers. You can feel it. So when I heard the car slowing down on the road in front of our house, it woke me with an unsettling feeling. I remember I could hear how the tires drove over the gravel in the driveway. My heart sank. I looked up at the wooden square clock in my bedroom. It was 2.17 a.m. For reasons I cannot explain, I crawled out of my bed and walked out to the living room and glanced out the windows that hung above the driveway. I kept my distance from the window so he couldn't see me. I stared down at him through the sheer curtains. A man in a dark-colored Buick Century sat in the car facing my house. I couldn't make out the distinctive facial features. I could see that he had light-colored hair with a bowl-cut style. If I had to guess now, I would say he was in his early to mid-thirties. He just sat there. He stared up at my house in a trance. I don't even remember him moving. I waited to see what he was going to do. I was filled with fear. Around 15 minutes, he just sat there. Then he very slowly backs up and drives away. He kept his eyes on the house as he drove. So maybe it was a wrong house or he was drunk. Who knows? Then I think he visited again. It was a Sunday evening and I was in the front yard playing with my siblings. I still remember that dreaded feeling of returning to school the next day. A car pulls up and it stops in front of the mailbox down the road. Our house was on a little hill with a back road in front. The mailbox was down on the road. We stopped playing and watched down in curiosity. We knew it was Sunday, and the mail doesn't come on that day, and it's not even the regular mailman's car. 
The man continued to sit there, staring up at us. At one point, he reached his arm out to the window and acted like he put something in the mailbox. He then drove about 50 yards up the road and stopped and sat. My siblings told me to go check the mailbox, but I don't know why they told me to. Maybe it's because I was the youngest. I walked down the little hill and opened the mailbox and nothing was in it. Suddenly I hear the tires screeching and the car was flying towards me in reverse. I screamed and we all ran into the house. He drove off very fast. We told our parents and they thought we were confused and minimized the situation. That night, while lying in bed, it clicked in my head. That man was the same man that came that one night. It was the same car, and I remember the blonde hairstyle. An unsettling feeling sank in. About a year after that, one day in school, I heard teachers telling kids to avoid a dark-colored Buick. They said a man was trying to kidnap kids at their mailbox after getting off the bus. I moved out of that town a few years later when my parents got divorced. Every once in a while, he comes to me in my dreams, but I haven't heard anything about this man since. Yesterday, I took my son fishing. He wanted to go to a nearby lake that we haven't been to in quite some time. It's not known to be a great area. For some background, the last time we went was about a year ago. A car drove by and screamed, Nice ass, at me while I stood there with my young son. This kind of garbage behavior is unfortunately expected in the area. It's also known to be a late night hookup spot as well as a late night drug deal location. Due to the lake's reputation, I'd made a deal with my dad that I wouldn't stay there past 4pm without him. Now on to the story. My 12 year old son, who looks much younger than he is, and I, pulled up at our favorite fishing spot. A small pond on the opposite side of the road is the lake. Almost immediately, an older gentleman approached us, asking if there were fish in the pond. I replied that we'd just gotten started, so nothing yet, but that we'd caught fish in the pond on plenty of the other occasions. He thanked us for the information, and returned to his spot on the other side of the road. About 15 minutes later, another younger man approaches the older man with the dog. I can see and hear them chatting, but they've made no move to involve us in the conversation, which I'm glad for. I just want to enjoy a day with my son. Unfortunately, the water in the pond was incredibly low and murky, and I could tell we weren't going to have any luck. I tell my son to pack it up, and we'll try another spot on the other side of the lake. As we begin packing our gear into the trunk, the younger man yells over, Sorry if my dog and I ran you off. I tell him it's no problem, and we're simply moving to a better fishing spot. He then starts telling me how nice it is to see a mom taking her kid fishing, how you don't see that very often, that kind of thing. I get this a lot, so I'm pretty used to it. We have a short conversation about it as I pack up, and I then move towards the driver's side doors to depart. Before I can leave, the younger man starts up another conversation, this time asking me how old I think he is. This feels strange to me, but I'm nice to a fault, so I answer his question. I tell him I'm a horrible judge of age, but maybe 25. He tells me he's 38 and I'm too kind, and I laugh it off saying something like, I work with teenagers, so they always guess well above my age just to be mean. He asks where I work and I stupidly tell him my city. It turns out he lives there too, and he starts going on and on about how he got a free apartment on such and such street because his baby mama kicked him out of their house. I think he's talking about some kind of government assistance program. Weird flex, but okay man. At this point, I'm standing by the car door with my hand on the handle, and my son is already in the back seat. This guy can't take a hint and starts telling me all about his awful baby mama and how women are supposed to be submissive, quiet, and do what they're told. He specifically said, I mean, it's cool that you can bait a hook or whatever, but you're still a woman. 
Now my alarm bells are blaring. This guy struck up a conversation by commending me for doing a typical dad thing with my kid. Now he's putting me down for the same thing. He's gone from being overly friendly and complimentary to agitated and ranting. I should have been rude and just got in the car and left, but I've unfortunately been conditioned, like many women, to be polite even when we're uncomfortable. Instead, I start making comments in the hopes he'll see I'm not some meek, submissive woman who's going to agree with him. After all, I'm a tatted up chick with an eyebrow piercing and two lip piercings. I don't exactly look like a submissive little housewife. I guess I was trying to make him just as uncomfortable as he made me in the hopes he'd leave me alone. After he says women shouldn't be loud or opinionated, I tell him, oh, well you wouldn't like me at all. He tries to backpedal saying, I mean, it's okay to be loud I guess, but don't try that with your man, you know. I say, my man doesn't tell me shit, I do what I want. This kind of back and forth goes on for a while before he finally shakes his head and says, I just don't understand what kind of woman would act like that. I reply, a strong one. As soon as the words left my mouth, the older gentleman yells from his spot on the bank, Yeah, say that again, honey. This distracted the creep long enough for me to hop in the car and lock the doors. I still don't feel safe though. Unbeknownst to the creep, only two of my car doors actually have functioning locks, but at least they're the two on his side. I put the key in the ignition and turn. No dice. Nothing. Of all the times for my car to act up, it chooses now. Panic has now set in. As I repeatedly try to start my car, I can see him out of the corner of my eye. He's taken notice of my car troubles and is trying to get my attention. As he now takes a few steps towards my car, the engine finally roars to life and I peel out of there. Only then do I let my composure crumble and have a long talk with my son about what just happened. To the older gentleman who took notice of my discomfort and provided a distraction, I'd gladly meet with you again any day. To the younger misogynistic creep, I don't know if I was actually in any danger from you, but my gut said I was. Let's never meet again. Oh, and to my dad, I'll make you a new deal. I'm never going to that lake alone again, regardless of the time of day. Last November, my brother was visiting us from Dundee with his three-year-old son. Since my brother had moved from Glasgow, we didn't get to see him or his family too often, so we cherished it any time we got to see them. His wife, unfortunately, could not travel down due to work, and only a day into his visit, he was called back for an emergency. His nephew wanted to stay as we bought him tickets to the football the day after, so I agreed to take him back to his dad in Dundee after the game. The only train I could get was a fairly late one, and it was therefore the last one of the day. So I took my nephew to the football and headed straight to the station afterwards. The train was fairly busy, but I'd booked us two seats. Just as we were about to board the train, the man standing next to me made an odd comment. Like sardines, aren't they? I hate sardines, he said. I found this fairly odd, and I just laughed it off awkwardly. As we made our way to our seats, I noticed an old couple sitting in them. I told them it was our seats, but they were fairly rude and told me that old people shouldn't be made to stand for a journey. I've always hated confrontation, especially in public, so I just left. There were no two seats together anywhere on the train, so me and my nephew were forced to stand for about an hour until many people on the train finally got off when it stopped in Perth. Me and my nephew sat down, and I mistakenly fell asleep as I was so tired after a fairly long day and standing for an hour on the train. As my nephew was only three, he obviously fell asleep as well. I awoke just as the last passengers were getting off at Dundee. I jumped up and tried to get my nephew off the train as quickly as possible, 
but he was too slow and I had to stay on the train with him, meaning we missed the stop. As the train was delayed slightly, it was now going straight to Aberdeen, which was about another hour or so away. I sat down and tried to phone anyone I knew, but I didn't have any signal. I began to panic as I knew that there would be no return trains from Aberdeen at this time of night, likely meaning I would have to stay the night there in a hotel. I tried to compose myself and looked about the train to see if there was anyone who could maybe help me. My carriage had more or less cleared out by this point and there were only three people left. An older woman sleeping a few rows in front of me, a young man reading a book at the opposite side, and a third man behind me. I told my nephew to go back to sleep and I started trying to plan what I would do when we got to Aberdeen. As my phone had no signal, this was obviously fairly difficult. I decided I should ask the man behind me for any help. I looked in the window's reflection at him and noticed it was the same man who made the sardine comment earlier. He was a middle-aged man, fairly average build and height, and there was nothing to suggest he was in any way dangerous. Except one thing. He was staring right back at me. I looked away for a minute thinking maybe he was just looking about the train as I did only a moment ago. But when I looked again, he was still staring. His stare didn't seem to break until he got up, presumably to go to the bathroom. I debated switching to another carriage, but before I could gather my stuff and wake up my nephew, he returned. Only this time, he sat in a different seat, facing me directly. A few uneasy minutes went by before he made his first comment. Someone sleepy, he said, nodding to my nephew. I laughed awkwardly and put my earphones in to avoid having to talk to him, even though my phone had just died. Must be some set of earphones if they can listen to music when your phone's dead, he said. My heart dropped. I'm only kidding you on, he said but I now had no excuse to avoid conversation with him. So are you going home or visiting someone? He asked. I made the mistake of telling him what had happened and that I'd missed my stop. That's quite the situation. You won't get a train back at this time. I nodded and said I'll just find a hotel for the night. He then approached my seat and sat across from me. Hotels will all be booked out. And even if they aren't, they'll charge you a fortune. I've got a place not far from the station. You can stay there for the night and get the train in the morning. I'll stay out the way of you and your son. Don't worry. I explained to the man that he was not my son and that I was happy to cough up the money for a hotel. And I tried to stay polite by saying I didn't want to be a nuisance for him, even though I really just wanted to tell him to fuck off. Oh, believe me, you won't be any nuisance to me, he said in an overly friendly tone. I was now feeling extremely unnerved, but still tried my best to talk myself out of the situation. This conversation carried on for another ten minutes or so, and he was increasingly insistent that I stayed with him. I didn't have any idea what to do. I felt completely helpless. I told him I needed the toilet in an effort to get away from the carriage. This is when he grabbed my wrist below the table. You are not going anywhere, he said in a hushed tone. You are staying with me. I'll keep you safe, he said in an extremely chilling voice. I couldn't even bring myself to scream out in the situation. The only other passengers on the carriage were at the opposite end, and I was terrified that if I screamed, the man would hurt me or my nephew. He wouldn't let go of my wrist and repeatedly began saying, just act natural. The remaining part of the journey seemed to last a lifetime and I knew even then there was no light at the end of this tunnel as this man would not let me go. The train finally reached Aberdeen and the man told me to wake my nephew, not to alarm him and tell him we were staying at this nice man's house for the evening. He held my hand as we got off the train and my worst feelings were coming true. 
as I knew what would happen when this man got us back to his house. All of a sudden, I was knocked to the floor in a heap of bodies. The police had tackled the man and were arresting him. As I got to my feet, I grabbed my nephew's hand and ran only a couple of yards before completely breaking down. The police comforted me and told me that the young man who was reading his book at the other side of the carriage had noticed what was going on. He had sent a text to the British Transport Police, whose number is all over the walls of the train on posters. It took me a couple of minutes to process everything, but I managed to gain enough composure to thank the police and express my gratitude towards the man who had sent the text. I only managed to say a few words to him, but I will be forever grateful to him as he saved me from what would have been a night of terror and very possibly saved me and my nephew's lives. The police very kindly took my nephew and I back to Dundee, where my brother and his wife were extremely relieved to see us. It is now some time since the incident, but it has had a lasting effect on me, and I always make sure that when I'm traveling late at night that I'm accompanied by someone and never run the risk of missing my stop ever again. So this story took place when I was 12. It's more than half my lifespan ago, but I still get really uneasy when thinking back to it. I tried to block it from my mind and not guess as to what could have happened, if not for two kind strangers. I was walking home from school one day. I was alone, however. At one of the intersections I cross, there was a tall, dirty-looking man that noticed me. I would guess his age was early 30s. Being a kid back then, I struggled telling the age of adults. He started following me and trying to strike up a conversation. He kept telling me that I was beautiful and that he wants us to be friends. He asked me where I live and if my parents would be home. He asked me so many questions, but I tried to just shrug him off and be polite. I didn't answer any of his questions. I just increased the pace at which I walked. When we were nearing the block on which I lived, I started becoming really uneasy. He wanted to follow me home, and I did not want him to. I felt he gave off a weird vibe, because adults did not usually speak to me that way. The only way I could get rid of him would be to give him my cell phone number and agree to answer when he calls. Because this situation made me uncomfortable, I gave him a fake number and hightailed it out of there. A few months passed without me running into that man again, so I completely put this out of my mind. He was probably just some random weirdo. However, as you can guess from here, things did not stay that way. One day, I found myself walking home after school again. I will admit that I wasn't paying much attention to my surroundings. It wasn't until I heard what sounded like footsteps running up behind me. I turned around to look and it was the same creepy man that I'd encountered before. He slowed his pace as he reached me, but he was yelling the entire time. He figured out that I'd given him the wrong number, and he was furious. He kept yelling and yelling that I think I'm better than him. That's why I gave him a fake number. I was terrified in that moment as he was very aggressive. I was afraid that he was going to hurt me, but I couldn't grab the attention of any motorists. I sped walked to the closest gas station with him following behind me, still yelling at me the entire time. When I got to the gas station, I immediately got the attention of two burly men standing next to their pickup truck. They must have seen the terrified look on my face, plus the man following me, as they immediately ran over to ask if I was alright. I was too scared to speak just shook my head frantically as I tried to get behind them. They immediately demanded to know why the man was following me. He fed them some bullshit line about being my brother. I just silently kept shaking my head. I guess they figured out what was happening at this point as they started yelling at the man, accusing him of something. I did not stay to find out. I took the opportunity of him being distracted to start running away. The man noticed that I was leaving and tried to take after me. 
The burly men really took offense to this as they immediately tackled him and threw him in the back of their pickup. He was screaming at this point. They sped off with the guy at an inconceivable speed right past me and just kept going. I was happy that they took him away, but I did not stop running until I reached home. I had no idea what to make out of this entire exchange, but it really shook me. I don't know where they took the creepy guy or what they did with him after. In all honesty, I didn't want to know. I told my parents and altered the route I walked home from school. I never saw him again, and I'm thankful for that. Even though I could not say what I needed in that moment, those two kind strangers saw that I was in distress and dealt with it for me. Even after all these years, I still remember the sheer terror and then relief when they took him away. This happened back when I was 11 or 12 years old. It was the beginning of summer, and I begged my mom to go to the water park in the next town. She couldn't drive, so she arranged for her friend to drop me off and pick me back up after. I was a decent swimmer and had been alone a couple of times before. My mom had given me the money for the admission, and a little extra to get a drink and snack from the vending machines. I arrived and got changed putting my bag in a locker and strapping the key around my ankle. I couldn't wait to get on the slides. There weren't too many people there as it was early evening, around 6pm, so I got on all the slides relatively quickly. My favorite was the river rapid slide. On this slide, you would slide down small sections of slide, splashing into small pools in between. You were supposed to use a rubber ring, but most kids and some adults did not bother. No one ever worked on the slides anyway, so it was a bit of a free-for-all. I went down the river rapid slide for the fourth or fifth time and splashed into the first pool. I mucked around for a bit here before wading towards the next section of the slide. I was completely alone on the slide, or so I thought. The next pool after this section of slide was a dark and closed section. I like to sit in there sometimes and relax before finishing the ride. However, this time, someone was already in there. A larger woman in her thirties or forties lay on her stomach with her feet over the last section of the slide, her head peeking above the water. She was cackling loudly, a hysterical, guttural laugh. She looked me in the eyes and pushed herself down the last section of the slide still laughing as it echoed off the slide walls. I was thoroughly freaked out and waited five minutes before sliding down so I didn't encounter her at the bottom. Presuming it was a random freaky coincidence, I went straight back on the slide. Again, no one else was around. I rode the first section normally before apprehensively sliding the second section into the dark cave pool, and I heard it again. That creepy, genuine, hysterical laughter. There she was, the same woman from before, grinning and laughing while staring straight at me. She again flushed herself down the slide, leaving me alone. I decided I wasn't going to ride the river rapid slide again that visit. She petrified me. I decided to go on the black hole next. It was a one-person slide, you're supposed to wait for the light to go green before sliding, so I figured I would be okay. I say supposed. I flung myself into the black abyss of the tube ride. However, I heard a second thud behind me. I turned around, and in the darkness, my worst fears were confirmed. I saw the shadowy figure of an overweight, middle-aged woman following me down the slide. And once again... She started laughing loudly and hard, the kind of laugh where you can barely pause for breath, as if you've seen the funniest show or meme you could imagine. I've never been more terrified in my life. I panicked, slamming my hands down on the floor of the slide and pushing in an attempt to make myself go faster. It worked a bit, but she was never far behind. 
cackling away. When I reached the bottom, I threw myself out of the landing strip area, grazing my knee. I ran to the changing room, not looking back. I locked myself in a stall and removed the key from my ankle before running out to grab my stuff and went straight back in. I got changed and bolted from the building and called my mom. She sent her friend to pick me up right away. This happened a few years ago, around mid-November. My mother and I loved being outside and going for walks. This night in particular was freezing, but we decided we wanted to go out for a quick walk. As we walked back home, we went down this one street that we use all the time. It's a neighborhood street that leads to the main street, then back into our neighborhood. We get halfway down the street when I hear a dog bark over the music on my phone. I turned it off and turned to look for the dog because I love dogs, and I wasn't aware there was a big dog on the street. For a bit of context, I know quite a few people on this street, and I know which houses have dogs. Most of the people on the block have small dogs or cats. This came from a house that didn't have a dog, let alone a big dog. I spun around and saw a big dark mass just feet from me. If he stepped two more feet, he would have been able to grab me. I immediately felt weird and started speed walking back to my mom, who at that point didn't realize I stopped. I turned off my phone and whispered to her that I thought we were being followed. She turned around and grabbed my arm and told me there were two men right behind us. We started walking in a zigzag pattern and sure enough, they followed our every step. Once they caught on that we knew, one of the guys started to make chit-chat with us. Awfully late for y'all to be walking, huh? I swear, his voice sounded like the definition of the siren's voices, luring sailors to their doom. He continued questioning us. My mom kept walking and replying with quick replies. From the sound of his voice, I knew we were in danger, so I went to dial 911. Instead, my mom told me to call my dad, as he would be able to get to us quicker because we were almost home. We got to the busy street and looked behind us to see them speed walking to us. We decided to risk it and ran into the middle of the street as cars passed on either side of us. We ran across again and met my dad on that side. We looked across the street and both men were gone. We got into the car and searched the streets but these guys just disappeared into what seemed like thin air. I asked my mom if we would have been kidnapped if I hadn't heard the dog. She asked me what dog. I asked her how she didn't hear this massive dog bark, especially with how good her hearing is. I still have no clue what it was I heard, but I do know it most likely saved my life. I'm a former medic. We responded to a car wreck in which an SUV had run off the road and into a ditch at a high speed, causing the vehicle to flip end over end several times. There was a family of four in the car. The father, who was the driver, was unbelted and was ejected through the windshield, after which the vehicle landed on him before continuing to flip. He was dead on the scene when we arrived. The mother was in the passenger seat and she was belted, but the belt somehow malfunctioned and she was thrown forward far enough for her head to hit the windshield and put a hole in it. She was alive when we arrived, but barely. The vehicle was severely mangled and we were unable to extricate her quickly. We had to work a trauma code on her while she was still in the seat. By the time the rescue squad could get the vehicle access to remove her, she had been without pulse for nearly 10 minutes. The second arriving unit continued CPR on her during transport to the ER, but she was declared dead shortly after arriving at the hospital. The back seat contained two children. My recollection is that there was a girl of about 12 years of age and a boy who was about 8. They were both properly restrained 
and other than obvious scrapes and bruises, neither appeared to be seriously injured. Their vitals were in good shape, and other than being in shock, they seemed to have appropriate levels of consciousness. Because of the difficulty getting into the vehicle, they were trapped, but they could see all of our efforts to resuscitate their mother. Because of her condition compared to theirs, the main effort of extrication was to get the mother out first. The children were safely removed after she'd been removed and transported. They were taken to the same ER as the mother. Once back at the ER, the two children were thoroughly checked by the physicians and by radiology for any internal injuries or anything we may have missed. Neither had anything significant. What stuck with me the most was what I saw and learned as we were restocking our unit to go back on the road. One of the cops had let us know that the family was from out of town and they'd been on vacation. The closest family could not get down to be with the children for at least two hours. Soon after learning that, I was leaving the ER and I looked into the room where the children had been put after their trip to radiology. They were both on the same bed and the girl had her arms wrapped around her little brother. Both had thousand yard stares. I don't know if or how anyone had told them about their parents, but you could tell by the looks on their faces that they knew. I will never forget that day. I often wonder how those kids turned out and how difficult it must have been for them. I grew up in rural Appalachia, so I grew up hearing all kinds of superstitions and legends about ghosts and other creepy things. Of course, as an adult, I realized they were mostly made up by people trying to scare their kids from wandering off into the woods, and they were passed down over the generations. I was told to never respond if someone called my name in the woods, and if we heard whistling outside at night, it meant the devil was close. Of course, there's real truth and valuable advice in some of those stories. If a stranger is calling to you in the woods or whistling outside your house at night, you probably should be afraid, especially as a child. I never experienced either there in the mountains. The scariest thing that ever happened to me wasn't supernatural and happened in New Mexico. My mom died when I was very little, and when I was 20, my dad passed away leaving me without immediate family except my brother. My dad didn't have much, but he left his house to my brother and just enough money to me that I was able to buy two acres and a nice used camper. My boyfriend, now husband, wanted to move back home and be close to his mom, and we planned to eventually build a house. It seemed like such a cool adventure to me at the time. It was literally in the desert, a dirt lot off a dirt road, with no electricity or water access and surrounded by other identical empty plots. Until very recently, you could still find land like that for a little bit of nothing because it's inconvenient and expensive to truly live comfortably out there. We had to haul water from my in-laws house and use a generator for electricity. My husband worked nights as a security guard so I was alone in that camper almost every night. Honestly, it was boring and it felt safe enough to me then, because I have a big bear of a Rottweiler named Zeus, who would have defended either of us to the death. Obviously though, as I'd find out, it wasn't really that safe, dog or not. It was a normal night like any other. I'd been outside watching the sky while I smoked a bowl, and came back in to get ready for bed. I just undressed and climbed into bed, when I heard whistling and felt the camper sort of shift, like a hard gust of wind had hit it. It wasn't that unusual, because sometimes the wind really blew hard out there, so I would have ignored it if Zeus hadn't started growling like the devil himself was outside. He was crouched down toward the doorway, ready to attack. I was terrified, and it suddenly seemed so foolish to have assumed I was safe out there alone. With a thin aluminum door between me and whoever or whatever was out there in the dark. I couldn't help but think about the story my grandfather told me all those years ago about hearing whistling at night 
And while I'm not a very religious person in general, I'd be lying if I said it wasn't pretty unnerving in that moment. The sound of it was so unnaturally high-pitched that it almost sounded like the wind, but not quite, because it had a sort of sad melody to it. Besides that, my dog had never growled at the wind before. I remember thinking how crazy it was I could hear it over the generator, and I couldn't tell where it was coming from. It sounded like it was everywhere. I tried to work up the courage to go peek outside, but I was frozen to the bed. Zeus was going crazy now, growling and snarling and pacing. He rarely barked, but when he did, it was intimidating as hell, and once he started barking at the wall like he was possessed, everything sort of stopped. It was like the tension in the air just slowly dissipated. Zeus was just as freaked out as me, and couldn't settle down until I finally let him out about an hour later. He sniffed the back of the camper where the bedroom was for a good minute before reluctantly turning away and coming back inside. But I was too chicken shit to go outside myself. Cell service was spotty. This was a long time ago where everyone still had flip phones, and I was without a way to leave or call for help. When I told my husband the next morning, he was convinced it was traffickers or worse, trying to break in on me, and Zeus had scared them off. It was somewhat plausible to me, but I didn't feel that was the explanation. No one had actually tried to break in. That would be some strange kidnappers to just stand outside whistling. Then he told me he heard rumors of a small cult who lived somewhere out there, and maybe it was some of them trying to scare us away. That was more terrifying to me in a way, since I figured if that was the case, they might come back. But in the daylight, with my husband there, it also seemed a bit silly. I remembered how Zeus was sniffing at the back of the camper, and we decided to go look around. The dirt out there is soft and sandy, and it looked like it had been trampled around in by multiple people with different sized bare feet, the dirt that was right under the small window over our bed. The weirdest part is how there were no tracks leading off in any directions away from the camper, just the ones outside the window, and one set halfway around the backside wall, right around where Zeus had started barking. Suddenly, that crazy cult rumor didn't seem very far-fetched or silly to me. And that's how I ended up living with my mother-in-law for over a year. Because fuck living in fear of being harassed, or worse. We still own the lot where it happened, but we bought a place in town. The desert is beautiful, and I love hiking in it with other people. But at the same time, I've noticed something about it. It also really seems to attract crazy folks. I grew up on the top of this mountain that was mostly abandoned since the 60s, when an old ski hill burnt down. There were two other full-time residents up at the top where we lived. The rest of the houses stood empty the majority of the time, or were abandoned. The history of this mountain dates far back, hundreds of years ago, before the colonization of Canada. There were two native communities at war. One lived on top of this mountain, one lived in the valley below. At the base of the mountain, the two communities were supposed to meet for battle. During the journey down, the valley tribe snuck up behind the mountain tribe and slaughtered all their women and children. When the mountain tribe returned home, they were apparently slaughtered too. On the entire mountainside, these vining wild strawberries grow, and it's said that they grow from the spilt blood of the mountain tribe. Many people have died on this mountain. When I was growing up, there were hundreds of old crosses littering the twists and turns of the mountain. My father later became one of those crosses. In a small meadow surrounded by trees sat a small cottage, no driveways and only an overgrown pathway to lead you to it. If you looked inside, their breakfasts sat still prepared, oatmeal and eggs untouched for years. The man that lived there was supposedly a fugitive, 
who disappeared further into the mountains when the police came up and found him one day. We had these weird neighbors who would come two weekends a month from the city with their daughter, who was my age. They would bring friends over, get high, drunk, and naked, and have orgies in their yard or the forest. There was this eerie feeling you had while on this mountain, which was aptly named Forbidden. I stood looking out my bedroom window at night, I swear I could see things moving in the forest below. We had the highest concentration of mountain lions in the world, and I was often stalked home. One night, my mother woke to the sound of the sliding glass door opening and closing. She walked downstairs, and my sister was standing there sleepwalking, whispering over and over again, Here, kitty kitty. My sister had never been a sleepwalker until this, my mother grabbed her, closed and locked the sliding door, then flicked on the lights, and right there on the deck, pacing back and forth, was a cougar. My father also became a violent sleepwalker while living up there. He would have screaming matches with the wall, and sometimes ended up throwing items around. This wasn't something he did until the last few years of his life. My father was a skilled driver, and he'd driven up this mountain many times. A few months before the accident, I started having waking nightmares of my father's death. Something was telling me he was going to die. I remember waking up frequently and looking out the window into the forest during this period, and feeling like something was communicating with me, that he would die. He kissed me goodnight one night, and went out the door to go to town with his friends. They left in separate vehicles, him first. From the accounts of what happened, it was a freak accident. They were driving below speed limit down a straight stretch nearing a cliff slash corner when my dad's truck suddenly lost traction and started skidding sideways towards the cliff. My dad opened the truck door and jumped out, and the truck suddenly veered the other way and flipped onto him on the ground something that physically shouldn't have been possible. It crushed almost every bone in his body. He survived for eight days in hospital after being airlifted. The day he died, I knew again. I knew he was dead, and it was like this feeling that something was communicating this to me. I didn't need to be told. I was so sure of this feeling that I collapsed onto the ground the second I got it and started screaming, he's dead, isn't he? He's dead, isn't he? Over and over again. I was eight. I had never experienced death before. There's more that went on up there to a lot of different people over the years. It's known locally as a haunted and weird place. Nothing good ever happens there. People do weird and crazy out of character things. They commit heinous crimes, die, or just lose their minds. We moved when I was nine. I never felt that feeling again anywhere else. That feeling of something insidious all around you. I've only been up there a handful of times since, and every time I'm there, that feeling returns. I usually don't care about graveyard shifts, but now I'm terrified. I work a graveyard shift as a security guard for a recycling yard. I've been on this site for two weeks. Basically every hour I make rounds across a giant recycling yard, covered in various precious metals that are broken down and sold. During my shift, I scan various checkpoints and ensure nobody besides me is in the yard or facility. One of my other tasks is to go through some grassy and bushy terrain and over a set of train tracks to take a photo of the warehouse far across. This is to ensure it's safe and clear. I have to use a flashlight with 2K lumens so I can see my way through pretty much the entire yard. Well, just an hour and a half ago on my round, I went through the grass and over the train tracks. I took the picture of the warehouse and submitted it. All of a sudden, I get this intense feeling that I'm being watched. The hairs on my neck stand up, and I freeze. 
My flashlight is still on and pointing at the warehouse. I slowly turn around and point my flashlight behind me. I kid you not, about ten yards away, I see a skinny, old, wrinkled white man with a large white beard sitting on a chair. He was looking directly at me. He had dirty jean overalls and what I think was a western-style cowboy fedora on. Now, I'm a six-foot and 220-pound man, but I screamed, fuck at a pitch that was embarrassing. I accidentally dropped my flashlight out of shock. Mind you, there are thin, tiny metal shards literally everywhere on the ground. I can't see a damn thing now as the flashlight is facing away from my sight. All I hear is quick-paced shuffling and clanging of metal from footsteps quickly running towards me. Once the metal-crunching footsteps are within five feet of me, I hear them quickly veer to the left and past me. Within three to four seconds, the metal clanging is gone, followed by the faraway sound of rustling bushes. I then grabbed my flashlight from the ground and pointed it to the sound. The old man was gone, past the bushes to who knows where. I was shaking from adrenaline and fear. I managed to catch my breath and called several emergency contacts. When they arrived, the old man was gone. I believe maybe he was there just to watch the active trains move across. I say this because the metal chair was facing the tracks. It's still there. I took a photo of it, more as a memento if anything. I'm now in the office, still terrified and alone. And tomorrow, I'm doing another 11-hour graveyard. I won't quit as I need the money. I just wanted to get this off my chest. It chills me to this day when I think about what happened, or should I say could have happened, to my sister and I in 2007. I was 25 and she was 23. We were living in Phoenix and living a pretty wild life. Lots of partying. However, she could keep it in check. I was a blackout drunk. We were out with some friends at a party. I was particularly stupid that night and took my friend's car key to go pick up this couple I'd met earlier in the night. Needless to say, I was wasted and reckless. My sister called me while I was out all upset because our friend discovered that I took her car. I went back to the property and was promptly screamed at and kicked out, rightfully so. My sister was so embarrassed and crying, she was really intoxicated too, which wasn't a normal thing for her. I remember we were walking to find a taxi or something, it's all pretty hazy to me. The next thing I know, we're in the back of a car at a gas station on Grand Avenue, this street leads off into an old Arizona interstate highway. The random couple I'd met earlier were trying to open the door and get us out of the car. They happened to be at this gas station at probably 1am. I don't even know how they spotted me. They must have sensed trouble. I have hazy details, but I know they were frantic and insistent about getting us out of the car. From what they told us, the man driving the car appeared to be a total creep and no one I would seemingly associate with. I have no recollection of how we ended up in his car, who he was, where he was taking us, and why he needed to fill his tank. Sometimes I think the mysterious couple were angels sent to look after us. Both my sister and I were missing our phones the next day. I'm certain the man had taken them. There's a number of other things that could have happened that night, and I feel lucky that we are still alive. It racks me with guilt that I put my little sister in that situation, and any time I feel like picking up a drink, it's one of those memories I play back to remind myself where alcohol takes me. About eight years ago, my girlfriends and I would download plenty of fish and meet random guys to take exploring with us. 
definitely not the smartest, especially since we were out in the middle of nowhere, Pennsylvania. This one night, we met a guy called Todd. Todd was an odd guy. He seemed socially distant, and when he slid into the back of my SUV, I instantly got the feeling of regret. We were going to a place called Ronnie's Point. Todd wanted to stay in the car for a bit to scope out the area, while us girls went ahead to explore. Red flag. I was so sure he was going to try and steal my car. We went into the abandoned hospital, and out of nowhere, here comes Todd around the corner. He scared us so bad we let out a slight scream. Todd started making comments about how his great-grandfather was a security guard at the asylum, and that his grandfather told him stories about how they would shoot at the sick individuals for fun. He laughed and said, How much fun would that be? We continued to explore, and Todd just hung out in the background. We eventually left, and Todd insisted on sitting behind me in the car. I needed gas, so I started driving to the nearest gas station. Maybe two minutes up the winding road, I felt his slimy hands creep up and start massaging my shoulders. I kept leaning forward to give him the hint I was not interested. As he is massaging my shoulders, he's telling my friends and I how stupid we are for inviting random strangers out, how we never know who's getting in our car, and how they might hurt us and whatnot. He started laughing again, and I will never forget the tone of his voice or the grip of his hands on my shoulders. He said, Maybe that person is in the car with you, right now. I pulled into the gas station and demanded he got out of the car. He did, and I left him there. We got back home, and my friend went on to plenty of fish to block him, but he already blocked her or deleted his account. We never heard from him again, but we did stop inviting random people to urban explore and ghost hunt with us. My dad and I drove to his hometown in Mexico a few years back. We knew not to drive at night because of the cartel situation, so we timed the trip to have us arrive no later than 5pm. The problem was, this time, the border crossing took us hours compared to the 30 minute smacks we've experienced before. My anxiety was at its limit, with knots in my stomach, thinking about the worst possible scenarios from the moment we reached the border and every hour that passed without us crossing made me nervous. Now we're 10 hours away, putting us at 11 p.m. arrival, meaning we would be driving about three hours or so in the dark. If that wasn't enough, our GPS decided not to work in Mexican territory. Luckily for us, we made this trek enough times in my youth that my dad knew the cities we had to go by, so we would just follow the signs. Guess whose job it was to navigate. Don't get me wrong, I'm a great navigator by any means necessary, so it wasn't hard. But knowing that our lives were literally in my hands was absolutely terrifying. One wrong turn wouldn't just be an oopsie turnaround moment. I'm very glad to say that we had no missed turns or wrong exits or anything. What did happen though, once we entered the city that bordered our town, was that the cartel lookout started following us and taking down our plates, radioing each other to watch for us and figure out where we were going. One of them even tried to get us to stop, but that's the last thing you should do. Our family told us later that there was a curfew in place, so no one was supposed to be out past sundown. They saw that we stopped at my grandma's and watched us until she let us in. We were safe once they found out who we were. A few other scary things happened in the three weeks we were there, but nothing was as terrifying as the drive down. My husband and I were doing renovations in our house, and we had no window coverings in our front room. The front room was completely gutted and had just a ladder. In the middle of the night, my dog started barking a warning bark. Now, 
I immediately get out of bed and started to scale the wall to peek downstairs. When I looked around the corner to the front room, I saw someone looking in the large window with a flashlight. My dogs ran to the front door, barking. I went into one of the spare bedrooms that overlooked the front yard and saw a cop car. What was odd is that the cop didn't knock or announce himself, so they must have been looking for someone, right? I got my phone and called our local dispatch number and asked if someone had been called out to my area or if there was a search underway, and they said no. I thanked them and hung up. So I wanted to let this cop know that, yes, people lived in what may have looked like an abandoned house, but something just didn't feel right, so I didn't want to open the door. So instead I turned my porch light on and off repeatedly to see what the cop would do. He sprinted to his car and took off. I don't know what he was doing at my house or why he was looking in my windows, but I know he broke protocol by not calling it in and he was by himself. I told my husband about this, who slept through all of it. He said it was just a cop. Me, on the other hand, I know something wasn't right. A huge thanks to my dogs for letting me know. I've wanted to tell this story for years, and now I finally have a way to share it. This is going to be long, but it will tell you about the scariest experience of my life. I was 15 years old, living in a medium-sized city in North Florida. There were about 60,000 people, but some areas were really spread out and rural. Don't think of it like New York City or anything, more like a lot of houses spread out over a huge area and condensed shopping centers. I was a bit of a punk that my parents had a hard time controlling, so that meant I basically snuck out constantly and was always riding my bike around the city all hours of the night with my friends, fighting and constantly causing trouble. For reference, I was probably 5 foot 10 and 150 pounds. My next door neighbors were my best friends, Nick and Tim. Nick was younger than us, probably 5 foot 5 and 140 pounds, and Tim was 5 foot 8 and easily 210. Nick and Tim were brothers only a year or so apart. On that night, Tim had texted me around 1 a.m., asking me to ride bikes with him and his brother to his girlfriend's house so he can get lucky. I remember being hesitant because of how long the bike ride was, but Tim begged and begged me to go out until I agreed. Our city had a curfew, meaning any police in the area that saw you and assumed you were a minor would stop you and possibly issue a ticket and bring you home. That meant we had to be careful about being seen by cars going by. Well, the bike ride to her house went by without any issues. We took our time, joked around and smoked a little pot, and genuinely just enjoyed the ride together. We ran out of what little pot we had on the way and finally got to his girlfriend's house. After what felt like an hour, Tim snuck around the back to go in and Nick and I just sat on the electrical box and talked. Maybe 30 minutes went by and Tim triumphantly snuck out of the house, bragging about his time in there and says we should head out. Annoyed at how long it took and nearly sober, we both agreed. The first mile of the ride went by smoothly, but things changed. We had just passed a decent sized shopping center and a church. We rode by it slowly, in zero rush at all. After we passed it, it led to a long stretch of road with woods and canals on each side. The road name is Jefferson Parkway, two lanes on each side separated by palm trees and landscaping in the middle. Sidewalks on both sides, and on the right side, another road that connects to the parkway. We were riding on the right-hand sidewalk. Off in the distance, we saw a very tall older man wearing a yellow raincoat and a large backpack. He was walking back and forth on the sidewalk under a streetlight on the corner of the parkway and the side street. We all went silent as we got closer. I don't think he could have seen or heard us as there were no lights over us and there were sprinklers going off in the median. 
I remember hearing him dragging his feet across the ground and mumbling. He was dragging his feet, almost like he was trying to brush away the concrete to find something underneath it. The mumbling was incoherent and frantic. Honestly, it made my heart sink and my stomach knot up. I couldn't understand anything he was saying, and the only way to get home was to go by him. Nick said, Yo, let's go across the street and get onto the other sidewalk. Tim and I agreed. I remember this so distinctly. We crossed the landscape median, and a jet of sprinkler water hit me directly in the face and got into my mouth and eyes. It smelled like sulfur and tasted horrible. On the other side, we could hear the mumbling and scraping of his feet clearer. I could now see more details about him. He was smoking a cigarette and was probably six foot five. He had on a huge green backpack, was extremely skinny, he had long grey hair and was wearing combat boots and blue ripped jeans, and he also had a full white beard. He didn't seem to notice us until we were directly across from him. We all had our eyes locked in his direction when he suddenly stopped walking, talking, and scraping his feet. He looked up from the ground and let out this god-awful screech. It was like he tried to say a hundred words at once. None of us knew what he tried to say. After the initial scream, I could make out, What the fuck are you doing? It startled us. We were now 25 yards away from him, and then he screams, What the fuck are you looking at? I was a foolish teenager. I piped up to say something smart, and Tim riding next to me grabbed onto me and said, Don't say a fucking word. So I didn't, and in hindsight, I'm so glad I didn't. He kept screaming in our direction, and we kept riding. The further we rode, the fainter the screaming got. Then, it stopped. We crossed the street again to the other side and made it about a mile down the road, all of us on edge. We glanced over our shoulders constantly to make sure he wasn't following us. We talked briefly about it, how strange it was and whatnot but we were glad it was over with, or so we thought. Nick and Tim were riding in front of me when I thought I heard something behind me. I turned around, and there he was, maybe an arm's length away, headed directly for me. The yellow raincoat hood was pulled up over his head and buttoned. This guy was standing up on his mountain bike, pedaling as hard as he could. We locked eyes and... He started screaming, and I mean screaming. He screamed not words, not any language. It was a constant scream as loud as he could. I have the chills writing this even now. As a 25-year-old grown-ass man with a wife and a baby, if someone ever illustrated that image and I saw it, I would probably have a panic attack. I screamed, he's right behind us, and stood up pedaling as hard as I could. I think we all did. And he was right behind us the whole time, screaming. Every so often, he would get right on top of us, screaming and trying to knock us off of our bikes. I don't know how long we rode with him behind us, but it felt like eternity. I think age played a factor, because he must have gotten tired and let us get ahead a bit. Exhausted, we pulled into a neighborhood and started cutting through yards trying to lose him. We jumped off our bikes and all just decided if he's chasing us, we were going to make our stand together and fight. It was like a hive mind decision. All too tired to keep running, it was our only option. We waited for him, but he never came. I don't even remember hearing him. I still can't recall when we lost him. I called my house phone, waking both my parents up in the process, and told my dad about the situation. He told me to get home and figure it out. I asked to talk to my mother, and she yelled at me on the phone and refused to come pick us up, as I stood in the middle of the street, hoping this crazy guy didn't come and kill us all. I got home with Nick and Tim in tow, who asked if they could crash in my room. Of course I said yes. I think we all still have some weird feelings about that night. 
and we never really spoke of it again. I don't know what he wanted. He was clearly on drugs, but it makes me wonder if he would have robbed us, or worse. In this case, I was working the graveyard shift at a call center. We were an inbound and outbound call center, contracted to handle the call center loads from various companies. The clients ranged from banks and moneylenders to budding cellular companies that were just forming then. I was handling a call for a man in New York. His name was John. John called technical and policy support because for some reason he wasn't able to text anymore. Texting was still pretty new at the time, at least in terms of the capacity we know it to be now. The man seemed pretty chipper, all things considered, and we chatted away about random stuff while I walked him through the troubleshooting script on my PC. Here I have to comment that if the cell phone people had was of excellent quality, and my PC was running great as well, I could hear somebody mowing the lawn across the street, even if the windows and doors were all closed. We're talking amazing levels of details. In this case, this was a boon. But in general, it's annoying given how many people had the TV on in the background. It's real distracting to troubleshoot phone issues while I'm hearing the news somewhere in the back. Due to this level of detail, I could hear some sort of vehicle break hard outside. The man was distracted and attempting to describe what was happening to his phone since starting troubleshooting. I heard what sounded like the front door get violently kicked in and John let out a startled yelp. I told you to stay away from Heather. Four gunshots ring out. They were so loud I actually had to toss off my headset. My ears literally rang because of the amplification software in the PC, making it feel like I was in the room with John when the shots rang out. Once my hearing returned to my one good ear, my supervisor flags me over to his office we called Air Traffic Control due to the angled windows literally resembling an airport control tower. I was sat down while my supervisor called 911 in John City. Since he had access to what I was working on, he knew where John was, complete with the address. Police and first responders arrived and found John unconscious but alive. While he'd taken all four rounds, not a one had hit anything critical. I'd find out later he took one in his left collarbone one in the right shoulder when he twitched in response to the hit in his left shoulder bone, one in the left hip, and one to the left thigh. The kinetic trauma was enough to knock him out cold. When the after-action report came out, John had been taken to the hospital where he was stabilized and treated for the bullet wounds. As for our gunman, here's what led up to the shooting and what happened after, as it was explained by my supervisor. The gunman was the older brother of a woman named Heather. John was very sweet on her. The gunman and John had met previously since all three went to the same bar. For whatever reason, the gunman didn't like the look or vibe of John. From my perspective, even for a New Yorker, John seemed like an amazing guy. I'd even go as far to say I'd date John if that was his thing. The gunman approached John and said point blank he didn't like him. He said he felt John was a creep and warned him to stay away from his sister. John heeded the warning, at least in visible public. John had already been given her number and the pair chatted over the phone. This led to clandestine rendezvous at motels as they began to entangle romantically. Oh yes, those two got it on. Apparently, it was also part of the thrill that Mr. Gunman could find out and rage. That's exactly what happened. One of the gunman's buddies spotted the pair leaving a motel, known for quick dalliances, and told the gunman. The gunman waited until the next morning so he could catch John at home before work. He plucked his 38 revolver out of his gun box in his truck and invaded John's home. The police were curious why only four of six shots were loaded suggesting the gunman had shot two rounds before this incident, but never reloaded. They'd never find out, and neither would we. To paraphrase Joan Rivers, 
Mr. Gunman, who are you wearing? Oh, is that state penitentiary? The gunman would eventually be tried and convicted of charges ranging from firearm violations, menacing and intimidation, assault with a deadly weapon, and attempted murder. We didn't find out what happened with John and Heather, but we presume that despite the trauma, they either got and stayed together, or they split up for good. My boyfriend was driving me home last night around midnight. I was on my phone pulling up something to show him when we parked. He suddenly whipped around and asked me if I saw that out of his window. I said no and asked what it was. I live in a quiet suburban neighborhood. We have some deer and other small wildlife. The most dramatic human activity was several years back when a car was speeding and crashed through the living room of the house at the bottom of the hill. He said there was a girl on all fours in a driveway, waving her hand and phone light at us as we drove by. We slowed down to discuss if we should go back, is she hurt or in trouble, trying to flag help for someone inside or filming a TikTok. I was worried that this was some ploy to make a stop so someone else could jump out. We both thought it was weird and decided to go back in case she needed help. Our window had been down to get some fresh night air, so we rolled them up when we went back. When we went back, she was no longer on the ground. She ran up to my window very quickly. She looked like she was in PJs and was in her teens. My boyfriend noped out of there, swerved around her, and drove out of the neighborhood as another car was driving by and passed by her. We were both pretty rattled at this point. It was so unusual and we decided that we'd do another loop back. This was the only way into the neighborhood, so we didn't really have a choice. If she was still there after that other car had driven by, he would talk to her since she'd be on his side again. We drove back down, and she was just standing in the middle of her driveway, waving her arms with her phone light again. He slowed down with his window down and asked her if everything was okay. She said yes, and started running at the car again, almost in front of another vehicle that was driving by. We were at a loss and feeling very uneasy about the whole thing, but we figured there was nothing else we could do at that point. She said she was fine, and she had a cell phone to call 911 if something was going on. He dropped me off, and said that she wasn't there when he drove back out, so I have no idea what that was all about but I found it very unnerving. This is something I've never really told anyone about, but I've been thinking about it a lot lately, so here it is. A few years back, in 2015 to 2016, when I was 18 to 19, I used to work at this little cafe inside of a car parts factory. It was basically a full-out but compact restaurant kitchen and lunchroom for the workers to eat there. Well, this one day, I get a call from my best friend and co-worker. She's all kinds of upset because of this creepy new temp worker that made her feel severely uncomfortable by asking her a bunch of personal questions. Things like what she drove, where she lived, if she was single or had any kids, when she got off of work, those kind of things. She didn't want to walk out to her car alone. Mind you, she was my age too, 18 to 19, and this guy was mid to late 30s, if not already in his early 40s, and we're in Flint, Michigan, so we weren't about to take any chances. I drive up to the parking lot, find her car, park next to it, and she has a security guard escort her out. We didn't see the guy then, but she described him to me in the guard, and that was that for a few days. Someone found him and told him to stay away from her, and he did, but then he met me. I knew exactly who he was as soon as he stepped up to the register to place his lunch order, just from the description I'd been given, 
and by the creepy vibes he was giving off. He pulled the same intense Q&A on me that he'd done to my friend too, but instead of telling him to fuck off or calling security or anything like that, I just told him a bunch of straight up lies. I told him that I drove a blue 2012 Honda Civic, which I knew for a fact was one of the second shift manager's vehicles, who always parked near the front of the building, and so I knew that it was going to be there until second shift ended at 11pm. I also told him that my shift ended around 9.30, which was really the time that I usually slipped out for a cigarette break. So when 9.30 hit later that night, I walked outside to smoke my cigarette, and I saw exactly what I was expecting to see. That stupid creep in the parking lot close to the area that the Honda Civic was sitting. He was just pacing back and forth behind two vehicles that were parked a few spaces down in the same row, playing on his phone the entire time. At one point, he glanced up and saw me staring at him, but I had my big leather winter coat and hat on, so I don't know if he recognized me at first from a distance or not. I finished my smoke and went back inside, and explain the entire situation to the security guards, one of which was the original guard that had escorted my friend out to her car a couple of days before, and they were dying laughing at the fact I'd pulled one over on the prick, and it actually caught him being shady. I'm not sure what exactly they did about it, because I went back to work after that, but I do know that they immediately went out and confronted him in the parking lot, and that the guy was fired that same week. To this day, I still don't know what his intentions were, but it doesn't take a genius to figure out that it couldn't have been anything good. So ultimately, the moral of the story is always have your friends' backs and trust your instincts, because if you don't, you could end up cornered in a parking lot and possibly attacked or abducted by some creepy guy who asked one too many questions. I recently moved from the US to the Balklands for a summer legal internship. After a few days of getting settled in my home for the summer, I decided to sign up to a gym close to my apartment to serve as a self-care ritual and blow off steam after tough work days. Coming home from my first workout at the new gym, endorphins on a hundred, I noticed at a crosswalk that a man across from this busy street where I stopped was staring at me. Now this isn't really uncommon as I found out in my new home, and I've gotten used to dealing with occasional male stares, but they are usually very brief. This guy, however, was not looking away. I stared back for a full beat, so I knew that he knew I saw him. I hoped that would be the end of it, and then I turned my head away to continue down the street, trying to avoid a creepy feeling that this wasn't the end of the interaction. From what I could tell, he didn't cross the lengthy street to meet me, and probably just continued down from his side. Next thing I knew, about two minutes later, I'm at the crosswalk, about to cross, when I see him in my peripheral next to me at the stop. How he crossed the street and sped up to meet me so quickly is either a reflection of his cunning and athletic prowess or my general lack of observational skills. Standing next to me, he continued staring at me, but I tried not to tip him off to me noticing this. I took off as fast as I could when it was safe to cross the crosswalk, and naturally, he matched my pace a step or so behind me, still staring. Here I find myself in a familiar situation that I imagine many who have been followed also find themselves in. It's a critical juncture, if you will, where you ask, is this someone following me or a silly misunderstanding? I begin to ask myself, am I overreacting? I've been followed many a time before, sadly, and so I have found that the best way to handle it is to try to cut the baby in half, so to speak. I give them the benefit of the doubt to prove to me that they aren't doing what I fear they're doing, while also trying to avoid any situation that would escalate the danger or cue him up to where I'm going. Trust, but verify. 
so I decided to zip quickly towards another street, not my own, in the hopes that he would prove me wrong and not continue to follow me. This was a busy intersection, and there were about six different streets to follow from the crosswalk. He followed me down this random street choice, where there is truly only residential buildings. No stores or restaurants he could be headed toward that could explain him choosing this street, unless he lived nearby. I did something I've done before, when followed, to test the other person. I slowed down and sped up my pace randomly to see if they will match mine, or like a normal person heading somewhere, try to walk by me as there was plenty of room to do so on this street. Within a block or so, I realized he was definitely following, definitely still staring, but not only that, with every few steps, I felt his presence, keeping pace, was also suddenly getting closer and closer to me. The sun is setting at this point, and we were walking towards a part of town that I didn't know as well. The spirit moves, and I decided to make a break for it. I slowed down as slow as I've gone throughout this whole pursuit, checking in my peripheral, and jettisoning myself across the street until I got onto the other side. Once I get across, I look back once more, to see that he was now staring across the street and moved toward it to follow me more. But this time, I give him the meanest glare I can muster, and I reached for my bag, as if to suggest that I was reaching for pepper spray or something. He noticed the gesture, made eye contact, stopped, and then he turned his head away to feign looking at the numbers on the street, like he was lost or looking for a specific spot as if he hadn't been slowing up and speeding down with me for the past ten minutes, not looking anywhere but at my backside. His acting was zero out of ten for capturing the innocence of somebody definitely not creepily following women, half his age, back from the gym for twenty plus minutes. He continued to pretend to look around, glanced back at me, looked around some more, glanced back at me again, and when he looks away for the third time, I decided that then is the time to truly make a break for it. I begin booking it down the opposite street while occasionally peering back to see if he kept following. I take a bunch of well-lit, busy streets, employing random unnecessary turns as I have when I've been followed before. Eventually, when I checked out the whole street and felt confident that I'd lost him, I finally calculated my way back home. The next day, I asked a friend from work who's a local to take me to get some pepper spray. I bought a mini version, the smallest size that can easily fit in a purse. The pepper spray's brand name for a bottle of this size is literally called Madame, which is emblazoned across the side of the bottle in bright pink lettering. I got lost on a 14 mile hike because of a faded sign and poorly marked branching trails. It wasn't a high traffic hiking trail since it was mid-July and hit temperatures of 105 degrees Fahrenheit at high noon. We left early in the morning to avoid the afternoon heat, so getting lost put us four miles off track. So once we got back to the right trail, it was perilously close to noon on a moderately difficult return trail. My friend and I had enough water for the normal trail length, but nowhere near for the extra time we spent out in the extreme heat. Heat exhaustion swiftly set in, and our water went quickly. We would move from shaded spot to shaded spot when we could, but there was little tree cover for the last seven miles. Eventually it got so bad, I collapsed in a semi-fetid pool of standing water to cool off as best as I could. I remember sitting there, nauseous, shaking, and barely able to stand, thinking we were going to die out there because we'd read the wrong trail sign and got off course. Thankfully, a group came down the trail, saw us, and immediately offered water and assistance to get us the last couple of miles out and back to our vehicle. What was supposed to be a four-hour hike turned into a ten. I lost thirteen pounds, my feet were covered in blisters and sores, and I was so weak 
I couldn't get out of bed for days. So yeah, that was terrifying. I was in bed asleep at 7am when I heard a loud bang. I thought nothing of it because of the large cat tree I have downstairs that's always getting knocked over. So I rolled over and tried to get back to sleep. Not long after, my elderly cat comes running into my bedroom, jumps up on the bed, and tries to hide under the blankets. This immediately woke me up because that old fat cat hadn't ran nor jumped on our bed for years. As I came to, I see two men coming up my stairs. At that point, I had felt like time stopped and somehow ran incredibly fast at the same time. I jumped out of bed and started screaming, get the fuck out of my house, and I remembered thinking while chasing these guys through my house and screaming again and again at the top of my lungs that my voice sounded exactly like my brother, and I wondered how strange that was. I tackled one of them on the front of my lawn but he struggled free and got away. I saw the getaway car and tried to keep repeating the license number, but it faded away in my mind as I was repeating it. I remember vividly being so mad at myself that I couldn't remember seven numbers and how stupid I was for not grabbing my phone. Looking back on the situation, there are so many things that happened that I never noticed, like how I fractured my arm from slamming into the wall at the bottom of my stairs and then I cut my feet up on the splintered wood on my front lawn. The adrenaline rush of a true fight-or-flight situation is something so strange, it's almost impossible to accurately describe. The sense of time, not being aware of pain and injuries for hours, and the hyper-focus on some details, but the complete loss of others. Luckily, I wasn't seriously hurt, and nothing was stolen but I installed cameras all over my house the very next day. My parents went out of town for the weekend. I was 16 at the time. We live in a pretty rural town of about 1,500 people. I was streaming my game and having a blast. I'd ordered pizza and the night was going great. Now, ever since my parents would leave for the weekends, I knew where my stepdad had a pistol, a Ruger 9mm. Whenever they'd leave, I felt safer having the pistol with me. So when this all first started, I learned and got trained in pistols. It's about 11.30 to 12 at night when I hear a loud bang and the floor beneath me shook. Coincidentally, there was a door to the basement below where my desk sat, so I calmly told my stream I'd be back, grabbed the pistol, and flagged the door from our kitchen that led to the basement for about five minutes. Nobody came up, so I got to the basement door and really quietly opened it up. I hear whispering and shuffling of things. I flicked on the light to the stairs of the basement and said, I'm giving you till 10 to leave this house or you're not gonna like the outcome. And it turned pin drop silent. I started counting from 10, and once I hit five, I racked the slide to chamber around. And as they heard that slide rack back, all I heard was shuffling and stuff being dropped, and they ran out the back door. I'm thankful they left because I didn't want to shoot anyone, but I wasn't going to let someone steal from my family. I come to find out it was a relative that was privy to my parents' departure, and they figured I wouldn't be around. This story is about the most terrifying night of my life, and why I can't stand fireworks. I wasn't the most social teenager. I had my group of friends and spent every free minute gaming. After school and on the weekends, we'd play, and I'd talk to them through my headset. So, unsurprisingly, when the 4th of July weekend rolled around, I was 14, and my parents had been invited to what I deemed 
to be the world's most boring party. I flexed my independence muscles and decided to stay home and have a gaming marathon instead. All week, my best friend Alex had been goading me about how much better he thought he was on COD than I. Time to prove him wrong, I thought. I'm an only child, and I'm kind of embarrassed to admit my mom worried about me, and it hadn't been that long ago that she would insist I had a babysitter on the odd occasion that my parents went out. My dad, however, was from a larger family with three siblings, and he thought that my mother smothered me. He was all about teaching me self-reliance. So, much to my, honestly, relief, they started leaving me home alone more, and I had the house to myself a handful of times by this point. And I think you can guess what I mean by handful. Aside from hounding the hub, I did what any self-respecting 14-year-old would do, and round up the snacks and soda and settled in to play some cod with my friends. I was having a blast. After a few hours, my friends from school went offline to fix something to eat. I decided to grab another drink and realized the fireworks were starting. I hadn't even realized it had gotten dark. I went to the kitchen which had a big window across the entire width of the wall and the blinds were still open. My mother had asked me to close them when it got dark before she left. I'd been too absorbed in my game to care, but I figured I'd better do it before I forgot, to avoid being yelled at. After I got my snacks, I headed over to the window to shut the blinds. I noticed there were fireworks going off down the street and a few houses over. As my dumbass stood there, I suddenly heard a tapping on the front door. Not a knock, but like half-heartedly tapping something, I'm not sure what, against the door. Instantly, I was freaked out. Like, why not knock properly? And anyway, no one had a cause to knock. I knew that my family were at the party and wouldn't be back for hours, and they wouldn't knock anyway because they had the key. I would have seen their Uber pull up. No Uber, no car. Shit. Tap, tap, tap. The staircase was opposite the front door with a mirror on the right side wall as you went up the stairs. There was a small glass pane in the top of the door. I could see from where I was standing in the reflection of the mirror that there was a moving shadow behind the glass pane of the door. For the first time of my life, I understood what it meant to feel chills at the back of my neck. My first instinct was to run upstairs to safety, but I knew if I did so, the person at the door would see me. I stood there, not moving for what felt like forever. I was hoping whoever it was would go away. Out of sight because of the angle, but still able to keep watch on the front door in the mirror, I kept my eyes fixed on the shadow. Eventually it disappeared, and I heard footsteps receding on the gravel driveway. I held my breath for a moment, and when I thought it was safe, I bolted up the stairs. I guess I felt safer up there. I laughed at myself a little. Sure that it was someone we knew and that I'd overreacted, I hopped back on the chat and told them what had happened. A few of them teased me for it, but some of them told me I should call the police. I kind of felt stupid and told them at this point I hadn't actually confirmed that it was someone trying to break in. It was just someone tapping on the door. Mind you, the tapping was insipid, and if someone was trying to get the attention of the homeowner, they would knock harder. So I decided to creep to the top of the stairs and see if I could see anything. The shadow I first saw illuminated by the streetlights was not there. I was sure they'd left. Again, I brushed it off and again laughed at myself. I went back to my desk and eventually got sidetracked by some news of an upcoming video game release. The fireworks were still popping outside, but every now and then there would be a gap in the displays. It was while there was relative quiet outside that I suddenly heard crunching footsteps below my window. I froze, and I mean I was terrified. Someone was in the backyard. I knew for sure now this wasn't one of my parents' friends or a neighbor who needed something. Whoever was in the backyard had hopped the gate. I knew it wasn't either of my parents, because they always turned the side light on whenever they went back there at night. 
Whoever it was back there in the pitch dark, I sat there dead still, listening. I decided to go to my parents' room so I could get a look out on the backyard through their window. I kept the light off so I wouldn't be seen. I couldn't see anything, but I could still hear footsteps on the gravel. A firework went off. Bang. I heard three hard thuds below me, which I swear did not sound like fireworks, right below my parents' window. I realized with a shot of adrenaline that someone was banging against the dining room window below me. My heart was pounding. I don't think I even took the time to compute that someone was trying to get in. I just turned and ran to the bathroom and locked myself in. I backed up to the far side and sat between the toilet and the bath, right under the window. The window was cracked because it was hot and smelly from earlier in the night, but I didn't dare close it, in case whoever it was saw. The fireworks were still going off, and I couldn't think straight. I was frozen. I never bothered to turn the light on in there, and in hindsight, it's probably a good job I didn't. But the fireworks were illuminating the bathroom walls, and my ears were starting to ring with panic. I finally managed to pull myself together enough to pull my cell phone from my pants. I dialed 911. I told the operator that someone was trying to get into my house and gave her my address. Is there a room with a lock? She asked. I'm locked in the bathroom. I breathed into the phone as quietly as I could manage. She told me she was sending someone out and asked me, Can you hear anything? No, I whispered. Just fireworks. Which, in all honesty, was worse. I had no idea where the guy was, or if he was still trying to get in. I told her again. I couldn't hear anything. He might be inside, I don't know. He was banging on the outside window before. He could have smashed the glass already. She instructed me to stay calm and reassured me that the cops were on their way. My stomach sank into the bottom of my shoes. I figured the police were having a busy night, but I had no other option than to trust that they would get to me before the intruder did. She told me to stay as quiet and as calm as possible and reassured me that whoever it was was just probably looking to steal something and they would not be searching for me, that I should stay hidden until the cops got there. I figured she had a point, but it didn't make me feel much better. As I sat there without hearing a sound, all I could think was that my parents had finally thought I was old enough to be left alone, and now I was cowering in the corner of the bathroom. Though the operator was on the other end of the line, I had been trying to remain quiet and I hadn't heard anything for some time. My breathing had slowed some, but then, through the open window, I heard what sounded like someone treading on glass. I told the operator, I hear glass. He's broken the window. Officers will be with you soon. Stay where you are and try to stay quiet. I heard footsteps in the hallway downstairs. It always was incredibly echoey. I was absolutely terrified. I was too frozen to even tell the operator what I heard. The cops were taking too long. This guy was surely going to come up and search all of the rooms and try the bathroom door. When he realized it was locked, he was probably going to work out that it's a bathroom and that there was someone hiding inside. I tried to make a mental inventory of all of the valuable items in the living room and the garage that he would take before coming up the stairs. Thankfully, despite listening as hard as I could, I didn't hear footsteps coming up the stairs. Instead, I heard sirens. The operator confirmed that the police were nearby. I heard the glass crunch again and eventually heard an officer announce himself. I think they're here, I told the operator. I thanked her and she hung up. I couldn't move. I was just frozen in fear. I heard several pairs of footsteps coming up the stairs and carry on along the hallway to either side. I heard voices outside the door, checking the bedrooms, I presumed. Kid, are you here? A deep male voice introduced himself as Officer Matthews. I gingerly cracked the bathroom door open. Sure enough, it was the cops. Still, to this day, I have never felt relief like it. A few officers asked if I was okay 
They could see I wasn't hurt, but they made me sit down, checked me for signs of shock, and we got in touch with my parents. At some point, I asked if someone was in the house. They realized how terrified I was and told me, He's gone. The garage hatch was open when we got here. The officer asked me, as if for confirmation, how many cars my parents had and if they were in the garage tonight. I said two and explained that my parents had taken an Uber. There's a Ford and an Alfa Romeo. Well, he's taken the Alfa Romeo, he said, nodding. My dad was going to be livid. My parents arrived shortly after. My mom apologized to me profusely for leaving me alone, even though it had to happen. My dad was angry about the car and the damage, but he was ultimately glad I was okay. The police said that they would keep us informed. A little old lady who lives across the street and is friendly with my parents knocked on the door the next morning. She said she'd seen a car pull out of the garage and thought it odd that my dad didn't close the garage door behind him. Then she saw the police arrive. She tends to sit by the front window and watch the street. Not really realizing that my mom was out and I was alone, she figured whatever it was was in hand and there wasn't much she could do. She came by to see if everything was okay the next morning. Unfortunately, she wasn't able to make out who was driving the car, and it presumed it was my dad. The cops didn't find the car or the guy. Unfortunately, we lived in the suburbs at the time. It was mainly residential, and there wasn't much CCTV. They said the guy could have taken it back to a garage or hidden it on their property to resell, and probably had the tools to remove the VIN number. My parents installed security cameras after that, and we didn't live in that house for much longer. I'm grateful to the 911 operator and the cops that came that night. I still have PTSD when the 4th of July comes around, and every time I hear a firework, my chest gets tight and my heart begins to race. I will never forget that night as long as I live. I'm a male in my early 30s, and about seven years ago I dated a girl called Amber. Amber seemed pretty normal at first, very beautiful with long glossy black hair, and if anything I thought she was a little clingy, but I put it down to a lack of dating experience as she was only 20 at the time. We dated for a few weeks before things got physical. She wanted to take it slow and I respected that. The red flag started flying when the day after we slept together for the first time, I got an unexpected delivery to my workplace. I worked in construction at the time and was working on housing developments, so obviously I was on the same site for some time, but when the project would finish, we would go to the next site. Anyway, that day my friend John shouted up to me while I was working on the roof. I couldn't tell what he was saying, but glancing at my watch and realizing it was about lunchtime anyway, I headed down to see what he wanted. He told me I had a package. This was more than a little odd as it wasn't normal to take deliveries on a site, and I didn't know anyone who would be mailing something to me here. I figured the guys were playing a prank on me. Amber had made me a packed lunch and delivered it to the building site. A pretty sweet gesture, I thought. There was a little note in the bag which read, I can't wait to make you dinner when you get home, honey. Home? Did she mean my place or hers? I just kind of shrugged it off. When I got home that evening, she was waiting for me on my doorstep, looking kind of impatient. When I said, Hey, you okay? You've been waiting for me. She blew out a frustrated breath and said, Yes, of course. I was supposed to make you dinner. Don't you want me here? Of course I do, I said, while internally wishing I could just drop down on the couch with an ice-cold beer, actually. But I wasn't complaining about the company or the prospect of a home-cooked meal. I smiled at her, and her face transformed from pouty to beaming in a second. Okay, I thought this is getting serious, but it wasn't enough to turn me off her yet. I kissed her and thanked her for the packed lunch, then asked how she knew where I was working that day. Oh, 
You told me you were on a site in Taos. I just asked around for the development site. Okay, thanks, I said. Didn't you like that? She replied. Oh no, it was sweet of you, thank you. I answered back. I didn't want to deal with anything I might start by telling her how I really felt about it. She made me dinner and spent the night again. The next day, I got another lunch bag. Was she driving here every day to deliver me lunch? Huh. That's a lot. It was July 3rd and I was planning to go to my buddy's barbecue that night. A lot of my friends were out of town visiting family on the 4th, and he wanted to have something for the construction crew, so I headed home to shower and change. When I got home, though, there she was, waiting out front again. Hey... Did we have plans? I asked her, worried I'd forgotten about it. What else would you be doing? She said. I told her I was sorry, but I promised the guys from work that I had an event to attend, that I had promised to take some plates with me. Thinking, why am I playing it down to this girl? I like her, but I don't think we've even discussed being an item yet. I decided it was probably my fault and that I'd given her the wrong impression, so I said... Hey, I'm sorry, honey. We've been planning this for a while. I decided to talk to her about it properly tomorrow. She didn't seem too pleased, but she stomped off to her car and said kind of petulantly, Have a good time then. The next morning I woke up and instantly regretted the extra shots of bourbon I had the night before. I grabbed my phone to shut off the alarm, but I realized it wasn't going off. It was Saturday. No work for me today, thank goodness. But as soon as my head dropped back to the pillow, I realized what it was that woke me up. It was a knocking at the door and the bell was ringing. I sat up, head spinning, wondering who could be pounding at my door this time on a Saturday morning, until I swung it open to find Amber standing there with a bakery bag and coffee. Before my dry mouth could find the words, she said, Hey, and brushed past me into the hallway. I brought you breakfast. Always with the food bribes, I thought. Oh, thank you, I said as she walked into the kitchen and I trailed behind her. I was getting worried. You didn't text me last night. What time did you get back? Who was there? No, it was really late when I got back. I thought you'd be asleep. It was just the guys from work. No, I couldn't sleep because you didn't text me. I was worried something had happened to you, she said. Well, I'm way too hungover for this, I thought. But I needed to talk to her before this gets any weirder. No, nothing happened to me. I was just having fun with the guys. Hey, Amber, thank you for the breakfast. It was really sweet, but I'm so hungover. Did we have plans for today? Well, it's the 4th of July. Couples do things on the 4th of July. You're expected at my mom's this afternoon. Are you spending it with someone else? I was dumbfounded. Had I missed the invitation? No way was I ready to meet her family. And besides, I had plans with my own parents. I was starting to get serious Glenn Close vibes by this point. So I told her as kindly as possible that I needed some time with my own family, to have a happy fourth, and that I'd call her tomorrow. All day she spammed me with messages, asking me what I was doing, asking why I wasn't replying to her messages, that kind of thing. Her folks must have been real pleased that she was glued to her phone. By Saturday night, she was asking, what did I do wrong? Are you breaking up with me? And call me a dick but I was feeling weird about the whole thing. Never once had we discussed being together or put any kind of label on it. I checked myself because I was wondering if I inadvertently let her on. But no, in all honesty, I don't think I had. I decided I probably wouldn't call her the next day after all. Maybe I'd give her some space and take her to a nice and quiet but public place on Tuesday and tell her that I was sorry, but it's not going to work. Yes, I made up my mind to take her to dinner on Tuesday. I know it seems like an asshole thing to do in a public place, 
But honestly, I thought if she came to my house, she might try to convince me to stay. Sunday, I messaged her and invited her to dinner. The quiet local Italian restaurant was about three quarters full, but not overly busy. I didn't want to make a scene and embarrass her. I told her I think she's a wonderful girl, but that I don't think I want a relationship right now. I felt like an ass for the lie, but it was the kindest way I could think to let her down. I totally could not have expected her reaction. She slammed her cutlery down on the table and started bawling, and I do mean bawling, so that a few of the other patrons turned to see what was going on. I tried to say that I was sorry and placed my hand on hers, but she yanked it away, screaming, Don't touch me. Oh, hell. A very concerned waitress then came over and asked if everything was all right. I was about to say, Yes, everything is fine, thank you. When Amber started sobbing, He's done with me. He's found someone else. He's a liar and a cheat. By this point, everyone in the restaurant was staring at me. I was pretty sure my mouth was hanging open, and I just said, What are you talking about? Why else wouldn't you want to be with me? I knew there was someone else after you ditched me on the 4th, she said. I was dumbfounded. I tried to tell her, and I guess the waitress, who was looking at me with a righteous expression, that no, there was no one else, but she wasn't hearing it. She continued to make a scene for a good ten minutes before getting up and stomping out of the restaurant. I settled the bill and headed out to find her, as I was pretty sure she should not have been driving in that state. But when I got outside, she'd already gone. Those tears must have cleared up real quick. Well, that went well, I thought. A couple of days went by and I was relieved. I thought I was in the clear, but on day three, John came up to me on the site and handed me a lunch bag. Jeff said to give this to you. Said a little lady dropped it off. Come on, I thought to myself. I took a seat and opened the bag, half expecting a steaming pile of shit or a death threat, but it was just another packed lunch. Honestly, I had no appetite. Not that I thought she would poison me or anything but I just didn't fancy this twisted gesture. Instead, I tossed it in the trash and opted for my own sandwich. I somehow knew she was going to be waiting for me that night when I got home. This time, I told her she needed to leave, that I was sorry, but she's getting too pushy. She sneered at me and asked if I had another girl coming around. No, I'm gonna lay on the couch and watch TV. I'm tired and I want you to go. She then basically cursed me out before leaving. For the next couple of weeks, I got lunch bags on and off with notes of apology inside, asking me to please forgive her and telling me she loves me and wants to start a family with me. Honestly, I'd had enough. They stopped when I moved to the next site, but still every night upon returning home, I expected her to show up at my door. If she ever did, I drive straight to my buddy's house for the night and call the police. She never did show up again, but I got messages for months after that until I finally blocked her number and social media accounts. But I still got the occasional friend request from the duplicate Facebook accounts as well as messages. This went on for about six months. I didn't date seriously for a while after that, and I kept it casual. About five years ago, I met a girl who I quickly fell in love with. She's honestly the best. A few weeks after we'd been seriously seeing each other, and a matter of days after I'd updated my relationship status on Facebook, she asked me if I knew a girl named Amber. Yeah, I said, and I asked her why. She told me she received a friend request from a Facebook account with Amber's name and picture of her. She then tells me how she got a message from her, reading, You are only temporary. You can be easily erased. It just made me feel cold all over. More than anything, her choice of words seemed to be sinister to me. Even though I'd never really suspected Amber was dangerous, she was just a little crazy. 
I told my girlfriend everything that happened with Amber and insisted we go to the police. Luckily, she didn't take much convincing. To me, it read like a threat, but in the end, the police said it was too ambiguous and probably wouldn't be considered a direct threat. Shortly after this, I moved into my girlfriend's apartment, seeing as she had a nicer place, and thankfully, we haven't heard from Amber since. Although I did get another friend request from a dummy account. There was no picture, and it was just a few days ago. And I'm certain it's her. This happened back when I was in my early 20s. It was the beginning of 4th of July weekend, and my friends, Nikki, Dean, Jason, and I, decided to embark on a camping trip to celebrate our freedom in the wilderness. We grew up together, but life had gotten busy. We had to make time to meet up. Our answer to this were weekend camping trips a few times a year. We were all big into the outdoors. Our destination that weekend was Eagles Creek State Park, renowned for crazy beautiful landscapes and good hiking. Setting up camp was a lot of fun. We were laughing and joking. We passed around bourbon as we fixed dinner. We could hear the crickets and the occasional owl. It was so relaxing. We talked for hours, catching each other up on everything we'd missed. As it got later and later, we got sleepy and it was soon time to head to bed. Inside my tent, I lay listening intently to the sounds outside. Having grown up camping with my dad, I'd always found the sounds from the woods comforting. It didn't take me long to drift off to sleep. I don't know how long I'd been sleeping for, but I woke suddenly. I didn't know what woke me, so I listened, but I couldn't hear anything. I figured it was probably an animal, expelling any irrational fears as they came into my mind. I must have drifted off to sleep again, because I again was woken by a noise, but this time I knew exactly what had woken me. I heard a scream. My first instinct was fear for my friends, but I heard muffled exclamations from my friends' tents nearby. I grabbed my heavy flashlight and my knife and scrambled out of my tent, to find my friends coming out too. We scanned the darkness for any sign of who had screamed, or any immediate danger. Did you hear that? Dean whispered. He was on high alert. It could be an animal, I reassured him, trying to sound composed despite my racing thoughts. I had pretty good knowledge of the wildlife in the area and the sounds they made. My friends weren't convinced. They knew their stuff, too. In hindsight, this may not have been the smartest thing to do, but at the time, we felt concerned that someone might be hurt or in trouble, and as a group, we decided we would see if we could find them. We were all more than a little freaked out, but we had weapons, and there were four of us. We knew many other people camped here, so I guess we underestimated the danger. We headed towards where we heard the scream. We heard more screaming, and this is when I felt the lead weight settle in my stomach. Jason told all of us to turn off our flashlights in case we needed to stay hidden. The moon was big, so we could see our footing. This terrified me, though, and I remember clasping Nikki's hand. We suddenly heard footfall in the undergrowth. I can't accurately describe how terrified I was in that moment. I just froze and jerked Nikki to a stop with me. Jason, who at this point was in front, suddenly turned his flashlight back on, and as he did so, we saw the source of the screams. A woman, disheveled and terrified, was coming towards us. Aside from scratches and a few tears in her clothes, she looked like any one of us, around our age, a normal camper. Oh, Thank goodness, please, she said breathlessly as she came close to us. She had tears streaming down her face. I got separated from my friends and something chased me. We tried to calm her and ascertain what happened, but all she kept saying 
was something chased me, or someone. She was concerned for her friends. She had no idea where her camp was, but she said she'd been running for what felt like so long. She was sure it was far. We asked her how large her group was, and she said she was here with six friends. We reassured her that they would be safe as a group. It took some convincing, but we told her to come back to camp with us, that there was no sense trying to find the camp in the dark, and that we set out first thing in the morning to search for her group. I slept in Nikki's tent that night, and let the girl, Aubrey it turned out her name was, sleep in mine. We helped her clean her scratches before we went to sleep, and made sure she wasn't in shock. She had tripped over tree roots and got her shins pretty good. It scared the living daylights out of me that she was in this state and still kept running. When I had a quiet minute with her, I asked her again what happened. She was calm enough now to explain it to me. Apparently she'd felt watched all day, and when they set off on a hike that afternoon, she'd been distracted by the view. She'd taken her camera with her to take some photos of the scenery. She was taking a shot and heard some rustling behind her. Presuming it was her friend, she said, Isn't this amazing? But there had been no reply, and she turned around to see no one there, and she could not see her friends. She guessed that they hadn't realized she stopped and just kept walking. She said there'd been a sense of unease. She had an even stronger sense now that she was being watched, and as she tried to find her friends, she would hear the rustling behind her, only to turn around and see nothing. As she went further, without any sign of her friends, she got more and more uneasy and started walking quicker and quicker. The rustling got more and more frequent. She said she just had this sense of danger, and by this point, she was stumbling forward desperately, hoping her friends would be over the next brow. She said she could swear she heard footsteps behind her, but she couldn't see anyone. This is when she broke out into a run, and so did the footsteps. She just kept running. She'd been frantic for hours until she found us. As rational as I tried to be, telling myself it was probably an animal, I was spooked, and I went to bed clutching my knife. First thing in the morning, we fueled up and set out to find Aubrey's friends. She told us which part of the park they'd set up camp, and in the daylight we were able to find our way there. As it turned out, it wasn't far away. We made it to the spot they'd set up camp. This is it. I can see Mitch's tent. As the site came into view, Hey, Aubrey shouted, I'm back. Rushing up to the blue tent that she just pointed out, no response. It was unzipped and there was no one inside. Are you here? She called. Nothing. She turned around to us then, and looking down at the ashes of the fire, her face fell. I noticed then that the fire had died, but it was still glowing. It had not been entirely put out. Empty cans were littered around the fire. All of the tents were unzipped. She went from tent to tent, but none of her friends were inside. And as we caught on, we started looking around. They wouldn't let the fire die like that, she said. And we always put it out when we leave. They wouldn't leave litter. Their packs are gone. I... She was visibly upset. Dean being Dean asked her if maybe they'd left in a hurry. Which obviously wasn't the right thing to say because Aubrey started panicking, convinced that something had happened to them. Maybe they were worried about you when you didn't return and went to look for you, I said, trying to be reassuring, but she was clearly still worried for her friends. I think it's time we went to the ranger station, Jason said. If they went looking for you, there's a good chance they informed the ranger. We'll find them. We ended up finding Aubrey's group there. They were so relieved and sharing long hugs. She explained to them how we helped her. When she told them what had happened to her in the forest, they all turned visibly uneasy. I noticed one of her friends looked like she'd seen a ghost. It turned out they decided to look for Aubrey in the morning, but when they'd gone to bed that night, they all heard strange noises outside their tents, 
Every one of them had heard footsteps. The friend that had looked ashen when she heard about Aubrey's ordeal said she'd heard footsteps circling her tent for hours. She was sharing the tent with another friend. Whoever was outside had begun to pull on the zipper of her tent. She had shouted, I have a gun, and her friend who had just started to wake up bolted up and started shouting every cuss word under the sun. She says she just felt like she had to intimidate whoever it was. The others in the group heard the commotion and came out of their tents to see a figure running off into the trees. The man had been pacing around her tent in circles for hours. They were all scared shitless and went to sleep the rest of the night in their vehicles. None of them were able to get much sleep through worry that Aubrey was alone in the woods, so at first light they headed to the ranger station to report what had happened and to get help searching for Aubrey. The ranger was about to head to the camp to see if Aubrey had returned when we got there. He ended up escorting us there to retrieve our belongings, and we decided to head back to civilization early that 4th of July. We said goodbye to Aubrey and her friends. They thanked us for letting Aubrey stay at our camp that night, and I still have Aubrey on Facebook. The traffic was awful, but we were glad to get out of there. I still go camping but my dad makes me carry my Glock when I do. I don't know what that guy wanted, but if he was the one chasing Aubrey, I can only think his intentions were sinister. Many years ago, I used to work night shift at a hotel in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. During the season, it wasn't so bad, mostly families and stuff. We had on-site security then too, however, in the off-season, the winter months were different. The cheap weekly rates we'd offer attracted a lot of creepy people. The idea was supposed to be to make money in the off-season by renting to what is known as snowbirds, older retired people who came to the beach for a month or more through the winter. It did not always work out that way though. The cheap rates made it possible for a less than desirable element to become long-term residents. I've discovered more than my fair share of meth labs, broken up physical assaults, and more during the winter months. Working third shift, I would meet some interesting people. The cold weather would mean some homeless people would come in and get warm and grab a cup of free coffee. I wasn't supposed to let them, but it's not in me to be cruel. I would let them grab a coffee and get warm for a minute, as long as they didn't cause trouble. As you can see, night shift in the winter made for some crazy and sometimes creepy stories. I have a lot, but this one is one that stands out, because it didn't end well for me. I had a great night up until this point. I'd gone to an indie wrestling show with my best friend before work. In fact, I had agreed to come in an hour early the next night for the young lady that worked second shift in exchange for her working an hour late for me on this night so I could enjoy the wrestling show. Ironically enough, I met Terry Funk that night, a wrestling legend known for his hardcore and bloody matches. Little did I know I was about to experience this kind of violence for real. I was supposed to be there at midnight due to her working over an hour for me. I normally came in at 11 p.m. I counted the register and she briefed me on her shift as to what had happened as per usual. As she was leaving, my friend Andrew pulled up. He worked second shift maintenance at this hotel and the other two hotels are company owned. He would regularly stop by after work and grab us some food and we would play World of Warcraft on our laptops after eating for a while due to business being slow. He was just getting my money and order for food and getting ready to leave. I was excited, telling him about how much fun I had at the wrestling show and was showing him my Terry Funk shirt that I was so proud of. I was just walking into the back office to put the shirt up when I heard the doorbell indicating a customer had entered. It is true what they say, ask not for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee. I turned around when I heard someone say something loudly, but I couldn't make out what they had said. I had just reached the doorway when I saw Andrew just fall down in front of me. 
The next thing I know, a guy walks around the corner and punches me in the head with a short steel pipe in his hand. It staggered me and I went to one knee. The next thing I know, he hits me in the head with a pipe. After that, I hear another guy who I hadn't noticed to this moment, saying that he got away and got a cop. They left out the door. I was finally able to get to my feet. I tried to call the police from the phone in the back office, but it was having issues. I slammed it in frustration. I was hurting and scared. I was really freaking out. I realized that they could come back, so I ran and locked the door. I didn't know where Andrew had gone, and that worried me. I called 911 about this time. Blood had started pouring down my head. I told the operator I'd been attacked and needed an officer and ambulance. I then called the other hotel we ran to let the night manager, Travis, who was over all three properties, know what happened. He thought I was messing with him at first, because when we got bored, we would prank each other. I finally convinced him I was not joking. He was going to lock up and come down. The police and ambulance pulled up and I opened the door. It was at this point that I found out that after they'd sucker punched Andrew and knocked him down, he was amazingly able to jump over the desk and escape just as a cop was driving by, which he managed to flag down for help. I ended up in the hospital ER where I had to have 10 staples in my scalp and they gave me morphine for the pain. I had no way to get home after being treated, but the doctor and nurses took pity on me and paid for a cab. My plan was to go back to work because this was December and Christmas was coming. I had three kids and needed all the hours I could get. When I got back to the hotel, the IT guy Ted was there with his wife, Barbara, who also worked the front desk. She was shocked to see me. She thought I would still be in the hospital. I thought I'd only been hit in the head once after being punched, but the video which Ted was pulling for the police showed a different story. After I went to one knee, the guy had hit me not just once, but ten times in total. I kept trying to grab the pipe and get up for some reason. I don't remember that. I guess I was out on my feet. He kept punching me and hitting me with the pipe until his friend tells him Andrew had gotten away and then proceeded to get the cops. The two of them then ran out. I was given a room at the other hotel we own, and Ted and Barbara gave me a lift there as I was in no condition to drive due to the morphine. They also gave me a paid week off to heal. They switched me over to the other hotel on night shift for a month, just in case they were after me in particular. We never found out why they chose to attack me. The police thought it might be a failed strong-armed robbery due to Andrew getting away and me just not going down. It shook me up though, not knowing. Even though I was at our other hotel when I came back to working night shift, I was still nervous. Every time the door chimed, I tensed up. I couldn't afford to quit though. As I said, I had three kids I was supporting. They never caught the guys as far as I know. A detective stopped by about two months later when I was working second. He showed me several mugshots and asked me if any of them looked familiar. I never got a great look at them as it all happened so fast. I had seen the video, which wasn't the best quality. Even so, two of them looked very familiar like them. I pointed them out and he asked how sure I was. I told him honestly, like 85%. He then yelled and asked me if I wanted someone to go to jail for attempted murder on 85%. I was stunned into silence. I was the victim. I was attacked for no reason, and he's yelling at me like it's my fault. I was busy being attacked to get a good look at them. I no longer work at a hotel, and I don't do night shifts, and I'm glad, because it's just too dangerous in this area. This happened to me and my girlfriend I was dating back in the summer of 2014. This all took place in South Carolina, and my girlfriend and I wanted to take a camping trip. We initially tried to go to a place 45 miles from our hometown, but they were going to charge us double what we thought we were going to pay for. We decided to head back, and it just occurred to me that there's a spot very close to where we live. Now I will say it's more boondocking and off-grid, we didn't have to pay for anything, 
We just parked the car and got out. This place is quite gorgeous. There's a historic bridge and trail, also some of the oldest railroad tracks in the south. We got there before sunset, so we had plenty of time to pitch the tent and set everything up. There were a few cars when we arrived, but they were mostly hikers and would be gone before nightfall. The only thing that made us uncomfortable was a busted up and rusted old white van with no license plate. We both pointed that out, thinking it was weird, but we shrugged it off and started walking to a good place to set up camp. After several hours, around 3am, following some quality time spent with my girlfriend and taking in all the nature and then going to sleep, we started hearing this obscure singing and walking around our tent. Any time you hear commotion that early in the morning, nothing good can come from it. I peered my head out of the tent to see what was going on. I didn't see anything or anyone, but nonetheless, I didn't want to stay in that area when we both were freaked out. Just because I couldn't see them doesn't mean it's not there. I barely did a decent walk around our tent. As we were quietly gathering our belongings, we swore we heard the singing get louder. I recall words in this song he was singing had, Now won't y'all come out, followed by this raspy laughing. Once we finally packed the tent, that was when the crunching on the leaves and his humming began. We knew this guy was close by now. We booked it. I grabbed my girlfriend's hand and threw the tent and folding chairs on my back. We made sure to run the opposite way from where all the noise was coming from. Luckily, we set up camp fairly close to the parking lot because I could see the lights through the trees. As we ran and scurried away from whoever was chasing us, we noticed the lights from the parking lot weren't just the street lights, but also to our horror, it was that old, rusty white van we saw in the beginning. We hurried uphill, just hoping this guy was alone. If he had an accomplice, that would be another person to deal with. As we reached the lot, we got into the bright street lights, and I noticed my girlfriend's hand make a slight twitch, and her pace slowed down. From what I could tell, she was turning her head to take a look at our attacker. I heard her gasp loudly. Come on, don't look, we're almost there. She focused back, and we continued running in unison. The guy was getting closer, as I could hear the footsteps on the gravel intensify. I heard his wheezing and him barking. Don't y'all think you'll get away? As we just made it past the van, we split, and I handed her the keys so she could unlock and start the car, and I can throw all the gear into the trunk and we can make it out of this place. As I frantically laid the camping gear in the back seat and head over to the driver's side, that was when my body faced forward for the first time in a while. Every noise this guy was making was close and amplified now. With the car running, I kept my head down and put it in reverse, but curiosity got the better of me. In the brightness of my headlights, this man was a behemoth with a stern wrinkled face with patchy red hair, a goatee that had dirt and crud smeared all over it. His eyes were fixated on us like a scope, magnifying on two ten-point bucks. He was wanting to kill. Get back here, he barked, waving a baseball bat back and forth. I shook my head, and with that, I swerved out, and we were on our way out with our hearts racing. In the rearview mirror, we saw the man slam the bat in frustration. A narrow escape. We drove to Waffle House and stayed there until sunrise. My boyfriend at the time and I were house-sitting for his uncle. My boyfriend was at work and I was bathing our son before bed. I had the bathroom window very slightly cracked and heard a cough from outside. This house was in a residential neighborhood, so it could have been a neighbor, but I suddenly felt anxious and scared, and something told me to go make sure the back door was locked. I left my two-year-old son alone in a towel in the bathroom and ran to the back door. As I placed my hand on a doorknob, locking it, I came face to face with someone through the glass who had his hand on the outside doorknob. He started pounding on the door and juggling the doorknob, 
saying he was looking for someone, and I just told him no, they're not here. He kept jiggling the doorknob, and I ran to my son and grabbed my cell phone to call for help. Remember, I'm house-sitting though, and this was in 2004 to 2005 when they had those flip-open phones, not a smart one where you can just look at a map. So I had no idea what the address was or where the house phone was. Anyway, I call 911 from the bathroom on my cell phone, all while hearing loud pounding at the back door. The dispatcher tells me to find a house phone, piece of mail, anything with an address on it. I locate the house phone and call 911 from that, so I have no idea how the police got there so quickly, but just as I hear the back door glass break, the guy on the phone tells me to cover my son's head with a blanket and run out the front door into the back seat of the police car. I ran out the front door and saw six or more police officers all with guns drawn and I got straight into the waiting cruiser. After they arrested the guy, they asked me if the machete on the back porch belonged to the owners of the house. The guy had a machete, and had I not trusted my gut that the cough sounded a little too close, and to check the back door, he would have walked right into an unlocked house to a 19-year-old female and her young son alone. Turns out he'd been robbing houses and had a backpack full of stolen things, and he was high on meth. Anyways, I'm really glad I followed my gut on that one. I was talking to a friend and remembered this creepy story from the pandemic. I lived alone. I had no cars and no shops nearby. It was 9pm and I'd got back from work and realized there was no food in the house, so I ordered a grocery delivery on Uber Eats. I asked them to leave it at the door due to the rules. There was a knock at the door, and I saw a tall, skinny guy standing right by it. I shouted through the letterbox to leave it on the floor and back up. He said no, and that he had to hand it to me as it had alcohol in it. I hadn't ordered any alcohol, so I told him he had the wrong order. He claimed it was correct. I told him sternly to put it on the floor and back up. Again, he refused. Stupidly, I opened the door a crack to tell him to do it due to the rules, and he stepped towards the door and put his hand on the handle. I pulled it shut and shouted to leave it or I was reporting him. He put it down and stepped back. I asked him through the letterbox to back up further. He did, but again, when I opened the door, he stepped forward. I always remember the chill that went down my spine when he said, Pretty, very pretty, in a low monotone voice. I noticed he had his phone out pointed at me, and I asked what he was doing. He said he had to take a picture, but it was pointed at my face and not the bag on the floor. I grabbed it and slammed the door shut and locked it. I watched through a crack in the curtains as he stood by the door pacing back and forth as if he couldn't make up his mind. He knocked, but I ignored it. I was getting seriously creepy vibes and called my best friend for advice. She told me to report him and not open the door. I shouted out the letterbox for him to leave, but he refused and still stood there. My dog, who is normally the sweetest thing going, had picked up on my anxiety and began barking at the door. He turned and got into his car that was parked across the street from my house. I kept watching for the next ten minutes or so through my window, but he wouldn't leave. He just sat there, but I figured maybe he was picking another order to take. Suddenly a message popped up on Uber. He told me he'd forgotten a bag in the car and asked me to come get it. I checked my order and it was all there, so I messaged saying it wasn't mine. He got insistent, saying he couldn't leave until I picked it up. He was practically begging me to come to the car, saying it wouldn't take a minute and I could grab it from the passenger side. I lost my shit. I told him I'd heard what he'd said, that I knew he was taking a picture of me and not the order, and that I was calling the police. He still said I had to come get it. The entire time I was on the phone to the police, he was still messaging me, even saying... 
The police won't come. Pick up the order and I'll leave. Why are you making it hard? The police told me someone would be there within 20 minutes and to stay inside with the doors locked. My dog was going nuts, hackles up and barking. My neighbor's husband, who was six foot four and built like a brick shed, texted saying he heard a commotion and asked if I was okay. I told him what was going on and he immediately ran out, shouting at the guy that he was a predator and to fuck off before he got fucked up. The delivery guy peeled out of there and my neighbors came over to make me a cup of tea and wait for the police. I made a report to both them and Uber, but all I got was an apology from Uber. The police never came back to me. I got a car shortly after and didn't use Uber again until my boyfriend moved in. So, to the creepy predatory Uber driver, let's not meet again. So this happened a few months ago. My boyfriend went on a short trip with his friends. The original plan was for them to go on a poker cruise, but this got cancelled because the boat didn't have a place to harbor or something like that. The boat would have gone to Norway, so my boyfriend and his friends decided to drive to Czech Republic instead. I only found out about this when they were already on their way. All they did was play poker in different places, one of them being King's Casino. He loved that place, by the way, and it really did look beautiful from the photos. Anyway, it was their way back when something terrifying happened. It happened on the drive back when they were on the highway in Germany. In the car was my boyfriend and two other friends. After quite the drive, they needed to take a piss. They decided to stop at this abandoned looking place where a lot of truck drivers stopped. It did give them a creepy vibe, but they really needed to go so they still decided to stop there, something they'd regret very much. So picture this, an abandoned place with lots of trucks, with a dark forest stretching beyond view in the middle of the night, quite creepy. So my boyfriend and his friends arrive there, and they get out to take a piss. While walking, one of his friends made a joke about how it's such a typical place for a murder to happen. It did make them feel a bit uneasy, but they still laughed it off. At some point, they found a good place to piss. It wasn't far from their car. After a minute or so, one of them suddenly says, Someone's coming. My boyfriend and the other friend obviously freaked out a bit, but they did think it was a joke, until they heard footsteps running towards them. They were approaching fast. Someone was full-on sprinting towards them. Once they heard that, they all started running for their lives towards the car and frantically got in. They sped out of there as fast as possible. My boyfriend and the friend who wasn't driving were trying to see if they could see who it was, but it was too dark to see anything at all. They had no idea who charged them at night. This freaked my boyfriend out so much that he couldn't sleep when he got to my place. When he told me the story, it really creeped me out as if I went through it. Funnily enough, that was also the time I watched all of Mr. Ballin's videos about people who went to places they shouldn't have, and videos about the missing 401. So all I could think about were the horrible things that could have happened to him if they didn't get out of there safely. I also got kind of mad at him, saying, Do you want to become a Mr. Ballin video? And... Do you want to become an unsolved mystery? I was just so scared for him. We can laugh about it now, but back then, it freaked both of us out a lot. For a bit of background, I'm a dog walker and pet sitter. Some of the dogs I walk have reactivity, as did this one dog, a pit and lab mix. She used to be a bad puller, along with being incredibly reactive to other dogs on leash as soon as she'd see them. Through lots of work and training with her, she's come a long way with her reactivity, to the point it's really not an issue anymore. Even when other owners' carelessness allows their dogs to get too close for comfort, 
On this one walk, she was a dream the whole time. She passed multiple dogs without issue. She would just look at me for a treat she knew she'd get if she was good. We turned down a side street that looked completely vacant at the time, so I could give her some more relaxed walking time, and all went well for a while. Not a soul in sight, until there was. Well, I'm usually very good at keeping my head on a swivel, as some of my walks are not in the safest areas of the city. This guy took me by surprise. I don't know how he did it, but he got about two to three feet behind us without my dog or me knowing he was there. And all of a sudden, he shouted something unintelligible. I could only make out the last two words. Your dog. Immediately, my dog, with no prior history of human reactivity, got between us and started growling, snapping, and lunging aggressively at this man. I'm a smaller woman at 5'3", and I guess this guy was 6'7", at the very least, and he was incredibly muscular. As soon as he saw my dog trying to attack him, and me struggling to hold her back, he threw his arms up and bolted across the street without another word. He disappeared shortly after around a corner. I've never praised a dog for reactivity until that moment. I gave her all the treats I had left in my pocket, took her home, and told her owner what had just happened and how her dog might have saved my life. Of course, I hope I'm wrong, and the guy was just slow with social cues, but neither the dog nor I got that impression. Needless to say, she's by far my favorite client dog. I go on walks with her still every week, but we haven't gone down that street again while there are no people about. I'm beyond blessed to have her and get to walk her weekly, but I do hope I never meet the, your dog guy, again. Last week I received a call from an unknown caller. My first thought was that someone wants to sell me anything or something like that. Normally, I wouldn't answer, but I was bored and thought I might prank the other person. A male voice that didn't sound familiar to me said, You proved that you're a real fighter. You didn't let life defeat you. I will call you again in a week, and then it will start. I thought nothing about it, and I assumed it was a harmless joke. Until yesterday, when a week passed by. I was on my way to a job interview and was waiting at a bus stop for the bus, which was already in sight but stood in front of a red traffic light. My phone started to ring, and again it's from an unknown caller. This time I didn't want to answer, but all of a sudden this guy who was sitting at the bus stop said, didn't he mention he would call you again? At first I thought he was on the phone because he had airpods inside of his ears, but then he looked straight in my direction and asked, don't you want to answer? I asked him what he means, but he didn't answer me. Then my bus arrived. I was in a hurry, so I just got on and left. I did my job interview and went home, and I haven't left my apartment since. Sometimes I look out of the windows to see if anything or anyone seems strange to me, but so far I haven't noticed anything. There have been no further calls. I'm a bit scared now, and I don't know what I should do about it. What do you think about all of this? For context, I'm a 27 year old male, 6 foot, and about 210 pounds, and definitely don't frighten easy. So a few months ago, I made a trip up to the local gas station to grab some beer. I walked in like usual and noticed a new guy working the register. He says hello in a friendly tone as I walk past, and I do the same in return. I go to the back and grab my beer and walk to the front. Very typical, nothing out of the ordinary. So I set my beer on the counter, and this is where it happened. I made eye contact with the new guy, and instantly my blood ran cold, and my adrenaline rushed. My fight or flight was triggered, and I could feel every hair on my body standing on end. 
It almost seemed time slowed to a crawl, and this guy was just staring through my soul. I can barely describe the instant sense of danger and impending doom. Every part of my being was screaming, You're in danger. Run. Now. All of this was in the span of a couple of seconds, but it felt like an eternity. And the silence was broken when he said what my total was. I was unable to break eye contact. It was impossible while I fumbled with my wallet. I set a $5 bill on the counter and quickly walked out, not even waiting for my change. I had a massive panic attack in my truck and almost crashed on my way home. I told my wife what happened. She chalked it up to, a guy scared me. I told my friends about it and they thought I was insane. I stopped talking about it, but the feeling and the image of this guy was stuck with me. A week or so after that encounter, I had a low tire on my trailer, so I stopped at that same gas station. I had change on me, so I wouldn't have to go inside for any reason. While I'm crouching down, airing up my tire, I start getting the same intense feeling. That feeling of danger, the feeling of panic, and that I need to run. Confused yet alert, I lift my head to look around. This guy is glaring at me from the window of the gas station. Blank expression. Just staring me down like I'm being sized up or something. He watches me get in my truck and drive away. And I swear, I didn't see him blink once. The next day, I've had enough and I'm getting to the bottom of this, damn it. So I decide I'm going to talk to this guy and figure out what the hell is going on. Because this isn't right. I get to the gas station and it's the usual lady working. I asked her about the new guy and when he'd be back around. She told me he actually quit working there that day. I was relieved and confused at the same time, but I figured I could finally forget about all that strange shit and move on. I haven't seen that guy since, but that feeling and that face still remains burned in my head like it was yesterday. I still don't go to that gas station just so I don't have to think about it. Anyway, has this ever happened to you guys? I've tried talking to people and they always give me the same shit about it. If anyone has a clue on what could have caused this, please let me know. Thanks for listening. A colleague of my mother's told her this story, and I got instant goosebumps when I heard it. My mom's colleague lives alone. No partner, parents, or children. Just a dog to keep her company. But every year during the summer holidays, she invites her cousins to spend an evening with her. They then watch movies, play games, and eat candy. And the children absolutely love it. As she lives alone, she only has one bedroom. When she's having a sleepover with the cousins, she lets the children sleep in the bedroom, and she herself sleeps on the couch downstairs. So last summer, she organized a sleepover with her cousin as usual. It was fun, and she just put the children to sleep in her bedroom. Tired but satisfied, she dropped down on her couch and soon fell asleep. Around 3am, she was woken up by her dog barking restlessly. This was quite abnormal because her dog never barked at night. Still half asleep, she got up from the couch and walked over to her dog to see what was going on. She bends down to pet her dog and says, Hey, what's wrong, buddy? As she says this, she hears someone behind her in the darkness respond, I don't know either. She started screaming and immediately ran upstairs to lock herself and the children in the bedroom and call the police. In the end, it turned out to be just a drunk man who'd entered the wrong home. But man, I would have shat myself if this happened to me. My son fell asleep on the couch around noon, and I thought, perfect, I'll go nap too. About an hour or so later, I woke up to him crying. This in itself is pretty unusual, since he's a very happy little boy, 
but I comforted him and he clung to me like he never wanted to let go. After about 10 or 15 minutes, I untangled myself and turned on Donald Duck for him to watch. He was happy and snuggly like usual, and some time went by. I was laying on the couch with him, just reading stories about possessions on Reddit. When he gets up, he walked toward the kitchen through the hallway. When he suddenly stops, turns around and looks at me, eyes locked. He slides one finger across his throat in a very well-known gesture. He doesn't make a sound, nor does he have any expression on his face. A few seconds pass and he turns around and walks into the kitchen. About 30 seconds later, he comes walking into the living room and seems to be his happy self again. A couple of days ago, his mother was watching him here. She wrote me a message on Messenger and a door opened by itself and she felt something or someone touch her. I definitely believe her. There's a lot of weird stuff going on here, but I ignore it to the extent that it almost becomes ridiculous. I have many spooky stories to tell, but this actually freaked me out enough to acknowledge it. He's just three years old. Almost a year ago, I was fresh out of college and had just moved into an apartment with my high school bestie and her fiancé. This was after a long period of not seeing her in person. My bestie and I had a long and great relationship with a few rocky periods. I didn't know her fiancé well, but I had met him a couple of times. He came off as rude and kind of loud, but mostly nice enough. I let a lot of little annoying behavior slide because she was so in love with him. I really just wanted to spend time with my best friend. Over the course of a few months, I slowly discovered that she was trapped in an abusive relationship with the most classic example of a malignant narcissist imaginable. Their fights escalated to the point where he was completely trashing the apartment, breaking her phone and laptop, hiding her car keys, blocking the door, and grabbing her arms so hard she had bruises all while hurling out the worst insults he could fathom at the top of his lungs for hours. This man is about a foot taller and a hundred pounds heavier than me, so there was nothing I could do other than give her a ride somewhere else away from him until the next morning. He didn't like it when I did that. Once it reached the point of physical harm against her, I put my foot down and demanded that he move out or I would call the cops. He wasn't technically signed onto the lease, so I could have kicked him out. He begged for time to find a new place. He was extremely drunk and high the night he heard her, and he promised to stay sober until he moved. Not wanting to escalate things, I agreed on the condition that nothing like that would ever happen again. My friend and her fiancé broke up soon after that. Three weeks pass and everything is going great. Her ex-fiancé has found a new place, is in training for a new job, and while still loud and inconsiderate, he hasn't caused any problems so far. I get ready for bed early. I have an important meeting early the next day. I put on some comfortable pajamas, locking my door before I change out of habit. My best friend is out working, and it's just me upstairs in bed, and her ex-fiancé is downstairs yelling on the phone about something. I tune him out and try to sleep. He's moving out next week. My chest rattles from the booming footfalls of the stairs to my room, waking me from my sleep. My eyes snap open to see my bedroom doorknob rattling back and forth, locked. He lets out a yell of pure malice and bangs on my door. He screams my name, and it's so slurred, he sounds like he's trying to impersonate a lizard man. The hinges aren't looking so good. We lived in a shitty, cheap apartment with thin doors. I have something to do before he breaks open the door, right? I say the only thing I can think of. What the fuck? Suddenly, the banging and screaming stops. My doorknob falls still. After a terrifying moment of silence, he says flatly, Open the door, bud. Just come and open the door. I still laugh about that one. Like after all that, I just walk over and open it up. 
Instead, I grabbed my essentials and jumped out the window. I was on the second floor, but we lived on a hill, so the fall wasn't quite that high. I still managed to fall wrong. I hobbled as quickly as I could to my car and peeled away. I called my best friend and warned her not to go home. We made plans for her to stay with a friend after she got off of work. I made it to the friend's house and passed out for a few hours. I woke up to a call from my best friend. He traveled all the way to her workplace with a knife and broke in. He assaulted her and held the knife up to her special needs client's throat and said he'd kill him in front of her. Thank God a co-worker overheard everything in another room and was able to call the police in time for everyone to come out alive. My best friend also said he was on the phone with her while he was banging on my door, and he said he was going to kill me and make her listen. I was totally alone in the apartment with him, sleeping upstairs in my bed. If I hadn't locked my doors that night, would I even still be alive? If I had left my car keys downstairs, would I have been able to get away? When I returned to my apartment the next morning, my bedroom door was completely kicked in. My belongings were scattered everywhere, and the large butcher knives were missing from the kitchen, and they were instead sitting in the corner of the hallway to my room. Last year, I was living in a very rural town in the middle of the mountains. Most small western towns only have one road that goes into the big city. Our road in particular was about 50 miles of empty highway, surrounded only by cliffs, fields, and occasionally a farm. At the very entrance to this road, once you enter the city, is a huge truck stop and gas station that is always packed. My mom and I were going back home after a midnight showing of whatever movie we had decided to see, and, as per usual, we stopped to fill up on gas and get a drink for the long drive. As we were leaving, I vaguely noticed a dingy older jeep pull out the same time we did, but of course, I didn't take much notice of it. It wasn't weird that someone would be leaving the same time as us. As we started down the pitch black road, the jeep kept at a steady pace behind us. Again, not weird. Until it came flying up past us before disappearing behind a hill. My mom and I just scoffed. We were going 60, but when people knew the roads well, they often drove them at close to 100, even at night. Eventually, we came up to the jeep from before. It was pulled over, but the back half of the vehicle was in the road and what was clearly a man's arm was waving out the window, gesturing for us to pull over. Of course, we pass it. The man flies past us once more and pulls over again. He does this once more, and my mom and I begin to get very nervous. After passing him for the third time, he flies up and begins tailgating us. He's driving so close that we can't see his headlights in the rearview mirror and he's honking his horn every so often, waving his arm for us to pull over. He carries on with this for 30 minutes. My mom and I are terrified. She's white-knuckling the wheel. I'm holding a pocket knife to make myself feel better. I swore at my own mom for the first time that night, begging her, don't you fucking dare pull over. If you've ever seen the movie, Rest Stop, that's all that was going through my mind. The road is a dead zone for service, so we couldn't call the police or anyone. The picture of us dead or worse on the side of the empty road was the only thing I could think about. But, as soon as it had started, it ended. The man slammed on his brakes, turned around, and went back. The ride home was silent, and I ended up sleeping in my mom's room out of fear. The next morning, we had a discussion and came to the conclusion he'd seen two lone women traveling at night and thought we'd be easy pickings, which he would have been right. Some people suggest that he'd seen us drop money or a receipt at the gas station and want it to be a good Samaritan. I think that's ridiculous. Nobody following two women home in such an aggressive manner has good intentions. 
We moved out of town a few months later for unrelated reasons, but just before we did, the same car was reported following a group of four men on their way to work. So, maybe he just likes to scare people. Either way, that night was easily one of the scariest of my life. I was essentially homeless about seven to eight years ago after breaking up with someone, among other factors. I found a room in a boarding house. One of the other boarders was a guy around my age. I remember the first time I saw him was when I got out of the shower and was walking back to my room. He stared me down, but I thought it was kind of a uh, whoops, just looking out into the hall and seeing someone, didn't mean to make eye contact kind of thing. The next day, there was a note under my door basically saying, Hey, I'm your housemate. Let me know if you need anything or want to hang out. Having come out of a few bad situations, I was without many people, so we struck up a friendship. Over time, it became apparent he had a crush on me, and it soon became very creepy. The more I learned about him, the more off I realized he was. He had two or maybe three kids, all with different women. Whatever, that's fine. But custody, none with any of them. One he had unsupervised visitation with. One he had supervised visitation with. And the third, his girlfriend moved to get away from him and wouldn't tell him if the child even existed or not. Due to the issues with his kids and exes, he started to self-medicate with alcohol. He did this purposefully, as he admitted this was why he was doing it, getting blackout drunk to deal with his feelings. That's when the stalking started. One night, during one of his blackouts, I thought I could calm him down, so I went to his room to keep the landlady from calling the cops. He grabbed my arm, pinned him to my sides, then laid on top of me, pinning me between him and the floor. I got out and ran. The police ended up being called, but he wasn't kicked out. After that, his obsession grew out of what I can only think was some sort of psychotic guilt. Instead of apologizing and staying sober, he started tracking my movements. With this, more letters showed up under my door. A lot of them were angry. The one I remember most was him essentially accusing me of cheating on him. It was like a rambling manifesto with things about how he knows I must be lying to him about having a boyfriend now because he left a cigarette between my door and the door jam, and because it wasn't crushed and didn't fall out, that meant I never came home, and thus I had to have a boyfriend I was staying the night with. This would then be followed by strange text messages telling me I deserve everything bad that happened to me because I apparently used him. I only lived there for about five to six weeks, but this started about a few days in and only ended when I finally said, fuck it, and moved into a weekly studio that was far more expensive. I'd just gotten a job and had the ability to pay for it, and since I was genuinely afraid for my safety, I made sure to leave when I knew he wouldn't be there. Oh, and the ex I mentioned at the beginning of this, he was also actively threatening me during this same period. I had him blocked on everything but the guy found a loophole by sending me songs on fucking Spotify related to what he was mad about that day, with messages attached to them so he could actively berate me. I used to live in a three-story house with my parents, younger sibling, and our dog, we moved into this house a few months before my younger sibling was born, and that was when we first met the neighbors across the street. Lucas, who was the oldest child in their family, was always a bit strange, but there were some aspects of his personality that were more than just strange. They were straight up disturbing. It would take hours to cover everything, so I'm just going to get straight to the point. I'm almost positive that Lucas has been inside of our house in the middle of the night. Our house was built on a hill, 
so it looked like it was only two stories from the front, and the basement was connected to the backyard. The yards in this neighborhood were much larger than they are in newer housing developments, so it would have been very easy for someone to enter our backyard unnoticed. Despite this, my family was terrible about making sure all of the basement doors were locked. My younger sibling and I would always go in and out when we were playing in the backyard, or someone would go down to let the dog out, and we would end up forgetting to lock one of the doors before bed. We also lived in a safe area where it was common for people to leave their doors unlocked. However, my family did always lock the door leading down to the basement every night along with all of the other doors on the main level of the house. I had a fucked up sleep schedule back then, so I would usually still be awake at 3 or 4 in the morning. There are two specific instances that happened very late at night, which make me think that Lucas had been inside of our house without our knowledge. One night, I was in my bedroom on the upper level of the house. It was probably around 2.30 in the morning when I suddenly heard the sound of an angry growl coming from downstairs. Thinking that my dog had spotted a cat in the front yard, I quickly rushed down to stop him from barking and waking up my entire family. This kind of thing would happen every now and then, so I wasn't thinking too much of it at the time. But instead of going downstairs and finding my dog by the front window, I found him by the locked door that leads down to the basement. The fur on the back of his neck was standing up, and his nose was pressed to the bottom of the door. I instantly froze when I realized what was happening. There was something, or someone, on the other side of the basement door. I was barely a teenager at the time, so I began to panic and started making my way upstairs as quietly as possible. I woke up both of my parents, but neither of them took me very seriously. My dad just assumed that my dog was hearing random noises coming from outside, but he did eventually go down to check things out. He said that everything downstairs looked normal, but he also mentioned that we forgot to lock one of the basement doors that night. Then there was another time that I was up late and in my room, but this time, instead of hearing my dog growling, I heard a loud bark that echoed through the entire house. The sound was sudden and intense, similar to a shot, and it almost made me jump out of my chair. Assuming again that my dog had seen a cat outside, I quickly looked out of my bedroom window and tried to spot whatever he was barking at. But my heart suddenly dropped when, instead of seeing a cat, I saw Lucas running out of our front yard in the pitch black. I watched him run across the street and back towards his own house. Before I rushed to close the curtains and duck out of sight, I remember sitting there, struggling to process what I'd just seen, questioning why Lucas would be in our yard in the middle of the night. I told my mom about it the very next morning, and she said she would bring it up to Lucas's mom. Because of these two instances, and because of other details that I can't include, I'm 99.9% .9 sure that Lucas had been inside of our house in the middle of the night. If you knew the entire story behind this family, then you would also find the thought of this to be extremely disturbing. I do want to mention that this all happened years ago. My family no longer lives in that house, and those neighbors across the street are doing fine. But looking back on everything now, I'm realizing just how creepy the situation truly was. I live in a small rural town in the eastern US. That being said, you end up seeing a lot of the same people if you frequent the same places. I often go to a particular gas station close to my house for snacks, gas, cigarettes, you name it. A few months ago, I was standing in line to pay, and the man in front of me, probably in his 50s or 60s by the looks of him, started to talk to me. I'm very aware of my surroundings at all times, and I don't often engage with strangers in public, especially old men. I kept my answers short. He started by asking pretty innocent questions, like what I was buying, but this quickly escalated into what I was doing that night. 
if I had a boyfriend, if I lived close. Thankfully, he was next in line, so the questioning stopped when he was called up to the counter and paid and left. I went on with my day, feeling just a little creeped out. Fast forward to a few weeks later, I run into him at the gas station. I have no idea how he remembered me. I look completely different, as I was dressed in business casual for work this time, and I was dressed like a slob the first time. He started talking to me again, again asking about if I had a boyfriend, where I lived, where I worked, that kind of thing. I mostly ignored him until he got really upset that I wasn't really talking to him, and then I got scared. So I started answering some of his questions with fake answers. When I left to go to the parking lot after paying, he was sitting on the curb outside, presumably waiting for me. I felt really uncomfortable, but I had to get into my car and leave as I was running late for work. I know he saw what car I drive, my license plate and everything, and it really wouldn't be that hard to find me in my town, so I was really creeped out. At this point, I didn't contact the police or anything as I assumed there was nothing they could do as I didn't have any hard proof of anything. I did tell my roommate and describe the guy to her in case she saw him or anything suspicious. A few weeks after the second encounter, I saw him again, this time at the grocery store. I didn't interact with him, and he seemed to not notice me for a while. Until one time we almost ran right into each other going down an aisle. I looked away and just kept walking pretending I didn't notice him. That's when I started to see him in every aisle I walked down, in the checkout line and everything. It was like he was following me. I walked out to my car after paying, and he was standing about 10 yards away from my car at another car, smoking a cigarette. I again ignored him, got into my car to leave, and noticed he got into his car as well. I purposely started driving the opposite direction to my house, making random turns, and he followed me through every single one, speeding up and slowing down to stay with me. I'd had enough, so I, being the true crime enthusiast that I am, started driving directly to the police station. I guess he figured out where I was going, and he made a random turn and I lost him. I got to the police station and made a report, because now I at least had a description, as well as the car he was driving. They told me, since there wasn't any hard proof, they couldn't do anything, but they would keep my report and told me to call them or visit again if I had any more information. I haven't seen him in a few weeks now, and I stopped going to the same gas station near my house. I have a feeling that I was definitely being targeted by this man, but I had no idea what his intentions were. I'm scared, and I look over my shoulder everywhere I go now. I'm seriously thinking about buying a new car and possibly moving out of this town. So someone was following me home yesterday, and now I don't want to leave the house. I was walking home from the store yesterday, and I saw a black box car drive past me extremely slow and the man in the car was clearly watching me. When he fully passed me, I saw that he was watching me in his rearview mirror. I thought it was weird and slowed my pace down so that I could tell if he was waiting for me, or just a slow driver. He was still driving extremely slow, but it moved a little when he saw two guys riding past on bikes. He then moved to the edge of the short street we were on and waited there. I was still towards the beginning of the street, so I acted like I forgot something and turned around to get out of his sight. I waited and kind of peeked out to see if he had left, and when I saw he was gone, I continued walking. I didn't think it would happen, but I made a mental note that if I saw the car behind me, it meant he circled back around. After I continued walking, I made three turns and was three turns away from my house. When I was walking up a little hill and almost at the fourth turn, I looked back and saw the man at the corner I just turned from, and that told me he had circled back around to find me. He sat there watching me continue walking 
until I got up the little hill and turned the corner. Then, as I had just barely made the last turn and it was close to my house, I saw the man's car just turn the corner up the street, straight across from the way I was walking, waiting there. I pulled out my phone to call my mom and walked the other way, and he left soon after I pulled out my phone. My mom came out and walked with me back to the house, and I didn't see the car for the rest of the day. But I keep thinking, he knows what neighborhood I live in. What if he comes back? What if the next time he comes back, I'm out by myself again? What if there's no one home to call? What if he sees me leaving and comes back when I'm the only one home? I'm so scared he's going to come back, I don't want to go outside. I don't want to show him where I live, especially because I'm home alone very often. I have summer school and I have to go, but I don't want to leave the house in fear he might be waiting for me. I'm constantly looking out the windows to see if I can spot him, especially since if he was at the store I was at, he's definitely somewhere near my neighborhood. I was having lunch with a friend at Subway, and as we were walking in, I noticed a car driving and parking very terribly with a bit of a flat tire. I thought nothing of it and had ordered my sandwich. A few minutes later, a middle-aged blonde woman walked in. She was wearing green cowboy boots, starry leggings, a purple skirt, a red wife beater, sunglasses, and a grey puff jacket. She asked the subway employee if they still have salad, and then asked, Does salad help with, like, cold? After waiting in line for like ten minutes for her salad, she exited without even ordering a salad. Five minutes later, she came back and got in line again. She started plugging her nose between her middle and pointer fingers. She waited in line for another ten minutes and read the menu with her finger. After a while, she got out of line again and stood at the trash can, directly behind my friend, facing me, staring at me, and plugging her nose. She scoffed at me and went outside. She sat on a chair that was missing a leg right in front of the glass door with her back to me. The subway employee told her that it was broken, and she said she felt it when she sat down, and she continued to sit there. She came back inside for a third time and she gestured to a high school-aged boy in the line behind her. She gestured for him to take his airpods out. She whispered in his ear, and the guy said aloud, That one, and pointed at me. She whispered again and promptly leaves. The kid told me that she told him she hates the girl facing the door. That was me. After we finished eating, my friend and I stepped outside to smoke. The weather was getting nicer, so we stayed outside for a good half hour. We soon realized she was the chick who parked all crazy, and she was still sitting outside watching us the whole time, with her car door open. I was scared shitless, but my friend was smart enough to get her license plate number, in case something happened while I was frozen, trying not to make it obvious that I saw what she was doing. Luckily, I made good acquaintances with one of the subway employees, and he let me hang out in the storage room for a bit until she left. I later found out that seconds after I stepped into the storage room, she'd come back into the store, taken a quick look around, and then dipped. I didn't know what would have happened if the high school kid didn't speak up, or if she didn't park crazy, because I wouldn't have noticed her watching me. I don't believe I did anything to offend her, Although I may not have been able to hide my disdain for her fashion choices, she didn't appear to be under the influence of anything, despite her sunglasses and reckless driving. I honestly hope she was under the influence, because it would be a much more depressing reality if she were just that mentally ill and wasn't being actively treated for it. I wished my friend kept her license plate number on her phone, so that I could have possibly intervened with the obvious drug or mental issue at play as some atypical social behavior puts her in danger as well. By far one of my strangest encounters.
For context, this story spans all the way back from middle school to now. I personally believe this girl is closer to a stalker than anything. During my 7th grade year of middle school, there was a girl in my class that suddenly took a liking to me. Her name was Stacy. It was pretty obvious she liked me, and I didn't care too much for it at all. Especially at that time, it didn't bother me. A couple of weeks passed since she's made it really apparent she had a crush on me. I'm at my home in my basement when I get a text on my phone. It's from a random number that I'd never seen before. Even weirder, I never gave out my iCloud account to anyone from my school, and the email itself was random enough that no one could have guessed what it was. Anyway, I eventually find out a couple of minutes later it was Stacy texting me. I entertained it because I didn't want to be mean and just not respond, so she would text me every day like clockwork. Now at this time, I had a crush on a girl named Amanda, and this Halloween dance was coming up. Maybe a week from the Halloween dance, I get a text from Stacy, and in this text stream she finally confessed her feelings for me, and I tell her I didn't have any feelings for her and that I was sorry. I try to remain as respectful as possible. Stacy then begins to text me essentially how she knew it was a long shot that I'd like her back because she knew who I liked. So, in the back of my mind at this point, I'm like, what? How does she know who I like? So I ask first, how do you know who I like? And she tells me, Amanda, and that her friend had told her. And the friend that she just happened to be dating was my friend who told her who my crush was. I then asked, did my friend tell your friend who I liked? And she said, Yes. I was pissed. The next day I arrive and I confront my friend and he swears he didn't tell anyone. And I trust him. I confront Stacy later that night, to which she tells me that she lied and figured out who it was because she stared at me so much. I didn't even know what to say other than to stop talking to her. Fast forward to the summer and she's texting me every day how she needs to get over me. I mean every day. So for probably two weeks, I kept telling her how she'd find someone else who would like her and care for her, and how I just wasn't the one. Eventually I get tired of this, and I tell her if she's going to get over me, she's going to have to stop talking to me. She gets angry with me, and I told her to stop contacting me. I thought that was it, and I was so wrong. The worst had yet to come. Fast forward to my birthday of 8th grade, when I think all of this has blown over. Half a year had passed, and I put it all behind me until I get to school, and I see on my locker that Stacy has made a drawing for me, and taped it onto my locker, saying, Happy Birthday. I took the drawing off and shoved it into my locker, and completely forgot about it for the rest of the day until it was night time and all my friends had come over to my house. Stacy texts me and asks why I didn't say thank you for the drawing. I apologized and said that I had a lot going on that day. She accepted it, and I thought that was the end of that. I was wrong again. I woke up in the morning to multiple texts telling me how I was wrong for not saying thank you, and at that point I'd finally had enough and just blocked her. Nearing the end of the year, we were assigned an essay about a lesson we'd learned in our life. It was a pretty easy assignment, until I realized we had to present it in front of the whole class. Now my school was small, there were only about 40 kids to a grade, and each grade was split up in half, so it wasn't the worst thing to present in front of everyone, until it was. The day arrived that we had to present our this I believe essay, and when Stacy waddles up to the front of the classroom and says her essay title is Love is a Delicate Matter, I thought to myself, what if this is about me? It was. The whole essay, top to bottom, was about her confessing her love for me, literally no joke, and in the end, completely slandering me by calling me a jerk that was never worth liking to begin with. The worst part about this was how quickly word traveled in school. There were no secrets. Everyone knew this girl liked me all the way back in 7th grade. It was, and is, one of the most embarrassing moments I've ever had to sit through. Not to mention, she got a standing ovation. P. 
people were crying. My friends were all laughing their asses off, and the teachers were too. I only had one thought the rest of the day. What just happened? Now, I thought this was the end of it. I was wrong a third time. A couple of years pass, and nothing crazy has happened since, until my junior year. A good buddy of mine told me he needed to talk to me and that it was important, so I said yes, and eventually we meet up in the stairwell, and he tells me that Stacy has made a play about us in middle school. Yeah, that's right, a play to present in front of a whole crowd. I was baffled. This girl made her whole upbringing about a middle school crush. Turns out they made a video of the play, and I finally got to watch that this year. It was terrible and I mean I wanted to pull my eyes out type of bad. I also saved her essay, and that's pretty bad too. Anyway, I just graduated, and hope that I don't have to see this person again. I live in a small town where everyone knows everyone and everything. My sister and I adore film photography, so we were hopping from park to park just this past April to get shots of the spring foliage. My school is located in the middle of the woods just off of a residential area, and down an adjacent road is a beautiful, scenic, mountainous park of about 250 acres with various recreational sections, playgrounds, and also trails. I visited the park to read frequently in isolation, but it was always fairly empty. That day would be no exception, as it was overcast and rainy, and the previous, much more popular parks we visited were devoid of people. On the way to the park, I hit a light that essentially functioned as a stop sign. I lingered just a bit at this light because people tend to cut me off, and another car to my left stopped just a hair after mine. My blinker was on to make a right, and they had no blinker on, so we were going in the same direction. As we climbed the hill toward the park, I glanced in my rearview mirror to find the car hanging back at a snail's pace. A line of cars were jammed up behind it, and I remember questioning why this guy was going 25 to 30 miles per hour when the limit was 45. As the hill crested, I made a left into the park, and lo and behold, it was absolutely empty. Perfect. We passed approximately five parking lots with their respective playgrounds and soccer fields and trails, winding through the hilly terrain before we came upon the parking lot I typically parked in Redden. It was the prettiest part of the land, with tall trees encapsulating the back and sides, and a picturesque view of the mountains and foliage in the front. But today, again was painfully dreary looking, and although we expected to see more buds and blossoms, the majority of the trees still remained bare. I suggested turning around to my sister, until she insisted we explored the end of the park. I thought it wouldn't hurt, so we continued forward, descended the hill, and came upon a dead end. The road was not very long, with a parking lot to the right, and one all the way at the end to the left. It was as we were going down the road that I absentmindedly glanced in my rearview mirror. The car. It had been following me distantly as to remain out of sight, but as we approached this dead end, it suddenly sprang into view. Thoughts began to flood. Who also goes to an isolated park on a rainy day? What are the chances that they're going back to the very dead end I am when there were eight to nine empty parking lots before me? And when there's nothing to do down here, who is in that car? Please be a woman and her kids. Please be a woman and her kids. Please. The entrance to the lots was the width of one car, framed by deep ditches on both sides. I kept thinking, if I pull into the lot and park, that car can block me in at the entrance. And if I try to escape another way, my car will plummet into the ditch. At this point, this is all coming out as incoherent frantic babbling to my sister. I swing into a lot, and as the car continues towards us, I quite literally floor it in a whiplash-inducing crescent, 
and book it out of the way I came. Now I'm creeping up the incline as this car descends, and at one point we're perpendicular, stealing a look at the individual inside. A 45 to 50 year old man. I frantically climbed down the hill and we're now, luckily, a good distance away. The hill's elevation offers us a clear view of the car, and I instruct my sister to keep a vigorous watch as I continue driving. She reports him to pulling into the center of the last lot as if to park, remaining rather still, but still veering ever so slightly to the left, as if to turn around. I'm shaking and checking my rearview mirror obsessively as we exit the park, descending the road we initially traversed. It's when I'm nearing that very light the car tailed me from that I glance back and, in its usual fashion, the same car makes its slow, obscure approach. At this moment, my sister receives a well-timed call from my father. We inform him of the situation and he questions us, but we are absolutely certain and insistent. He remains skeptical. I turn on my blinker to make a left. The car follows, adrenaline and panic surging. I begin racing down the road with the intent to sandwich multiple cars between us and expand the distance. I make multiple loops around my town to assure I'm safe, and this continues for a good 20 minutes. Until it works, I lose him. I have combed through sex offender registries of my town and neighboring ones and have attempted to identify his car, but no luck. I can find no trace of this man. I mentioned previously that my town is very small, so I'm always cautious on the road, especially when approaching that light at the same time of day. I haven't returned to that park since, but I am plagued with questions. What was this man planning to do? My car had a very visible parking pass of the school my sister and I attend, and I fear he intends to target us or one of the other students someday. After all, the school is not very far from that very park. Every time I see a similar car, my heart drops to my stomach. So, to the middle-aged man that trailed me for miles, let's not meet. Ten years ago, my ex and I were struggling for money and ended up moving into a cramped old flat in a 1920s hotel that had been converted into flats. We initially were offered the second floor flat, but despite being nicer, there was this air of dread in it. We both felt very uncomfortable in it, like we shouldn't be there. So we ended up taking the first floor flat. Within a month of us living there, a young girl moved in above us. She screamed, banged, and came in and out at odd hours. My ex would bang on the ceiling, and she'd stop for a bit before starting up again. We complained, and then three months later, it stopped for the most part. We still heard heavy, slow stomps on the ceiling, closing doors, and an occasional low moan. It wasn't anywhere near as bad as before, and only really happened at night, so we just gave up trying to get her to shut up. One night, we were laying in bed about to sleep when the stomping began. It started quiet before getting louder and louder until it was right above our heads. My ex lost it. He went upstairs and banged on her door. No answer. He came back downstairs and when it continued, he banged on the ceiling, shouting, Shut the hell up. We've had enough. It stopped and we finally got some sleep. The next day, I was complaining to the ground floor resident, Emma. She looked confused, then told me the girl had abandoned the flat a month ago, just up and left during the night. I told her I must have been mistaken, but my ex and I were very confused. I reported it to the landlord, who said he'd been doing minor repairs, but only during the day, and that he would change the locks in case the girl had been coming and going. Things settled for a bit, but then weird things started happening. Keys left on the side would disappear and show up in the kitchen drawer. Doors would be open when I swore I closed them. I was having mental health issues at the time, and my ex told me I must have been doing it. So I just left it. 
I stopped mentioning the weird occurrences because he wasn't very supportive and he always blamed me for them. Then it happened. I was alone, cooking in the kitchen with my headphones in. I remember it was stormy outside and the wind was whipping up against the window panes. Suddenly, I got this eerie feeling that I should run, so I took out my headphones and looked into the lounge. Nothing. Still, the feeling persisted, and I felt the hairs on my arms stand up. I needed to pee, but to get to the bathroom, you had to go into the bedroom. Something told me not to go, to run, but I ignored it and went to the bedroom and opened the door. It was dark but I could plainly see someone sitting on our bed. I shut my eyes, hoping it was just tiredness or my mental issues. But no, there she was when I opened my eyes. My hand was stuck on the door handle, and my whole body froze, when suddenly the person started turning their head towards me. I can see her face now, grayish blue, black where the eyes should be, a mass of long black hair down her shoulders. I screamed, ran out of the flat and downstairs, crying and hysterical. I banged on Emma's door and she let me in. As she calmed me, her husband went to check the flat, but said no one was there. I was too scared to go back up, so I sat with Emma until I calmed down. My ex came home and we went back up. He asked me why I was so anxious. I lied and said it was the storm. I felt I couldn't tell him. He would either laugh or say I was a psycho. I went to the doctor and told him about it, and a month later I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder and given medication. I saw the woman once more in the mirror behind me, but I just shut my eyes and walked out. I told myself it was just my bipolar and that soon the meds would work. Three months later, we moved into another house. We were chatting about how happy we were to be rid of the place and how creepy it had been, when my ex laughed nervously and said he hoped the woman hadn't followed us. My blood froze, and I asked him what he meant. He told me that a few times he'd woken up to see a woman with a gray face and no eyes standing at the end of our bed, staring at me. He was in a bad place at the time and assumed it was night terrors. I remember one night where he woke screaming and dashed to turn on the lights. He said it was a nightmare, but he now told me it was because he'd woken to the woman lying above me, almost parallel, staring at me. As I said before, I had never told him about her. We laughed it off, but I was creeped out for a while. A few years ago, Emma popped up on my social media. We got chatting and the topic of the woman came up. She didn't laugh. Instead, she told me that she heard that the flat above us used to be rented by an elderly lady decades before who had drowned in the nearby lake just days after her husband left her for another woman. I asked her why she hadn't said anything at the time, but she said I'd been so hysterical at the time that there was no point upsetting me further. I still think about this sometimes. I've been medicated for years and manage my symptoms well. I don't really believe in the paranormal. It seems a bit far-fetched, but I still sometimes wonder whether that woman was a shared hallucination or something much, much worse. I went camping with some new friends once, and one demanded he not share a tent with anyone because he sleepwalks, after we'd already made the plans that he would share a tent with one friend while my girlfriend and I would have our own. We said whatever. I was kind of pissed off about it, but left it so we could still enjoy the weekend. My girlfriend and I shared an awkward tent with basically a random person. That night, I was woken up by my girlfriend who said, Chris's friend is freaking me out. So I looked outside the tent, and the guy is just walking in circles. I told her he sleepwalks, so we just need to keep an eye on him and make sure he doesn't do anything stupid. About 30 seconds later, he starts screaming, hello, at the top of his lungs, and that goes on for a while. 
just standing there in the middle of the campsite, screaming. At this point, we're all awake and watching him like, what the fuck? Then he turns towards the woods, screams hello, and points his pistol into the nothingness. Luckily, it was away from us. Now, up to this point, I didn't even know he brought his firearm. So, I went ahead and got mine out too, because I was thinking like, shit, he's going to sleep shoot us. But he doesn't. Instead, he put it down, got into his tent, and went immediately back to sleep. The next morning, I asked him what the fuck he was doing. It turned out he was not asleep, and he thought he heard coyotes, so his first thought was to wander off by himself into the night, instead of waking any of us up. I never camped with him again. A few years later, he made the noose for scaring the shit out of an entire campsite one night, because he was running through the woods and shooting his firearm erratically because he saw Bigfoot and was trying to track him down. He was a really weird guy. This happened to me a while back. I was roughly 16 and just couldn't sleep. At 2am, I heard this loud noise that made me jump. I'd never heard a noise quite like it. The sound was a cross between a giggle and a scream. I paused my show and turned on the light. There was nothing there though. As I turned around to go back to my bed, I saw what looked like a shadow of a woman standing in the hallway. I froze. Did she see me? She began to walk towards my room, which was the opposite end to my parents' room, so I was worried that she was going to come and get me or something. As she got closer, I backed away from the door and started to go towards the left side of my bed. Next to my bedside table, I keep a bat for self-defense. I grabbed a bat and hid behind the side of my bed, praying the woman hadn't seen me. After about a minute, there were footsteps going down the stairs. I breathed a sigh of relief and got up, going back to close my door. As the door closed, it hit my toe. Now these doors were heavy, and back then I was a proper Slim Jim. I had no padding, so when the door hit my toe, I let out a quiet, shit. At that point, I realized what I had done. The lady's head whipped around, and we locked eyes. She came back up the stairs and came heading towards my room. I tried my best to shut my door, but before I could, she got her foot into it. Your father said everyone was asleep. Why are you up? My mouth opened, but words wouldn't come out. I was terrified. The lady pushed open my door, thrusting me to the floor. You were gonna forget that you ever saw me, young man, and you're going to go straight to bed. Do you understand? Suddenly, I heard my parents' bedroom door open. I shouted out, and in comes my dad. Shh, Indigo, for goodness sake. You're gonna wake up your brothers. Sandra, I thought you were leaving. I stopped for a moment. You know this creepy witch. My dad gave me the, if I could scream at you right now, I would look, and told the woman to leave. You were not to tell your mother about this, Indigo. Go to bed. The next morning I woke up and figured what had happened. My dad was having an affair. My mom traveled a lot with work, so he was probably sleeping with the Sandra person every time she was away. That pissed me right off. Luckily my mom was back once I woke up, and so I thought she deserved to know. I wasn't going to tell her directly yet though. I wanted to see if I could pressure my dad into it first. So dad, fun night last night. He almost choked on his breakfast. He didn't break, though. My mom asked what I was talking about, and he just said he went out with some friends for some beers, and by the time he got home, everyone was asleep. In the end, he never told her. So the next time she went away and Sandra came and slept with my dad, I told her, and they got a divorce.
This happened last holiday season. It was my first Christmas with my partner, so we were hanging out and telling each other our personal and family traditions so we could do them together. I brought up hot cocoa and peppermint schnapps, and he said he'd never had it before. It's hands down one of my favorite parts of winter, so I excitedly said we had to try it and offered to go just down the street to the liquor store for a small bottle of schnapps. The liquor store is less than a mile from his house, and it has an overhang in a parking spot near the door. I was just running in quickly, so I parked there. As I got out of the car, I noticed a homeless man going through a dumpster about a hundred feet away. I didn't think much of it. It's the low California desert, and unfortunately homelessness is very common. I grabbed the schnapps and walked out of the store, but as I turned to go to my car, I saw the homeless man suddenly start speed walking right towards me. I was maybe 10 feet from my car, but at this point, so was he. I freaked out and bolted to my driver's side door, and he does the same. I jumped in as quickly as I could and slammed the door as he was getting to it, but my purse stopped it from closing all the way. I felt the door was partially latched though, so I hit the button that locked all the doors and quickly pulled it closed the rest of the way, just as this man started pulling on the door to open it. He was right by my window, so close I could see his bulging eyes in the dark, and he started trying to say something to me. I kept yelling no as I started the car, and I was able to get away. I haven't gone back to that liquor store since. I just don't want to meet him ever again. I recently quit my job at a fast food chain after working there almost 10 months. This story is part of the reason why I didn't want to stay much longer. I worked the drive through from 5pm to 11pm almost every weekend. Seeing regulars was not uncommon for me, and I would even memorize most of their orders and fill it out as soon as I heard their voice. Most were very polite and occasionally tipped, but on one particularly busy day, there was an unfamiliar, weary presence. I had just started my shift, so I was running food to the window. I made eye contact with the man at the window in his car and immediately felt uneasy. I brushed it off because we were busy and I had work to do. My manager set up my cash drawer. I took over drive through orders and payments and whatnot. There were lots of orders, so I wasn't paying special attention to specific voices or menu choices. But one did catch my attention. It was a low, hesitant voice asking for a sandwich. I give the man the total and he waits in line. He arrives at the window and it's the man from earlier. I assumed he just forgot to order something. Now, his car was pretty low to the ground, so he had to extend his arm out to hand me his debit card. As he does this, he mumbles something under his breath without breaking eye contact with me. I'm sorry, what was that? I question. I said, you're looking beautiful today. At this point, I'm really uncomfortable. Not only do I have a boyfriend, but I'm also underage, and I'm not interested at all. Oh, uh, thank you, I say nervously. I handed him the bag of food and quickly shut the window until he drove away. I half-heartedly complained about him to some co-workers, as we usually do with weird customers, but I still had a strange gut feeling. A little while later, when the average wait in our line was about 10 minutes, I hear a familiar voice over the mic asking for a cup of water. It was low, but agitated and forceful. I saw his face through the windshield and walked away from the window so my manager would take care of him. This happened a couple more times that day, asking for straws and other free things. At this point, I was sure that he was just trying to look at me. I was so frustrated with him and the rest of my work day that I went to the bathroom and cried. I usually have pretty thick skin when it comes to this stuff, but I was just so over it. The rest of the night went on 
and he didn't make another appearance. I thought I'd probably never see him again, until my very last shift at the store a few months later. We weren't busy that evening, but it was much later in the day than the first encounter. I did not recognize the voice, but I immediately recognized his face and car. I swallowed my pride and took his payment, trying not to make eye contact. I called my manager, and he said that he would give the food out for me. As suspected, the man was back in the drive through not long afterwards for a cup of water. This time I knew better. I sent a male co-worker to the window to get it for him since I was busy anyway. Once given the water, the man asked my co-worker, You guys close at 11 now, right? I was so glad I was getting picked up by my mom that night. I was constantly looking out the windows and making sure he wasn't out there waiting for me. Call me paranoid, but I listened to enough true crime to be overly cautious. I lived in a duplex for a number of years, and pretty much since day one, I'd hear noises like someone moving around upstairs. Only problem, we lived in a single-story building. I figured that even in the worst-case scenario, someone was secretly living in the attic. We'd be able to hear if they ever climbed down into the apartment, as they'd need to step onto a washer-dryer and open squeaky and generally loud accordion doors. One night, our daughter threw up on our bed in the middle of the night. My wife and I slept on the couch, and I hear a loud crunching sort of noise that I can't identify coming from the kitchen right in view of the couch, but I see nothing, mostly because of how dark it was. The next morning, my wife asks if I heard the sounds in the kitchen. I spend a few more nights on the couch to see if I can catch that sound again. It happens multiple times every night and I finally catch what was making that sound. A rat had been sneaking into the kitchen and just wondering. The noise we heard was the rat entering the kitchen through a gap between wood and metal, then walking on the linoleum. After that, it all made sense, and we started noticing all sorts of other rat noises, like the one in the attic. I used to clean movie theaters. Our shifts would start at 2 a.m. On a slow weekday night, I decided to go out and pick up the trash in the parking lot. It was around 4 to 5 a.m. The theater was also next to a really busy road, so people passing by could see into the parking lot clear as day. I had headphones in and a grabby thing in my hand to pick up gross stuff when I suddenly get a call from my boss who's inside the building. She tells me that she just saw a truck pull into the parking lot and we weren't expecting any vendors today. As she says this, the truck pulls up next to me and stops as the man starts to open the door. There was a clear moment when he started to lean out and then he saw that I was on a phone call and the grabby thing over my shoulder like a baseball bat. He sees my hands then looks up at me and says, Looks like it might snow today. He then closes his door and drives off. I'm 100% sure that if my boss didn't call me, the man would have tried to grab me and get me into his truck. I then warned everyone that no one should do the parking lot garbage until it's light out and to always be on alert. I will preface this by saying I'm not a spiritual person. I don't believe in an afterlife or past lives or souls or anything. This experience, however, was weirdly vivid and I still think about it, despite it happening years ago. I had a dream some time ago where I died. I don't remember how, but that's not the part that stood out to me. I ended up in this purgatory slash waiting room type of place, think a dentist's office, there was a lot of white. I remember one of the receptionists trying to sort me into heaven or hell, but I kept trying to tell her this was some kind of mistake and that I shouldn't be there. 
I explained that I couldn't be dead because my mother, who was going back to school at the time, would miss me and all her efforts to improve our life would have been for nothing. She sent me away to try and cope. I don't remember much else of the middle then, but I do remember before I woke up from the dream, the same receptionist lady placed her hand on my shoulder and said, don't let your mother's hard work go to waste. I woke up immediately after that. Like I said, I'm not a spiritual person, but if I die and wake up in some dentist's office, I would not be surprised. I used to mess around this massive property that consisted of three gigantic factory buildings right next to a big strip mall plaza. It was pretty popular because the cops never cared enough to patrol, so the whole place was completely covered in really amazing graffiti. Once our group of nine visited, just after a tropical storm that knocked out power in most of the state, we thought it'd be cool to go stargaze up on the roof. To get up, you have to crawl through this partially collapsed passageway and then climb three stories up on an old ladder. A few minutes after we all got up, a waterlogged section of roof started collapsing and we all had to scramble on top of each other to get down the ladder, with a few people basically falling part way down. We managed to crawl out the passageway part just as some metal parts of the roof started crashing down. We decided we probably shouldn't stick around and find out how much water damage the storm had done. We still continued to visit it for several years until the property changed hands and a security guard was hired to watch over it. But we never dared to go on that roof again and definitely never went after rainstorms. I worked on ships. There was one night I was on a ship sailing through Alaskan waters. It happened to be my first night ever seeing the Northern Lights. I can't believe how awesome that was. It made the sky clear. It made the night look like it was dusk. We were able to see clearly for miles. A few buddies and I hit the roof, or what we call it, Lido deck at 1am just to gaze at it. An hour or so in, there were six of us on top nearly the entire crew now. A big white spotlight shines at us. We were near land, but where the spotlight was was above the water, and it wasn't low enough to be on a ship. This was very high up. It shined on us for about 15 to 20 seconds. Once the light turned off, we looked to see what it was. We saw nothing. No trace of an aircraft or anything. A couple of minutes go by and the same light shined on us, this time it was on the other side of our vessel, above mountains, still unable to see what it was. We all saw it. We all have never seen any aircrafts hovering above these waters, especially at 2 a.m. We didn't know what it was. We think it might have been some sort of silenced aircraft that the military was probably doing drills or something with. But anyway, that was one of the weirder things to happen out on the ocean. This one is my brother's experience, not mine, but I'm somewhat partly involved with it. A couple of decades ago, when I was still in elementary school in my home country, it was just a normal day at school. I came home to my mom's clinic after school with my brother. I usually go home with both of them after my mom closes shop every evening, but this particular day, I told my mom that I'd be going home early, so I left my brother and mother behind at the clinic. I got home and dusk came and darkness had fallen. I'm starting to become curious as to why they hadn't arrived home yet. After another hour, I'm starting to get worried, wondering if something bad had happened. All three of us normally come home before nightfall, and it was just very odd that they hadn't gotten home yet. I was scared shitless, having endless thoughts of what could have gone wrong. As a kid in elementary school, I couldn't handle the stress and I started crying like crazy. Midnight struck and they were still missing. Finally, at 2am, I hear a knock on the front door 
and I quickly rush to open it. I'm usually scared to open the door this late, but I couldn't care less. I just wanted my brother and my mother to be the two humans knocking. I opened the door and I saw two pale figures. My mom and my brother were soaking wet, barefoot, and they were shaking like crazy. I couldn't even fathom what had happened, and we just stared at each other for a good few minutes until I finally broke the silence with, what happened? My mother told me the most fucked up story. They rode a passenger bus around evening time after closing shop and everything was going well, until near the end of the trip. While on the bus, they heard a couple of loud thuds just underneath the bus, making the whole vehicle shake a bit. They heard metal scratching through concrete and all. The bus had to stop, and in my country, the roads are very dark with no lighting, so they had to resort to flashlights brought by the driver and conductor. The driver was the first one off the bus with the flashlights to check what could have happened and inspect the underside of the bus. He got back inside with a face that looked like he was about to puke, and he asked everybody to get off the bus and find another way to get home. My brother and mother got off and they peeked under the bus, only to realize there was the mangled body of a motorcyclist underneath the bus. It was dark, but with the help of some flashlights, they could see flesh, brains, blood smeared on the concrete. There was a lot that meshed with twisted metal underneath the bus. My mother and brother told me the bus hit a motorcyclist and the person went under, crushing and smearing the motorcyclist between the bus and the concrete. I could not sleep that night, and neither could my mother or brother. The next morning, just as we were trying to heal from what had happened and all the trauma, my aunt broke the news to us later that following day that her husband never got home that night. The mangled body under the bus was my uncle's. I still hurt every time I recall this story. I'm shaking as I type and share this with you all. God bless, and please tell everyone in your family you love them, because you never know what tomorrow will be like. It happened two months ago in Poland. I dropped off my friends at the airport and was driving alone back home, which takes approximately 50 minutes. It was between midnight and 1am since their flight was delayed and I wanted to make sure they boarded the plane. I live in a metropolitan area of a few cities, so the way back can go either through highway, express road or slow roads crossing the city centers. About a third of the journey on the highway, I noticed that there was a car driving behind me for a while now, and occasionally getting too close to my bumper, although there were two more lanes on which they could easily have overtaken me if they wanted to. I got a weird feeling, so I decided to switch to the slow roads in the city center. The car continued to follow me. I didn't get a look at the driver because I was trying to memorize the license plate. Still, I thought maybe I was being paranoid. To make sure, I decided at a roundabout that I'd go around twice, and maybe, if that person is also just on their way home, they'd turn on the road they're supposed to go on. They didn't. They kept following me. So to be double sure that I'm not imagining things, I did the trick with a roundabout again after a few more minutes. As they continued to follow me, I started to really freak out. My phone was dead. I couldn't call the police or even my girlfriend to ask the neighbors to wait for me in the front of the building. I started thinking about just driving as long as my car would allow it, and I noticed that luckily I have a full tank of gas. Then I thought, gas station. The gas station is not far from my home, there's always at least two people during the night shift. I know most of the workers and they have cameras everywhere. I park close to the entrance, right in front of the camera. So did that car, but a bit further away, outside of camera range. A man got out, going my direction. I ran into the gas station, screaming that the person out there has been following me, and that I needed help. When I got inside the building, I noticed the man get back into his car and drive away. 
The employees at the gas station helped me calm down and get home safely a few hours later. But since then, I look over my shoulder all the time. Especially when I'm driving alone and obsessively memorizing license plate. So, to that driver, let's not meet. As a child and young teen, I lived in a very strange situation in the woods. I'm not sure if this encounter may have been some kind of entity, or perhaps something different. I hope someone can give me more information about what happened to me and my friend. I was around 12 years old at the time, and my best friend Alex must have been 10. Alex's father had purchased a large amount of forested land around 100 kilometers away from the city we lived in. It was all forest when Alex's family acquired it. They cleared a little patch to build a house, and the rest was pure, unadulterated forest. Their land was cut in two by a dirt road that, if you followed it for several kilometers, led to a few houses, and their land was very different depending on which side of the dirt road you looked. On the right side, where their house was, the forest was light and luminous. Or at least it felt that way. It was not too dense, with little rolling hills, a lovely place to play. On the left side of the road, it was another story. First, there was a deep ditch, perhaps two meters deep, which then became a quite high and steep hill. Weirdly enough, along the long road, the ditch was full of car parts. A set of car wheels here, a door there, a steering wheel way over there all old and overgrown with moss. And over the steep hill, the forest gave off a really bad vibe. It had lots of very tall, dark, coniferous trees with almost black trunks, and the place seemed somehow devoid of light or life. Climbing the hill, there was some sort of swamp there. When we were there, there was this strange pressure we sensed a kind of animal instinct that told us to leave this place. The strange atmosphere was spontaneously obvious to both me and Alex, and we playfully called that side of the road Demon's Forest. One weekend day, probably in 2001 or 2002, my family and I came to visit Alex's family. Bored by the adults, my friend and I decided to go play in the forest. Alex's father told us to watch out, there was an animal that had been rummaging in their trash bin and causing other nuisances. He said it was a dog that looked somewhat like a Rottweiler that surely belonged to someone living up the dirt road. He warned us that we shouldn't interact with the dog if we saw it, as it didn't look healthy as far as he could tell, or something was weird about it. He said it somehow looked diseased or contagious, or had patches of fur missing, I can't remember exactly. And so we set out on our walk. It was autumn, and the leaves were pretty and golden, many having already fallen to the ground. It was a calm, slightly overcast, windless day. The air was very still and calm. Alex and I decided to walk along the dirt road, with the pleasant section of the forest to our right, and Demon's Forest to our left. We chatted while following the road as it was rising up a slope. As usual, we were slightly creeped out going up that road because of the weird vibes of the forest to the left side, but we were challenging ourselves to be brave and trying not to really think about how unsettling it felt. A good distance away from their home, when it was already well out of sight, I noticed the first strange thing of the day. Out of the steep hill on the left side of the road, there was a very large and dark pine tree hanging over the road. Someone had attached a pink ribbon to one of the branches. The strange thing was, the ribbon was flailing strongly in the wind. Its loose ends were flapping almost horizontally. Here's the thing. It was a completely windless day. There was no wind to speak of. The ribbon was within my reach, so I even touched it as it was flailing. I even licked my finger and held it in the air to check if I could feel any wind or air current at all. As my dad had taught me, the air was perfectly still, yet the ribbon flailed. I mentioned it to my friend, 
He seemed distracted and he was younger than me and sometimes didn't catch on to what I said, so I didn't press the matter. We continued our climb. We reached a place where the hill on the left side of the road had a gentler slope and began farther away from the road. In fact, it looked as if the hill was kind of carved out in a way that would have made it easy for us to climb to get into Demon's Forest. It almost seemed as if the hill was carved in a sloping circle, like in a theater, and the road we stood on would have been the stage. It gave us a very clear, treeless view of the hillside, full of golden and red fallen leaves. The trees began at the top of the hill, maybe nine meters higher, we stopped to admire the view. Canadian autumns are a sight to behold. Alex suddenly got really excited. He thought he heard something in the demon's woods up the hill, and he really wanted me to pay attention. He explained that there are wildcats in that forest. They had spotted them with his dad. One of them had reportedly had kittens. Kittens being one of the most exciting things in the world for kids our age, getting us all riled up. But somehow... My hackles were up, and I couldn't really relax, even thinking about adorable wild kittens. He actually thought he had heard the cat meow in the forest, up the hill close by. He vehemently suggested that we try meowing at it to see if it would respond. Maybe it would even bring its kittens along and we could see them and play with them, he said. I hadn't heard any sounds at all, and I really didn't like his idea of screaming meows into the creepy forest. What kind of wild cat would respond to human children anyway? Wouldn't it be obvious that we are not cats by the sound of us? That seemed like a dumb idea to me. Before I could try to talk him out of it, he loudly meowed into the forest. To my utter shock, the forest meowed back. Alex was delighted. He meowed again. Something in the forest answered again. I was actually shocked. This didn't make much sense to me. It creeped me out, but I suspended my disbelief to see what would happen. He kept meowing over and over. For every one of his meows, there was one coming back in response from the woods. Something felt off to me. Feral or wild animals didn't behave that way. Even at 12 years old, I realized that. And it wasn't an echo. The cat did not bounce back any sound that we threw at it except meows, which it reciprocated immediately. And anyway, there were no hard rocky surfaces around off which sound could bounce off of. Everything was covered in a soft layer of sound dulling leaves. Alex got even more excited. Listen, the cat is coming towards us. She's coming to see us with her kittens. To my surprise, he was right. There was a rustle of dead leaves coming from above us, from above the slope in the creepy forest. It seemed like the rustling was getting closer to us, but it was way off. Because cats are small and light and careful with their steps, they don't make a ruckus when they walk through the woods. But here, the rustling leaf sounds were extremely obvious, along with the meowing. And in fact, it sounded more like steps like someone with two legs walking in the leaves, and it was getting closer to us. My alarm signals were starting to go off with all the wrongness of it all, while my younger friend was oblivious. He was calling it more vehemently, noticing that it was coming towards us. Then I realized what seemed so wrong. The sound was coming towards us, but there was nothing to be seen. Right in front of us, we had the gently sloping hill, treeless and clearly visible. Anything coming from the forest should have been plainly exposed to view. There was nothing. No source for the rustling sound. Nothing moving. Oh, her kittens are joining her. Listen, there are more sounds. They're coming to play with us. He was right. The walking sounds seemed to have multiplied and now came from various directions all at once, ever getting closer with nothing being visible. Something was way off. I wanted to leave, but Alex was getting mad at me. The kittens were almost here and he wanted to see them, he insisted. At this point, it was extremely tense and fight or flight was activating from the wrongness of it all. We were alone and quite exposed on this, 
theater stage to whatever was getting closer to us, which was, more and more obviously with every movement, decidedly not kittens. I was on the verge to force him to go run home, and then suddenly I heard a very loud panting sound right at my feet. During the first millisecond, I got only mildly surprised. We had a huge husky at home, and I was used to it panting next to my feet. But then, a sense of profound dread downed on me as I realized that, obviously, my dog was not here. And it must be another dog, a very big one by the sound of it, right at my feet. I looked down in a panic ready to jump away from the dog that somehow got extremely close to me, almost on me without my noticing. The only thing there is absolutely nothing at my feet, but I still hear the loud, breathy panting sound coming from there. I whirl around all 360 degrees, screaming. Where is it coming from? There's nothing at my feet or anywhere around me. There's nothing there. Yet the sound is clearly there. As I whirl about in a frenzy, I look up the dirt road we were following. Around a hundred meters away, at the top of the slope, I see a lone dog standing. It looks somewhat similar to a Rottweiler, but in very, very bad shape. Extremely unkempt, with patches of fur missing, shaggy and dirty as hell, with some skin exposed where the fur is missing. It looks down at us, too. Obviously, there's no way that I could hear it panting at that distance, and the source of the sound is at my feet. And at that point, the flight instinct wins inside me. I have never run as desperately and as fast in my whole life. Thank God it was all downhill. Alex kept pace right beside me, terrified. We made it home in one piece. We never walked in those woods anymore. I went back to Alex's place several times in my life. I never wanted to walk in the woods again. We had amazing parties at his house as teens. I was often there rather drunk and having a great time. But I always had this very stressful sensation when I went out of his house. Especially at night. When I slept over there, I had these extremely strange experiences. Where, when I woke up, I sensed as if. Something was there and was observing me. In my mid-awake state, I even saw something floating near the ceiling. It had a sensation that it was not an immediate threat, though. It was observing. We never discussed what happened that day. I did some research, and I see that this land is historically Algonquin land. If anybody can help clarify what happened... I would be thankful. So this all started when me and my two buddies went to go fish off this bank on the river in the afternoon. The layout is that you drive over this levee before you drop down into a boat wrap slash parking area right next to the river. We brought pizza, beer, weed, music, and of course our rods, hoping we'd just hang out and do some late night fishing. At this point, we're all set up on the bank with our chairs and speaker having a nice evening, and it's probably been two hours. It's 9pm now. All three of us were feeling good with some beers in our system, and then we all of a sudden hear two cars with really loud music pull up, and everyone gets out. The car must have had four to five people in each of them, because I heard a lot of people talking, but it was all in Spanish, so I couldn't make anything out. We try to ignore it, but then it gets really loud that we couldn't enjoy ourselves, so we start packing our stuff to head back to the car and just chill out while we sober up. While we're gathering our things, we start to hear what sounds like an argument go down. We start to hear lots of glass shattering and people screaming at the top of their lungs. At this point, we're just keeping quiet, and then you start to hear what sounded like someone getting punched repeatedly, and then a loud splash into the river by the boat ramp, and someone saying, Nah, leave him, leave him, which were the only words spoken in English. At this point, we didn't know what we just heard happen, 
and we didn't want to stick around and find out. The three of us trekked back up the steep incline to get back to the car, but as soon as we came into their view, they all got back into the two cars and quickly sped over the levee, except we spotted one of the cars just sitting on top of the levee, slowly creeping forward. When we turned our car on, that car then went fully over the levee. We realized we were the only car left in the parking lot, and it was now pitch black outside, about 9.30. We sat there for no more than 30 seconds, just trying to process what we just heard go down, and then we decided we needed to get out of there completely and park somewhere to sober up all the way. As we're going over the levee, the road goes over it and then down and makes a sharp left. Right after we take that sharp left, our hearts drop when we see four cars lined up, completely horizontal across the road, blocking us from getting through. There's orchards on our left and right, so there was no going around all of it. At this point, my buddy just gassed it straight towards their bumpers to try and split between the cars and get out of there, even if it meant damaging the front end of his car. Just as we do that, one of the four cars slightly moved out of the way, creating a gap. We flew right through it and got out of there, and they were laying on the horn while we passed through. We don't know what their intentions were, but there were clearly two cars in the boat ramp area where we just were at, and two cars on the other side of the levee blocking the road from anyone else coming in. I ended up filing a police report just in case they really did dump a body into the river, but I haven't heard anything back. It's definitely one of my most terrifying experiences. So, to the four cars who may or may not have robbed us, or God forbid killed us, let's not meet. I'm going to tell this story just to make people aware of the dangers they may be putting themselves in by selling items online. I get a message from someone telling me they want to buy a specific item, and from the get-go the person was pretty pushy. I wanted to make some money, so I responded. The whole time I was talking to this person, something felt off. This guy, Adam, was being a little bit weird from the first message. Adam kept changing the time they were coming to get the item. Adam asked me if I had change for a certain amount, and I said no. This was before Adam got to my house to pick the item up. I told him he needed to get the change because I didn't have any cash. He ends up showing up and had parked around the corner somewhere I couldn't see the car. And I felt something was off with him because he handed me the incorrect amount and asked if I had change. I had already told him I didn't. He then proceeded to ask me to get in the car so we can go get change. I told him I don't get in the car with strangers. Adam said, Oh, I'm from Europe and we don't worry about getting in strangers' cars. I'm thinking, yeah, okay, but I'm definitely not going to. He also asked me a lot of unnecessary questions about the watch. It was brand new and I'd already told him this, plus it was just an ordinary wind-up watch to set the time. Adam went and got the change, surprise, surprise. So when he got back, I could now see the car and there were a few other people in it. I had a really bad feeling, so I just grabbed the money, gave Adam the watch, and ran back inside. I don't know. Am I making a big deal over this? A number of years ago, I was up in the northern end of British Columbia in the islands out by Port Hardy. I set up camp right by the beach close to the shore. I did the normal catch a fish and cook it for dinner on the campfire thing. Perfect, really. A few hours pass and it's getting dark. I climb into the tent and fall asleep quickly. I get woken up by extremely heavy breathing on the beach from something big. It was coming from in the area of my fire, but the tide was in now so the waves would have covered it. My first thought is a bear. But on the islands where I was, bears were not common at all, to the point where there hasn't been one documented ever. This is blasting through my mind, 
but then the urban talk of Bigfoot runs through my mind. At this point, I'm like, there's no such thing as Bigfoot, so what the hell is it? I gain my courage and open my tent. I shine my flashlight around, but I don't see anything, so I get out of my tent. I'm shining my flashlight around when I hear it again. This huge breath, but followed by a small splash. I focus my light on the beach where I see a massive orca rolling around on the kelp right about where my fire was. This behemoth of a marine mammal scared the living shit out of me, but it turned into being one of the most amazing events I've ever witnessed. As I sat watching this massive animal rolling and playing yards from me, I noticed more of them just offshore, bobbing there, probably half asleep. Needless to say, I did not sleep after that until they left. I hope you enjoyed that guys. If you have a scary story you would like me to read in an upcoming video, this is one way to help me guarantee variety in the stories I share. You can email me or post it to my subreddit. I'll drop the details in the video description. Thank you all for listening and a special thanks to my patrons and channel members who now have early access to ad-free videos as well as other behind the scenes content. Thank you to Brock Bollard, Kim Thompson, Angela Reeves, Sherry Agbehi, Nathan Shadwick, Nicholas Johnson, Samantha Place, Cheryl Duckworth, Scout Monk 405, Z Harris, Unladylike 13, Ventura CA, Elizabeth Mares, Alexia Tuttle, Marciana Rainey, Yolo Sapien, Mary Wright, Jessica Copperfield, Zoe D. Danielle Scholl, Jane Wiggins, Tara Harris, Mary Wright, Kelly Townsend, M, Deshaun Edmondson, Kimmy Love, Wendy Maris, Confessions of a Cleaner, Megan Abrams, Miss Tycoon, Stephen Sloan, Christina Myway, Ashley Bray, Madis Felter, Danielle, Tina Marie Heckman, Amal Garner, Lisa Radford, Deborah Malays, Connie Sue, Taya Adwell, Diana Johnston, Vampy Debs, Jasmine Davis, Erica Asir, Fox Mulder, Ram Beltran, Tina, Nick Bigdowski, Sarah C.H., Neil Kavanaugh, Tiara Sanders, Timothy Stratton, Jennifer Jenkins, Lloyd Rash, Maribel DeLuna, Michael O'Malley, Marissa, Kuro, Amber Hobbs, King Slim, Justin Beast Gillespie, Joy Dana, Jay Bardle, Anissa, Stephanie McLaren, Lumini Kami, Skin Crawler, Adiara, Bella Place 2006, Michelle Welchman, Dana B, Lisa McDonald, Clarice Scott, Madison C, Wasps Sting, Jennifer J, Ashley, Lilypad, Lee, Taya, Wyatt, Gina, Laura, JK06, Fenrizio, Donna, Joey, Big GSC, Tanya, Spaghetti Yolo King, Matthew, October Gypsy, Lisa, Ali, Thomas, Build With Me, Leticia, Fran, Debs, Insomnicats, Stephanie, Summer, Rebecca, Tyra, This Bad Kitty, Your Pappy's Dilly, Laney, Tripping Balls Through History, Samantha, Erica, Alyssa, Tracy, Killian's Place, April, James Arterburg, Jen, Joy, Handout, Pegasus Genesis, Karen Keaton, V. Berry, LJ, Fiona X Fox, Scott, I Like Booty, Monica Level Ace, Chris and Donna, Holly Spry, Kimber, Jasmine, Sanatix, Heather Haven, Kitty Cat Luna 2, 
ADHD Aurora, Janice, Cinderella Baby, Borderline Betty, Lady Draco, Erica Nicole, Snowball Rathena, Melanie, The Honeybee 987, Pretty Girl 215, Ryan, Brooke, Wendy, Crafty Cow, Tina, Dina, Vampy Debs, Patricia, Amber, Krista, Brenda, Absinthe Alice, Christy, Kay, Spider's Web, Ooh La La Andrea, Sue, Monique, Sean Gorman, Emma Lisa, Sigma Cube X, Greg, Chelsea, Amanda Jane, Sam, Zeb Tepe, Sarah C, Austin, Tegan, Lil Smart, Jenny, Gabrielle, Fire 05, Sarah P, James Gargano, Gemma Allen, Monica Level Ace, and Alex. I hope you're doing well guys. I'll see you all on the next one.